Working the night shift in a small research facility was always a creepy experience. The building was situated on the outskirts of town, surrounded by dense forest and far from the comforting glow of the city lights. As a laboratory assistant, I had grown used to the solitude of the night, but one particular night would forever change the way I viewed the facility. My shift began like any other. The research facility specialized in studying rare plants and their potential medicinal properties. Most nights, the silence was broken only by the soft hum of the air conditioning system and the distant chirping of crickets. But that night was different. As I made my rounds, checking on the various experiments, I noticed something odd. In one of the isolated containment chambers, a peculiar plant had grown much larger than it should have. It was a rare species known as Luminaris, with phosphorescent leaves that emitted a soft, eerie glow. But this plant had exceeded its normal size and now filled the chamber. I approached the containment chamber. My curiosity peaked. The soft green glow of the Luminaris leaves cast a surreal, almost otherworldly light on the surroundings. I reached out to touch the leaves, but before my fingers could make contact, a voice behind me said, Don't touch it. Startled, I spun around to see Dr. Eleanor Weber, the head researcher. She was known for her reclusive nature and rarely ventured into the facility during the night. Her face was pale, and her eyes held a mixture of fear and fascination. What's going on, Dr. Weber? I asked, bewildered by the strange occurrence. Why has this plant grown so large? She didn't answer immediately, her eyes fixed on the Luminaris. Finally, she spoke, her voice barely more than a whisper. It's not just the size, it's the rate of growth. I've never seen anything like it. We both watched in silence as the luminaries continued to expand, its leaves pulsating within strange light. Dr. Weber's fear was palpable, and I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. As we left the containment chamber, she explained that the luminaries had been a subject of intense research for years. Its unique properties made it a potential game-changer in the pharmaceutical industry. But its cultivation was notoriously difficult, with growth rates measured in millimeters over months, not inches and hours. Dr. Weber believed that something extraordinary had occurred, something beyond our comprehension. She was determined to find answers, and as the night progressed, we delved deeper into the anomaly. Our investigation led us to the main research lab where the Luminaris seeds were stored. To our shock, the seeds had begun to germinate, their tiny shoots pushing through the soil. It was as if an invisible force was propelling their growth. Dr. Weber took a sample of the anomalous plant, and we returned to her office to examine it under the microscope. What we discovered was beyond belief. The plant cells showed signs of accelerated growth, as if they had been subjected to some unknown force. As the night wore on, we became increasingly absorbed in our research, forgetting about the time. The Luminaris anomaly was unlike anything we had ever seen, and it held a dark, magnetic allure. At around 3 a.m., while we were engrossed in our research, a low, guttural sound echoed through the facility. Dr. Weber and I exchanged worried glances. The sound was unnatural, a discordant blend of whispers and growls. We decided to investigate, following the sound to its source. It led us to a remote section of the facility that housed the staff quarters. As we approached, the strange noises grew louder and more unsettling. It was as if the building itself was alive with a sinister presence. Inside one of the quarters, we discovered a horrifying scene. The room had been torn apart, furniture scattered, and the walls were covered in strange symbols. At the center of the room was the facility's janitor, Mr. Ramirez. He was huddled in a corner, his eyes vacant, and he muttered incoherently. Dr. Weber tried to speak to him, to understand what had happened, but Mr. Ramirez's words were a nonsensical jumble. He kept repeating the word growth over and over. We called for security and Mr. Ramirez was escorted from the facility, but the sense of dread remained. The mysterious anomaly of the Luminaris and the strange events of the night had left us all deeply unnerved. We returned to the main lab, determined to find answers. As we examined the Luminaris sample, Dr. Weber made a chilling discovery. The plant cells were mutating, merging with other organisms in ways that defied the laws of nature. The more we delved into the research, the more we realized that we were dealing with something far beyond our understanding. Dr. Weber's fascination had given way to fear, 
and I couldn't help but feel that we had stumbled upon something malevolent. We worked through the night, our research becoming increasingly frantic as the luminaries continued to grow and mutate. The sounds that had plagued us earlier had returned, filling the facility with a sense of foreboding. At around 4 a.m., as we reached a breakthrough in our research, a blinding flash of light filled the lab. We shielded our eyes, stumbling back in shock. When the light subsided, we were met with an astonishing sight. The Luminaris had grown to an enormous size, its leaves stretching out like dark, outstretched hands. It pulsed within green light, filling the lab with an otherworldly glow. Dr. Weber and I exchanged horrified glances. The Luminaris had become a monstrous, mutated entity, its presence dominating the room. It was as if it had absorbed the very essence of the facility. We tried to retreat to escape the nightmarish scene, but the door to the lab had become sealed shut. Panic set in as we realized we were trapped with the abomination. The Luminaris leaves seemed to reach out, as if they had a mind of their own. We fought to break free, our desperate struggles doing little against the overwhelming power of the Luminaris. The plant seemed to pulse with malevolence, its unnatural growth spiraling out of control. As the Luminaris closed in, the facility itself seemed to come alive, the walls shifting and contorting as if they were part of some grotesque living organism. The guttural sounds grew louder, filling the air with a cacophony of whispers and growls. Dr. Weber and I clung to each other, our fear mounting as the monstrous plant closed in. It was as if we had become part of a grotesque experiment, one that defied all logic and reason. The luminaris leaves enveloped us, their scary light casting us into a surreal, nightmarish world. It was a place where the boundaries between reality and nightmare had blurred a place where the laws of nature were bent and twisted. And as the luminaries consumed us, I couldn't help but wonder if the plant had become a doorway to a world beyond our comprehension, a world of darkness and malevolence. It was a world that had claimed us, a world that we would never escape. The night shift had become a night of horror, a night that would forever haunt my dreams. Story three. The night shift was always my least favorite part of the job. The empty hallways of St. Martin's retirement home seemed to echo with the ghostly memories of its inhabitants. The corridors played tricks on my tired eyes, and the creaks and groans of the old building were unnerving. But it was a paycheck and I had bills to pay. As the new night nurse on duty, I was responsible for the well-being of the elderly residents during the darkest hours. Most of them slept through the night, but a few would occasionally need my assistance. The isolation of the night shift only heightened my unease. It was as if the building itself was haunted by the shadows of the past. The first few weeks were relatively uneventful, except for the occasional patient needing assistance to the bathroom or a glass of water. But as the nights passed, I began to notice peculiar things. The residents, particularly the ones with dementia, would sometimes speak in hushed tones to no one in particular. They claimed to see figures standing at the foot of their beds or hear distant whispers. I tried to reassure them chalking it up to their old age and fragile mental states. But deep down, their stories sent a cold feeling down my spine. And then there was Mrs. Henderson. Mrs. Henderson was an elderly woman who lived in room 212. She was sharp for her age, a former librarian who still possessed a wealth of knowledge. But as the weeks went by, I noticed she became increasingly agitated during my shifts. One night as I entered her room to check on her, she grabbed my arm with surprising strength. Her eyes were wide with fear as she whispered, They're watching. Don't you see them, dear? They're always there. I followed her gaze, but there was nothing to see. The room was empty, save for the soft glow of the nightlight. I tried to soothe her, telling her it was just her imagination. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. As days turned into weeks, I noticed a pattern. The residents' restlessness seemed to increase with each passing night. They would talk of shadowy figures, distant voices, and faces in the windows. I began to doubt my own sanity, wondering if the isolation and dark atmosphere of the retirement home were playing tricks on my mind. One night, as I made my rounds, I heard a faint sound coming from the basement. It was a soft, melodic hum that made my blood freeze. I decided to investigate, my curiosity getting the best of me. I descended the creaky stairs and as I reached the bottom, the humming grew louder. The basement was a labyrinthine maze of storage rooms and long-forgotten furniture. 
The source of the humming seemed to be coming from one of the rooms at the end of the corridor. The door was slightly ajar, and a pale, eerie light seeped through the crack. As I pushed the door open, I was met with a scene that froze me in my tracks. In the center of the room, a group of elderly residents sat in a circle, their faces twisted with a strange mix of fear and ecstasy. They were chanting in a language I couldn't comprehend, their voices rising and falling in an unsettling rhythm. In the center of the circle was Mrs. Henderson, her eyes rolled back in her head, her frail body swaying to the haunting melody. My heart raced as I watched the bizarre spectacle unfold before me. I had no idea what I was witnessing, but it felt like something out of a nightmare. I couldn't move, couldn't speak as the chanting continued. It was as if time had stopped and I was trapped in this surreal otherworldly moment. I finally mustered the courage to step back and quietly close the door, retreating to the safety of the narrow corridor. My mind raced with questions and fear. What were they doing? What was the purpose of that strange ritual? I decided to consult my supervisor in the morning, hoping for an explanation. The morning couldn't come soon enough. I rushed to my supervisor's office, my heart pounding with anxiety. I explained what I had witnessed in the basement, expecting shock and disbelief. But to my surprise, my supervisor's face remained unnervingly calm. That's nothing to worry about, he said with a dismissive wave of his hand. Sometimes they just do strange things at night. It's part of their condition. I tried to protest to convey the urgency of the situation, but he brushed it off as the ramblings of confused elderly residents. I couldn't help but feel as though there was more to the story than he was letting on. That night I couldn't get the image of the basement ritual out of my mind. I felt a growing sense of unease, a gnawing fear that there was something sinister lurking in the shadows of St. Martin's retirement home. As I made my rounds that evening, I couldn't help but notice the tension in the air. The residents seemed more restless than ever, their eyes darting around as if they were constantly on edge. It was as if the retirement home had become a pressure cooker ready to burst at any moment. And then it happened. As I entered Mrs. Henderson's room, I found her lying in bed, her eyes wide with terror. She pointed a trembling finger towards the window, her voice barely more than a whisper. They're here, she said, her voice quivering. The watchers in the night, they're waiting for you. I turned to look out the window, half expecting to see some malevolent presence lurking in the darkness. But there was nothing, just the same empty courtyard and the distant glow of streetlights. I tried to calm Mrs. Henderson, but her fear was palpable. She clutched my arm and begged me not to leave her alone. I decided to stay with her, hoping to provide some comfort in the face of her overwhelming terror. As the night wore on, Mrs. Henderson's fear only intensified. She spoke of the watchers in the night, of the things they had seen and the terrible secrets they held. It was a chilling narrative that creeped me out. Suddenly, the lights in the room flickered and dimmed, casting mysterious shadows on the walls. Mrs. Henderson's grip on my arm tightened, and she gasped in terror. I turned to look at the window, and that's when I saw them. Figures, dark and indistinct, stood outside the window. They were tall and featureless, their outlines shifting and swaying in the night breeze. Mrs. Henderson's eyes were locked onto them, her face a mask of pure horror. I tried to pull the curtains shut to block out the nightmarish figures, but they seemed to flicker in and out of existence, as if they were ethereal and insubstantial. I was overcome with a sense of dread, a feeling that we were being watched by something vicious and beyond our understanding. Mrs. Henderson's frail voice broke the silence, her words laced with terror. They're the watchers in the night. They've been waiting for you, waiting for your turn. I couldn't bear to look at those shadowy figures any longer. I grabbed Mrs. Henderson, her trembling body in my arms, and rushed out of the room. As I made my way down the hallway, I noticed that the other residents were also in a state of fear and agitation. They spoke of the watchers in the night, of their long-awaited arrival. The retirement home had descended into chaos. Residents roamed the corridors in a daze, their voices filled with terror and confusion. It was as if a sinister force had descended upon the building, and there was no escape from its grasp. I desperately tried to call for help, but the phone lines were dead, and the lights continued to flicker, casting weird, dancing shadows on the walls. The building seemed to groan and creak, as if it were a living, breathing entity. 
As I led Mrs. Henderson down the stairwell, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being pursued. The air was thick with an oppressive sense of dread, and the dark figures seemed to be closing in on us. Finally, we reached the ground floor, but the entrance seemed impossibly far away. The retirement home had become a nightmarish labyrinth, and we were trapped in its web of fear and uncertainty. Just as we reached the entrance, I heard a soft, melodic hum, the same creepy tune that I had heard in the basement. I turned to look behind us, and the figures were there, their shadowy forms looming in the darkness. They were closing in, their presence suffocating and malicious. I pushed the heavy double doors open, the night air rushing in to greet us. As I stepped out into the courtyard, I felt a strange sensation, as if the ground beneath me was shifting and undulating. I turned to look back at the retirement home, and what I saw will haunt me for the rest of my days. The building seemed to contort and twist, its windows transforming into gaping, hollow eyes that stared out at me with an otherworldly malevolence. The retirement home had become a nightmarish entity, a living, breathing abomination that defied all reason and logic. Mrs. Henderson's voice broke through my shock, her trembling words a haunting lament. They've been waiting for you, waiting for your turn. I turned and fled into the night, leaving the retirement home and its horrors behind. The night air was cold and unforgiving, and the darkness seemed to stretch on into eternity. As I stumbled through the streets, I couldn't help but wonder what had become of the residents and the sinister figures that had pursued us. I was haunted by the memory of the retirement home, a place where the boundaries between reality and nightmare had blurred and twisted. The night shift had turned into a night of terror, a night that would forever haunt my dreams. The retirement home and its dark secrets were now a part of me, an unending nightmare that I could never escape. And as I walked through the cold, unforgiving darkness, I couldn't help but wonder if the retirement home was still there, waiting for its next victim, waiting for my turn to come. In the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, there existed a remote camping spot known only to a select few adventurers. It was a place of pristine beauty, where the rugged terrain and dense forests created a sanctuary for those seeking solace in nature. A group of friends, James, Emma, and Daniel, decided to embark on a camping trip to this hidden gem. They were experienced outdoors enthusiasts and had heard tales of the untouched wilderness and pristine streams of the area. Their journey into the heart of the Appalachians was challenging, requiring them to navigate steep slopes and dense underbrush. But the promise of unspoiled wilderness and the chance to disconnect from the modern world drove them forward. They arrived at their secluded campsite, nestled in a valley surrounded by towering peaks. It was a place of breathtaking beauty, far removed from the trappings of civilization. They pitched their tents and spent the day hiking through the rugged terrain. As night descended, they gathered around a campfire, its crackling flames providing a sense of warmth and security in the remote wilderness. The stars overhead shone with a brilliance only found in such isolated locations. As they settled in for the night, they heard the distant call of an owl and the rustling of leaves in the forest. But there was something else, something unsettling about the night. It was as if the forest held its breath, waiting for something to happen. In the middle of the night, James was awoken by a sound that sent a shiver down his spine, a faint echoing voice calling out in the darkness. He woke Emma and Daniel, and together they listened for any sign of distress. The voice came again, a desperate plea for help, and it was unmistakably human. They knew they had to investigate, fearing that someone might be in danger. Armed with flashlights, they followed the sound deeper into the forest. The forest was eerily silent as they ventured into its depths, the only sound the distant rush of the nearby stream. They soon came upon a small clearing, where they discovered an old tattered tent. Cautiously, they entered the tent, their flashlights revealing a scene of disarray. Sleeping bags were torn open, and supplies were scattered across the floor. It was as if the occupants had fled in a panic. Then they heard it again, the voice this time closer, as if it were just beyond the trees. They followed the sound, their hearts pounding with trepidation. It led them to a narrow trail that wound deeper into the forest. As they ventured further along the trail, they stumbled upon a backpack and a hiking jacket, abandoned on the ground as if their owner had hastily discarded them. 
It was a chilling sight, a sign that someone had been in distress. The voice came again, echoing through the trees, desperate and pleading. It sent shivers down their spines, and they knew they had to leave the forest immediately, fearing that they too might become victims of whatever unseen force had claimed the camper. They retreated from the wilderness of the Appalachians, their encounter with the phantom camper forever etched in their memories. They couldn't help but wonder if the voice they had heard was the desperate plea of a lost soul, forever trapped in the remote wilderness, forever seeking escape from the enigmatic forces that had claimed them. Story 2. Deep in the heart of the Adirondack Mountains, there existed a remote and secluded camping spot known only to a few seasoned adventurers. It was a place untouched by modernity, a paradise for those seeking solitude and communion with nature. One crisp autumn weekend, a trio of friends, Ben, Emily, and Alex, embarked on a camping trip to this hidden gem. They were avid hikers and had heard tales of the pristine wilderness and untouched beauty of the area. Their journey into the heart of the Adirondacks was challenging, requiring them to traverse rugged terrain and ford rushing rivers. But the promise of pristine wilderness and untouched beauty drove them forward. They arrived at their secluded campsite, nestled in a small valley surrounded by towering pine trees. It was a place of breathtaking beauty, far removed from the trappings of civilization. They pitched their tents by the edge of a crystal clear stream and spent the day hiking through the pristine forest. As night descended, they gathered around a campfire, its crackling flames providing a sense of warmth and security in the remote wilderness. The stars overhead shone with a brilliance only found in such remote locations. As they settled in for the night, they heard the distant call of an owl and the rustling of leaves in the forest. But there was something else, something unsettling about the night. They couldn't quite put their finger on it. In the morning, they discovered the source of their unease. Surrounding their campsite were dozens of footprints, human footprints, leading to and from the stream. It was as if someone had been walking around their campsite while they slept. They followed the footprints, their hearts pounding with trepidation. The tracks led deeper into the forest, becoming more erratic as they went. It was as if the person had been wandering aimlessly in the dark. Suddenly, they came upon a small, dilapidated cabin hidden deep in the woods. Its windows were shattered and its door hung off its hinges. It was a chilling sight, a place that seemed to have been abandoned for years. Cautiously, they entered the cabin, their flashlights illuminating the decaying interior. As they explored, they found old newspapers and photographs, all dating back decades. The cabin seemed to be a relic of the past, frozen in time. Then they heard a soft whispering, a voice that seemed to echo through the cabin's walls. It was a woman's voice filled with sorrow and longing. They followed the sound, which led them to a small room at the back of the cabin. Inside the room, they discovered a diary, its pages filled with the handwritten entries of a woman named Evelyn. Her words spoke of loneliness, isolation, and a deep yearning for human connection. She wrote of a tragedy that had befallen her family, leaving her alone in the wilderness. As they read on, the entries grew more chilling. Evelyn spoke of strange occurrences in the forest, of eerie figures that seemed to watch her from the shadows. She described sleepless nights haunted by whispers and footsteps outside her cabin. The final entry was dated decades ago and spoke of a decision to leave the cabin and seek help. But there was an ominous tone to the words, as if Evelyn knew that she was leaving something behind, something that would never let her go. As they exited the cabin, they noticed that the footprints had disappeared as if they had never been there. It was as if the cabin itself had drawn them in, revealing its secrets and then erasing all evidence of their presence. They left the remote wilderness of the Adirondacks, their encounter with the cabin and its enigmatic past forever etched in their memories. They couldn't help but wonder if Evelyn's spirit still lingered in the forest, a lost soul forever seeking connection in the wilderness. Story three. In the heart of the Smoky Mountains, there existed a hidden camping spot known only to a select few. It was a place of unparalleled beauty, where the dense forest stretched as far as the eye could see, and the stars shone with a brilliance unmatched by city lights. A group of friends, Jake, Megan, and Chris, decided to embark on a camping trip to this secluded paradise. They were avid outdoors enthusiasts and had heard stories of the pristine wilderness and abundant wildlife of the area. 
Their journey took them deep into the heart of the Smoky Mountains, where they pitched their tents near a pristine mountain stream. It was a place of breathtaking beauty, untouched by the trappings of modernity. As the day turned to night, they gathered around a campfire, sharing stories and laughter under the canopy of stars. The forest seemed alive with the sounds of night creatures, their calls and rustlings creating a symphony of nature. As they settled in for the night, they heard the distant call of an owl and the rushing of the nearby stream. But there was something else, something unsettling about the night. It was as if the forest held its breath, waiting for something to happen. In the early hours of the morning, Chris was awoken by a sound that chilled him to the bone, a distant echoing gunshot. He shook Jake and Megan awake and they listened in the darkness for any sign of danger. The forest was silent, as if the gunshot had never occurred. They wondered if it had been a hunter in the distance, but something about the sound had seemed off, as if it didn't belong in the tranquil wilderness. As they debated whether to investigate, they heard it again, the unmistakable sound of a gunshot, much closer this time. It echoed through the forest, sending shivers down their spines. They decided to leave their campsite immediately, fearing that they might be in the line of fire. But as they packed up their gear, they heard something that froze them in their tracks, a series of eerie, ghostly whispers seemingly carried on the wind. The whispers spoke of death and despair, of a hunter condemned to roam the forest for eternity. They spoke of a curse that had befallen him, a curse that bound him to the wilderness. Terrified but compelled to uncover the source of the haunting whispers, they followed the sound deeper into the forest. The moonlight illuminated their path, casting eerie shadows on the towering trees. They soon came upon a clearing where an old, dilapidated hunting cabin stood. Its windows were shattered, and its door hung off its hinges. It was a chilling sight, a place that seemed to have been abandoned for years. Cautiously, they entered the cabin, their flashlights revealing the decaying interior. As they explored, they found old hunting gear and trophies, all covered in dust and cobwebs. It was as if the cabin had been frozen in time. In a corner of the cabin, they discovered a journal, its pages filled with the handwritten entries of a man named Samuel. His words spoke of a love for hunting and the thrill of the chase. But as they read on, the entries grew darker, revealing a descent into obsession and madness. Samuel wrote of a fateful day when he had wounded a majestic buck, but had been unable to claim his prize. He spoke of a mysterious figure that had appeared in the forest, cursing him to roam the wilderness as a phantom hunter, forever seeking the elusive buck. The final entry was dated decades ago and spoke of Samuel's decision to leave the cabin and seek help. But there was a sense of hopelessness in his words, as if he knew that he was bound to the forest, unable to escape the curse that had befallen him. As they exited the cabin, they noticed that the forest had grown silent, as if the whispers had ceased. It was as if the cabin itself had drawn them in, revealing its secrets, and then silencing its haunting past. They left the Smoky Mountains, their encounter with the cabin and its enigmatic past forever etched in their memories. They couldn't help but wonder if Samuel's spirit still roamed the forest, a phantom hunter forever seeking his elusive prey. Story 4 In the remote wilderness of the Pacific Northwest, there existed a pristine camping spot known only to a handful of intrepid explorers. It was a place of rugged beauty, where towering trees reached for the sky, and the sound of rushing rivers filled the air. A group of friends, Mia, Ethan, and Lily, decided to embark on a camping trip to this hidden haven. They were outdoor enthusiasts and had heard tales of the untouched wilderness and abundant wildlife of the area. Their journey into the heart of the Pacific Northwest was challenging, requiring them to navigate dense forests and ford rushing rivers. But the promise of unspoiled wilderness and breathtaking vistas drove them forward. They arrived at their secluded campsite, nestled on the banks of a pristine river. It was a place of unparalleled beauty, far removed from the trappings of modernity. They pitched their tents and spent the day hiking through the lush forest. As night descended, they gathered around a campfire, its warm glow providing a sense of comfort in the remote wilderness. The stars overhead shone with a brilliance only found in such isolated locations. As they settled in for the night, they heard the distant call of an owl and the rustling of leaves in the forest. 
But there was something else, something unsettling about the night. It was as if the forest held its breath, as if it were waiting for something to happen. In the middle of the night, Mia was awoken by a sound that sent a chill down her spine, a distant echoing cry for help. She woke Ethan and Lily, and together they listened in the darkness for any sign of distress. The cry came again, closer this time, and it was unmistakably human. They knew they had to investigate, fearing that someone might be in danger. With flashlights in hand, they followed the sound deeper into the forest. The forest was eerily silent as they ventured into its depths, the only sound the rushing of the river in the distance. They soon came upon a small clearing where they discovered a tent pitched haphazardly. Cautiously, they entered the tent, their flashlights revealing a scene of chaos. Sleeping bags were tossed about, and supplies were strewn across the floor. It was as if the occupants had fled in a hurry. Then they heard it again, the cry for help, this time coming from deeper in the forest. They followed the sound, their hearts pounding with trepidation. It led them to a narrow trail that disappeared into the trees. As they ventured further along the trail, they stumbled upon a journal, its pages filled with handwritten entries. It belonged to a woman named Sarah, and her words spoke of a solo camping trip in the wilderness. Sarah wrote of the beauty of the forest and the solitude she had found in its depths. But as they read on, the entries grew more unsettling. She described strange occurrences in the night, of eerie shadows and ghostly whispers that seemed to haunt her campsite. The final entry was dated only a few nights ago and spoke of a chilling encounter. Sarah had heard the cries for help in the darkness, and when she had ventured out of her tent to investigate, she had been met with a sense of overwhelming dread. She wrote of a presence in the forest, a malevolent force that seemed to watch her every move. She feared that she was being hunted, that something in the wilderness wanted to claim her. As they continued down the trail, they found themselves in a small clearing, where they discovered a backpack and a pair of hiking boots. It was as if Sarah had vanished without a trace, leaving behind only her belongings. The cry for help came again, this time echoing through the trees closer than ever. It sent shivers down their spines, and they knew they had to leave the forest immediately, fearing that they too might become victims of whatever malevolent force had claimed Sarah. They retreated from the wilderness of the Pacific Northwest, their encounter with the mysterious disappearance forever etched in their memories. They couldn't help but wonder if Sarah's spirit still haunted the forest, a lost soul forever seeking answers to the enigmatic forces that had claimed her. Story 5. Nestled in the heart of the dense forest, Willow Lake had always been a tranquil and picturesque camping destination. Families and nature enthusiasts flocked to its shores during the summer months, seeking respite from the hustle and bustle of the city. One warm July weekend, a group of friends, Sarah, Mike, Lisa, and Tom, decided to embark on a camping trip to Willow Lake. They had heard stories of its serene beauty and the abundance of wildlife in the area. It seemed like the perfect getaway. They arrived at the campsite, pitched their tents, and spent the day hiking along the trails that crisscrossed the woods. As evening descended, they gathered around a crackling campfire, roasting marshmallows and sharing ghost stories. As the night deepened, an eerie stillness settled over the forest. The usual sounds of nocturnal creatures seemed to have vanished, leaving the group in a hushed silence that was punctuated only by the crackling of the fire. Sarah, an avid photographer, decided to capture the beauty of the moonlit lake. She ventured toward the water's edge, her camera in hand. The others watched as she framed her shot, capturing the shimmering reflection of the full moon on the tranquil surface. Just as Sarah was about to take her photo, she heard a faint whisper behind her. Startled, she turned, but there was no one there. She dismissed it as a trick of the wind and snapped her photo. But as the flash illuminated the area, it revealed a chilling sight. Standing at the water's edge was a figure, its back to Sarah. It appeared to be a woman, her long, disheveled hair flowing down her back. Sarah called out to the figure, asking if she was lost or needed help. There was no response. The figure remained motionless, facing the lake. Sarah cautiously approached, her heart pounding in her chest. When she reached out to touch the woman's shoulder, the figure turned slowly, revealing a face etched with sadness and despair. Her eyes were vacant and her lips moved soundlessly as if trying to convey a message. 
Terrified, Sarah stumbled backward, her friends rushing to her side. They saw the spectral figure, too, standing by the water's edge, a ghostly presence that seemed to radiate sorrow. They decided to pack up and leave the campsite immediately, their fear overpowering their curiosity. As they retreated, they glanced back one last time to see the figure disappear into the moonlit mist. The group never returned to Willow Lake, their encounter with the mysterious apparition forever etched in their memories. They would later learn that the lake had a history of tragedies, including drownings and disappearances, leaving them to wonder if the ghostly woman they had encountered was a lost soul still seeking peace. I've always been a nature enthusiast, and hiking has been a passion of mine for as long as I can remember. It was a sunny Saturday morning when I decided to embark on a solo hiking adventure in a remote and less traveled part of the Rocky Mountains. The idea was to find tranquility, to escape the bustling city life and reconnect with nature. The trail I chose led into an uncharted territory, a region that had been rarely explored by hikers. It was an area rich in dense forests, rolling hills and breathtaking vistas. The promise of solitude and a genuine wilderness experience excited me. The day began with optimism and a sense of adventure. The early morning sun cast long shadows through the trees as I hiked deeper into the woods. The trail was marked, but it became increasingly overgrown and less maintained as I progressed. It was clear that few had ventured this far, but that only added to the appeal. The songs of birds and the rustling of leaves underfoot accompanied me. As the day wore on, I paused by a tranquil creek to refill my water bottle. The sun dappled the water's surface, and I could see small fish darting in the clear stream. I was in awe of the untouched beauty of the place. My goal was to reach a high ridge from which I'd have a panoramic view of the surrounding wilderness. I knew I would need to make camp up there for the night. With each step, I felt more disconnected from the outside world and more attuned to the wilderness that enveloped me. As the sun began to set, I found the perfect spot on the ridge to set up my campsite. I pitched my tent near the edge where I'd have a clear view of the sunrise. I sat by the fire, cooking a simple meal, and watching the stars twinkle above. But as night fell, the forest around me came alive with strange sounds. Owls hooted in the distance and the leaves rustled in the breeze. It was the kind of experience I had yearned for, and I was fully in my element. However, it was during the night that my journey took an unsettling turn. I awoke to a cold, chilling howl that echoed through the trees. It was unlike any sound I had ever heard, a low and mournful cry that sent shivers down my spine. My heart raced as I listened to the haunting howl. It was followed by more, as if a pack of unseen creatures were communicating through the night. Fear gripped me and I realized that I was not alone in the wilderness. I had been trained to handle encounters with wildlife and knew that some animals could be territorial or curious, but this felt different. The howling continued, drawing nearer to my campsite. The sensation of being watched grew stronger and I began to question whether this was a natural occurrence or something more ominous. With a flashlight in hand, I unzipped the tent and peered into the darkness. I couldn't see anything beyond the circle of light but the howling was closer now, echoing from the surrounding trees. My instincts told me to remain in the tent, but curiosity and fear pushed me to investigate. I cautiously made my way to the edge of the ridge where the forest below was obscured by shadows. The howling grew louder, and I began to make out the silhouettes of creatures moving through the underbrush. Their eyes gleamed with an scary, phosphorescent glow in the dim light of my flashlight. It was a pack of wolves, their silvery fur illuminated by the beam of my flashlight. They moved with a fluid grace, circling my campsite, their eyes locked onto me. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched the pack. It was a mesmerizing and terrifying sight. I had encountered wolves before, but I had never seen them behave like this, so close to a human presence. The leader of the pack, a massive silver-coated wolf, approached the edge of the ridge and locked eyes with me. Its gaze was intense and unwavering, as if it held a deep intelligence. I knew better than to run or make any sudden movements. For what felt like an eternity, I and the wolf maintained our silent standoff, each assessing the other. The howling of the pack had ceased, and the forest was still. The moment was surreal, 
a connection between man and beast in the heart of the wilderness. Then with a subtle nod of its head, the wolf turned and led the pack back into the darkness of the forest. The dark phosphorescent glow of their eyes faded into the night, and the howling resumed, echoing through the trees as they disappeared from view. I was left with a profound sense of wonder and a touch of fear. The wilderness had a way of revealing its secrets, and I had just witnessed a spectacle that few could claim to have experienced. The following morning I awoke to the sound of birdsong and the warmth of the rising sun. The wolves were gone, leaving only their footprints and the memory of their haunting presence. I continued my hike, my perspective on the wilderness forever changed. I marveled at the untamed beauty of the land and the mysteries that it held. It was a reminder that even in the most remote corners of the world, we are not truly alone. As the days passed, I trekked deeper into the uncharted woods, exploring landscapes that few had laid eyes on. The trail had become less defined and the forest more untamed, but I continued on, driven by a sense of adventure and the allure of the unknown. The solitude of the wilderness surrounded me, and I embraced it as a kind of sanctuary. I couldn't help but feel that the forest had revealed a side of itself to me, a realm that few would ever have the privilege to witness. But as time passed, I began to realize that I was venturing deeper into uncharted territory, away from the well-trodden paths of civilization. The forest had a way of distorting time and space, and the sense of isolation grew stronger with each passing day. I continued my journey searching for the next breathtaking vista, the next uncharted wonder. My supplies were dwindling and my encounters with wildlife became more frequent. In the end, I couldn't help but wonder if the uncharted woods held a truth that was beyond my comprehension a realm of solitude and fascination that would forever remain a mystery. My journey had been a descent into the unknown, a venture into a realm of fear and wonder, and I had emerged from the experience forever changed. I had returned from the depths of the wilderness, but the memories of my time in the uncharted woods would continue to haunt me, a reminder of the beauty and the uncertainty that exist in the natural world. Story 2 I've always had a deep love for the outdoors, so it wasn't unusual for me to spend weekends exploring new hiking trails in the wilderness of upstate New York. This particular weekend, I decided to venture into the vast Catskill Mountains, an area renowned for its beauty and serenity. The crisp morning air greeted me as I embarked on my hike, following a well-marked trail into the dense forest. The path was clear and the sun filtered through the leaves, casting a dappled light on the forest floor. The sounds of nature surrounded me, from the chirping of birds to the gentle rustling of leaves in the breeze. As I hiked deeper into the woods, I became increasingly aware of the sheer solitude that enveloped me. There was a tranquil and a dead silence that settled over the forest. Although I was alone, I couldn't help but feel as if unseen eyes were watching my every step. The feeling was unnerving, but I shrugged it off as a product of the profound quiet. Hours passed as I ventured further into the forest. The trail had become narrower and the dense underbrush encroached on both sides. I felt a sense of vulnerability, a realization that I was in a remote area where help was far from reach. My goal for the day had been to reach a pristine mountain lake I had read about, nestled deep within the Catskills. It was rumored to be a hidden gem, a place of breathtaking beauty. But as the day wore on, I began to worry that I had veered off the path. I took out my map and compass to assess my location, but to my shock, I couldn't find them. Panic surged through me as I realized that I must have left them behind at my last rest stop. I cursed my carelessness, but told myself that I could rely on my intuition and make my way back. I turned to retrace my steps, but to my surprise, the trail I had been following seemed to have disappeared. The once clear path had become an overgrown tangle of branches and underbrush. I fought back the rising fear and decided to push forward confident that I could eventually find my way back to the main trail. The hours passed and my sense of unease deepened as I continued to walk deeper into the woods. The forest around me had grown unfamiliar, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was lost. The towering trees seemed to loom over me, their branches blocking out the sunlight. The stillness of the woods was broken only by the occasional call of a distant bird. As the day turned into evening, I made the difficult decision to set up camp. I gathered wood for a fire and constructed a makeshift shelter using branches and leaves. 
The night was quiet and dark, save for the soft rustling of leaves in the wind. The following morning I was determined to find my way back to civilization. I scoured the area for any signs of the trail, but it was as if the path had vanished entirely. I couldn't understand how I had managed to get so disoriented in what should have been a straightforward hike. I continued to walk, driven by a growing sense of desperation. The forest felt like a labyrinth, with no clear direction or landmarks to guide me. The solitude of the wilderness, which had once been so serene, now felt oppressive and isolating. Each step I took seemed to lead me further into the depths of the forest, away from the familiar world I had known. The shadows of the trees cast long shapes on the ground, and the silence was punctuated only by the sounds of my own footsteps. I searched for any signs of human activity, a path, or a clearing that might lead me to safety, but the forest held no answers. I couldn't help but feel as if I had stepped into a different world, a place where the rules of reality no longer applied, desperate to find my way back. My supplies were running low and I had no means of communication with the outside world. I was well and truly alone, a lost soul in the heart of the Catskills. The forest offered no relief from the oppressive silence, and the solitude weighed heavily on my shoulders. The feeling of being watched never left me, and I couldn't escape the sensation that I was not alone. In my desperate search for a way out, I stumbled upon a small, decrepit cabin deep in the woods. It was an unexpected discovery, a structure that seemed out of place in the heart of the wilderness. I approached cautiously, the cabin's weathered walls casting long, creepy shadows in the fading light. Inside I found the remnants of a life long gone. Old furniture, rusted cookware, and faded photographs covered the cabin's interior. It was as if time had stood still, frozen in a moment from the past. I couldn't help but wonder who had lived in the cabin and what had become of them. The place seemed abandoned, but there was an unsettling feeling of being watched, as if the walls themselves held secrets. I spent the night in the cabin, sheltered from the elements. The hours passed slowly, the darkness outside growing more oppressive. I couldn't escape the feeling that the forest was closing in around me, that I was a mere intruder in a place that did not belong to me. The following morning I continued my journey through the woods, determined to find a way out, but the forest seemed intent on keeping its secrets. I came across strange symbols carved into the trees, intricate patterns that seemed to form a trail of their own. I followed them, hoping they would lead me to safety, but they only seemed to take me deeper into the wilderness. The sense of isolation and despair deepened with each passing day. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being drawn deeper into the heart of the forest, as if it had a scary will of its own. I fought to keep my hope alive, clinging to the belief that I would one day find my way back to civilization. The forest had become my prison, a place of fear and uncertainty, and I was a lost soul in a realm of shadows and enigma. In the end, I couldn't escape the feeling that I had ventured into a world where time had no meaning, a place where the boundaries between the known and the unknown had blurred and merged. The forest had become a place of isolation and fear, and I was forever lost in its depths. My ordeal in the wilderness had been a descent into the unknown, a journey into a realm of solitude and desperation. The forest had revealed its enigmatic and unforgiving nature, and I had emerged from the experience forever changed. I had returned from the depths of the wilderness, but the memories of my time lost in the woods would continue to haunt me, a reminder of the beauty and the dangers that exist in the natural world. Story 3 I had always been an adventurous soul. The thrill of the unknown and the call of the wild had guided me through countless trails and uncharted paths. But nothing could have prepared me for that one fateful journey into the dense, foreboding woods. It was a crisp autumn morning when I set out, the leaves beneath my boots crunching like brittle bones. A cold wind rustled the trees and I shivered, though I couldn't tell if it was from excitement or the chilling breeze. The forest loomed before me, a sea of trees that seemed to stretch endlessly. I had heard tales of its vastness, but my youthful arrogance led me to believe I could conquer it. As I ventured deeper, the trees closed in around me, casting long, sinister shadows. The sunlight filtered through the leaves in sporadic beams, creating a scary patchwork of light and dark. With each step, my sense of direction began to blur, 
The trail I'd followed was gradually erased by the relentless march of the undergrowth. Panic clawed at the edges of my mind, but I pushed it away, convincing myself that I could backtrack. Hours passed, and my futile attempts to retrace my steps only left me more disoriented. The forest was a labyrinth, a place where time and space seemed to warp and twist, playing tricks on my senses. The more I struggled to find my way, the further I sank into the heart of the wilderness. My hunger gnawed at my insides, and the water in my canteen was running dangerously low. Panic had now fully engulfed me. The forest felt sentient, as though it were mocking my feeble attempts to escape. The distant calls of wildlife became whispers, and the rustling leaves carried unsettling secrets. I felt as if I was being watched, stalked by something unseen. Night fell like a shroud and I huddled under a makeshift shelter of leaves and branches, feeling utterly exposed. The chilling symphony of the forest at night enveloped me, the howls of distant animals and the rustling of unseen creatures. Sleep was elusive, as every rustle or distant sound sent me into a state of high alert. Morning brought no solace. The woods seemed to have transformed overnight, the once familiar path now a maze of confusion. I decided to walk in a straight line, desperate to escape this haunting place. But the forest had other plans. It led me in circles and my strength waned with each step. I was hungry, tired, and on the brink of despair. It was then that I saw him or at least I thought I did. A shadowy figure darted between the trees just at the edge of my vision. My heart raced and I chased after it, convinced it was my way out. But the figure remained elusive, a phantom in the woods. Days turned into weeks and my desperation grew. I survived on a diet of berries and rainwater, but it was far from enough. My once taut frame had become emaciated and my clothes clung to my shrunken body. The lines between reality and delusion blurred and I often heard voices calling my name from the darkness, though no one was there. One night, as I lay beneath a twisted oak tree, the forest revealed its true nature. I was jolted awake by the sensation of something warm and wet on my hand. In the pale moonlight, I saw it. An animal carcass torn and eviscerated, its entrails spread around my shelter like a gruesome offering. Fear clenched my heart as I realized the cruel message that the forest had sent. It was as if the wilderness had become a sentient, sinister entity, toying with me, luring me deeper into its clutches. I knew then that I was no longer alone in these woods, but I could never be sure who or what was watching me. The forest held secrets darker than the night, and I had become ensnared in its web of terror. Hunger and fear drove me to the brink of madness, and I began to question my own sanity. And then, one fateful day, I saw him again. The shadowy figure, this time closer, more distinct. It was a man, disheveled and wild, with eyes that held a hint of madness. He beckoned to me, his voice a mere whisper on the wind. In my fragile state, I followed him without question, convinced that he was my salvation. He led me to a small clearing in the heart of the forest, where a ramshackle cabin stood. It was a crude structure, cobbled together from rotting wood and tattered cloth. Inside, a fire crackled in a makeshift hearth casting mystic shadows on the walls. The man, whose name was Elijah, explained that he had been lost in the woods for years, just like me. He had learned to survive in this unforgiving wilderness, and he offered me food and shelter. Desperation clouded my judgment, and I accepted his hospitality, though a nagging voice in my mind warned me that there was something deeply unsettling about him. Days turned into weeks as I lived in the cabin with Elijah, my only companion in this forsaken place. He spoke of the forest as if it were a living, breathing entity, a dark force that demanded sacrifices. He claimed that he had made a pact with the forest, offering it sustenance in return for his own survival. As the weeks passed, I began to notice the gruesome trophies that adorned the cabin's walls, skulls of animals and even a few human bones. It was then that the horrifying truth began to dawn on me. Elijah was not merely a survivor, he was a part of the very darkness that had consumed the forest. He was a cannibal. The realization struck me like a lightning bolt and I knew I had to escape. But the forest, now even more sinister, seemed to tighten its grip on me. Every attempt to leave was thwarted, as if the trees themselves conspired to keep me there. Elijah's sanity unraveled further, and he spoke of the forest's insatiable hunger, of the countless lost souls who had met their end within its depths. I knew that my only chance lay in outwitting Elijah, 
and so I bided my time, pretending to embrace his twisted worldview. I learned his routines and waited for the right moment. One fateful night, as he lay in a feverish sleep, I made my move. The forest, it seemed, had grown tired of its plaything. I crept out of the cabin, my heart pounding like a drum, and plunged deeper into the woods, my every step a prayer to the forces of nature for salvation. The forest seemed to part before me, as if it had grown weary of the game and I stumbled upon a trail. With a newfound burst of energy, I followed it, guided by the distant glow of moonlight. But I was free, and I would never forget the horrors I had witnessed within the heart of the unforgiving forest. The tale of my ordeal became a cautionary legend among those who dared to enter the woods, a reminder of the darkness that could consume even the most adventurous souls. As I sit here alone in this forgotten room, the memories of that fateful summer flood back, like a relentless tide of darkness. I never thought I'd be entangled in something so sinister, so surreal. But here I am, recounting my story, hoping that it serves as a cautionary tale. It all began innocently enough. I had recently graduated from college, eager to embark on the adventure of adult life. The world stretched out before me, full of possibilities. I had moved to a new city and was slowly settling into my job. But something was missing. A sense of belonging, a community. Little did I know that longing would lead me down a path I could never have imagined. One sunny afternoon, while sipping coffee at a local cafe, I noticed a flyer on the community board. It was an invitation to a gathering promising enlightenment and inner peace. The group called themselves the Cult of the Silent Shadows. The flyer showed a serene, masked figure bathed in moonlight, holding a candle. It piqued my curiosity, and with nothing to lose, I decided to attend their meeting. The address led me to an unassuming building on the outskirts of town. I entered a room filled with people of all ages, races, and backgrounds. The atmosphere was warm and inviting, and I felt an immediate sense of camaraderie. It seemed like the community I had been searching for. Their leader, a charismatic man named Gabriel, took the stage. He was a tall figure with piercing blue eyes and an air of magnetism that was impossible to ignore. He spoke eloquently about the struggles of modern life, the chaos of the world, and the need for inner tranquility. We are the silent shadows, he proclaimed, and we offer you a path to serenity, away from the noise and distractions of the outside world. His words resonated with me as they did with everyone else in the room. Gabriel spoke of meditation, mindfulness, and the power of silence in a world filled with constant chatter. It all sounded so appealing, so simple. Over the next few weeks, I attended the Silent Shadows gatherings regularly. The teachings became the anchor of my life. Gabriel's charisma and the sense of belonging I found within the group were addictive. I was not alone in my devotion, many others were equally captivated. As the days turned into months, the group's activities grew more intense. We were encouraged to immerse ourselves fully in their teachings. I began spending more time with my fellow members, often at the cult's secluded retreat deep in the woods. It was during one of these retreats that I began to notice something strange. The teachings, once focused on meditation and mindfulness, had taken a darker turn. Gabriel spoke of the need to shed our former selves, to become shadows of our former lives. He preached the power of silence, not just as a form of meditation, but as a way of life. The group started practicing silence for days at a time, communicating only through gestures and writing. We were discouraged from contacting our families and friends outside the cult, as they were seen as distractions from our true purpose. I began to feel a growing unease, but my attachment to Gabriel and the community kept me from questioning too deeply. I was not alone in my hesitation, but no one dared to speak out against the charismatic leader. One evening as the sun set behind the trees, Gabriel gathered us around a roaring bonfire. The atmosphere was charged with anticipation. Gabriel announced that to become true silent shadows, we must undergo a ritual of purification. The ritual involved fasting for three days, spending all our waking hours in complete silence and meditating by the fire. It was meant to cleanse our minds and souls to make us more receptive to the cult's teachings. I felt a knot of dread in my stomach, but couldn't bring myself to refuse. As the days of fasting passed, I became increasingly weak. My body ached, and my mind felt like a stormy sea. 
The silence, once soothing, now pressed down on me like a heavy weight. It was as if we were all sinking into a darkness, a collective silence that threatened to swallow us whole. On the third night of the ritual, something changed. As we meditated around the fire, the flames seemed to dance with an eerie, unnatural intensity. Gabriel stood at the center, his eyes closed in deep concentration. Then, with a sudden and unsettling calmness, he began to chant in a language I didn't recognize. The chant grew louder and more fervent, and the flames leaped higher, casting bizarre flickering shadows on the faces of the cult members. I watched in growing horror as the atmosphere shifted from one of serenity to something altogether different. It was at that moment that I realized the true nature of the silent shadows. We were not a community seeking enlightenment and inner peace. We were pawns in Gabriel's grand delusion. He had manipulated us into a cult of silence, using our vulnerability and desire for belonging against us. I knew I had to escape. With trembling hands, I rose from my meditation spot and slowly backed away from the fire. The cult members were so engrossed in the ritual that they didn't notice my departure. I slipped into the darkness of the woods, my heart pounding like a drum. As I made my way back to civilization, I couldn't help but wonder about the fate of my fellow cult members. Had they truly become the silent shadows Gabriel had envisioned? Or had they fallen victim to a madness born of silence and isolation? I reported the cult to the authorities, but by the time they arrived at the retreat, it was empty. Gabriel and his followers had vanished, leaving behind only the lingering echoes of their chilling silence. In the years that followed, I rebuilt my life, forever haunted by the memory of the silent shadows. I learned the hard way that the quest for belonging and purpose can sometimes lead us down the darkest of paths, and I vowed to never let the shadows of silence consume me again. But even now, as I sit here alone, I can't shake the feeling that Gabriel and his cult are still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for their next unsuspecting victim. The darkness of that summer still clings to me, a constant reminder of the horrors that can hide behind a mask of serenity. Months had passed since my escape from the Cult of the Silent Shadows. I had rebuilt my life, but the memories of that nightmarish experience continued to haunt my every waking moment. I couldn't help but wonder what had become of my fellow cult members, and whether Gabriel and his twisted teachings still held them in their grip. I kept a low profile, fearing that the cult might somehow track me down. My days were spent in constant vigilance, always watching my back, always on edge. But I couldn't shake the feeling that Gabriel and his followers were out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the right moment to strike. One day, as I was going through my mail, I came across a letter. It was an anonymous message, a simple piece of paper with a single word written in bold letters. Silence. My heart raced as I realized that the cult had found me, or at least someone who knew about my past involvement with them. I had to find out who sent the letter, and more importantly, whether the cult was still active. I began to dig deeper, retracing my steps and reaching out to former cult members who had managed to break free like me. It wasn't easy. Many were still too frightened to talk, but gradually I pieced together a picture of what had transpired after my escape. It seemed that in the wake of my departure, the cult had become even more secretive and reclusive. They had changed their meeting locations frequently, always staying one step ahead of anyone who might be looking for them. Gabriel's hold on his followers had grown stronger, and his teachings had taken a more extreme turn. Rumors circulated that the cult had become involved in criminal activities, using their collective silence as a cover for illegal operations. But these were only whispers, and concrete information was hard to come by. Determined to expose the cult and bring an end to their reign of silence, I reached out to a journalist friend who had a reputation for investigating secretive organizations. With the evidence I had gathered, we began to dig deeper into the activities of the Cult of the Silent Shadows. Our investigation led us down a twisted and treacherous path. We followed leads, interviewed former cult members, and even managed to infiltrate some of their gatherings undercover. What we discovered was chilling. The cult had evolved into a tightly knit secretive society with Gabriel as its unquestioned leader. His charisma and manipulative tactics had only grown more potent over time. The members had become fanatical in their devotion, believing that silence was the key to ultimate enlightenment. But behind the facade of serenity and inner peace lay a darker truth. The cult had indeed become involved in criminal activities, 
ranging from money laundering to extortion. Their network stretched far and wide, with members in positions of power and influence across various industries. As we delve deeper into our investigation, we realize that exposing the cult would not be easy. They had eyes and ears everywhere, and anyone who tried to speak out against them faced threats, intimidation, and even violence. But we were determined to unmask the shadows and bring an end to their reign of terror. We compiled our findings, collected evidence, and prepared to blow the lid off the cult of the Silent Shadows. Our investigative report was set to be published in a major newspaper, promising to expose the cult's criminal activities and the dangers they posed to society. But as the publication date drew nearer, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were walking into a trap. My fears were realized on the night before the report was scheduled to be released. I received another anonymous message, this time more ominous than the first. It was a simple warning, silence is golden. I immediately contacted my journalist friend and we decided to go public with the threats we had received. We believed that the cult would think twice about taking any drastic action if their actions were brought to light. The next day, as the report hit the headlines, the cult's reaction was swift and brutal. They released a statement denying all allegations and accusing us of spreading lies and slander. Gabriel, in a chilling video message, warned that those who sought to expose the cult's secrets would face dire consequences. Despite our fears, we pressed on, believing that the power of truth and justice would prevail. But the cult was not to be underestimated. They launched a campaign of harassment and intimidation against us, trying to discredit our investigation and silence us through any means necessary. As the pressure mounted, my journalist friend and I received a tip that Gabriel and his inner circle would be holding a secret gathering in an isolated location. It was an opportunity we couldn't pass up. We contacted law enforcement and provided them with the information we had gathered. On the night of the raid, we accompanied the police to the remote location where the cult's gathering was taking place. The tension was palpable as we approached the compound. We knew that this would be the moment of reckoning, the final showdown with the cult of the Silent Shadows. As we stormed the compound, a fierce battle ensued. Gabriel and his followers, armed with unwavering devotion and a willingness to protect their secrets at all costs, put up a formidable resistance. But the combined efforts of law enforcement and the evidence we had gathered proved to be their undoing. Gabriel was arrested, and his mask of charisma finally shattered. The cult members were taken into custody, their reign of silence broken. The truth about their criminal activities was exposed for the world to see. In the aftermath of the raid, I couldn't help but reflect on the journey that had led me from a naive seeker of belonging to an unwitting victim of a dangerous cult, and finally to a crusader for justice. The cult of the Silent Shadows had been dismantled, its darkness brought into the light. But the scars it had left on my psyche and the lives of its former members would never fully heal. I had learned the hard way that the search for meaning and community could sometimes lead to places of unimaginable darkness. The experience left me with a profound sense of caution and a determination to be vigilant against the allure of charismatic leaders and their promises of enlightenment. Story 2 My name is Sarah and I grew up in a quiet suburban neighborhood with my loving parents David and Linda and my younger brother Michael. We were an ordinary family leading an ordinary life. Our days were filled with school, work, and the occasional family outing. But that all changed one fateful day. It was a crisp autumn afternoon when we first encountered the cult. David had taken us to the local farmer's market, a place we often visited on weekends. As we strolled among the stalls, sampling fresh produce and enjoying the vibrant atmosphere, a woman approached us. She was dressed in simple robes, her demeanor calm and serene. Hello. She said with a warm smile. I couldn't help but notice your family. You seem like kindred spirits. We exchanged pleasantries and the woman introduced herself as Emily. She spoke of a community called the Tranquil Souls, a group of like-minded individuals seeking inner peace and enlightenment. Emily's words were captivating and we found ourselves drawn to her presence. Over the following weeks, Emily became a frequent visitor to our home. She brought with her the teachings of the Tranquil Souls, a philosophy centered around mindfulness, meditation, and a simpler way of life. She spoke of finding tranquility in a chaotic world, and her words resonated deeply with my family. One evening, as we sat around the dinner table, 
Emily proposed that we attend one of the Tranquil Souls gatherings. It's an opportunity to experience our community firsthand, she said, to see if it aligns with your desires for inner peace. We were hesitant at first, but the allure of tranquility and the sense of belonging that Emily offered were too enticing to resist. With her guidance, we made the decision to visit the Tranquil Souls. Our first gathering with the Tranquil Souls was held in an idyllic rural setting. A small group of people dressed in robes similar to Emily's welcomed us with open arms. They exuded an air of serenity that was both captivating and unnerving. The teachings of the Tranquil Souls revolved around meditation, minimalism, and the renunciation of worldly possessions. At first, it seemed like a path to inner peace, a way to simplify our lives and find a sense of purpose. But as time went on, the teachings became increasingly extreme. We were encouraged to sever ties with our old lives, to let go of our possessions, and to embrace a life of austerity. The cult members spoke in hushed tones about the need to transcend the material world and reach a higher state of consciousness. My family and I became increasingly isolated from our friends and extended family as the tranquil souls became the center of our lives. Emily, once a mere acquaintance, had become our de facto leader. Her charisma and unwavering devotion to the cult were impossible to resist. As the cult's grip on our family tightened, I began to notice disturbing changes in my parents and brother. They had become increasingly distant, their eyes vacant and hollow. The cult's teachings had taken a darker turn, emphasizing the need for complete submission and the rejection of individuality. I tried to reason with my family, to convince them that we were headed down a dangerous path, but my words fell on deaf ears. They saw me as an outsider, a threat to their newfound sense of purpose. One evening I overheard a chilling conversation between my parents and Emily. They spoke of a final ceremony that would allow them to transcend the material world and achieve true enlightenment. The details were shrouded in secrecy, but the sense of foreboding in the air was palpable. Terrified for my family's safety, I reached out to a childhood friend, Rebecca, who had been concerned about our sudden withdrawal from society. I confided in her about the tranquil souls and their increasingly sinister teachings. Rebecca, now a journalist, took it upon herself to investigate the cult. She uncovered a trail of disappearances, financial irregularities, and allegations of mind control associated with the tranquil souls. It became clear that the cult was not what it appeared to be. Together, we devised a plan to rescue my family from the clutches of the tranquil souls. We contacted law enforcement, providing them with the evidence Rebecca had gathered. It was a race against time to stop the impending final ceremony. As the authorities prepared to raid the cult's compound, Rebecca and I infiltrated the tranquil souls in disguise. We attended one of their gatherings, where the atmosphere was tense with anticipation. The cult members dressed in their robes gathered around a massive bonfire. Emily stood at the center, her eyes closed in deep concentration. The cult's teachings had culminated in this moment, and I feared what would happen next. As the authorities closed in on the compound, Rebecca and I sprang into action. We distracted the cult members, urging them to reconsider their choices, while law enforcement moved in to apprehend Emily and the cult leaders. A tense standoff ensued, but ultimately, the cult members, my family included, were freed from the clutches of the tranquil souls. Emily and the cult leaders were arrested, their twisted beliefs exposed for all to see. In the aftermath of the rescue operation, my family and I faced a long and difficult journey of recovery. The hold of the tranquil souls had left deep scars, both physical and psychological. But with the support of therapy and the love of our extended family and friends, we began the process of healing. Rebecca's investigative reporting on the cult led to a nationwide expose, shedding light on the dangers of cults and the tactics they used to manipulate and control their members. The tranquil souls were disbanded and their leaders faced justice for their crimes. As I look back on that harrowing chapter of our lives, I can't help but reflect on the thin line between seeking inner peace and falling prey to the allure of a charismatic leader and a dangerous ideology. My family and I emerged from the darkness stronger and wiser, with a newfound appreciation for the importance of critical thinking and the bonds of love that hold a family together. The tranquil souls may have left their mark on us, but we refuse to let their darkness define us.
We were survivors and we were determined to live our lives with newfound strength, resilience, and a commitment to never let the shadows of a cult engulf us again. Story three. My name is Mark, and I've always considered myself a rational and level-headed individual. I was in a loving relationship with my girlfriend, Emily, who shared my passion for adventure and self-improvement. We enjoyed exploring new places, seeking out unique experiences and pushing the boundaries of our comfort zones. Life was a grand adventure with Emily by my side. One sunny afternoon, as Emily and I were sipping coffee at our favorite local cafe, she excitedly showed me a beautifully designed invitation. It was embossed with intricate symbols and read, The Benevolent Cult of the Hidden Truth. Emily explained that she had stumbled upon this group online and had been following their teachings for a while. She believed that they held the key to enlightenment and personal growth. The idea of joining a group called a cult made me uneasy, but Emily insisted that it was different. She claimed that they were focused on self-improvement, kindness, and uncovering hidden truths about oneself and the world. With her enthusiasm and persuasive arguments, I reluctantly agreed to attend their introductory meeting. The introductory meeting took place in a cozy yet elegant room in an inconspicuous building. We were greeted by friendly and seemingly ordinary individuals who welcomed us warmly. Emily introduced me to the group's leader, a charismatic woman named Sophia, who exuded an air of calm and wisdom. Sophia began by explaining the group's philosophy centered around kindness, self-discovery, and the pursuit of hidden truths. She emphasized that they were not a typical cult, but rather a community of like-minded individuals seeking to improve themselves and make the world a better place. Emily and I attended several more meetings, each one focusing on personal development, mindfulness, and the cultivation of empathy. The group's teachings were captivating, and I started to believe that perhaps I had misunderstood the word cult. As the months went by, Emily became increasingly involved in the benevolent cult of the hidden truth. She attended their gatherings more frequently, sometimes staying overnight at their retreats. She spoke passionately about the positive changes she was experiencing and urged me to become more involved. But something didn't sit right with me. I noticed that Emily was becoming more distant from our friends and family and her devotion to the group was bordering on obsession. She began to spend less time with me and I couldn't help but feel like I was losing her to the cult. One evening I decided to investigate the group further. I attended one of their gatherings without Emily's knowledge, hoping to uncover the truth behind their seemingly benevolent facade. As I arrived at the retreat, I noticed a serene atmosphere, with participants engaged in meditation and deep philosophical discussions. Sophia, the charismatic leader, led a session focused on the concept of inner purity and the need to shed one's past to embrace a brighter future. But then as the night wore on, I witnessed something terrifying. The group's teachings took a darker turn. Sophia began speaking about the ultimate truth that could only be achieved through sacrifice. She spoke of letting go of one's attachments, even to loved ones, to attain a higher state of consciousness. I knew I had to act quickly. The group's teachings had taken a disturbing turn and I feared for Emily's safety. I reached out to a friend, Alex, who had experience in investigating cults and the tactics they used to manipulate their members. Together, we delved deeper into the benevolent cult of the hidden truth, uncovering a trail of disappearances, financial irregularities, and allegations of psychological manipulation. It became clear that this cult was far more sinister than it appeared. We also discovered that Sophia, the cult's leader, had a history of leading similar groups that had all ended in tragedy. She had a talent for drawing in vulnerable individuals and using her charisma to exploit them. With the evidence we had gathered, Alex and I contacted law enforcement and shared our findings. It was clear that Emily was in grave danger, along with the other members of the cult. We knew that we had to act swiftly to rescue them from Sophia's grip. We devised a plan to infiltrate the cult's compound during one of their retreats. With the help of law enforcement, we would apprehend Sophia and her followers and put an end to their reign of darkness. The night of the rescue mission was tense with anticipation. Alex and I disguised ourselves as cult members, armed with the evidence we had collected, and a determination to free Emily and the others from the clutches of the benevolent cult of the hidden truth. As we infiltrated the cult's compound, we witnessed Emily and the other members gathered around a massive bonfire. 
Sophia, in her charismatic and persuasive manner, was preparing them for the ultimate truth, which involved a ritualistic act of sacrifice. With law enforcement at the ready, we began to confront the cult members, urging them to reconsider their choices and the darkness that had enveloped their lives. Sophia, however, was not easily swayed. A tense standoff ensued with cult members torn between their loyalty to Sophia and the evidence of her dark intentions. As the authorities closed in, Sophia's grip began to weaken and some members started to question their devotion. In the end, Emily and the other cult members were freed from the clutches of the benevolent cult of the hidden truth. Sophia was arrested, her charismatic facade shattered. The truth about the cult's sinister activities was exposed for the world to see. As Emily and I emerged from the darkness of the cult's influence, we faced a long and challenging road to recovery. The scars ran deep, both physically and emotionally. But with the support of therapy and the love of our friends and family, we began the process of healing. The benevolent cult of the hidden truth may have left its mark on us, but we were determined to emerge stronger and wiser. With a newfound appreciation for the importance of critical thinking and the bonds of love that held us together. Looking back on that harrowing chapter of our lives, I can't help but reflect on the fine line between seeking personal growth and falling prey to the manipulative tactics of a charismatic leader. Emily and I emerged from the darkness stronger and more resilient, committed to living our lives with newfound wisdom and a determination to never let the shadows of a cult engulf us again. The benevolent cult of the hidden truth may have temporarily ensnared our lives, but it ultimately failed to extinguish the light of reason and love that guided us back to the truth. As I watched my family's car disappear into the distance, I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. My parents were heading out of town for the weekend, leaving me alone in our old creaky house. I was no stranger to solitude, but this time felt different. A heavy feeling settled in my chest, and an unshakable feeling of dread began to creep into my thoughts. The house itself was a relic of the past, a grand structure with imposing pillars and a sprawling overgrown garden. It was beautiful in its own way, but as the sun dipped below the horizon and shadows stretched across the property, it transformed into something foreboding. I reluctantly closed the front door and locked it, the click echoing through the empty hallway. The house felt too big, too silent, and suddenly, I felt too small. The first night alone in a house could be daunting, but as time wore on I had imagined myself growing into the role. I could make my own meals, watch my favorite movies, and revel in the freedom of being the master of my own domain. Yet as I moved from room to room, something about the darkness outside felt oppressive, as if it were closing in on me. I made my way to the kitchen trying to shake off the feeling of unease. The familiar space with its warm wooden cabinets and cozy ambience was meant to be comforting. However, the faintest hint of a draft seemed to whisper through the room. I tightened the shawl around my shoulders and decided to prepare a simple meal to distract myself. As I stood at the stove, the low hum of the refrigerator and the ticking of the kitchen clock were the only sounds that reached my ears. The house was eerily silent, and with each creak and groan, I couldn't help but feel as though it had a life of its own. I had always known it was old, but that night, it felt ancient, bearing secrets from generations long past. I finished my meal and tried to find solace in the glow of the television. I put on a comedy, but even the laugh track couldn't drown out the unsettling sense of isolation. The show's canned laughter sounded more like mocking than mirth, and I switched it off, casting the room into silence once more. Reluctantly, I made my way upstairs to my bedroom. The old wooden steps creaked beneath my weight, creating a symphony of unsettling sounds. I couldn't help but look over my shoulder half expecting to see something lurking in the shadows behind me. Of course, there was nothing there, but that didn't stop the creeping feeling that I was not alone. My bedroom, with its soft muted colors and familiar scent, should have been a sanctuary, but that night, it was just another chamber in the house of unease. The window offered a view of the moonlit garden, its unkempt hedges and statues shrouded in a cold glow. I closed the curtains and turned off the lights, plunging the room into darkness. Lying in bed, I couldn't help but listen to the strange sounds of the old house. It was as if it were alive, breathing in the night, exhaling soft sighs and whispers. 
I closed my eyes and tried to remind myself that it was just an old house, that my unease was nothing more than my imagination running wild. Yet despite my rationalizations, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Hours passed and the darkness seemed to press down on me, heavy and suffocating. I tossed and turned in bed, unable to find comfort. The gentle, rhythmic ticking of the clock in the hallway only served to remind me of the relentless passage of time. Just as I felt myself drifting into sleep, a noise from downstairs jolted me awake. It was a soft but distinct thud, followed by the sound of something scraping against the floor. My heart began to race and I strained to listen. Silence settled in the room once more. I debated whether to investigate the source of the noise, but fear kept me frozen in place. The darkness outside my window seemed impenetrable, and the shadows in the room appeared to twist and contort. My imagination was running wild, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister lurked in the house. Another noise, this one louder and more distinct, broke the silence. It was the unmistakable sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, coming up the stairs. My heart pounded in my chest as the footsteps drew nearer, the creaking of the old wooden steps growing louder. I clutched the blanket tightly, unsure of what to do. My first instinct was to call the police, but the feeling of vulnerability kept me rooted in place. The footsteps reached the top of the staircase and drew closer to my bedroom. Panic surged through me, and I scrambled out of bed, searching for a place to hide. The closet seemed like the safest option, and I squeezed into it pulling the door closed as quietly as I could. I left a slight crack to peer through, my eyes fixed on the dimly lit room beyond. The footsteps grew louder and the door to my bedroom slowly creaked open. A figure emerged from the darkness, barely visible in the moonlight. It was a man, tall and slender, dressed in tattered clothing. His face was obscured, hidden by the shadows. He moved with a deliberate, almost predatory grace, as if he knew the house intimately. The intruder's presence sent a cold feeling down my spine. He moved through the room, his eyes scanning every corner. The moonlight revealed a gaunt face with hollow cheeks and a scruffy beard. In his hand, he held a knife, its blade gleaming in the dim light. I held my breath as the intruder approached the closet. His steps were slow and deliberate, and I prayed that he wouldn't discover me. The closet door seemed like paper, too flimsy to protect me from the danger lurking just outside. My heart pounded in my chest, drowning out all other sounds. The man's hand reached for the closet door, and I braced myself for the inevitable. But then, just as his fingers brushed the wood, he hesitated. A low growl echoed through the room, causing the intruder to freeze. The sound was not human. It was primal and filled with menace. I strained to see what had caused it and my eyes widened in terror. From the darkness of the room, a pair of glowing eyes emerged. They were feral, belonging to a creature that shouldn't exist within the confines of the house. The growl grew louder, more menacing, and the intruder backed away from the closet. In that moment, fear gave way to curiosity. I couldn't see the creature clearly, but I had the distinct feeling that it was not a typical household pet. It was something wild and untamed, a guardian of the darkness. The intruder, sensing that he was outmatched, fled from the room, leaving the closet door ajar. I waited, my heart still racing as the growling receded into the distance. I had narrowly escaped a terrifying encounter and the feeling of dread had shifted to one of profound gratitude. Hours passed and the first light of dawn began to filter through the curtains. With trembling hands I emerged from the closet, still cautious and unsure of what I might find. The house was silent once more and the intruder was gone, but the encounter had left an indelible mark on me. As I watched the sunrise, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe for the mysterious guardian that had protected me. The old house had revealed a hidden secret, a protector of the night that had stood between me and danger. The rest of the weekend passed without incident, and when my parents returned, I shared my harrowing experience with them. They were understandably shocked and concerned, but we found no sign of the intruder, and the police were unable to determine his identity. In the following weeks, I began to research the history of the house, hoping to uncover the origins of the guardian that had saved me. It was then that I stumbled upon an old, faded photograph, hidden in a dusty corner of the attic. The photograph depicted a man tall and slender, dressed in tattered clothing. 
His face was obscured, but I recognized the scruffy beard and gaunt features. He was standing in the overgrown garden, his gaze fixed on something beyond the frame. The photograph was dated more than a century ago. I couldn't explain the connection between the intruder and the man in the photograph, but it was clear that the old house held secrets that spanned generations. The guardian that had protected me was a mystery, a part of the house's history that had come to life in the darkest of moments. As time passed, the sense of unease in the old house began to fade, replaced by a feeling of reverence for the guardian that had watched over it for generations. The creak of the front door echoed through the empty house as my parents departed for a weekend getaway, leaving my sister, Emily, and me alone. At 17, I was no stranger to spending time on my own. I turned to Emily, who was 12, and tried to muster a reassuring smile. It's just the two of us this weekend, Em. We've got the whole house to ourselves. She nodded, her eyes wide with a mix of excitement and trepidation. Yeah, but it's kind of creepy when it's so quiet. I couldn't argue with her. The silence in the house was overwhelming, a heavy presence that seemed to settle in every corner. I told myself it was the absence of our parents that made the house seem so much larger and emptier than usual. We had our dinner in the cozy kitchen, chatting about school and life, doing our best to chase away the unease. But no matter how much we talked, the silence of the house lingered in the background, like a watchful spirit. After dinner, I suggested we watch a movie to distract ourselves from the disconcerting atmosphere. We settled on a comedy, and Emily's laughter filled the room as the characters on the screen stumbled through their ridiculous antics. It was a welcome distraction, but even as we laughed, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone. The movie ended and Emily stifled a yawn. I'm heading to bed, you coming? I shook my head. I'll join you later. Just going to check things out downstairs first. She gave me a worried look but didn't protest. With a quick good night, she headed upstairs, leaving me alone in the dimly lit living room. The house seemed to creak and groan as I moved through it, its age and weight pressing down on me. The silence was so profound that it felt as though it was closing in, squeezing the very air from the room. I took a deep breath and tried to shake off the feeling of dread. As I passed the hallway leading to the basement, I heard a faint sound like a whisper carried on the wind. I paused, my heart racing, straining to hear more. But the house remained still, as though it had swallowed the sound. Chalking it up to my imagination, I continued my exploration of the house. I made my way to the large, darkened living room, where heavy drapes blocked out the moonlight. I switched on the overhead light, dispelling some of the darkness that clung to the room. The furniture was old, relics from a different time, and the room held a sense of history that was both fascinating and unsettling. I'd heard stories of past occupants, tales of love and loss, of joy and sorrow, and sometimes it felt as though those stories were imprinted on the very walls. I moved to the bookshelves that lined one wall, running my fingers over the spines of old books and photo albums. As I leafed through one album, I came across a series of faded photographs. They depicted a family, a couple with two children in a house that looked strikingly similar to the one I now lived in. There was something haunting about those photographs, a sense of familiarity and yet a gnawing discomfort. The faces in the photographs were unfamiliar, but I couldn't shake the feeling that they were somehow connected to the house, as though the past had reached out to touch the present. With a shiver, I closed the album and returned it to the shelf. The room had grown colder and I could feel the presence of the past lingering like a shadow in the corners. I decided it was time to head upstairs and join Emily. The heavy silence of the house had grown oppressive, and the stories of the past were pressing in on me. As I climbed the stairs, I could have sworn I heard a faint whisper behind me, a voice carried on the wind, but when I turned, there was nothing there. I joined Emily in our shared bedroom, the dim glow of her nightlight casting dark shadows on the walls. She was already asleep, her breathing soft and steady. I climbed into my own bed, trying to put the unsettling feeling of the house behind me. But the night brought no solace. As I lay in the darkness, I couldn't escape the feeling of being watched. The room seemed to pulse with an unsettling energy, and I could hear the soft rustling of fabric and the gentle creak of floorboards, as if someone were moving through the house. Hours passed, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was not alone in the room. 
I turned to look at Emily, half expecting to see a figure lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing there, and my unease only deepened. I decided to check on the source of the sounds, telling myself that it was probably just the old house settling. I climbed out of bed and made my way to the hallway. The darkness was thick, like a shroud, and I moved cautiously, guided only by the faint moonlight filtering through the windows. As I descended the stairs, the sounds grew louder, more distinct. It was as though the house had come to life, its walls murmuring secrets that had been long buried. I followed the sounds to the living room, where the overhead light flickered to life, casting a creepy glow on the room. And there in the center of the room I saw her, a young girl, no older than Emily, with long dark hair and eyes that held a haunting sadness. She was dressed in an old-fashioned nightgown, her feet bare and dirty. She looked at me with a mixture of fear and longing, as though she had been waiting for someone to finally see her. My heart raced as I took in the sight of the ghostly figure before me. I had heard the stories, tales of a young girl who had lived in the house long ago and had vanished without a trace. It was said that she had never left the house, that her spirit still lingered in the dark corners, searching for something lost. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. As the young girl reached out a hand toward me, her fingers trembling. And then, with a soft, plaintive whisper, she spoke. Help me. The sound was barely audible, a faint echo in the night, but it gave me a scary feeling. I knew I had to do something, to find out what had happened to this lost soul, to help her find peace. But as I took a step toward her, she faded away, dissolving into the shadows. The house fell silent once more, the only sound the thudding of my own heart. I returned to my room, my mind racing with questions and fear. The young girl's presence had shaken me to my core and I couldn't escape the feeling that her story was entwined with the history of the house. Morning came and I told Emily about the ghostly encounter. She listened with wide eyes, her fear mirrored in my own. We decided to investigate the history of the house, hoping to uncover the mystery of the young girl and the stories that had been passed down through generations. Our research revealed a tragic tale. The young girl named Isabella had lived in the house with her family in the late 1800s. She had vanished one fateful night, leaving her family in despair. Despite extensive searches, she was never found, and her disappearance had remained a haunting mystery. As we delved deeper into the history, we learned that the house had passed through various owners over the years, and each had their own stories of unexplained phenomena and ghostly encounters. It seemed that Isabella's spirit had remained in the house, searching for answers and perhaps someone who could finally help her find peace. Determined to uncover the truth, we embarked on a quest to find out what had happened to Isabella. We scoured old records, visited local archives, and even interviewed descendants of past owners. Slowly, we pieced together a narrative of a family torn apart by tragedy, a series of secrets and the mystery of a lost girl who had never found her way home. As we delved deeper into the past, we began to experience more encounters with Isabella's ghost. She appeared to us at night, her presence both scary and heart-wrenching. She would speak in soft, mournful whispers, imploring us to help her, to uncover the truth of what had happened on that fateful night so long ago. We couldn't deny her plea, and our determination to unravel the mystery only grew stronger. Together, we combed through the old attic, searching for clues that had remained hidden for generations. And then, as we sifted through dusty boxes and tattered letters, we made a discovery that scent creeped me out. Hidden beneath a pile of old photographs, we found a letter, its pages yellowed with age. It was a letter from Isabella to her parents, written on the night of her disappearance. In it, she revealed a secret, a forbidden love that had torn her family apart. As we read the letter, it became clear that Isabella had run away from home, unable to bear the pain of her family's disapproval. She had hoped to find her true love and start a new life, but fate had other plans. The letter ended abruptly with no indication of what had happened to her. Armed with this new information, we continued our investigation, determined to uncover the full story of Isabella's disappearance. We tracked down old family records and discovered that she had indeed run away eloping with her love, a poor artist from a neighboring town. Their love had been forbidden and their families had disowned them. Isabella and her love had struggled to make a life together, but tragedy had struck. They had been separated, 
and Isabella had vanished without a trace. Our research led us to a small, forgotten cemetery on the outskirts of town, where we found the final piece of the puzzle. Isabella's grave, a simple weathered headstone marked her resting place. The date of her death was the same as the night she had disappeared. With heavy hearts, we realized that Isabella's ghost had been searching for closure, for someone to uncover the truth of her story. We had brought her one step closer to finding peace, but her presence in the house had not yet faded. We decided to hold a small private ceremony at Isabella's grave, a gesture of remembrance and closure. As we stood by her headstone, the air grew heavy and we felt the weight of the past. Emily and I said our goodbyes to Isabella, thanking her for the lessons she had taught us about love, loss, and the enduring power of the human spirit. That night, as we returned to the house, we felt a profound sense of peace. Isabella's ghost, it seemed, had found the closure she had longed for, and the house was no longer filled with the haunting presence of the past. In the years that followed, the old house became a place of warmth and comfort, a sanctuary for our family. I sat alone in our old family home, the soft ticking of the antique clock on the wall the only sound to break the heavy silence. My parents had left for a week-long business trip, and I had volunteered to take care of our aging dog, Max, while they were away. I was 16, and spending a week on my own wasn't new to me. But as the evening sun dipped below the horizon and shadows stretched across the rooms, a feeling of unease crept in. The house, built in the early 1900s, bore the weight of its history, and every creak and groan seemed to carry with it a whisper of the past. Max, an old and arthritic Labrador, lay at my feet. His presence was comforting, a reminder of the familiar in this sea of uncertainty. I stroked his graying fur, my fingers finding solace in the soft rhythm of his breath. The first night alone in the house felt oddly disquieting. I made a simple dinner, and as I ate, the empty chairs around the dining table seemed to watch me, their emptiness unsettling. I turned on some music, hoping to drown out the silence, but it only seemed to echo through the empty rooms. After dinner, I took Max for a short walk in the garden, the chilly evening air offering a welcome break from the stifling quiet of the house. As we made our way back inside, the soft rustling of leaves in the garden seemed to carry secrets of their own. I shook off the feeling of unease and closed the door, locking it securely behind us. The evening passed uneventfully and I settled in the living room to watch a movie. The flickering light from the screen cast shifting shadows across the walls, and for a moment I felt as if the house were holding its breath. I brushed the feeling aside and tried to immerse myself in the film. As the movie ended and the room plunged into darkness, I realized that it was time to head to bed. Max followed me upstairs, his slow, deliberate steps echoing through the hallway. The house was silent, and as I climbed into bed I couldn't help but feel as though I were being watched. Sleep was elusive, and the silence seemed to grow heavier with each passing moment. I tossed and turned, my thoughts racing through the labyrinth of the dark. The old house felt like a living, breathing entity, its walls listening to secrets long buried. Then, in the stillness of the night, a sound broke through, a soft, rhythmic tapping, like a finger gently rapping on a window pane. I listened intently, straining to locate the source of the sound. It was persistent, almost like a distant melody, and it seemed to be coming from somewhere within the house. As I slipped out of bed, Max's eyes followed me, his gaze filled with a mixture of curiosity and apprehension. The tapping grew louder and I moved through the hallway, trying to pinpoint its origin. It was as if the very walls were murmuring, carrying with them a haunting melody. I reached the top of the stairs and followed the sound down to the living room. The tapping led me to the large bay window that overlooked the garden. I gazed outside, my breath catching in my throat as I saw what had been making the sound. A gnarled tree branch swaying in the wind and brushing against the glass. Relief washed over me and I laughed at my own jittery nerves. It was just a tree branch, a trick of the wind, but in the stillness of the house it had taken on an eerie presence. I made a mental note to trim the branch the next day and return to bed. Max followed me and with his reassuring presence I gradually drifted off to sleep. The house settled into an uneasy quiet and I thought I could hear the faint echoes of footsteps in the dark, but I brushed it off as the stuff of dreams. The following day I busied myself with chores around the house. I cleaned the rooms, trimmed the overgrown hedges in the garden, 
and even tackled the chore of trimming the troublesome tree branch outside the living room window. The sunlight cast long, comforting shadows across the property, and for a moment, the unease of the night before seemed like a distant memory. As the day turned into evening, I settled in the living room with Max, watching TV. The laughter of the characters on the screen was a comforting contrast to the silence of the house. I had almost forgotten the strange events of the previous night when the tapping sound returned. It was just as rhythmic and insistent as before, and this time I couldn't deny the feeling that it was coming from within the house. I muted the television and listened carefully, trying to locate the source of the sound. Max, too, lifted his head, his ears perked in the direction of the living room window. The tapping seemed to grow louder, more urgent, and I realized it was coming from the basement. I had never been particularly fond of the basement, with its old creaky stairs and dimly lit corners, but I couldn't ignore the persistent sound. With Max at my side, I made my way to the basement door, my heart pounding in my chest. The silence in the house had turned oppressive, and the tapping seemed to be a defiant challenge to that silence. I took a deep breath and descended into the dimly lit basement. The tapping grew louder as I reached the bottom of the stairs, and my eyes were drawn to a small narrow window set high in the basement wall. The window was covered by a tattered curtain, its fabric moving gently in the breeze. And as I approached, I realized that the tapping sound was the curtain brushing against the window frame. Relief washed over me and I chuckled at my own jittery nerves. It was just the wind, the same wind that had caused the tree branch to tap against the living room window the night before. I made a mental note to secure the curtain and headed back upstairs with Max. That night I settled into bed with Max at my side, trying to shake off the lingering unease from the previous nights. Sleep once again proved elusive, the silence of the house pressing in on me. I listened to the soft sound of Max's breathing, grateful for his presence. Just as I began to drift off, a sound broke through the stillness, a low, mournful howl. I sat up in bed, my heart racing. It was Max, his head tilted back his eyes filled with a mixture of fear and confusion. The howl was not his own, but it seemed to be coming from somewhere within the house. I called out to Max, trying to calm him, but his howling continued. I could feel the unease from the previous nights returning, and the house seemed to pulse with an unsettling energy. I knew I had to investigate the source of the sound. With Max following closely, I made my way downstairs, my unease growing with each step. The howling was louder now, echoing through the house like a mournful lament. It seemed to be coming from the basement once again. I reached the basement door and descended the stairs, the howling growing more distinct. It was as though the sound was beckoning me, pulling me deeper into the darkness. I reached the basement window, the same one where I had discovered the tapping curtain the night before. But this time the curtain was still and the window was closed. The howling continued, its source elusive. I could feel Max's distress, his eyes fixed on the dark corners of the basement, as though he could sense something I couldn't. I called out once more, trying to calm Max and to dispel the unease that had settled over me. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the howling ceased. The house fell into silence once more, the only sound the soft ticking of the antique clock on the wall. I retreated from the basement, Max at my side, a sense of foreboding settling over me. I couldn't explain the source of the howling, but it was clear that the old house held mysteries that extended beyond its walls. As I climbed back into bed, I couldn't escape the feeling that the house itself was trying to communicate with me. Morning came and I decided to delve into the history of the house, hoping to uncover the mysteries that seemed to be lurking within its walls. I learned that the house had been built in the early 1900s by a prominent family, but their history was shrouded in secrecy. As I delved deeper, I uncovered a newspaper article from the early 1920s. The article described a tragic event, a fire that had claimed the lives of the family who had built the house. The fire had been a mystery, its cause never determined, and it had left the house empty and abandoned for years. I couldn't ignore the feeling of unease that settled over me as I read the article. It was as though the events of the past were reaching out to touch the present, their stories carried on the wind in the tapping of branches and in the mournful howling that had filled the house. I decided to explore the basement once more, convinced that it held the key to the mysteries of the house. As I descended the stairs, the unease in the air grew heavier, 
and the basement seemed to shift and contort as though it were a place of secrets long buried. I made my way to the narrow window, the same one where I had discovered the tapping curtain. But this time as I approached, I noticed something strange, a soft ghostly figure that seemed to be standing just beyond the glass. The figure was indistinct, its features blurred, and it was difficult to make out any details. But there was no denying the sense of a presence, a silent observer who had been watching from the shadows. With trepidation, I reached for the curtain, pulling it aside to reveal the basement window. The figure remained, its eyes fixed on me, and for a moment I felt as though I were looking into the past, into a world that had long since vanished. The figure's eyes held a haunting sadness, a plea for understanding, and it seemed to be reaching out to me, trying to convey a message. I couldn't explain the presence of the figure, but it was clear that it was connected to the mysteries of the house. As I watched, the figure slowly faded away, dissipating into the darkness. The house seemed to breathe a sigh of relief, and the unease that had settled over it began to lift. I returned to my room, my mind racing with questions and fear. The figure in the basement had shown me that the house held secrets that extended beyond its walls, that its history was a tapestry of tragedy and loss. And as I watched the sunrise from my bedroom window, I couldn't help but feel that the house was not just a structure, but a living entity, a repository of stories that were waiting to be uncovered. In the days that followed, I continued my research into the history of the house, determined to uncover the secrets that had long been buried. The figure in the basement had been a messenger, a reminder that the past could not be forgotten, that the stories of those who had lived in the house were still waiting to be told. As I uncovered more of the house's history, I realized that it was a place of both darkness and light, a sanctuary for the lost and a repository of the past. The mysteries of the house had become a part of my own story, a testament to the enduring power of history and the importance of uncovering the truth. Moving to the bustling city was a dream I had harbored since my childhood in the quiet countryside. The opportunity finally arrived when I secured a job in the heart of the metropolis. I found a cozy apartment on the seventh floor of an old building, and the city's vibrant energy flowed through its veins. I had anticipated many challenges, but what awaited me in the apartment below was beyond my wildest imagination. The first few weeks in the city were a whirlwind of excitement. I was awestruck by the towering skyscrapers, the endless stream of people, and the ceaseless hum of life. My apartment was a haven of tranquility, and I often spent my evenings on the balcony, gazing at the city lights below. It was during one such evening that I first noticed the peculiar occurrences. A muffled sound like distant whispers seemed to rise from the apartment below mine. At first I dismissed it as a figment of my imagination, the city's symphony playing tricks on my senses. However, the sounds persisted, growing more distinct each night. I couldn't help but wonder about the neighbors who resided in the apartment below. They were a mystery to me, as I had not yet met them, and the apartment's occupant had recently moved in, just like me. The sounds emanating from below were a peculiar mix of hushed conversations, muffled laughter, and occasional crying. It was as if the inhabitants of the apartment were engaged in a perpetual state of discussion, never raising their voices, but their conversations were impossible to ignore. One evening, as I leaned over my balcony railing trying to identify the source of the sounds, I spotted a dim light emanating from the window below. A faint glow painted the curtains in shades of amber, and the silhouette of a person could be seen moving in the room. The sight piqued my curiosity. The following day, I decided to introduce myself to the new neighbors. I approached their door, my knuckles rapping against the wood. No response. I knocked once more with the same result. It was as if the apartment had been abandoned. Perplexed, I inquired with other tenants in the building about the inhabitants of the apartment below. No one seemed to know them, and they too mentioned hearing the odd sounds, like the ghostly echoes of conversations. The mystery deepened. Each night as the city below transformed into a glowing labyrinth, the strange occurrences in the apartment below continued. The hushed voices persisted and sometimes I would catch a glimpse of shadowy figures moving within. It was clear that someone was living there, but they chose to remain hidden from the world. 
As weeks turned into months, my unease grew. I contemplated reporting the matter to the building's management, but I had no evidence of any wrongdoing. The whisperings, however unsettling, did not constitute a crime. One evening, while I was trying to unravel the mystery, I noticed something peculiar. The lights from the apartment below had grown dim, their glow flickering like a fading ember. The hushed conversations had ceased and in silence filled the space. The change was unnerving, and it was as if the apartment had become a void. I couldn't help but wonder what had transpired within its walls. In the following days, I became increasingly anxious. The apartment below remained shrouded in darkness, and the whispers had given way to a silence that seemed to stretch into eternity. Unable to bear the tension any longer, I decided to involve the building management. The superintendent, Mr. Dawson, listened to my concerns and promised to investigate the matter. He assured me that he would pay a visit to the apartment and try to identify the tenants. Days passed and I anxiously awaited an update from Mr. Dawson. However, the information he provided only deepened my disquiet. When he had approached the apartment below, he found the door locked and no one answered his knocks. Peering through the windows, he saw that the apartment was empty, devoid of any furniture or personal belongings. The situation had grown increasingly bizarre. The apartment below remained uninhabited, yet the odd sounds continued to emanate from it, as if it held secrets that defied explanation. One evening, as I once again gazed at the window of the enigmatic apartment, I saw something that made my blood turn cold. The curtains had been drawn back and the room was bathed in an eerie, pulsating light. I could see shadowy figures moving within, their movements erratic and unnatural. I watched in horrified fascination as the figures seemed to writhe and twist, their forms morphing into grotesque shapes. It was a nightmarish spectacle that defied all reason. The apartment had become a place of unimaginable horror, a dark anomaly within the building. Terrified, I contacted the police explaining the strange occurrences and the unsettling events that had transpired within the apartment below. The officers arrived promptly and I led them to the apartment. When they attempted to open the door, they found it unlocked, as if someone had recently left. The apartment was in disarray, furniture overturned, and the walls adorned with strange symbols. It was a scene of chaos and madness. The officers conducted a thorough search, but they found no one inside. It was as if the apartment had been abandoned in a hurry, its occupants vanishing into thin air. The mystery of the apartment below remained unsolved and it left me with a sense of dread that would haunt me for years to come. The building's tenants whispered about the start events, their voices filled with uncertainty and fear. No one could explain the inexplicable, the bizarre occurrences in the apartment that defied all reason. The whisperings, the creepy light, and the unsettling figures continued to linger in the minds of those who had witnessed them, a chilling reminder that some mysteries are never meant to be unraveled. The end. Second story begins. The neighborhood of Green Valley was a serene, picturesque place, known for its charming houses and friendly residents. It was the kind of place where everyone knew everyone else, and a feeling of safety and community pervaded the streets. But as with any seemingly idyllic neighborhood, there was a darker side that lurked beneath the surface. My wife, Emily, and I had recently moved to Green Valley in search of a peaceful life away from the chaos of the city. We were delighted with our new home, a cozy two-story house with a white picket fence that bordered a small but well-maintained garden. As we settled into our new life, we made an effort to get to know our neighbors. They welcomed us with open arms, inviting us over for dinner and neighborhood gatherings. But there was one resident, a man named Edward Montgomery who lived two houses down that remained a mystery. Edward was a reclusive figure who rarely participated in neighborhood events. Despite our attempts to be friendly, he always seemed to find a reason to avoid us. Emily would often joke that he was the neighborhood enigma, a title that stuck. The rumors about Edward began to circulate among the neighbors. Some said he was a retired detective. Others whispered that he had a troubled past, but no one knew the truth. It was this shroud of secrecy that made him all the more intriguing. The first sign that something was amiss occurred one summer evening. Emily and I were enjoying a glass of wine on our front porch when we spotted Edward for the first time. He was standing in his front yard, staring at our house, his eyes hidden behind a pair of dark sunglasses. Emily nudged me and whispered, Isn't that Edward? 
I nodded, unable to shake the unease that had settled within me. He stood there unblinking, as if he were studying our every move. It was as if he were assessing us, sizing us up, but for what purpose I couldn't fathom. Over the coming weeks, we would often catch glimpses of Edward from our porch. He would stand at his window, gazing out into the street, or sit in his car for hours on end, watching our house. It was as if he were a silent sentinel guarding a secret we were not privy to. Emily and I would often discuss our neighbor's behavior in hushed tones. It was clear that there was something unusual about Edward, and we couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon and cast long shadows across the neighborhood, I decided to pay Edward a visit. It was an attempt to bridge the gap, to understand the man who had remained such an enigma. I approached his house and knocked on the front door, but there was no response. I could hear the faint sound of a television from within, but it was as if Edward had simply disappeared. I left a friendly note with my contact information and decided to give him some space. Days turned into weeks and Edward's behavior only grew more peculiar. He would stand at his window sometimes in the middle of the night, and we would often catch him watching our house through his binoculars. It was as if he were always vigilant, always observing. Emily, who had always been the more cautious of the two of us, grew increasingly concerned. She suggested we contact the authorities, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there had to be a rational explanation for Edward's behavior. Perhaps he was a lonely old man, a recluse who had grown accustomed to his own habits. But one night everything changed. It was a particularly cold evening and Emily and I were bundled up on the couch watching television. The room was bathed in a soft, warm light and we felt safe and secure within the walls of our home. As we chatted and laughed, I happened to glance out the window. What I saw sent a shiver down my spine. Edward was standing in our front yard, illuminated by the dim glow of the street lamp. He held something in his hand and I could see that it was a photograph of us, a picture taken through our living room window. I sprang to my feet, my heart racing and flung the front door open. I shouted at Edward, demanding an explanation for his intrusion. He didn't respond but simply turned and walked away, disappearing into the darkness. I was seething with anger and fear. Emily and I decided that it was finally time to contact the authorities. We provided them with a detailed account of Edward's unsettling behavior, including the incident with the photograph. The police assured us that they would look into the matter, but in the days that followed, our anxiety only grew. The presence of Edward had cast a long, dark shadow over our lives and the feeling of being constantly watched had become a haunting reality. A few weeks passed and the police informed us that they had questioned Edward about the photograph. He had explained it away as a simple misunderstanding, a mistake, and there was no concrete evidence to suggest otherwise. The authorities could do little more and we were left feeling vulnerable and exposed. One evening, as Emily and I sat on our porch, we spotted Edward standing near his fence staring at us with an intensity that sent a chill down our spines. His gaze was unwavering, and it was as if he were trying to convey a message, though we couldn't discern its meaning. I stood up, unable to bear the sense of unease any longer, and approached Edward. What do you want from us? I demanded. He remained silent for a moment, and then, in a voice that was both chilling and earnest, he whispered, I'm trying to protect you. Protect us from what? Edward hesitated, his gaze never leaving us, and then he said, You don't understand. They're watching, always watching. We have to be careful, you see. The truth is out there, and we must protect it. I couldn't make sense of his words, and I realized that he had succumbed to his delusions, that his obsession with surveillance had led him down a dark and twisted path. Emily tugged at my arm, urging me to return to the safety of our porch, and as we retreated, Edward's gaze followed us, haunting and unrelenting. Days turned into weeks and the sense of being constantly watched only grew more oppressive. We knew that we had to protect ourselves to take control of our own lives. We installed security cameras, changed the locks on our doors, and did everything we could to regain our sense of security. But one evening, as we sat in our living room, the power suddenly went out. It was a stormy night and we could hear the howling wind outside. Emily and I exchanged worried glances and I grabbed a flashlight, determined to investigate the cause of the outage. As I ventured into the darkened hallway, I heard a sound that sent a jolt of fear coursing through me. It was a voice, soft and cold, that seemed to emanate from the shadows. 
You shouldn't have tried to escape. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest, and I shone the flashlight into the hallway. There, standing in the shadows, was Edward. His eyes were filled with a malevolent gleam, and he held a knife in his hand. Emily's scream pierced the darkness, and I could hear her struggling in the living room. I rushed back, but it was too late. Edward had attacked her, and she lay on the floor, blood pooling around her. I grabbed the nearest object I could find and swung it at Edward, hitting him in the head. He crumpled to the ground and I rushed to Emily's side, my hands trembling as I tried to stem the bleeding. The police arrived shortly after and Edward was taken into custody. He was charged with attempted murder and the truth about his obsession with surveillance and his delusions finally came to light. Emily survived the attack, but the scars, both physical and emotional, would never truly heal. Our peaceful life in Green Valley had been shattered, and the feeling of being watched had left us forever changed. Eager for an adventure off the beaten path, Tom and his friends embarked on a road trip through the remote countryside of Eastern Europe. They had heard rumors of a hidden village called Gavroska, untouched by modern civilization. After hours of driving, they stumbled upon the village nestled in a picturesque valley. Its inhabitants, dressed in traditional attire, welcomed the travelers with open arms. The village seemed idyllic, frozen in time. As they explored, Tom and his friends noticed peculiarities, the villagers' insistence on not mentioning the modern world, the absence of any technology, and the eerie quiet that pervaded the village. On the second day, they awoke to find the village deserted. Panic set in as they searched for any sign of life, but there was none. They decided to leave, but discovered their car had vanished. Trapped in Gavraska, they delved deeper into the mystery. Hidden in a cellar, they uncovered a journal from the 1800s that told of a curse placed upon the village. A curse that trapped its inhabitants in a timeless purgatory. With each passing day, Tom and his friends felt time slip away, their own bodies aging while the village remained untouched. Desperate, they sought a way to break the curse. Their research led them to a hidden chamber beneath the village church, where they discovered a decrepit altar. There, they performed a solemn ritual to appease the ancient curse, offering their own time and memories in exchange for the village's freedom. The village came alive once more, but Tom and his friends aged decades in an instant, their memories fading like mist. They were old, their lives reduced to fragments of time, but they had succeeded. The curse of Gavraska was lifted and the village was free. Tom was the only one who survived. A frail old man with only fleeting memories of his youth and friends, he would never forget the sacrifice that had set the village free. A sacrifice that had come at a great personal cost. For their annual adventure, a group of college friends decided to explore the Appalachian Mountains, known for their rugged terrain and hidden secrets. Their destination was a remote cave, rumored to hold ancient treasures. As they ventured into the cave, the air grew chilly and the darkness pressed in around them. Illuminating the path with flashlights, they navigated the labyrinthine tunnels, uncovering eerie carvings on the walls. Deeper within the cave, they discovered a chamber unlike any other, an underground lake, its waters shimmering with an unnatural glow. The sight was breathtaking, but the tranquility was short-lived. A shadowy figure emerged from the water, its eyes gleaming with malevolence. It spoke not with words, but with images in their minds, a warning to leave, for the cave was cursed. Fearful yet curious, the friends pressed on, desperate to uncover the cave's secrets. As they delved deeper, the shadows grew thicker and their flashlights flickered. One by one, they vanished, consumed by the darkness. Only Sarah remained, her heart pounding as she tried to escape, but the cave seemed to shift and twist trapping her within its depths. Finally, she reached the underground lake where the shadowy figure awaited. It revealed its true form, a guardian spirit tasked with protecting the cave's ancient secrets. With sorrow in its eyes, the guardian explained that the cave held the memories of those who had entered, bound for all eternity. The friends had become one with the cave, their souls imprisoned within its depths. Sarah, alone and terrified, realized that there was no escape. She had uncovered the cave's dark secret, but it had come at a terrible price. As she gazed into the glowing waters, she knew that she would join her friends in the shadows, 
a part of the cave's cursed legacy. Roanoke Island, with its rich history and maritime legends, drew tourists seeking adventure. A group of friends set out to explore the coastal town, eager to uncover the mysteries hidden within its shores. As they wandered the historic waterfront, they stumbled upon a dilapidated ship, its timbers rotting and sails tattered. The locals spoke of the ship as cursed, the Phantom Voyager, a vessel that had vanished without a trace centuries ago. Undeterred by the superstitions, the friends boarded the ship, armed with cameras and a sense of curiosity. They explored its eerie corridors and abandoned cabins, documenting their findings. As night fell, a thick fog enveloped the ship, cutting off their view of the shore. Panic set in as they realized they were trapped on the ghostly vessel. Desperate, they tried to signal for help, but their cries went unanswered. Strange occurrences plagued them. The sound of ghostly footsteps, whispers in the dark, and apparitions that seemed to flicker in and out of existence. The friends grew increasingly frightened, their unity crumbling. One by one, they vanished, consumed by the ship's supernatural forces. Only Alex remained, his heart pounding as he tried to make sense of the nightmare that had become his reality. In the ghostly silence, Alex stumbled upon a journal hidden in the captain's quarters. It revealed the ship's dark history, the captain's pact with a vengeful sea spirit, offering the souls of his crew in exchange for eternal life. The Phantom Voyager had become a floating prison, a vessel bound by dark magic to claim the souls of those who dared to step aboard. Alex understood that the ship could never be free until its curse was broken. With grim determination, he confronted the sea spirit, offering his own soul in exchange for the release of the ship and the trapped souls within. The spirit, its eyes filled with malevolence, accepted the offer, and the ship faded into the mist. Alex was left alone on the fog-shrouded waters, a survivor of the ghostly ordeal. He watched as the phantom voyager vanished from sight, knowing that his sacrifice had set the trapped souls free, but had come at a terrible cost. Angkor Wat, the famous temple complex in Cambodia, was a must-visit for tourists worldwide. Mark and his friends, avid urban explorers, decided to explore not just the main temple but also the less-known ruins nearby. The group had heard whispers of the temple's dark past, horrifying experiments, cruel treatment of patients, and rumors of restless spirits. Determined to document their adventure, they brought cameras, flashlights, and a sense of dread that clung to them like a second skin. As they entered the decaying building, the stench of mildew and decay assaulted their senses. Crumbling walls, shattered windows, and discarded hospital equipment painted a grim picture of what had transpired within these walls. The exploration was unnerving, but nothing could prepare them for what they discovered in the basement. Rows of rusted cages, restraints, and a chillingly preserved operating room told a haunting tale of suffering. Sarah's friend Jake couldn't resist trying on an old straitjacket for a photo. As he posed, a deafening crash echoed through the basement. The group frantically searched for the source of the noise, but found nothing. Their unease grew, and they decided to leave the basement. That's when they realized Jake was missing. Panic set in as they scoured the asylum, but there was no sign of him. Terrified and hearts pounding, they fled the asylum, vowing to return with help. The police were called, and a search of the building commenced. But Jake was never found. In the following weeks, the group reviewed their photos, hoping for clues. In one, they saw Jake straightjacketed, surrounded by shadowy figures with hollow eyes. His fate remained a mystery, but the chilling photograph served as a haunting reminder of their ill-fated exploration. As time passed, the group's obsession with Jake's disappearance grew. They delved deeper into the history of the asylum, uncovering tales of a doctor who had conducted grotesque experiments on patients leaving them scarred both physically and mentally. One evening, Sarah received an anonymous email with a cryptic message, coordinates leading to an abandoned mansion on the outskirts of town. Intrigued and driven by the need for closure, the group decided to investigate. The mansion, hidden behind overgrown trees and crumbling stone walls, exuded an air of malevolence. As they entered, they discovered a room filled with disturbing photographs and journals detailing the doctor's experiments. The truth unfolded before their eyes. 
Jake had become a victim of the asylum's dark past. He had been subjected to torturous procedures, his mind shattered by the doctor's sadistic pursuits. As they continued to explore, they stumbled upon a hidden chamber deep within the mansion. Inside, they found Jake, his emaciated body suspended from the ceiling by chains. His eyes, once vibrant, now held only emptiness. With trembling hands, they released Jake from his nightmarish prison. His reunion with Sarah was bittersweet, as the horrors he had endured left him a shell of his former self. The group vowed to bring the doctor's atrocities to light, to ensure that no one else would suffer the same fate. But as they left the mansion, they couldn't shake the feeling that the darkness of the asylum still clung to them, a haunting reminder of the evil they had uncovered. Nestled deep in the Appalachian Mountains, Whispering Pines Inn was known for its rustic charm and breathtaking views. Sarah and her husband Mark decided to spend their anniversary there, eager to escape the hustle and bustle of city life. The innkeeper, Mr. Simmons, welcomed them warmly and showed them to their room, a quaint antique-filled suite with a balcony overlooking the dense forest. Their first night was peaceful. But on the second night, Sarah was awakened by a soft, mournful whisper that seemed to emanate from the walls themselves. She roused Mark, but he heard nothing and dismissed it as a dream. The whispers grew louder each night, accompanied by a feeling of icy dread that seemed to seep into their bones. Sarah's sleepless nights left her exhausted, and Mark's skepticism slowly eroded. One evening as they sat on the balcony, a chilling voice spoke directly into their minds. Leave this place before it claims you, it warned. They glanced around, but there was no one to be seen. Terrified, they packed their bags and sought out Mr. Simmons. As they approached the innkeeper's office, they noticed a portrait on the wall, an eerie painting of Mr. Simmons himself, his eyes cold and lifeless. And Mr. Simmons explained that he had been bound to the inn by a dark pact made long ago, and the inn demanded souls to sustain it. He had lured countless guests to their doom, and he was bound to do so for eternity. With a heavy heart, Mr. Simmons urged them to run to save themselves from the inn's insatiable hunger. Sarah and Mark fled, leaving behind the cursed Whispering Pines Inn and its malevolent innkeeper. They sought refuge in a nearby town, haunted by the memories of their ordeal. The whispers and icy dread had left scars on their souls, a constant reminder of the evil that had lurked within the inn's walls. Years later, as they passed by the inn, they saw that it had fallen into further disrepair, its once charming exterior now a decrepit facade. They knew that the innkeeper's curse would forever bind him to the crumbling building, a prisoner of his own malevolence. I never should have gone to that abandoned asylum. It had always been a place of morbid fascination for me, and one fateful summer night, curiosity got the better of my fear. Little did I know that this decision would plunge me into a nightmare beyond my wildest imagination. It was a moonless night, and the air was thick with foreboding as I made my way through the overgrown path leading to the asylum. My footsteps echoed eerily in the silence, and the crunch of leaves beneath my feet was a symphony of dread. The asylum loomed ahead, its decaying facade illuminated only by the faint glow of my flashlight. As I stepped through the shattered remnants of a once imposing entrance, a chilling gust of wind enveloped me, as if the building itself were exhaling a malevolent breath. The interior was a maze of decaying corridors and shattered windows, where shadows danced in sinister patterns. My heart pounded, but I pressed on, compelled by an irresistible force. I followed the eerie sounds of distant whispers deeper into the asylum, my flashlight flickering as if it, too, was afraid of what lurked within. Suddenly, I stumbled upon a room, its door hanging ajar. The room was furnished with rusted metal beds, their surfaces stained with unspeakable horrors. My stomach churned as I realized I was in a former patient's room. As I scanned the room with trembling hands, I noticed something etched into the wall beside one of the beds. It was a crude drawing, a grotesque figure with elongated limbs and hollow eyes. Beside it, the words he sees were scrawled in blood-red letters. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and I had an overwhelming sense that I was not alone. I fled the room, my heart pounding in my chest, and continued my journey through the asylum's dark recesses. The whispered voices grew louder, and I could now discern words, 
though they made no sense. It was as if the very walls were whispering their own dreadful secrets. I descended into the bowels of the building where I stumbled upon an operating theater bathed in an eerie, flickering light. In the center of the room stood an old surgical table, restraint still intact. My flashlight beam revealed an array of surgical instruments, some encrusted with dried blood. The air was heavy with the stench of antiseptic and decay. My gaze was drawn to a corner of the room where an ornate mirror hung. My reflection stared back at me, but its eyes were empty voids, devoid of any semblance of humanity. Panic gripped me as I stumbled backward, crashing into a tray of instruments. The mirror shattered and the room plunged into darkness. I fumbled for my flashlight, my breath ragged. When the light returned, I was no longer alone. A figure stood at the entrance to the operating theater, shrouded in darkness. My heart raced as I tried to discern its features, but it remained a formless specter. The whispers intensified, growing into a cacophony of torment. He sees, he sees, they chanted in a dissonant chorus. The figure advanced slowly, its movements disjointed and unnatural. I tried to flee, but my legs betrayed me, refusing to move. As the figure drew closer, I finally caught a glimpse of its face, or what passed for one. It was a grotesque mask of agony and despair, twisted into a permanent rictus of torment. Its eyes, black pits devoid of humanity, fixed upon me with malevolence beyond comprehension. With a sudden surge of terror-fueled strength, I broke free from my paralysis and sprinted through the asylum's labyrinthine corridors, desperate to escape the relentless pursuit of the figure. The whispers pursued me, growing louder and more insistent with each passing moment. I stumbled into a room filled with rows of rusted metal beds, each occupied by a shadowy figure. Their hollow eyes stared into nothingness, and their mouths moved in silent agony. I realized with horror that these were the tortured souls of the asylum's former patients, trapped in an eternal nightmare. The figure was closing in, its distorted face contorted with sadistic glee. I had to find a way out to escape this living nightmare. With trembling hands, I pushed open a door at the end of the room and emerged into a moonlit courtyard. The asylum loomed behind me, its decaying facade now a nightmarish silhouette against the pale glow of the moon. I could still hear the whispers, faint but persistent, as if the asylum itself were whispering its cursed secrets. I ran through the courtyard through overgrown weeds and crumbling walls until I reached the outer perimeter of the asylum grounds. As I crossed the threshold, a deafening silence enveloped me and the whispers ceased. I collapsed onto the grass, gasping for breath, my mind reeling from the horrors I had witnessed. The asylum stood silent and foreboding, a sentinel of malevolence in the moonlight. I knew I had escaped with my life, but I would forever carry the scars of that night. To this day, I cannot forget the figure with the face of torment, the tortured souls in the asylum's depths, or the haunting whispers that continue to echo in my nightmares. The asylum's secrets remain buried in its decaying walls, but I know one thing for certain. Some places are best left unexplored, for the darkness they hold can consume even the bravest of souls. It had been a grueling week of hiking in the remote wilderness, and exhaustion had settled deep into our bones. My friends and I had embarked on this adventure seeking solitude and adventure but we had no idea what awaited us in the heart of the forest. As we set up camp near a serene lake, we couldn't help but marvel at the beauty that surrounded us. Towering trees formed a natural canopy overhead, and the still waters of the lake reflected the deep blue sky. It was idyllic, but the tranquility would soon give way to an unsettling sense of unease. On the second night, as we huddled around the campfire, a distant sound echoed through the trees. It was a soft, mournful wail that seemed to carry on the wind. We dismissed it as an animal, or perhaps the wind itself, but the unease in our group was palpable. As the days passed, the wailing continued, growing closer with each passing night. We attempted to rationalize it, attributing the sound to wildlife or the peculiar acoustics of the forest, but it gnawed at our nerves. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows through the trees, we heard it again louder and more haunting than before. This time it was unmistakably human, a cry of anguish that sent shivers down our spines. We decided to investigate, to determine the source of this eerie wail. Armed with flashlights, we ventured deeper into the forest following the sound. 
The path grew treacherous and the trees closed in around us, their branches clawing at the sky like skeletal fingers. The whale led us to a small clearing where we discovered an old dilapidated cabin. Its windows were shattered and the roof sagged under the weight of years of neglect. The cry seemed to emanate from within and our hearts raced as we cautiously approached. The door creaked open with a ghostly groan, revealing a scene of utter desolation. Dusty furniture lay in disarray, cobwebs hung in the corners and the air was heavy with the scent of decay. But what chilled us to the bone was the sight of an old worn photograph on the mantel. It depicted a family, a mother, father, and a young child, their faces etched with sorrow. It was as if time had frozen in that moment of despair. Beneath the photograph was an inscription, Never forget. The wailing continued, echoing through the cabin's decaying walls. We followed it to a room at the back of the cabin, where we discovered an old wooden trapdoor in the floor. With trembling hands, we lifted it, revealing a dark earthen tunnel beneath. Hesitant but driven by curiosity, we descended into the tunnel, our flashlights piercing the oppressive darkness. The cries grew louder and we soon realized their source, a hidden chamber buried deep underground. Inside, we found a room filled with chains and shackles, their cold, rusted metal bearing silent witness to untold suffering. The walls were lined with scratches and etchings, the desperate marks of someone who had been imprisoned here. As the wailing reached its crescendo, we discovered a journal tucked away in a corner. Its pages were filled with the anguished writings of a man who had been locked in this chamber, tormented by the relentless cries that had haunted us. We never did learn the fate of the man who had penned those desperate words, but the eerie cries that had led us to this place had been his torment, a ghostly echo of a tragedy long forgotten. Terrified and shaken, we fled the cabin, leaving behind the wailing and the darkness that had consumed it. We returned to our campsite, packed our gear, and left the wilderness behind, haunted by the chilling discovery we had made. To this day, the memory of that forsaken cabin and its mournful cries lingers in my nightmares, a reminder that even in the depths of the wilderness, the past can reach out and grasp you in its chilling grip. It was the summer of 1997 and my friends and I were eager to embark on a road trip adventure. We had just graduated from high school and this was our way of celebrating our newfound freedom before we scattered to colleges and universities across the country. Our destination, a remote abandoned mining town in the Nevada desert that we had heard about from locals. The sun hung low on the horizon as we set out on that fateful morning. Four friends packed into a beat up old van with a map spread across the dashboard. The desert stretched out before us, a vast expanse of sand and sagebrush that seemed to go on forever. It was desolate and eerily quiet, with only the occasional tumbleweed rolling across the cracked highway. Hours passed and the landscape remained unchanged. The old town was rumored to be located far off the beaten path, and we began to wonder if we were on the right track. The relentless sun beat down on us and our excitement began to wane as the miles dragged on. Just as we were about to give up and turn back, we spotted a weathered sign by the roadside. Welcome to Dustwood Population Zero. It was faded and barely legible, but it was the confirmation we needed. We followed a narrow dirt road off the highway and into the desert, winding deeper into the arid wilderness. As we approached Dustwood, we were struck by the sight of dilapidated buildings rising from the desert like specters of a bygone era. The town had been abandoned for decades, its wooden structures weathered by time and neglect. We couldn't help but be drawn to the eerie allure of a place forgotten by the world. We parked the van in the town's dusty square, the tires crunching on gravel as we exited the vehicle. The air was hot and dry and the silence was oppressive. The only sounds were the distant hum of the wind and the creaking of old timbers. Our first stop was an old saloon, its swinging doors barely hanging on their hinges. Inside, the bar was covered in a layer of dust, and broken glass littered the floor. Faded posters and remnants of a bygone era decorated the walls. It was as if the town's inhabitants had simply vanished, leaving everything behind. As we explored further, we stumbled upon the remnants of a schoolhouse, its chalkboard still covered in faded lessons, and a long-abandoned general store, its shelves barren and splintered. 
It was a town frozen in time, a snapshot of a once thriving community that had fallen into decay. We ventured deeper into Dustwood, our footsteps echoing in the empty streets. It was as if the town itself was holding its breath, waiting for something to break the silence. The sun was beginning to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows that seemed to stretch infinitely. As we approached the outskirts of town, we noticed a building that stood apart from the others, a large, imposing structure that loomed like a dark sentinel against the fading light. It was the old Dustwood Mine, the source of the town's prosperity in its heyday. We couldn't resist the urge to explore the mine, and we made our way inside, our flashlights piercing the inky darkness. The air grew cooler and damper as we descended into the depths of the earth. The tunnels seemed to stretch on forever, their walls lined with the remnants of mining equipment. As we ventured deeper, the walls of the mine began to close in around us, and the sense of isolation grew more pronounced. The beams of our flashlights danced along the walls, revealing ancient cave-ins and tunnels that seemed to lead to nowhere. Suddenly, we stumbled upon something that sent shivers down our spines. A series of handprints, smeared in what appeared to be blood along the tunnel walls. They were accompanied by crude drawings of terrified faces and desperate pleas for help. We exchanged nervous glances but pressed on, compelled by a mixture of curiosity and dread. The tunnels twisted and turned, leading us deeper into the labyrinthine darkness. The air grew colder and the silence was oppressive. It was then that we heard it, a faint, distant sound like a whisper carried on the wind. At first, we dismissed it as our imagination, but it grew louder and more insistent, echoing through the tunnels like a mournful cry. We followed the sound, our footsteps echoing in the narrow confines of the mine. It led us to a chamber, its walls adorned with more blood-smeared handprints and chilling messages. In the center of the chamber stood an old wooden platform, its surface stained with what could only be described as a pool of dried blood. As we approached, our flashlights revealed a rusted chain and shackles attached to the platform, and a shiver of horror coursed through us. It was a chilling reminder of the town's dark past, a past that had been buried beneath layers of time and silence. The whispers grew louder, their words incomprehensible but filled with anguish and despair. We knew we had to leave to escape the suffocating darkness of the mine, but as we turned to go, the entrance to the chamber slammed shut with a deafening crash plunging us into darkness. Panic surged through us as we fumbled for our flashlights, their beams revealing that we were no longer alone. Figures emerged from the shadows, their faces twisted in terror and suffering. They were the specters of Dustwood's past, the souls of those who had toiled in the mine and perished in its depths. Desperate and terrified, we fought to escape the chamber, but the figures closed in around us, their bony hands reaching out as if to drag us into their eternal torment. The whispers grew into a cacophony of agony, drowning out our cries for help. Just as all hope seemed lost, the entrance to the chamber suddenly burst open, and blinding daylight flooded in. We stumbled out of the mine, gasping for breath, and found ourselves back in the town square, the sun hanging low on the horizon. The figures of Dustwood's past remained trapped within the mine, their mournful cries echoing through the tunnels. We knew we had narrowly escaped a fate worse than death. Terrified and shaken, we piled back into the van and sped away from Dustwood, leaving the abandoned town and its haunting secrets behind. As we drove into the desert night, we couldn't help but wonder if we had disturbed something in that forsaken place, something that should have remained hidden. To this day, the memory of Dustwood and the chilling encounter in the mine haunts my dreams. It serves as a stark reminder that some places are best left untouched, their secrets buried in the sands of time, waiting for the curious and the foolish to stumble upon them. I had always been a skeptic when it came to online classified ads. Scammers, spammers, and worse lurked behind every deal too good to be true. But I was broke, desperate, and my college graduation was looming like a dark storm cloud ready to rain on my dreams. That's how I found myself scouring Craigslist one evening for part-time work. The clock on my laptop read 3 a.m. as I stumbled upon an ad that seemed promising. Paid research opportunity, help needed urgently, it proclaimed. The headline was catchy, but the post itself was rather vague. 
mentioning only that a private research firm was willing to pay top dollar for participants in a series of experiments. The compensation promised was enough to pay off my mounting student loans and maybe even have some leftover for celebration. With a mix of curiosity and desperation, I clicked on the ad, revealing an email address to contact for more details. I fired off an email, not expecting a response until the next day. However, within minutes, I received a reply from a sender named Researcher X. The email was concise and cryptic. Meet at the abandoned warehouse on 42nd Street at 11 p.m. tomorrow. Come alone. Wear black. I was skeptical, of course. The warning bells in my head clanged loudly. This was undoubtedly shady, maybe even dangerous. But I couldn't shake the idea that this could be the break I needed. I knew it was a risk, but I decided to go armed with the address, a pocket knife, and a smartphone that could dial 911 at a moment's notice. The day passed in a blur of nervous anticipation. I tried to focus on my last few college classes, but my mind kept wandering to the mysterious ad. Who were these researchers, and what kind of experiments required secrecy in a midnight meeting at an abandoned warehouse? As evening fell, I donned a black hoodie and pants, wanting to blend into the shadows. I shoved the pocket knife into my back pocket and made my way to 42nd Street. The rain had begun to drizzle, and the city streets were dark and quiet. I felt like a character in a noir film, my heart pounding with every echoing step. The warehouse came into view, a towering, decrepit structure with broken windows and graffiti-covered walls. The entrance was a rusted door ajar, revealing nothing but darkness inside. I hesitated for a moment, my fear trying to take control but I had come this far. I took a deep breath and stepped inside. The interior of the warehouse was even more ominous than the exterior. The only light came from a flickering bulb hanging from the ceiling, casting long dancing shadows across the grimy floor. The air was musty, filled with the scent of decay and dampness. I cautiously advanced further into the building. I could hear faint voices in the distance echoing through the cavernous space. Following the sounds, I eventually stumbled upon a small room. A table stood in the center, surrounded by four chairs. Seated in one of them was a figure shrouded in darkness. Take a seat, a voice said, low and raspy. I couldn't discern whether it was male or female. I hesitated for a moment before complying, sitting across from the mysterious figure. The dim light made it impossible to see their face. They pushed a folder toward me and my trembling hands reached for it. Inside, you'll find a document detailing the experiment. The voice continued. You have the right to leave at any time. But once you read the document, you'll understand the importance of what we're doing here. With that, the figure fell silent, leaving me alone with the folder. I opened it slowly, my eyes scanning the typed pages. The document explained that this research was focused on fear and the human psyche. It outlined a series of tasks I would be required to complete each designed to provoke fear in varying degrees. As I read further, I realized that this was no ordinary psychological experiment. The tasks included encounters with strangers in dark alleys, navigating through abandoned buildings, and even participating in staged accidents. The goal was to measure my physiological responses to fear-inducing scenarios and to assess my ability to remain calm under pressure. I should have left right then and there, but my curiosity and the promise of a substantial payment compelled me to stay. I signed the agreement at the end of the document, acknowledging the risks and agreeing to the terms of the experiment. Over the next few weeks, I found myself thrust into a series of increasingly unsettling situations. I was constantly under surveillance, my every move monitored by the researchers. They provided me with a smartphone and instructed me to document my experiences through video and voice recordings. The first task was relatively benign, a late-night walk through a park where I encountered a suspicious-looking stranger. I recorded the encounter as instructed, feeling a surge of fear as the stranger approached, only to be relieved when nothing untoward happened. But as the days passed, the experiments grew more sinister. I was sent to a derelict psychiatric hospital where I navigated dark labyrinthine corridors and encountered remnants of its grim past. My heart raced as I heard distant whispers and faint cries that seemed to emanate from nowhere. Next, I was instructed to board a deserted subway car at the end of the line and ride it until I reached an unfamiliar station. The platform was empty, the station devoid of life, and I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. 
My unease deepened as I noticed shadowy figures lurking in the tunnels, their eyes gleaming with malevolence. I recorded it all, my voice trembling as I narrated my experiences. But with each passing day, the fear grew harder to contain. The sleepless nights, the constant surveillance, and the uncertainty of what was real and what was part of the experiment began to take its toll on my sanity. Then came the night that would change everything. I received an email from Researcher X, containing an address and a single instruction. Visit this location alone. This is your final task. I had grown increasingly paranoid and a sense of impending doom hung over me like a dark cloud. The address led me to an isolated, abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of the city. The night was moonless and the only light came from the pale glow of distant streetlights. I entered the warehouse, my footsteps echoing in the silence. Inside the scene was unlike anything I had encountered before. The room was vast, with towering stacks of wooden crates, their contents hidden in the shadows. In the center of the room stood a single chair, and above it a solitary light bulb dangled from a frayed cord. I hesitated, my heart pounding in my chest. Something felt profoundly wrong about this situation. But the promise of payment, the desire to finally be free of this nightmare, pushed me forward. I took a seat beneath the swaying light bulb, and as if on cue it flickered to life, casting a harsh, unnatural glow. From the shadows emerged a figure dressed in black, their face concealed beneath a hood. You've done well, the figure said, their voice cold and emotionless. But there's one final test we must conduct. The figure produced a small leather-bound book and placed it on the crate in front of me. It was old and weathered its pages filled with faded text and illustrations of arcane symbols. You must read from this book, the figure commanded. Recite the words exactly as they are written, and your ordeal will be over. I glanced at the book, my unease growing. The symbols and text were like nothing I had ever seen, and a foreboding sense of dread washed over me. What is this? I stammered, my voice trembling. The figure leaned closer, their hooded face inches from mine. It is your final test, they hissed. Recite the words or remain trapped in this nightmare forever. I had no choice. Fear had brought me to this point and fear would see me through to the end. I opened the book and began to read, my voice shaking as I spoke the incomprehensible words. As the last syllable left my lips, a deafening roar filled the room. The very air seemed to tremble and the walls of the warehouse began to shake. I clung to the chair, my heart pounding in my chest. Suddenly the room was plunged into darkness and the figure before me disappeared. Panic surged through me as I fumbled for my phone, my fingers trembling as I activated its flashlight. The warehouse was empty, the chair and the book gone. I was alone, surrounded by the looming crates and the oppressive silence. I stumbled to my feet and made my way to the exit, my mind reeling. The experiments were over, but the fear remained, a festering seed of dread that had taken root in my soul. I returned to my apartment, the weight of what had transpired settling over me like a shroud. I never received the promised payment, and I never heard from researchers again. The entire experience remained shrouded in mystery, a nightmare from which I could never truly escape. To this day I am haunted by the knowledge that I willingly subjected myself to those experiments that I read from that accursed book. I can't help but wonder what I unleashed that night what malevolent forces I unwittingly invoked. And as I write this, I can't shake the feeling that I am still being watched, that the shadows that once lurked in the corners of my vision are now closing in, ready to claim me once and for all. So if you ever come across a mysterious Craigslist ad promising quick cash for participating in a research study, heed my warning, run the other way. Some fears are better left unexplored, some doors better left unopened, and some experiments better left untested. I can't believe I'm sharing this story, but I feel like I have to. It's been two years and the memories still haunt me. It all started innocently enough with an online classified ad. It was a cold and rainy evening and I had just moved to a new city. My apartment was still a mess of unpacked boxes and I was feeling a bit lonely. I had heard about Craigslist and decided to give it a try to find some furniture and maybe make a friend in the process. I logged onto the website and started browsing through the furniture listings. Most of them were standard. Couches, tables, chairs. 
But one ad caught my eye. It was titled Antique Mirror. Must go ASAP. The picture showed a beautiful ornate mirror that looked like it belonged in a Victorian mansion. The price was unbelievably low, and the seller claimed it needed to be gone that very night. Excited by the prospect of scoring such a great deal, I sent a message to the seller. Within minutes, I received a response from a woman named Margaret. She explained that her grandmother had passed away, and they were clearing out the old family home. The mirror was the last thing left, and they wanted it gone to make room for new memories. Margaret provided me with the address and insisted I come pick it up immediately. I was hesitant about going to a stranger's house so late at night, but the allure of the mirror was too strong. I decided to go, reasoning that it couldn't hurt to meet someone new. As I pulled up to the address Margaret had given me, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The house was a dilapidated Victorian-era mansion, its paint peeling and the windows covered in dust and grime. I knocked on the door and it creaked open slowly, revealing Margaret, a frail elderly woman with a friendly smile. She led me through the house, the floorboards groaning with each step. The place was filled with antique furniture and dusty family portraits, which seemed to watch my every move. Margaret took me to the mirror, which was even more beautiful up close. It was massive, easily seven feet tall, with intricate carvings and a tarnished silver frame. Margaret explained that the mirror had been in her family for generations, but had brought nothing but bad luck. She said her grandmother had claimed to see strange figures and hear voices when she looked into it. Margaret and her family had decided that it was best to part with it, and I naively agreed to take it off their hands. As we carried the mirror to my car, Margaret warned me to never look into it. She said it was cursed and had brought misery to her family. I laughed it off, thinking it was just an old superstition. I drove back to my apartment, excited about my new acquisition. I propped the mirror against the wall in the living room, feeling a strange thrill as I looked at my reflection in its aged glass. It was as if I had a connection to the past, to the generations of people who had gazed into it. That night, as I lay in bed, I heard a faint whisper coming from the living room. At first, I thought it was just my imagination, but the voices grew louder and more distinct. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but they sounded like a chorus of anguished souls. Terrified, I rushed into the living room, and there, in front of the mirror, I saw them. Figures, shadows, distorted faces staring back at me. They were moving, reaching out toward me, their mouths opening in silent screams. I stumbled backward, knocking over a chair, and the figures disappeared. For days, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I heard the whispers, felt their presence. I knew I had to get rid of the mirror, but it seemed to have a malevolent hold on me. I would find myself standing in front of it, unable to look away, feeling as though I was being drawn into its depths. One evening, as I stared into the mirror, I saw her. A woman with long, flowing hair and sad, empty eyes. She reached out to me, and I felt an overwhelming urge to touch her hand. As I did, I was pulled into the mirror, my world turning upside down. I found myself in a dark, shadowy realm surrounded by the figures I had seen before. They moaned and wailed, their faces contorted in agony. I screamed, but no sound escaped my lips. I tried to run, but my feet felt like they were glued to the ground. As I wandered through that nightmarish landscape, I realized that I was not alone. Margaret was there too, her eyes filled with regret. She explained that the mirror was a portal to the afterlife, a place where the souls of the cursed were trapped for eternity. She had brought me here to take her place, to bear the burden of the mirror's curse. I pleaded with her to help me escape, but she simply turned and walked away, disappearing into the darkness. I was left alone, surrounded by the tormented souls, forever trapped in the cursed mirror. And that's how I ended up here, writing this story from the other side. I can't warn you enough. Never trust a Craigslist ad that seems too good to be true, and never underestimate the power of a cursed mirror. My only hope is that by sharing my story, I can save others from the same fate. So if you ever come across an ad for an antique mirror that needs to go ASAP, just remember my story and run the other way. You never know what horrors might be lurking on the other side. It all began with a late night internet browsing session, as most strange and unsettling stories do. I was searching for a part-time job, something to help me cover my mounting bills while I struggled to finish my degree. 
That's when I stumbled upon a peculiar Craigslist ad that would lead me down a twisted path into the unknown. The ad's title read, Historical Tour Guides Wanted, Uncover the Past, Earn Cash. It piqued my interest immediately. As an aspiring history major, I had always been drawn to the mysteries of the past. The ad promised flexible hours and above average pay, which was exactly what I needed. I clicked on the ad and read the description. It stated that a local historical society was looking for tour guides to lead visitors through an old cemetery with a rich and mysterious history. The tours were to be conducted after dark, adding an allure to the experience. The pay offered was nearly too good to be true, and my curiosity got the best of me. I decided to send an email expressing my interest. Within hours, I received a reply from a man named Mr. Holloway, the coordinator of the historical society, he explained that they were in dire need of guides for the cemetery tours, especially with Halloween approaching. He scheduled an interview for the following evening at a cafe near the cemetery. The email concluded with an ominous message, prepare yourself for a journey into the past. The next evening I found myself sipping coffee in the corner of the cafe waiting for Mr. Holloway. He arrived promptly at 8 p.m., his tall slender figure draped in a long black coat. His eyes were hidden behind wire-rimmed glasses and his thin lips curled into a smile as he approached. Good evening, he said, extending a bony hand. I'm Mr. Holloway. You must be Alex. I shook his hand and introduced myself. He ordered a cup of black coffee and settled into the chair opposite mine. The cafe's patrons paid us no mind, engrossed in their own conversations. Mr. Holloway began by describing the history of the cemetery an ancient and sprawling burial ground that had been in use for over two centuries. He spoke of the many notable figures interred there, from war heroes to influential politicians, and he emphasized the importance of preserving their stories. Our goal, he explained, is to offer a unique experience to our visitors, one that not only educates, but also makes their veins freeze. We want our tours to be memorable, unforgettable, as he spoke, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease creep over me. The way he emphasized the word unforgettable sent a chill down my spine. I brushed it off as a simple case of nerves and continued to listen. Mr. Holloway detailed the responsibilities of the guides, which included memorizing historical facts, maintaining a respectful tone, and leading tours after dark. He explained that the darkness added an element of mystery to the experience, and that it was an essential part of the cemetery's allure. The tours will be conducted at night, under the light of the moon and lanterns, he said. It will be a true journey into the past, where the spirits of the past come alive. Spirits? The word hung in the air, unspoken but implied. I wondered if Mr. Holloway believed in ghosts, or if he was simply using the term metaphorically. After discussing logistics and pay, he handed me a black envelope, sealed with a wax stamp bearing the image of a skull, he instructed me to open it only when I was alone, as it contained sensitive information about the cemetery's history. As I left the cafe that night, the black envelope clutched in my hand. I couldn't help but feel a mixture of excitement and trepidation. It was a strange job interview, but the prospect of uncovering hidden stories from the past was too enticing to pass up. I waited until I was back in my apartment to open the black envelope. The wax seal cracked easily, revealing a single sheet of paper with detailed instructions for my first tour. It was scheduled for the upcoming Friday night and the meeting point was the cemetery's entrance. I spent the next few days immersed in research, learning about the cemetery's history and its famous residents. It had a rich and colorful past, filled with stories of love, betrayal, and tragedy. I couldn't wait to share these tales with the tour group and to step into the role of a historical guide. Friday night arrived and I donned a dark suit and tie, fitting attire for a cemetery tour. The moon hung low in the sky as I made my way to the cemetery's entrance. I was met by Mr. Holloway, who was dressed in his signature black coat. Ah, Alex, he greeted me with a smile. I see you're prepared. Our guests will be arriving shortly. As if on cue, a group of people began to gather at the entrance. They were a diverse bunch, ranging from college students to elderly couples all eager for a taste of history. Mr. Holloway introduced me as their guide, and I began to lead the group into the cemetery, lantern in hand. The night was clear and crisp, the air filled with the scent of fallen leaves. 
I spoke with enthusiasm as I led the group through the gravestones, recounting the stories of those who rested there. The guests listened attentively, their eyes wide with fascination. As the tour progressed, I noticed that some of the group members were growing increasingly uneasy. They whispered to each other and cast furtive glances over their shoulders. I couldn't blame them. After all, a cemetery at night could be an eerie place. But as we reached a particular section of the cemetery, the unease escalated into full-blown fear. The guests began to murmur and shuffle nervously, their lanterns casting wavering shadows. I turned to Mr. Holloway, who was watching with an inscrutable expression. What's going on? I whispered to him. He leaned in close and spoke in a hushed tone. This section of the cemetery has a dark history, one that we save for the climax of the tour. It's said to be haunted, you see. Some visitors claim to have seen apparitions and heard whispers in the dark. I glanced around, my nerves on edge. The atmosphere had indeed changed, and a weird stillness hung in the air. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. Just as I was about to continue the tour, a loud unearthly shriek echoed through the cemetery. The guests screamed in terror and I instinctively swung my lantern in the direction of the sound. What I saw froze me in my tracks. A figure pale and ghostly stood among the gravestones. Its eyes glowed with an unnatural light and its mouth opened in a silent scream. The guests scattered, fleeing in all directions, leaving me and Mr. Holloway alone with the apparition. What is that? I stammered, my voice trembling. Mr. Holloway's expression remained unreadable as he stepped toward the figure. It's a part of the tour, Alex. A special attraction, if you will. I watched in horror as the figure drew closer, its spectral form hovering in the moonlight. It reached out a transparent hand, and Mr. Holloway took it, leading the apparition away into the darkness. I stood there, my heart pounding as the night returned to its usual silence. The guests had disappeared into the night, leaving me alone in the cemetery. Days turned into weeks, and I couldn't shake the memory of that night. The apparition, the screams, Mr. Holloway's cryptic words, all of it haunted my thoughts. I tried to convince myself that it had been a staged event, a part of the tour meant to scare the guests, but something about it felt real, too real. I decided to confront Mr. Holloway to demand an explanation for what had happened. I sent him an email requesting a meeting and he agreed to meet me at the same cafe where we had first discussed the job. When I arrived, Mr. Holloway was already there, sitting in the same corner. He greeted me with a smile, though there was a tension in the air. Alex, he began, I'm glad you reached out. I wanted to discuss that night with you. I wasted no time. What was that thing, Mr. Holloway, the apparition in the cemetery? Was it real? He sighed, his shoulders slumping. I suppose it's time for the truth. Mr. Holloway proceeded to reveal the dark history of the cemetery, a history that had been concealed from the public for years. He explained that the cemetery had been the site of a clandestine group known as the Society of the Silent, a secret society that had dabbled in the occult and conducted bizarre rituals in the dead of night. The apparition, he told me, was a result of those rituals. It was the spirit of a member of the society, a man who had been trapped between the realms of the living and the dead. The society's rituals had unleashed forces beyond their control, and the cemetery had become a place of malevolent energy. We used the legend of the society and the apparition as a way to add an element of fear to the tours, Mr. Holloway admitted. It's a way to make the experience unforgettable, just as I promised. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The history of the cemetery, the society, and the apparition, all of it was true. It was a shocking revelation, and it left me with more questions than answers. I continued to work as a tour guide for the historical society sharing the stories of the cemetery's past with the guests. The knowledge that the apparition was real added an authenticity to the tours, and visitors left with a sense of having witnessed something truly otherworldly. But the revelation had changed something within me. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story, that the society's secrets ran deeper than I had been told. I couldn't resist the urge to uncover the truth. One night after the tour had ended and the guests had left, I approached Mr. Holloway with a determined expression. I want to know more, I said. I want to learn about the society, about the rituals they performed, and about the apparition. Will you show me? 
Mr. Holloway hesitated, his gaze fixed on mine. You must understand, Alex, that delving further into this may lead to consequences you cannot fathom. The Society's secrets are dangerous, and the apparition is a force beyond our control. I nodded, my curiosity outweighing my fear. I'm willing to take that risk. Mr. Holloway sighed and led me to a hidden chamber beneath the cemetery, a crypt that had remained sealed for centuries. Inside, he revealed a collection of old tomes and artifacts, each bearing the mark of the Society of the Silent. As I delved into the Society's history, I learned of their obsession with unlocking the secrets of the afterlife. They had conducted forbidden rituals, made pacts with dark entities, and tampered with forces that should have remained untouched. It was a chilling account of a group consumed by their desire for knowledge and power. But what fascinated me most was the apparition itself. According to the society's records, the spirit had been a member who had attempted to communicate with the dead. In a misguided experiment, they had opened a portal to the other side, allowing malevolent entities to enter our world. The apparition was the result of their doomed ritual, forever trapped between the realms. As I delved deeper into the society's secrets, I felt a growing unease. The apparition's presence seemed to loom over me, as if it resented my intrusion into its dark history. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had awakened something malevolent. One night, as I conducted a tour through the cemetery, a sense of foreboding washed over me. The air grew heavy with tension, and the guests seemed to sense it too. I recounted the stories of the cemetery with a trembling voice, my lantern casting long shadows. As we reached the section of the cemetery where the apparition had first appeared, a chilling wind swept through the gravestones. The lanterns flickered, and the group grew silent, their eyes wide with fear. And then it happened. The apparition materialized before us, its eyes glowing with an unnatural light. It let out a blood-curdling scream, and the guests screamed in terror, fleeing in all directions. I stood frozen in place, unable to tear my gaze away from the spectral figure. It reached out a ghostly hand, and I felt a cold, numbing sensation envelop me. The world around me twisted and distorted, and I found myself standing in a shadowy realm, the apparition before me. It spoke, its voice a haunting whisper. You have uncovered our secrets, Alex. You have trespassed where you should not have. I stammered, trying to find words, but fear had rendered me speechless. The apparition's eyes bore into mine, and I felt a surge of dread. You must make a choice, Alex. You can choose to forget what you have learned, to leave this place and never return. Or you can choose to stay and become a part of our history, forever trapped between the realms. I had no choice but to agree, to erase the memories of the society's secrets and the apparition from my mind. The apparition released its hold on me, and I found myself back in the cemetery, alone in the darkness. I returned to my apartment that night, my mind a whirlwind of confusion and fear. The memories of the society's secrets had been erased, but the knowledge of what had transpired lingered like a shadow in my subconscious. I continued to work as a tour guide, but the apparition's presence haunted me. It watched from the shadows, a constant reminder of the choices I had made. The burden of the society's secrets weighed heavily on my shoulders, a constant reminder of the darkness that lurked beneath the surface of the cemetery. As the years passed, I struggled to move on with my life, haunted by the memories of that night. I knew that the apparition was always there, waiting in the darkness, a specter of the past that could never be forgotten. And so I share this story as a warning to those who seek to uncover the secrets of the past, to those who are drawn to the darkness that lurks beneath the surface. Some mysteries are better left unsolved, some secrets better left buried. For the apparition of the cemetery still watches and its malevolent presence lingers, a reminder of the choices we make and the price we pay for our curiosity. The night was dark and rainy, the kind of night that made even the most fearless travelers uneasy. John had been driving for hours, the monotonous drumming of rain on the car's roof slowly pushing him towards exhaustion. His eyelids felt heavy, and he knew he needed to find a place to rest. As if on cue, a dimly lit sign emerged from the darkness ahead. It read, Miller's Gas and Grill, one mile ahead. John's heart quickened with relief, 
He could use a break, maybe grab a bite to eat. The prospect of a warm meal and a chance to stretch his legs was too tempting to resist. He followed the narrow, winding road as it led him towards the gas station. The rain showed no sign of letting up, and the steady hum of the engine provided a comforting backdrop to the otherwise eerie silence of the night. The headlights of his car illuminated the road ahead, revealing dense woods that seemed to press in on all sides. John couldn't help but feel a chill run down his spine. The gas station finally came into view, its flickering neon sign revealing a rustic, weather-worn building. It looked like something out of a forgotten era, a relic of a time when gas stations were more than just convenience stores. John pulled into the gravel lot and parked next to the only other car there, a beat-up pickup truck. As he stepped out of his car, the rain soaked through his jacket almost instantly. He hurried inside, the jingling of a bell above the door announcing his arrival. The interior of the gas station was just as old-fashioned as the exterior. Wooden shelves lined the walls, stocked with an odd assortment of products, and a counter sat at the far end, behind which stood an elderly man with a weathered face and a grizzled beard. Evening, stranger. The old man greeted him with a toothless smile. Evening, John replied, shaking off the rain from his coat. I could use a fill-up and a bite to eat. You still serving? The old man nodded and gestured towards a small diner area off to the side. Gas pumps out back. Help yourself to the menu. We got burgers, fries, and coffee. What'll it be? John ordered a cheeseburger and a coffee, then headed out to pump gas into his car. The rain was coming down harder now, making the task unpleasant. He couldn't help but feel a sense of unease as he stood alone in the dark, cold rain. The gas station's surroundings seemed strangely isolated, almost claustrophobic. Back inside, John took a seat at the counter. The old man, whose name tag read Miller, placed a steaming plate in front of him. John thanked him and dug into his meal, grateful for the warmth and sustenance. As he ate, he noticed a couple of locals sitting at the other end of the counter, huddled together in quiet conversation. Their eyes darted towards him occasionally, but they said nothing. John tried to strike up a conversation with Miller. Quiet night, huh? The old man nodded, his eyes distant. It's always quiet around these parts. Ain't much happens here. John couldn't argue with that. He finished his meal in silence, then pushed a few bills across the counter to cover the cost. As he prepared to leave, Miller spoke up. Be careful out there, these roads can get real tricky at night, especially in weather like this. John thanked him again and headed out into the storm. He climbed into his car and started the engine, watching the windshield wipers struggle to keep up with the rain. He couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about the gas station and its surroundings. The locals' strange behavior and Miller's cryptic warning only added to his unease. As he pulled out of the gas station, John couldn't help but notice that the pickup truck that had been parked there earlier was now gone. He glanced around, wondering where its owner had gone to on such a stormy night. But he quickly dismissed the thought, chalking it up to the oddities of rural life. The road stretched out before him, a never-ending ribbon of wet asphalt that seemed to disappear into the inky darkness. The rain continued to pour, making visibility poor and the journey treacherous. John gripped the steering wheel tightly, his senses on high alert. After what felt like an eternity, John spotted a pair of dim headlights approaching in the distance. He breathed a sigh of relief, grateful for the company on this desolate stretch of road. As the vehicle drew nearer, John noticed that it was the same pickup truck that had been parked at the gas station earlier. It was driving erratically, swerving from side to side as if the driver was struggling to maintain control. John slowed down, giving the truck plenty of space. He watched in growing concern as it weaved dangerously close to the edge of the road. It was as if the driver was playing a dangerous game of chicken with the darkness that surrounded them. Just as John was debating whether to call the police, the pickup truck suddenly veered off the road and into the woods. John slammed on his brakes, his heart pounding in his chest. He watched in horror as the truck crashed through the underbrush, its headlights disappearing into the dense forest. For a moment, John considered following the truck to see if the driver was okay. But the rain was coming down harder than ever, and he didn't relish the idea of getting stuck in the mud. He also couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong. The way the truck had swerved and then veered off the road had been deliberate, almost intentional. 
After a few minutes of indecision, John decided to continue on his way. He reasoned that the driver of the pickup truck might have been drunk or reckless, and there was nothing he could do to help them in this weather. He put the incident out of his mind and focused on the road ahead. As the miles passed, John couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled in the pit of his stomach. The rain showed no sign of letting up, and the road seemed to stretch on endlessly. He tried to distract himself by turning up the radio, but the crackling static and eerie echoing voices only added to his sense of isolation. Suddenly, the headlights of his car illuminated a figure standing in the middle of the road ahead. John slammed on his brakes, his heart leaping into his throat. The figure was a man, soaked to the bone and shivering in the rain. He was waving his arms frantically as if trying to flag down passing cars. Reluctantly, John rolled down his window a crack and called out to the man. Hey, are you okay? The man's voice was frantic and desperate. Please, you have to help me. My car broke down and I'm freezing out here. John's instincts told him to keep driving, to not get involved. But he couldn't leave the man stranded in the middle of nowhere on a night like this. He unlocked the passenger door and motioned for the man to get in. As soon as the man climbed into the car, John regretted his decision. The man's clothes were soaked through and he reeked of alcohol. His eyes were bloodshot and his speech was slurred. Thanks, man. The stranger mumbled, his words barely coherent. I don't know what I would have done out there. John forced a smile and tried to make small talk, but the man's responses were erratic and disjointed. He seemed agitated, constantly glancing out the window as if he were expecting something to jump out at them from the darkness. After what felt like an eternity, they finally reached a more populated area. John pulled into a well-lit parking lot and turned to the stranger. This is where I'm headed. You can get out here. The man hesitated for a moment, then nodded and stumbled out of the car. John watched as he walked away, disappearing into the night. Shaken by the encounter, John continued his journey. He couldn't help but wonder what had happened to the pickup truck he had seen earlier, and if the man he had picked up had anything to do with it. The rain had finally begun to let up, but the unease that had settled over him refused to dissipate. Hours passed and John finally reached his destination, a small town with a motel on the outskirts. He pulled into the parking lot and checked into a room, grateful for the chance to get out of the rain and rest for the night. As he lay in bed, John couldn't stop thinking about the strange events of the evening. The gas station, the pickup truck, the erratic driver, and the mysterious hitchhiker. All of it left him with an overwhelming sense of unease. He couldn't shake the feeling that he had stumbled onto something he wasn't meant to see, something that was best left hidden in the darkness. Just as he was about to drift off to sleep, John heard the sound of rain tapping against the window. But this time it was accompanied by a low, distant rumble of thunder. As he listened to the storm outside, a chilling thought crossed his mind. What if the rain had been a cover? A way to hide something far more sinister that lurked in the darkness of the night. With that unsettling thought in mind, John pulled the covers tighter around him and closed his eyes, hoping that the morning would bring answers and the chance to leave this mysterious and ominous place far behind. Tom had been on the road for hours. The desolate stretch of highway seemed to go on forever, with nothing but the endless expanse of the desert on either side. He had passed only a handful of cars, and the sun had long since set, casting a blanket of darkness over the landscape. The only source of light was his car's headlights slicing through the inky blackness. His gas gauge was edging dangerously close to empty, and panic began to creep into his mind. He had no choice but to pull over at the next gas station he found, no matter how isolated it might be. Just as he was starting to worry that he might run out of fuel before he reached one, he spotted a dimly lit sign in the distance. It read, Crossroads Gas and Mart, two miles ahead. Tom's heart skipped a beat. It was a lifeline in the middle of the desert. The Crossroads Gas and Mart looked like it had seen better days. Its neon sign flickered weakly, and the paint on the building was chipped and peeling. As Tom pulled into the gravel lot, he noticed that he was the only customer there. The place seemed deserted, and an eerie silence hung in the air. He parked his car next to the lone gas pump and climbed out. The wind was sharp and cold, and the darkness seemed to press in on him from all sides. He shivered as he approached the gas pump and grabbed the nozzle, trying to ignore the sense of unease that had settled over him. 
As Tom began to pump gas into his car, he noticed a figure in the dimly lit window of the convenience store. It was the gas station attendant, an old man with a weathered face and a stooped posture. He was staring at Tom with a vacant expression as if he had been waiting for him to arrive. Evening, Tom called out as he finished pumping gas. The old man didn't respond. He simply continued to stare. Tom decided to pay no mind to the strange behavior and headed into the convenience store. The interior was dimly lit and the shelves were sparsely stocked with dusty, outdated products. It felt like a relic from a bygone era, a time when gas stations were more than just places to refuel. The old man behind the counter had a name tag that read Sam. His eyes were fixed on Tom as he approached. Evening, Tom repeated, trying to break the eerie silence. I could use a fill-up and something to eat. You still serving? Sam nodded slowly, his gaze never leaving Tom. Gas pumps out back. Help yourself to the menu. We got burgers, fries, and coffee. What'll it be? Tom ordered a cheeseburger and a coffee, then headed out to pump gas. The wind had picked up and the sky was overcast. Tom couldn't help but feel a sense of isolation as he stood alone in the cold desert night, the gas station surroundings seemingly empty for miles. Back inside, Tom took a seat at the counter. He watched as Sam prepared his meal, the old man's movement slow and deliberate. Tom couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about the gas station and its lone attendant. The isolation, the eerie silence, and Sam's strange behavior all added to his unease. As he ate, Tom noticed a group of locals sitting at a corner booth, huddled together in hushed conversation. Their eyes darted towards him occasionally, but they said nothing. Tom tried to strike up a conversation with Sam to ease his discomfort. Quiet night, huh? He ventured. Sam nodded, his expression unchanging. It's always quiet around here. Not much happens. Tom finished his meal in silence and pushed a few bills across the counter to cover the cost. As he prepared to leave, Sam spoke up. Be careful out there. These roads can get tricky at night, especially in weather like this. Tom thanked Sam and headed out into the cold desert night. The wind cut through his jacket and he felt a chill run down his spine. The gas station surrounding seemed desolate, almost otherworldly, as if he had stepped into another dimension. He climbed into his car and started the engine, the headlights cutting through the darkness as he pulled onto the empty highway. The road stretched out before him, a lonely ribbon of asphalt disappearing into the vast desert. As he drove, Tom couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. He glanced in the rearview mirror but saw nothing behind him. The sense of unease grew stronger, and he couldn't help but think of the locals at the gas station and their secretive conversation. Just as he was starting to feel paranoid, Tom spotted a pair of headlights approaching in the distance. He breathed a sigh of relief, grateful for the company on this isolated stretch of road. As the vehicle drew nearer, he realized it was the same pickup truck that had been parked at the gas station. It was driving erratically, swerving from side to side. Tom slowed down, giving the truck plenty of space. He watched in growing concern as it veered dangerously close to the edge of the road. Suddenly, the pickup truck veered off the road and into the desert. Tom slammed on his brakes, his heart pounding in his chest. He watched in horror as the truck crashed through the sand and disappeared from sight. For a moment, Tom considered following the truck to see if the driver was okay. But the isolation of the desert and the unpredictability of the situation made him hesitate. He also couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong. The way the truck had swerved and then veered off the road had been deliberate, almost intentional. After a few minutes of indecision, Tom decided to continue on his way. He reasoned that the driver of the pickup truck might have been drunk or reckless, and there was nothing he could do to help them in this desolate place. He put the incident out of his mind and focused on the road ahead. Miles passed, and Tom finally reached the outskirts of a small town. He pulled into a well-lit parking lot and checked into a motel, grateful for the chance to get out of the cold desert night. As he lay in bed, he couldn't stop thinking about the strange events of the evening, the gas station, the pickup truck, the erratic driver, and the mysterious locals. Something was not right in this place, and Tom couldn't shake the feeling that he had stumbled upon a secret that was best left buried. Just as he was starting to drift off to sleep, 
Tom heard the sound of the wind howling outside, but this time it was accompanied by a low, distant rumble of thunder. As he listened to the storm raging in the desert, a chilling thought crossed his mind. What if the gas station at Crossroads was a haven for secrets, and the storm was a harbinger of the darkness that lurked beneath the surface? With that unsettling thought in mind, Tom pulled the covers tighter around him and closed his eyes, hoping that the morning would bring answers and the chance to escape the eerie gas station at Crossroads. As the night wore on, Tom's unease only deepened, and he couldn't escape the feeling that he had only scratched the surface of a much deeper and darker mystery. The gas station at Crossroads held its secrets, and he was determined to uncover them no matter the cost. The desert stretched out endlessly around Jack as he sped down the lonely highway. The sun was setting, casting long shadows over the barren landscape. He had been driving for hours, and his gas gauge was edging dangerously close to empty. Beads of sweat formed on his forehead as he scanned the horizon for any sign of a gas station. Just as panic began to set in, he spotted a dimly lit sign in the distance. It read, Desert Oasis Gas and Mart, five miles ahead. Jack let out a sigh of relief and pushed his foot down on the accelerator. He couldn't afford to run out of gas in the middle of nowhere. As he approached the gas station, it became clear that Desert Oasis had seen better days. The neon sign flickered weakly and the paint on the building was faded and peeling. He pulled into the gravel lot, noticing that he was the only customer there. The place seemed deserted and an eerie silence hung in the air. Jack parked his car next to the lone gas pump and climbed out. The wind was hot and dry, and the desert seemed to stretch out forever in every direction. He shivered despite the heat and approached the gas pump, trying to ignore the sense of unease that had settled over him. As he began to pump gas into his car, he noticed a figure in the dimly lit window of the convenience store. It was the gas station attendant, an elderly man with a weathered face and a distant look in his eyes. He was staring at Jack as if he had been waiting for him to arrive. Evening. Jack called out as he finished pumping gas. The old man didn't respond. He simply continued to stare. Jack decided to pay no mind to the strange behavior and headed into the convenience store. The interior was dimly lit, and the shelves were sparsely stocked with dusty, outdated products. It felt like a relic from a bygone era, a time when gas stations were more than just places to refuel. The old man behind the counter had a name tag that read, Frank. His eyes were fixed on Jack as he approached. Evening, Jack repeated, trying to break the eerie silence. I could use a fill-up and something to eat. You still serving? Frank nodded slowly, his gaze never leaving Jack. Gas pumps out back. Help yourself to the menu. We got burgers, fries, and coffee. What'll it be? Jack ordered a cheeseburger and a coffee, then headed out to pump gas. The wind had picked up, and the sky was clear and filled with stars. He couldn't help but feel a sense of isolation as he stood alone in the desert night, the gas station surroundings seemingly empty for miles. Back inside, Jack took a seat at the counter. He watched as Frank prepared his meal, the old man's movements slow and deliberate. Jack couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about the gas station and its lone attendant. The isolation, the eerie silence, and Frank's strange behavior all added to his unease. As he ate, Jack noticed a group of locals sitting at a corner booth, huddled together in hushed conversation. Their eyes darted towards him occasionally, but they said nothing. Jack tried to strike up a conversation with Frank to ease his discomfort. Quiet night, huh? He ventured. Frank nodded, his expression unchanging. It's always quiet around here. Not much happens. Jack finished his meal in silence and pushed a few bills across the counter to cover the cost. As he prepared to leave, Frank spoke up. Be careful out there. Jack thanked Frank and headed out into the desert night. The wind was hot and dry and the sky was filled with stars. The gas station's surroundings seemed desolate. He climbed into his car and started the engine, the headlights cutting through the darkness as he pulled onto the empty highway. The road stretched out before him, a lonely ribbon of asphalt disappearing into the vast desert. As he drove, Jack couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. He glanced in the rearview mirror, but saw nothing behind him. The sense of unease grew stronger, and he couldn't help but think of the locals at the gas station and their secretive conversation. 
Just as he was starting to feel paranoid, Jack spotted a pair of headlights approaching in the distance. He breathed a sigh of relief, grateful for the company on this isolated stretch of road. As the vehicle drew nearer, he realized it was the same pickup truck that had been parked at the gas station. It was driving erratically, swerving from side to side. Jack slowed down, giving the truck plenty of space. He watched in growing concern as it veered dangerously close to the edge of the road. Suddenly, the pickup truck veered off the road and into the desert. Jack slammed on his brakes, his heart pounding in his chest. He watched in horror as the truck crashed through the sand and disappeared from sight. For a moment, Jack considered following the truck to see if the driver was okay. But the isolation of the desert and the unpredictability of the situation made him hesitate. He also couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong. The way the truck had swerved and then veered off the road had been deliberate, almost intentional. After a few minutes of indecision, Jack decided to continue on his way. He reasoned that the driver of the pickup truck might have been drunk or reckless, and there was nothing he could do to help them in this desolate place. He put the incident out of his mind and focused on the road ahead. Miles passed and Jack finally reached the outskirts of a small town. He pulled into a well-lit parking lot and checked into a motel, grateful for the chance to get out of the desert night. As he lay in bed, he couldn't stop thinking about the strange events of the evening. The gas station, the pickup truck, the erratic driver, and the mysterious locals. Something was not right in this place, and Jack couldn't shake the feeling that he had stumbled upon a secret that was best left buried. Just as he was starting to drift off to sleep, Jack heard the sound of the wind howling outside but this time it was accompanied by a low, distant rumble of thunder. As he listened to the storm raging in the desert, a chilling thought crossed his mind. What if the gas station at Desert Oasis was a haven for secrets, and the storm was a harbinger of the darkness that lurked beneath the surface? With that unsettling thought in mind, Jack pulled the covers tighter around him and closed his eyes, hoping that the morning would bring answers and the chance to escape the eerie gas station at Desert Oasis. As the night wore on, Jack's unease only deepened, and he couldn't escape the feeling that he had only scratched the surface of a much deeper and darker mystery. The gas station at Desert Oasis held its secrets, and he was determined to uncover them no matter the cost. My family had just moved into a new home. It was a large, two-story house in a quiet suburban neighborhood. The sun had dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the street as we pulled into the driveway. We were all exhausted from the move, but we couldn't wait to settle into our new place. The house had a strange aura about it, even from the outside. It stood eerily still in the growing darkness, its windows reflecting the fading twilight. As we stepped out of the car, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching us, lurking in the shadows. My wife Sarah and I exchanged nervous glances, but we brushed off our unease as a product of the long day. We had two kids, Emily and Jack, who were equally eager to explore their new home. We grabbed our bags and headed inside. The interior of the house was grand, but it had an old world charm that creeped me out. The wooden floors creaked with each step and the walls were adorned with faded wallpaper that hinted at the house's long history. We started unpacking, hoping that making the house our own would ease our discomfort. That first night was restless, I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, unable to shake the feeling that something was off. The house seemed to groan and sigh as if it held secrets within its walls. I finally drifted off to sleep, but my dreams were plagued by dark shadows and whispered voices. In the days that followed, strange occurrences became a regular part of our lives. Objects would move on their own, and we would hear faint, disembodied footsteps in the hallway at night. Sarah and I tried to reassure each other that it was just our imaginations playing tricks on us, but deep down we knew something wasn't right. One evening as I was helping Emily with her homework in the dining room, I caught a glimpse of a shadowy figure out of the corner of my eye. I turned but there was nothing there. Emily looked at me, concern in her eyes. Daddy, I saw it too, she whispered. What did you see, I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. It looked like a tall man, but he was all black like a shadow. He was standing by the door. I felt a chill run down my spine. I didn't want to scare my daughter, so I tried to dismiss it. It must have been your imagination, sweetie. This house is just new to us, that's all. But as the days turned into weeks, 
The encounters with the shadowy figure became more frequent. Jack claimed to have seen it as well, always lurking in the corners of his room. Sarah and I decided it was time to investigate. We did some research on the house's history and discovered that it had been built in the late 19th century. Several families had lived here over the years, but none had stayed for long. There were rumors of tragedy and strange occurrences associated with the house, but no concrete details. One night, after putting the kids to bed, Sarah and I decided to stay up and see if we could catch a glimpse of the shadowy figure ourselves. We sat in the living room, the only source of light coming from a single lamp. Hours passed in silence, but nothing happened. Sarah was beginning to nod off when I suddenly saw movement in the hallway. I motioned for her to be quiet and pointed toward the shadowy figure. There it was, just as the children had described. A tall, dark silhouette stood in the hallway unmoving. We watched in terror as it seemed to glide closer, its form becoming more defined. It had a human shape, but its features were obscured by the impenetrable darkness. My heart pounded in my chest as I struggled to make sense of what I was seeing. Sarah's grip on my hand tightened and I could see the fear in her eyes. The figure was now at the entrance of the living room, just a few feet away from us. Then, without warning, it vanished. One moment it was there and the next it was gone, leaving us in stunned silence. We decided it was time to seek professional help. We contacted a paranormal investigator named Dr. Henderson, who had experience dealing with cases like ours. He arrived a few days later with a team of researchers and equipment. Dr. Henderson conducted a thorough investigation of the house, using various tools to measure electromagnetic fields and detect any unusual energy patterns. The team also set up cameras and audio recorders in different rooms. As we watched the monitors in the living room, we saw shadows darting across the hallway and heard faint whispers on the audio recordings. Dr. Henderson's team seemed both excited and unnerved by the evidence they were collecting. After a long night of investigation, Dr. Henderson sat us down in the living room to discuss his findings. There's definitely something strange happening in this house, he began. We've captured unexplained phenomena on our equipment, and I believe there's a strong presence here. What can we do about it? Sarah asked, her voice trembling. Dr. Henderson looked thoughtful. I recommend a more in-depth investigation, including a psychic medium who can try to communicate with whatever is in this house. It's possible that it's a residual energy or a trapped spirit. We agreed to the medium's involvement, desperate for answers. The following week, a woman named Eliza arrived at our home. She had a calm demeanor and a soothing presence that immediately put us at ease. Eliza began her investigation by walking through the house, her eyes closed as if she were tuning into something beyond our perception. She stopped in the hallway where we had seen the shadowy figure and gasped softly. There's a strong energy here, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. It's a presence that's trapped, unable to move on. It's filled with anger and sadness. She continued to explore the house, describing the sensations and emotions she was picking up on. As she entered Jack's room, her expression changed. This is where it's strongest, she said. The entity seems to be fixated on your son. We exchanged worried glances. Eliza suggested conducting a seance in Jack's room to try and communicate with the entity. We agreed, hoping it would provide us with some answers and a way to help our son. That night, we gathered in Jack's room, the lights dimmed and a single candle flickering on the floor. Eliza sat in the center and we joined hands in a circle. She began to speak softly, calling out to the entity. The room grew colder and we could see our breath in the air. Suddenly, Jack's toys started moving on their own as if manipulated by invisible hands. Emily gasped and I squeezed her hand to reassure her. Who are you? Eliza asked, her voice steady. A low, guttural voice echoed through the room, sending shivers down our spines. I am the guardian I watch, I protect. Protect? Eliza questioned. Protect whom? Jack, the voice replied, sending a chill through the room. He is mine to protect. We exchanged frightened glances. Eliza continued to communicate with the entity trying to understand its motives. It seemed to believe that Jack was in danger and that it needed to keep him safe at all costs. As the seance went on, the entity's messages grew more frantic and aggressive. It warned us to leave the house, to take Jack away from this place. 
It claimed that there were other malevolent entities in the house, and it was the only thing standing between us and them. We were terrified, unsure of what to believe. Eliza finally closed the seance and we sat in Jack's room trying to process everything we had just experienced. The room felt heavy with the presence of the entity, and we knew that we couldn't stay in the house any longer. Over the next few days, we packed up our belongings and made arrangements to stay with Sarah's parents while we figured out our next steps. Eliza blessed the house and performed a cleansing ritual, hoping to drive away the malevolent entities that had taken residence there. As we drove away from the house for the last time, I couldn't help but look back at it in the rearview mirror. It stood there, looming in the distance, a dark and foreboding presence that seemed to watch us go. We never returned to that house and we tried to put the terrifying ordeal behind us. Jack seemed to recover from the trauma and our lives slowly returned to normal. But we would always carry the memory of the shadowed guardian and the malevolent entities that had haunted our home. To this day, I can't help but wonder about the true nature of the entity that had claimed to protect us. Was it a benevolent force or was it something more sinister, using our fear and vulnerability to its advantage? One thing was certain. We would never forget the shadowed guardian and the nightmare that had unfolded in our new home. And as we drove away from that cursed house, I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still watching, still waiting in the depths of the darkness. My name is Ethan and I've always had a fascination with the woods. Ever since I was a child, I would spend hours exploring the dense forests that surrounded my family's cabin. The trees, the wildlife, the feeling of being surrounded by nature's secrets. It all drew me in like a moth to a flame. But as I would soon discover, some secrets are best left untouched. It was a crisp, moonlit night when it all began. The woods had always been a place of comfort and solace for me. But that night, as I ventured deeper into the forest than ever before, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was different. Something was watching me. I had brought my trusty flashlight, but even its beam seemed feeble in the vast expanse of the trees. I pushed onward, the crunch of leaves and twigs beneath my boots the only sound in the otherwise silent night. The forest was a labyrinth of shadows and my imagination played tricks on me. I thought I saw movement in the corner of my eye, heard faint whispers carried by the wind, and felt the temperature drop whenever I paused to catch my breath. Still I brushed it off as my own paranoia and continued my journey. Hours passed and I had lost all sense of time and direction. The moon hung low in the sky, casting eerie silhouettes of the trees on the forest floor. That's when I stumbled upon it, a clearing bathed in moonlight with an ancient gnarled tree at its center. The tree was unlike anything I had ever seen. Its bark was a deep, almost obsidian black and its branches twisted and contorted as if they were reaching out for something or someone. The air around it felt heavy and oppressive and the silence was suffocating. Despite my unease, I couldn't tear my eyes away from the tree. It had an otherworldly beauty, a sinister allure that drew me closer. I reached out to touch its bark, my fingers trembling as they made contact with the rough surface. That's when I heard it, a soft, mournful whisper like the sigh of a dying breeze. It seemed to emanate from the tree itself, as if it held the secrets of the forest within its ancient heart. Who are you? I whispered, my voice barely audible even to my own ears. The whisper grew louder, more insistent and I could make out words, faint and fragmented. Guardian, forsaken, beware. I stumbled back, my heart pounding in my chest. The tree, the clearing, the whole forest. It felt wrong, like a nightmare brought to life. Panic gripped me and I turned to run, but the path I had followed had vanished, replaced by an impenetrable wall of trees. I was trapped. The whispering grew louder, more frantic, and the shadows seemed to come alive twisting and writhing as if they had a life of their own. I had to get out of there, had to escape the suffocating darkness closing in around me. Frantically, I retraced my steps, stumbling over roots and underbrush as I tried to find my way back to the safety of the cabin. But the forest had changed, as if it had rearranged itself to keep me captive. The trees loomed like ancient sentinels, their branches reaching out to ensnare me. Hours turned into days, or at least it felt that way. I was exhausted my body aching from the relentless pursuit of escape. The whispers had grown louder, more menacing, and I could feel a malevolent presence lurking just beyond the edge of my vision. I had lost all sense of time and reality. The forest had become a nightmarish labyrinth, 
and I was its unwilling prisoner. I knew then that I had trespassed into something beyond my comprehension, something ancient and vengeful. Just when I thought I couldn't go on any longer, I stumbled upon a small, dilapidated cabin hidden deep within the woods. It was a decrepit, rotting structure, but it offered shelter from the relentless darkness that had pursued me. Inside, I found a dusty, tattered journal on a wooden table. Its pages were filled with the frenzied writings of a previous occupant, someone who had also been ensnared by the forest's sinister grip. Guardian of the Woods, the journal read. Beware its whispers, its seductive call. It promises secrets, power, but it's a trap, a malevolent force that feeds on the lost and the forsaken. I have seen things in these woods, things that should never have existed. The journal spoke of a ritual, a way to appease the guardian and escape its clutches. Desperate and terrified, I followed the instructions, reciting the incantation as the whispers grew louder and the shadows closed in around me. Suddenly, the cabin shook as if caught in a violent storm. The walls groaned and the roof threatened to collapse. I could hear the Guardian's furious howls, its rage echoing through the trees. But then, as suddenly as it had begun, the chaos stopped. The cabin was still, and the forest outside seemed to have lost interest in me. I cautiously stepped outside, and to my astonishment I found myself standing at the edge of the woods, just a stone's throw from the cabin. The Guardian had released me. I stumbled back to my family's cabin, disheveled and traumatized. I didn't speak of my ordeal, not wanting to burden my loved ones with the horrors I had witnessed. But the memory of that night, of the Guardian and the Whispers, haunted my dreams. Years passed, and I tried to put the forest and its malevolent Guardian behind me. I got married, had children of my own, and moved far away from those cursed woods. But the memory of that night was always there, lurking in the shadows of my mind. Then, one fateful night as I lay in bed, I heard it. The soft, mournful whisper, the same one I had heard in the clearing so long ago. It echoed through the darkness, filling my room with dread. Guardian forsaken, beware. My heart raced and I knew that the Guardian had not forgotten me. It had followed me, waiting for the right moment to reclaim what it believed was rightfully its own. I never went back to the woods, but the Guardian's whispers grew louder with each passing night. It seemed to seep into every corner of my life, poisoning my thoughts and driving me to the brink of madness. I tried to protect my family, to shield them from the malevolent force that had taken hold of me. But it was futile. The Guardian's whispers grew louder, more insistent, until I could no longer resist its call. One night, as the moon hung low in the sky, I left my home and ventured into the darkness, drawn by the sinister allure of the Guardian and the secrets it promised. The woods had claimed me once again, and this time I knew there was no escape. As I walked deeper into the forest, the shadows closed in around me, and the whispers became a deafening cacophony. I was no longer a trespasser. I was a willing servant, bound to the Guardian for eternity. And so I remain lost in the depths of the woods, a forsaken soul ensnared by the malevolent force that dwells within. The Guardian's whispers are my only companions now. A constant reminder of the darkness that lurks in the heart of the woods beyond midnight. It was a sweltering summer night in the heart of the city. The relentless heat had driven most of the residents indoors, seeking refuge in the cool embrace of air conditioning. But not me. I had always been drawn to the city's nocturnal side, its secrets and shadows that came alive after dark. With my headphones on and the city's pulse reverberating through my veins, I decided to take a late-night walk. The streets were nearly empty, bathed in the pale glow of streetlights that flickered like dying stars. I walked with purpose, the rhythmic beat of my music matching the cadence of my footsteps. As I turned down a dimly lit alley, my senses heightened. There was something unsettling about the deserted streets, a feeling that I couldn't quite shake. I glanced over my shoulder half expecting to see someone or something lurking in the shadows. There was no one there, of course, just the empty alley and the distant hum of the city. I forced myself to shake off the unease and continued my journey. It was when I reached the bridge that spans the river that I first noticed it, the shadowy figure that seemed to materialize out of thin air. It was a tall, imposing silhouette, shrouded in darkness and devoid of any discernible features. It stood beneath a flickering streetlight, motionless, as if waiting for something. 
My heart skipped a beat as I quickened my pace. I tried to convince myself that it was just a trick of the light, a figment of my overactive imagination. But as I glanced over my shoulder again, the figure was still there, closer now and undeniably real. I continued to walk, my heart pounding in my chest. I told myself to stay calm, that there was a logical explanation for this. Maybe it was just a late-night wanderer, lost in thought like I was. But the nagging feeling in the pit of my stomach told me otherwise. As I crossed the bridge and descended a flight of stairs that led to the riverbank, I realized that the figure was following me. Its movements were slow and deliberate, always keeping a fixed distance. I could hear the soft, rhythmic echo of its footsteps, a haunting accompaniment to the music in my ears. I considered turning back, confronting the figure, demanding an explanation for its unsettling presence. But a deep sense of dread held me back. I knew that whatever, or whoever this was, it was no ordinary stranger. I walked along the river, my footsteps echoing in the desolate night. The city's skyline loomed overhead, a dark, towering presence that seemed to press down on me. The figure continued to follow, its presence an ominous shadow at the edge of my perception. I couldn't take it anymore. I stopped in my tracks, ripping the headphones from my ears and turning to face the figure. It was closer now, just a few yards away, and I could see that it wore a long, tattered coat that billowed in the night breeze. Who are you? I demanded my voice quivering with a mixture of fear and anger. The figure remained silent, its form shrouded in darkness. I took a step closer, my heart pounding in my chest. I said, who are you? Why are you following me? Still, there was no response. The figure seemed to pulse with an unnatural energy, its presence a looming, oppressive force. I took a deep breath, my instincts screaming at me to run, to escape this menacing presence. But I couldn't tear my eyes away from it. I had to know who or what I was dealing with. What do you want? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Finally, the figure spoke, its voice a hollow, whispering rasp that felt cold. I seek redemption. The words hung in the air like a sinister omen. Redemption? What did that mean? And why did this figure's presence fill me with such an overwhelming sense of dread? I took another step closer, my curiosity overpowering my fear. Redemption for what? The figure hesitated as if struggling to find the right words. For the sins of the past. For the darkness that haunts my soul. I felt a chill run down my spine. The figure's words were cryptic, filled with a sense of profound sorrow and regret. I couldn't help but be drawn in, as if I were unraveling a mystery that I was never meant to uncover. Who are you? I asked again, my voice trembling. The figure finally stepped into the dim glow of a nearby streetlight, revealing a face that was both familiar and utterly alien. Its features were contorted, twisted by some unseen torment, and its eyes bore into mine with a haunting intensity. I am a reflection of your own darkness, it said, its voice echoing in my mind. I am the embodiment of your deepest fears and regrets. I stumbled back, a sense of dread washing over me, it couldn't be true, couldn't be real. This figure, this shadowy presence, it was a manifestation of my own inner demons. Get away from me, I whispered, my heart pounding in my chest. But the figure remained, its eyes never leaving mine. I cannot be banished so easily, for I am a part of you. I turned and ran, my footsteps echoing in the empty streets. The figure followed, always at a fixed distance, as if it were tethered to me by an invisible thread. Panic coursed through my veins as I sprinted through the city, desperate to escape the relentless pursuit of my own darkness. I didn't know how long I ran or where I was headed. All I knew was that I had to get away from the figure, from the haunting presence that threatened to consume me. My lungs burned, my legs ached, but I couldn't stop. Eventually, I found myself in a deserted park surrounded by trees and darkness. I collapsed onto a park bench, gasping for breath, my heart pounding in my chest. I looked around, expecting to see the figure closing in on me, but it was gone. I sat there in the darkness, my mind reeling from the encounter. The figure had vanished as suddenly as it had appeared, leaving me alone with my thoughts and my fear. I couldn't deny the truth any longer. The figure, the darkness, it was a part of me, a manifestation of my own inner demons. It had followed me, haunted me, 
and forced me to confront the darkness that lurked within my own soul. As I sat in the park, the first light of dawn began to break over the horizon, casting a faint glow over the city. I knew that I could never escape the shadowy figure, for it was a part of me, a reflection of my own fears and regrets. And as I watched the city awaken, I couldn't help but wonder if redemption was truly possible, if I could ever find a way to confront and conquer the darkness that dwelled within me. My name is Alex, and I never thought I'd be telling a story like this. It all began when my girlfriend Emily started acting strange, stranger than I could have ever imagined. Emily and I had been together for over two years, and for the most part, our relationship was perfect. We shared the same interests, had the same sense of humor, and couldn't get enough of each other's company. But something changed one fateful summer evening, and it was the beginning of a descent into madness I could never have predicted. It was a warm, balmy night when Emily and I decided to take a walk in the park near our apartment. The sun had dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the grass, and the air was filled with the gentle hum of crickets. It was the kind of night that made you feel alive, and Emily and I relished the opportunity to spend it together. As we strolled hand in hand, I couldn't help but admire how the moonlight played on her features, casting a soft glow over her face. She had always been beautiful, but that night, she looked positively ethereal. But then, as we reached the center of the park, Emily suddenly stopped in her tracks. Her grip on my hand tightened, and her eyes, once bright and full of life, took on a distant, vacant look. Emily, what's wrong? I asked, my concern growing. She didn't respond, didn't even acknowledge my presence. Instead, she began to mutter under her breath, her words unintelligible. It was as if she had been transported to another world, one that I couldn't see or understand. I tried to snap her out of it, gently shaking her shoulder and calling her name, but it was as if she were in a trance. Her muttering grew louder, more frantic, and I could see the fear in her eyes. Emily, snap out of it, I pleaded, my heart racing. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, the episode ended. Emily blinked as if waking from a dream and looked at me with a bewildered expression. What just happened? She asked, her voice trembling. I couldn't answer couldn't comprehend what had just occurred. I was relieved that she was back to herself, but a nagging unease settled in the pit of my stomach. We decided to cut our walk short and headed back to our apartment. Emily seemed shaken, but she couldn't provide any explanation for her strange behavior. She blamed it on stress and fatigue, and I wanted to believe her. But as the days went by, Emily's odd episodes became more frequent. She would zone out at random moments, her eyes losing focus as she muttered incomprehensible words. Sometimes, she would wake up in the middle of the night screaming in terror, unable to remember her nightmares. I was worried sick about her, but she insisted that she was fine, that it was just a phase. She brushed off my concerns, even though I could see the toll it was taking on her. Her once vibrant personality had become muted and withdrawn. Then one evening, as we were having dinner, Emily did something that sent chills down my spine. She suddenly stopped eating, her fork hovering halfway to her mouth, and her eyes locked onto mine with a malevolent intensity I had never seen before. Emily, what's wrong? I asked, my voice trembling. She didn't respond, didn't blink. Instead, she began to speak, but it wasn't her voice that came out of her mouth. It was a low, guttural growl filled with an otherworldly malevolence that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Leave now, the voice hissed, leave before it's too late. I recoiled in horror, pushing my chair back from the table. Emily's eyes cleared and she looked at me with confusion and fear. What's wrong? She asked, her voice trembling. I couldn't find the words to explain what had just happened. I felt like I was losing my mind, like reality itself was unraveling before my eyes. That night I couldn't sleep. I lay awake in bed, listening to Emily's soft breathing beside me. I didn't know what to do, who to turn to for help. It felt like I was trapped in a waking nightmare, and I couldn't escape. The days that followed were a blur of fear and uncertainty. Emily's episodes grew worse, and I could see the toll it was taking on her physically and emotionally. She had dark circles under her eyes, and her once lustrous hair had lost its shine. I tried to research her symptoms online, but I couldn't find any answers. It was as if whatever was afflicting her defied explanation. I begged her to see a doctor, but she refused, 
insisting that it was just a phase and that it would pass. Then one evening as I was sitting in the living room, I heard Emily talking to herself in the bedroom. It wasn't the muttering I had grown accustomed to. It was a full-blown conversation, as if she were speaking to someone else. I tiptoed to the bedroom door and listened, my heart pounding in my chest. Emily's voice was filled with anger and desperation, and she was pleading with someone, or something. No, please, I can't do it, she sobbed. You promised you would leave him alone. I pushed the bedroom door open and what I saw sent shockwaves through my body. Emily was sitting on the edge of the bed, her eyes wide with terror as she spoke to an empty corner of the room. Who are you talking to? I demanded, my voice trembling. Emily turned to me, her eyes filled with a mixture of fear and despair. It won't leave me alone, Alex. It's always there, watching, waiting. It wants something from me, something I can't give. I didn't know what to say, how to help her. I felt utterly powerless in the face of whatever was tormenting her. That night, I decided to set up a camera in the bedroom, hoping to capture evidence of Emily's strange behavior. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more to her episodes, something sinister and inexplicable. As I reviewed the footage the next morning, my blood ran cold. In the darkness of the bedroom, I could see Emily sitting on the bed, her eyes vacant as she spoke to the empty corner of the room. But there was something else, something I couldn't explain. A shadowy figure, barely visible in the dim light, seemed to materialize in the corner of the room. It was tall and hunched, its form shifting and contorting as if it were made of smoke and darkness. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was as if I had captured evidence of the malevolent presence that had taken hold of Emily. But what was it? And what did it want from her? I decided to seek help from a paranormal investigator, hoping that they could provide answers and a way to help Emily. The investigator, a man named Dr. Mitchell, arrived at our apartment with a team of researchers and equipment. They conducted a thorough investigation, using electromagnetic field detectors and audio recording devices. As they worked, I couldn't shake the feeling that the apartment was filled with an oppressive energy, as if something was watching us. Hours passed and the investigators finally sat down with me to discuss their findings. Dr. Mitchell had a grave expression on his face and I could tell that he had seen something that disturbed him. We've detected unusual energy patterns in your apartment, he began. And we've captured some disturbing audio recordings. He played a recording for me and I felt a chill run down my spine. It was Emily's voice, but it was distorted, filled with anguish and despair. She was pleading with someone, or something. I can't do it, she sobbed. I can't give you what you want. The recording made my blood freeze. I had heard those words before, in the bedroom that night when Emily had spoken to the empty corner. Dr. Mitchell continued, We believe that your girlfriend is being tormented by a malevolent entity, one that feeds on her fear and despair. It's a parasitic entity that has attached itself to her, and it won't let go without a fight. I was horrified by the revelation. I couldn't believe that something so sinister could have taken hold of Emily. I asked Dr. Mitchell if there was a way to remove the entity, to free her from its torment. He nodded solemnly. There is a ritual that can banish the entity, but it won't be easy. We'll need to perform it tonight during the peak of its activity, and we'll need your help. I agreed without hesitation, desperate to free Emily from the entity's grip. Dr. Mitchell and his team spent the day preparing for the ritual, gathering candles, incense, and other tools. As night fell, we gathered in the living room, ready to confront the malevolent entity. The atmosphere in the apartment was heavy with tension, and I could feel the entity's presence lurking in the shadows. Dr. Mitchell began the ritual, reciting incantations and performing sacred gestures. The room seemed to come alive with energy, as if the very air were charged with power. As the ritual reached its climax, I heard a low, guttural growl emanate from the darkness. The entity was fighting back, resisting its banishment. The room grew colder and the candles flickered as if they were about to be extinguished. But Dr. Mitchell pressed on, his voice unwavering. He called upon higher powers to aid us in our battle against the malevolent entity. I could feel the weight of its presence lifting, as if it were being torn away from Emily. And then, with a final triumphant incantation, Dr. Mitchell banished the entity from our apartment. The room seemed to brighten, and I could feel a sense of peace wash over me. It was finally over. 
Emily sat on the floor, her eyes wide with bewilderment. She looked at me as if she had just woken from a nightmare. What? What happened? She asked, her voice trembling. I helped her to her feet and held her tightly. It's over, Emily. The entity is gone. You're safe now. She nodded, tears streaming down her face. It was as if she had been freed from a prison of fear and despair. In the days that followed, Emily seemed like her old self again. Her strange episodes had ceased, and her vibrant personality had returned. We couldn't explain what had happened, but we were grateful that it was finally over. As I sat with Emily one evening holding her hand, she looked at me with gratitude and love in her eyes. Thank you, Alex. You saved me. I smiled and kissed her forehead. I would do anything for you, Emily. I'm just glad you're okay. But even as we embraced, I couldn't help but wonder what had really happened. What had caused Emily to be tormented by the malevolent entity in the first place. And I couldn't shake the feeling that there were secrets lurking in the shadows, waiting to be uncovered. As the days turned into weeks, I continued to research the paranormal, desperate to find answers. I discovered stories of entities that attached themselves to vulnerable individuals, feeding on their fear and despair. They were ancient and malevolent and they would stop at nothing to claim their victims. I couldn't help but wonder if there were others out there, like Emily, who were being tormented by these sinister entities. And I knew that I had to find a way to protect them, to banish the darkness that lurked in the shadows. As I delved deeper into the world of the paranormal, I couldn't shake the feeling that our battle against the malevolent entity was far from over. There were forces beyond our understanding, lurking in the darkness waiting to be uncovered. And I was determined to confront them no matter the cost, for in the shadows in the hidden corners of the world there were secrets waiting to be uncovered, and I was determined to uncover them. The darkness may have taken hold of Emily, but it would not claim any more victims on my watch. As I sit here alone in this forgotten room, the memories of that fateful summer flood back, like a relentless tide of darkness. I never thought I'd be entangled in something so sinister, so surreal. But here I am, recounting my story, hoping that it serves as a cautionary tale. It all began innocently enough. I had recently graduated from college, eager to embark on the adventure of adult life. The world stretched out before me, full of possibilities. I had moved to a new city and was slowly settling into my job. But something was missing. A sense of belonging, a community. Little did I know that longing would lead me down a path I could never have imagined. One sunny afternoon, while sipping coffee at a local cafe, I noticed a flyer on the community board. It was an invitation to a gathering promising enlightenment and inner peace. The group called themselves the Cult of the Silent Shadows. The flyer showed a serene, masked figure bathed in moonlight, holding a candle. It piqued my curiosity, and with nothing to lose, I decided to attend their meeting. The address led me to an unassuming building on the outskirts of town. I entered a room filled with people of all ages, races, and backgrounds. The atmosphere was warm and inviting, and I felt an immediate sense of camaraderie. It seemed like the community I had been searching for. Their leader, a charismatic man named Gabriel, took the stage. He was a tall figure with piercing blue eyes and an air of magnetism that was impossible to ignore. He spoke eloquently about the struggles of modern life, the chaos of the world, and the need for inner tranquility. We are the silent shadows, he proclaimed, and we offer you a path to serenity, away from the noise and distractions of the outside world. His words resonated with me as they did with everyone else in the room. Gabriel spoke of meditation, mindfulness, and the power of silence in a world filled with constant chatter. It all sounded so appealing, so simple. Over the next few weeks, I attended the Silent Shadows gatherings regularly. The teachings became the anchor of my life. Gabriel's charisma and the sense of belonging I found within the group were addictive. I was not alone in my devotion, many others were equally captivated. As the days turned into months, the group's activities grew more intense. We were encouraged to immerse ourselves fully in their teachings. I began spending more time with my fellow members, often at the cult's secluded retreat deep in the woods. It was during one of these retreats that I began to notice something strange. The teachings, once focused on meditation and mindfulness, had taken a darker turn. Gabriel spoke of the need to shed our former selves, 
to become shadows of our former lives. He preached the power of silence, not just as a form of meditation, but as a way of life. The group started practicing silence for days at a time, communicating only through gestures and writing. We were discouraged from contacting our families and friends outside the cult, as they were seen as distractions from our true purpose. I began to feel a growing unease, but my attachment to Gabriel and the community kept me from questioning too deeply. I was not alone in my hesitation, but no one dared to speak out against the charismatic leader. One evening as the sun set behind the trees, Gabriel gathered us around a roaring bonfire. The atmosphere was charged with anticipation. Gabriel announced that to become true silent shadows, we must undergo a ritual of purification. The ritual involved fasting for three days, spending all our waking hours in complete silence and meditating by the fire. It was meant to cleanse our minds and souls, to make us more receptive to the cult's teachings. I felt a knot of dread in my stomach but couldn't bring myself to refuse. As the days of fasting passed, I became increasingly weak. My body ached, and my mind felt like a stormy sea. The silence, once soothing, now pressed down on me like a heavy weight. It was as if we were all sinking into a darkness, a collective silence that threatened to swallow us whole. On the third night of the ritual, something changed. As we meditated around the fire, the flames seemed to dance with an eerie, unnatural intensity. Gabriel stood at the center, his eyes closed in deep concentration. Then, with a sudden and unsettling calmness, he began to chant in a language I didn't recognize. The chant grew louder and more fervent, and the flames leaped higher, casting bizarre flickering shadows on the faces of the cult members. I watched in growing horror as the atmosphere shifted from one of serenity to something altogether different. It was at that moment that I realized the true nature of the silent shadows. We were not a community seeking enlightenment and inner peace. We were pawns in Gabriel's grand delusion. He had manipulated us into a cult of silence using our vulnerability and desire for belonging against us. I knew I had to escape. With trembling hands, I rose from my meditation spot and slowly backed away from the fire. The cult members were so engrossed in the ritual that they didn't notice my departure. I slipped into the darkness of the woods, my heart pounding like a drum. As I made my way back to civilization, I couldn't help but wonder about the fate of my fellow cult members. Had they truly become the silent shadows Gabriel had envisioned? or had they fallen victim to a madness born of silence and isolation? I reported the cult to the authorities, but by the time they arrived at the retreat, it was empty. Gabriel and his followers had vanished, leaving behind only the lingering echoes of their chilling silence. In the years that followed, I rebuilt my life, forever haunted by the memory of the silent shadows. I learned the hard way that the quest for belonging and purpose can sometimes lead us down the darkest of paths and I vowed to never let the shadows of silence consume me again. But even now, as I sit here alone, I can't shake the feeling that Gabriel and his cult are still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for their next unsuspecting victim. The darkness of that summer still clings to me, a constant reminder of the horrors that can hide behind a mask of serenity. Months had passed since my escape from the cult of the silent shadows. I had rebuilt my life, but the memories of that nightmarish experience continued to haunt my every waking moment. I couldn't help but wonder what had become of my fellow cult members and whether Gabriel and his twisted teachings still held them in their grip. I kept a low profile, fearing that the cult might somehow track me down. My days were spent in constant vigilance, always watching my back, always on edge. But I couldn't shake the feeling that Gabriel and his followers were out there lurking in the shadows, waiting for the right moment to strike. One day, as I was going through my mail, I came across a letter. It was an anonymous message, a simple piece of paper with a single word written in bold letters. Silence. My heart raced as I realized that the cult had found me, or at least someone who knew about my past involvement with them. I had to find out who sent the letter, and more importantly, whether the cult was still active. I began to dig deeper, retracing my steps and reaching out to former cult members who had managed to break free like me. It wasn't easy. Many were still too frightened to talk, but gradually I pieced together a picture of what had transpired after my escape. It seemed that in the wake of my departure, the cult had become even more secretive and reclusive. They had changed their meeting locations frequently, 
always staying one step ahead of anyone who might be looking for them. Gabriel's hold on his followers had grown stronger, and his teachings had taken a more extreme turn. Rumors circulated that the cult had become involved in criminal activities, using their collective silence as a cover for illegal operations. But these were only whispers, and concrete information was hard to come by. Determined to expose the cult and bring an end to their reign of silence, I reached out to a journalist friend who had a reputation for investigating secretive organizations. With the evidence I had gathered, we began to dig deeper into the activities of the Cult of the Silent Shadows. Our investigation led us down a twisted and treacherous path. We followed leads, interviewed former cult members, and even managed to infiltrate some of their gatherings undercover. What we discovered was chilling. The cult had evolved into a tightly knit secretive society with Gabriel as its unquestioned leader. His charisma and manipulative tactics had only grown more potent over time. The members had become fanatical in their devotion, believing that silence was the key to ultimate enlightenment. But behind the facade of serenity and inner peace lay a darker truth. The cult had indeed become involved in criminal activities, ranging from money laundering to extortion. Their network stretched far and wide, with members in positions of power and influence across various industries. As we delved deeper into our investigation, we realized that exposing the cult would not be easy. They had eyes and ears everywhere, and anyone who tried to speak out against them faced threats, intimidation, and even violence. But we were determined to unmask the shadows and bring an end to their reign of terror. We compiled our findings, collected evidence, and prepared to blow the lid off the cult of the silent shadows. Our investigative report was set to be published in a major newspaper, promising to expose the cult's criminal activities and the dangers they posed to society. But as the publication date drew nearer, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were walking into a trap. My fears were realized on the night before the report was scheduled to be released. I received another anonymous message, this time more ominous than the first. It was a simple warning, silence is golden. I immediately contacted my journalist friend and we decided to go public with the threats we had received. We believed that the cult would think twice about taking any drastic action if their actions were brought to light. The next day, as the report hit the headlines, the cult's reaction was swift and brutal. They released a statement denying all allegations and accusing us of spreading lies and slander. Gabriel, in a chilling video message, warned that those who sought to expose the cult's secrets would face dire consequences. Despite our fears, we pressed on believing that the power of truth and justice would prevail. But the cult was not to be underestimated. They launched a campaign of harassment and intimidation against us, trying to discredit our investigation and silence us through any means necessary. As the pressure mounted, my journalist friend and I received a tip that Gabriel and his inner circle would be holding a secret gathering in an isolated location. It was an opportunity we couldn't pass up. We contacted law enforcement and provided them with the information we had gathered. On the night of the raid, we accompanied the police to the remote location where the cult's gathering was taking place. The tension was palpable as we approached the compound. We knew that this would be the moment of reckoning, the final showdown with the cult of the Silent Shadows. As we stormed the compound, a fierce battle ensued. Gabriel and his followers, armed with unwavering devotion and a willingness to protect their secrets at all costs, put up a formidable resistance. But the combined efforts of law enforcement and the evidence we had gathered proved to be their undoing. Gabriel was arrested, and his mask of charisma finally shattered. The cult members were taken into custody, their reign of silence broken. The truth about their criminal activities was exposed for the world to see. In the aftermath of the raid, I couldn't help but reflect on the journey that had led me from a naive seeker of belonging to an unwitting victim of a dangerous cult and finally to a crusader for justice. The cult of the silent shadows had been dismantled, its darkness brought into the light. But the scars it had left on my psyche and the lives of its former members would never fully heal. I had learned the hard way that the search for meaning and community could sometimes lead to places of unimaginable darkness. The experience left me with a profound sense of caution and a determination to be vigilant against the allure of charismatic leaders and their promises of enlightenment. As I looked back on the long and harrowing journey, I couldn't help but wonder if the shadows of the cult would ever truly fade away, or if they would continue to haunt me, 
like a lingering echo of silence in the darkest corners of my mind. My name is Sarah and I grew up in a quiet suburban neighborhood with my loving parents David and Linda and my younger brother Michael. We were an ordinary family leading an ordinary life. Our days were filled with school, work and the occasional family outing. But that all changed one fateful day. It was a crisp autumn afternoon when we first encountered the cult. David had taken us to the local farmer's market, a place we often visited on weekends. As we strolled among the stalls, sampling fresh produce and enjoying the vibrant atmosphere, a woman approached us. She was dressed in simple robes, her demeanor calm and serene. Hello, she said with a warm smile. I couldn't help but notice your family. You seem like kindred spirits. We exchanged pleasantries and the woman introduced herself as Emily. She spoke of a community called the Tranquil Souls, a group of like-minded individuals seeking inner peace and enlightenment. Emily's words were captivating and we found ourselves drawn to her presence. Over the following weeks, Emily became a frequent visitor to our home. She brought with her the teachings of the Tranquil Souls, a philosophy centered around mindfulness, meditation, and a simpler way of life. She spoke of finding tranquility in a chaotic world, and her words resonated deeply with my family. One evening, as we sat around the dinner table, Emily proposed that we attend one of the Tranquil Souls gatherings. It's an opportunity to experience our community firsthand, she said, to see if it aligns with your desires for inner peace. We were hesitant at first, but the allure of tranquility and the sense of belonging that Emily offered were too enticing to resist. With her guidance, we made the decision to visit the Tranquil Souls. Our first gathering with the Tranquil Souls was held in an idyllic rural setting. A small group of people dressed in robes similar to Emily's welcomed us with open arms. They exuded an air of serenity that was both captivating and unnerving. The teachings of the Tranquil Souls revolved around meditation, minimalism, and the renunciation of worldly possessions. At first, it seemed like a path to inner peace, a way to simplify our lives and find a sense of purpose but as time went on, the teachings became increasingly extreme. We were encouraged to sever ties with our old lives, to let go of our possessions, and to embrace a life of austerity. The cult members spoke in hushed tones about the need to transcend the material world and reach a higher state of consciousness. My family and I became increasingly isolated from our friends and extended family as the tranquil souls became the center of our lives. Emily, once a mere acquaintance, had become our de facto leader. Her charisma and unwavering devotion to the cult were impossible to resist. As the cult's grip on our family tightened, I began to notice disturbing changes in my parents and brother. They had become increasingly distant, their eyes vacant and hollow. The cult's teachings had taken a darker turn, emphasizing the need for complete submission and the rejection of individuality. I tried to reason with my family, to convince them that we were headed down a dangerous path, but my words fell on deaf ears. They saw me as an outsider, a threat to their newfound sense of purpose. One evening I overheard a chilling conversation between my parents and Emily. They spoke of a final ceremony that would allow them to transcend the material world and achieve true enlightenment. The details were shrouded in secrecy, but the sense of foreboding in the air was palpable. Terrified for my family's safety, I reached out to a childhood friend, Rebecca, who had been concerned about our sudden withdrawal from society. I confided in her about the tranquil souls and their increasingly sinister teachings. Rebecca, now a journalist, took it upon herself to investigate the cult. She uncovered a trail of disappearances, financial irregularities, and allegations of mind control associated with the tranquil souls. It became clear that the cult was not what it appeared to be. Together, we devised a plan to rescue my family from the clutches of the tranquil souls. We contacted law enforcement, providing them with the evidence Rebecca had gathered. It was a race against time to stop the impending final ceremony. As the authorities prepared to raid the cult's compound, Rebecca and I infiltrated the tranquil souls in disguise. We attended one of their gatherings, where the atmosphere was tense with anticipation. The cult members dressed in their robes gathered around a massive bonfire. Emily stood at the center, her eyes closed in deep concentration. The cult's teachings had culminated in this moment, and I feared what would happen next. 
As the authorities closed in on the compound, Rebecca and I sprang into action. We distracted the cult members, urging them to reconsider their choices, while law enforcement moved in to apprehend Emily and the cult leaders. A tense standoff ensued, but ultimately the cult members, my family included, were freed from the clutches of the tranquil souls. Emily and the cult leaders were arrested, their twisted beliefs exposed for all to see. In the aftermath of the rescue operation, my family and I faced a long and difficult journey of recovery. The hold of the tranquil souls had left deep scars, both physical and psychological. But with the support of therapy and the love of our extended family and friends, we began the process of healing. Rebecca's investigative reporting on the cult led to a nationwide expose, shedding light on the dangers of cults and the tactics they use to manipulate and control their members. The tranquil souls were disbanded and their leaders faced justice for their crimes. As I look back on that harrowing chapter of our lives, I can't help but reflect on the thin line between seeking inner peace and falling prey to the allure of a charismatic leader and a dangerous ideology. My family and I emerged from the darkness stronger and wiser, with a newfound appreciation for the importance of critical thinking and the bonds of love that hold a family together. The tranquil souls may have left their mark on us, but we refused to let their darkness define us. We were survivors, and we were determined to live our lives with newfound strength, resilience, and a commitment to never let the shadows of a cult engulf us again. My name is Mark, and I've always considered myself a rational and level-headed individual. I was in a loving relationship with my girlfriend, Emily, who shared my passion for adventure and self-improvement. We enjoyed exploring new places, seeking out unique experiences, and pushing the boundaries of our comfort zones. Life was a grand adventure with Emily by my side. One sunny afternoon, as Emily and I were sipping coffee at our favorite local cafe, she excitedly showed me a beautifully designed invitation. It was embossed with intricate symbols and read, The Benevolent Cult of the Hidden Truth. Emily explained that she had stumbled upon this group online and had been following their teachings for a while. She believed that they held the key to enlightenment and personal growth. The idea of joining a group called a cult made me uneasy, but Emily insisted that it was different. She claimed that they were focused on self-improvement, kindness, and uncovering hidden truths about oneself and the world. With her enthusiasm and persuasive arguments, I reluctantly agreed to attend their introductory meeting. The introductory meeting took place in a cozy yet elegant room in an inconspicuous building. We were greeted by friendly and seemingly ordinary individuals who welcomed us warmly. Emily introduced me to the group's leader, a charismatic woman named Sophia, who exuded an air of calm and wisdom. Sophia began by explaining the group's philosophy centered around kindness, self-discovery, and the pursuit of hidden truths. She emphasized that they were not a typical cult, but rather a community of like-minded individuals seeking to improve themselves and make the world a better place. Emily and I attended several more meetings, each one focusing on personal development, mindfulness, and the cultivation of empathy. The group's teachings were captivating, and I started to believe that perhaps I had misunderstood the word cult. As the months went by, Emily became increasingly involved in the benevolent cult of the hidden truth. She attended their gatherings more frequently, sometimes staying overnight at their retreats. She spoke passionately about the positive changes she was experiencing and urged me to become more involved. But something didn't sit right with me. I noticed that Emily was becoming more distant from our friends and family, and her devotion to the group was bordering on obsession. She began to spend less time with me, and I couldn't help but feel like I was losing her to the cult. One evening, I decided to investigate the group further. I attended one of their gatherings without Emily's knowledge, hoping to uncover the truth behind their seemingly benevolent facade. As I arrived at the retreat, I noticed a serene atmosphere with participants engaged in meditation and deep philosophical discussions. Sophia, the charismatic leader, led a session focused on the concept of inner purity and the need to shed one's past to embrace a brighter future. But then as the night wore on, I witnessed something terrifying. The group's teachings took a darker turn. Sophia began speaking about the ultimate truth that could only be achieved through sacrifice. She spoke of letting go of one's attachments, even to loved ones, to attain a higher state of consciousness. I knew I had to act quickly, 
The group's teachings had taken a disturbing turn and I feared for Emily's safety. I reached out to a friend, Alex, who had experience in investigating cults and the tactics they used to manipulate their members. Together, we delved deeper into the benevolent cult of the hidden truth, uncovering a trail of disappearances, financial irregularities, and allegations of psychological manipulation. It became clear that this cult was far more sinister than it appeared. We also discovered that Sophia, the cult's leader, had a history of leading similar groups that had all ended in tragedy. She had a talent for drawing in vulnerable individuals and using her charisma to exploit them. With the evidence we had gathered, Alex and I contacted law enforcement and shared our findings. It was clear that Emily was in grave danger, along with the other members of the cult. We knew that we had to act swiftly to rescue them from Sophia's grip. We devised a plan to infiltrate the cult's compound during one of their retreats. With the help of law enforcement, we would apprehend Sophia and her followers and put an end to their reign of darkness. The night of the rescue mission was tense with anticipation. Alex and I disguised ourselves as cult members, armed with the evidence we had collected, and a determination to free Emily and the others from the clutches of the benevolent cult of the hidden truth. As we infiltrated the cult's compound, we witnessed Emily and the other members gathered around a massive bonfire. Sophia, in her charismatic and persuasive manner, was preparing them for the ultimate truth, which involved a ritualistic act of sacrifice. With law enforcement at the ready, we began to confront the cult members, urging them to reconsider their choices and the darkness that had enveloped their lives. Sophia, however, was not easily swayed. A tense standoff ensued with cult members torn between their loyalty to Sophia and the evidence of her dark intentions. As the authorities closed in, Sophia's grip began to weaken and some members started to question their devotion. In the end, Emily and the other cult members were freed from the clutches of the benevolent cult of the hidden truth. Sophia was arrested, her charismatic facade shattered. The truth about the cult's sinister activities was exposed for the world to see. As Emily and I emerged from the darkness of the cult's influence, we faced a long and challenging road to recovery. The scars ran deep, both physically and emotionally. But with the support of therapy and the love of our friends and family, we began the process of healing. The benevolent cult of the hidden truth may have left its mark on us, but we were determined to emerge stronger and wiser. With a newfound appreciation for the importance of critical thinking and the bonds of love that held us together. Looking back on that harrowing chapter of our lives, I can't help but reflect on the fine line between seeking personal growth and falling prey to the manipulative tactics of a charismatic leader. Emily and I emerged from the darkness stronger and more resilient, committed to living our lives with newfound wisdom and a determination to never let the shadows of a cult engulf us again. The benevolent cult of the hidden truth may have temporarily ensnared our lives, but it ultimately failed to extinguish the light of reason and love that guided us back to the truth. The chill of autumn had settled into our small college town, and with it came the promise of new beginnings. I was excited to start my freshman year at Crestwood University, eager to make friends and explore the world beyond my hometown. Little did I know that the darkest, most unsettling chapter of my life was about to unfold within the walls of my dormitory. My roommate Mark seemed like an ordinary guy at first. He was friendly, always willing to help with my heavy bags during move-in day, and he even offered to share his stash of snacks. We hit it off quickly, bonding over our shared love of horror movies and late-night gaming sessions. Everything was perfect, or so I thought. As the weeks passed, I began to notice odd things about Mark. He was a night owl, staying up until the early hours of the morning. I'd often wake to find him hunched over his desk, staring at his computer screen with an intensity that creeped me out. I tried not to think too much of it, chalking it up to his eccentric study habits. One evening, curiosity got the better of me. Mark had left his laptop open and I couldn't resist taking a peek. What I saw made my blood run cold. His screen was filled with newspaper articles and photographs of missing persons, each one carefully cataloged with notes. My heart raced as I realized the extent of his obsession. Mark, what is all of this? I asked, my voice trembling as I confronted him about the disturbing discovery. He turned to face me, his eyes devoid of emotion. 
Just a hobby, he replied casually, as if discussing the weather. I'm interested in unsolved mysteries, that's all. But it wasn't just the obsession with missing persons that unnerved me. Mark's behavior grew increasingly erratic. He would disappear for days on end, claiming he was visiting his family or taking impromptu trips. Whenever he returned, he'd bring back strange, unmarked packages that he stashed in the depths of our closet. I tried to distance myself from Mark, spending more time with my new friends on campus, but he always managed to pull me back into his world. He'd invite me to movie nights or offer me his snacks, and I'd find myself unable to refuse. It was as though he had some strange power over me, a magnetic pull I couldn't resist. One evening after a particularly long gaming session, I couldn't hold back my questions any longer. Mark, what are those packages you keep bringing back? And why do you always leave in the middle of the night? He grinned a chilling, predatory smile. I have a secret, he whispered, his voice laced with menace. But I can't tell you just yet. You'll find out soon enough. I should have run then, fled from the darkness that seemed to envelop my roommate. But fear held me captive, and I couldn't tear myself away from the web he'd woven around me. Weeks turned into months, and the campus buzzed with rumors of missing students. It was as if our peaceful college town had become a breeding ground for tragedy. I couldn't help but connect the dots, wondering if Mark's obsession with missing persons had taken a sinister turn. One night as I lay in bed unable to sleep, I heard the creaking of our closet door. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched in horror as Mark emerged, carrying one of the mysterious packages. He didn't notice me, too consumed by whatever dark purpose drove him. I watched in terror as he unwrapped the package, revealing a collection of photographs, all of them featuring me. Each image had been taken without my knowledge, capturing intimate moments from my life. Fear gripped me as I realized that I was at the center of his obsession. Mark, what the hell is this? I screamed, my voice trembling with rage and fear. He turned to face me, his eyes filled with a manic intensity. You see, I have a secret and you're a part of it, he hissed. I knew I had to escape to run as far away from Mark as possible. I leaped out of bed and bolted for the door, but he was faster, tackling me to the ground. We grappled on the floor, my fear-fueled strength matching his desperation. As we struggled, Mark's words spilled out in a frenzied confession. He had been responsible for the disappearances on campus, luring unsuspecting students into his twisted web. He had been studying me, preparing for the day when I would become his next victim. With every ounce of strength, I managed to break free from his grip and make a run for it. I dashed out of the room, the chilling echo of his maniacal laughter following me down the dormitory hallway. My mind raced as I fled, knowing that I had narrowly escaped a fate worse than death. I reached the campus security office, breathless and covered in bruises. They took my statement and launched an immediate search for Mark. As they combed through his room, they discovered a chilling array of evidence, including photographs and personal items belonging to his victims. Mark was apprehended, and the truth of his dark secret was laid bare for all to see. He had been living a double life, posing as an ordinary college student while hiding a sinister obsession with abducting and tormenting his fellow classmates. In the aftermath, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had taken hold of me. The scars, both physical and emotional, ran deep, a constant reminder of the horrors I had narrowly escaped. Crestwood University would never be the same, and neither would I. As the seasons changed and the years passed, I found solace in therapy and the support of my friends and family. Mark was locked away, never to harm another soul. But the nightmares of that fateful year would haunt me forever. The darkness that had once resided within my own dormitory had been exposed, but the true nature of Mark's secret would forever remain a chilling mystery, one that I hoped would fade into obscurity, never to be unearthed again. But the story didn't end with Mark's capture. As the investigation deepened, the authorities discovered a network of hidden chambers beneath our dormitory, each one containing evidence of Mark's depraved activities. The underground lair was a chilling maze of photographs, journals, and mementos, each one linked to a different victim. It became clear that Mark had been operating in secret for years, selecting his victims with disturbing precision. He had meticulously documented their lives, collecting information and mementos that allowed him to assume their identities. It was a nightmare beyond comprehension, 
a secret so dark and twisted that it defied explanation. The campus was in shock and the media descended upon Crestwood University, hungry for every detail of the horrifying discovery. Students and their families demanded answers, and the university was forced to confront the unthinkable truth that had festered beneath their very noses. As the investigation continued, more victims were identified and the full scope of Mark's crimes became clear. Families were reunited with their missing loved ones, but the scars of their ordeals ran deep. Crestwood University would never fully recover from the stain of Mark's actions, and the dormitory where the nightmare had unfolded was forever tainted. In the years that followed, I tried to move on with my life, but the memories of that fateful year continued to haunt me. I couldn't escape the feeling of being watched, of a darkness that lingered in the corners of my mind. The nightmares persisted, a relentless reminder of the horror I had endured. As I walked the halls of Crestwood University, I couldn't help but wonder how many other secrets lay hidden beneath the surface, how many other nightmares were waiting to be uncovered. The campus had been forever changed by the darkness that had taken root within its walls, a darkness that had nearly claimed me as its victim. The legacy of Mark's dark secret would cast a long shadow over Crestwood University, a chilling reminder that even in the most ordinary of places, the most sinister of secrets could be lurking waiting to be revealed. And so, as I looked out at the campus that had once been a place of promise and hope, I couldn't help but wonder if the darkness that had consumed Mark might one day resurface, casting its sinister shadow once again. I had always thought of myself as someone who could handle life's twists and turns with ease. After all, I had weathered my fair share of ups and downs over the years. But nothing could have prepared me for the peculiar turn my life would take when I moved in with my new roommate, Alex. It was a sweltering summer day when I first met Alex. I had been searching for a roommate to share the rent of my small two-bedroom apartment, and he had responded to my online ad. We met at a nearby cafe, and our initial conversation was pleasant enough. Alex was a tall, wiry man in his early thirties, with a mop of unruly brown hair and an awkward but endearing smile. We quickly agreed to become roommates. His rent payment would be a lifesaver for me, and Alex assured me that he was quiet and kept to himself, which sounded like a dream come true for a roommate. Little did I know that his reserved demeanor would soon unravel into a series of bizarre and unsettling behaviors. The first sign that something was amiss came in the form of late-night noises. At first, I chalked it up to the usual settling sounds of an old apartment building. But as the weeks went by, the noises became more distinct and scary. I would hear faint whispers and soft thumps in the middle of the night, as if Alex were engaged in some mysterious nocturnal activity. One night, unable to ignore it any longer, I ventured out of my room to investigate. I found Alex sitting cross-legged in the living room, surrounded by an array of candles. He was hunched over a worn, leather-bound book, muttering incantations in a language I couldn't recognize. His eyes were wide, unblinking, and filled with an intensity that made my blood freeze. Alex, what are you doing? I stammered, my voice trembling with a mix of fear and confusion. He looked up at me, his eyes momentarily vacant, before a twisted smile crept across his face. Just some late night reading, he replied cryptically before closing the book and extinguishing the candles. I returned to my room, my heart pounding in my chest. The encounter had left me deeply unsettled, but I convinced myself that it was nothing more than an eccentric habit, a quirk that I could tolerate in a roommate. As the weeks turned into months, Alex's behavior grew increasingly erratic. He would spend hours locked in his room, and when he emerged, he would be carrying strange items, a taxidermy crow, an antique dagger, and even a collection of unmarked vials filled with murky liquids. I had no idea what he was doing with these items, but it was clear that he was immersed in some bizarre and unsettling hobby. One evening, I returned home from work to find our living room, transformed into a makeshift altar. Candles, incense, and strange symbols were scattered across the floor. Alex was kneeling at the center, his eyes closed in what appeared to be deep meditation. Alex, what is all of this? I demanded, my frustration and anxiety boiling over. He opened his eyes slowly, gazing at me with a scary calmness. I'm pursuing a higher purpose, he replied, his voice carrying an otherworldly quality. I've found a path to enlightenment and I must follow it. I couldn't make sense of his cryptic words and a sense of dread settled over me. 
It was as if Alex had ventured into a world of his own, one that was steeped in mysticism and darkness. I couldn't fathom what had led him down this path or how it had taken hold of him so completely. As the days turned into weeks, I became increasingly isolated in my own home. Alex's presence loomed over me like a dark cloud, and I couldn't escape the feeling that he was hiding something. Something far more sinister than his eccentric hobbies. It was as though a wall had been erected between us, and I was left on the outside, trying to peer in and make sense of the madness that had consumed my roommate. One night, unable to sleep, I decided to investigate further. I carefully picked the lock to Alex's room and ventured inside. What I discovered would haunt me for the rest of my days. The walls of his room were covered in intricate symbols, drawn in what appeared to be blood. Shelves were lined with ancient-looking books, each one filled with cryptic texts and illustrations of grotesque creatures. The air was heavy with the scent of incense, and in the center of the room I found a circle etched into the floor, surrounded by candles and adorned with disturbing symbols. As I inspected the room, I stumbled upon a hidden compartment beneath the floorboards. Inside, I found a collection of journals, each one filled with Alex's ramblings and accounts of his bizarre experiences. He wrote of visions of encounters with entities from other realms and of a growing obsession with the occult. My heart raced as I realized the depth of Alex's descent into madness. It was clear that he had become entangled in a world of dark magic and forbidden knowledge, and there was no telling where it would lead him or what it might mean for me. Terrified and unsure of what to do, I confronted Alex about what I had discovered. His reaction was unlike anything I could have anticipated. He laughed, a chilling, mirthless laugh. You've stumbled upon the truth, my friend, he said, his eyes gleaming with a manic intensity. I've unlocked the secrets of the universe and there's no turning back. I knew then that I had to escape, to flee from the madness that had consumed my roommate. I packed my belongings hastily and made plans to move out. But as I prepared to leave, I couldn't shake the feeling that Alex's dark obsession would follow me, that I had become entangled in a web of darkness that would never let me go. As I settled into my new apartment far away from the nightmare of my old life, I couldn't help but wonder what had become of Alex. Had his obsession with the occult consumed him completely, or had he found some semblance of peace? I would never know the answers, but the memory of those eerie nights in our shared apartment would haunt me forever. I had learned a valuable lesson about the darkness that can lurk within the hearts and minds of those we think we know. It was a lesson that would stay with me, a reminder that sometimes the most unsettling and inexplicable mysteries can be found closer to home than we ever imagined. In the years that followed, I tried to put the nightmare of my former roommate behind me to move on with my life and leave the darkness that had consumed him far behind. But I couldn't escape the feeling that some part of that darkness had latched onto me, that I had become a part of a story that was far from over. And so, as I looked out at the world, I couldn't help but wonder how many other individuals were hiding their own dark secrets, how many others were on the brink of a descent into madness and obsession. The line between reality and the unknown was thinner than I had ever imagined and I couldn't help but fear what lurked on the other side. Living with roommates was nothing new to me. In fact, it had been a significant part of my adult life since graduating from college. The shared rent, responsibilities, and the occasional company of fellow housemates had always seemed like a reasonable arrangement. But when my new roommate, John, introduced me to his girlfriend, Sarah, our home dynamic took a turn into uncharted territory revealing a dark secret that would forever change my perspective on shared living. John had moved in about a month ago, taking over the room across the hall from mine in our cozy two-bedroom apartment. He was a friendly, easygoing guy, always ready with a joke or a helping hand when needed. He had mentioned his girlfriend, Sarah, a few times in passing, but I hadn't had the chance to meet her until one fateful Friday evening. I was relaxing in the living room engrossed in a book when I heard the front door swing open followed by the muffled sound of conversation. I looked up as John and a woman entered the apartment. She was petite with a cascade of jet black hair and an air of mystery that seemed to envelop her. Hey, this is Sarah, John said with a warm smile. Sarah, meet my roommate, Alex. Sarah extended her hand and I shook it, offering a polite greeting. There was something about her that piqued my curiosity, a sense that there was more to her than met the eye. 
but I dismissed it as mere intrigue, thinking that perhaps it was just my overactive imagination. As the weeks went by, Sarah became a regular presence in our apartment. She and John spent most evenings together, cooking dinner, watching movies, and sharing stories of their day. On the surface, they appeared to be the picture-perfect couple, deeply in love and genuinely happy. However, I couldn't help but notice that Sarah had a certain aloofness about her. She would often retreat into herself, lost in thought as if carrying a weighty secret. I tried to respect their privacy and dismissed it as a personal quirk, but a growing unease began to gnaw at me. One evening, I found myself alone in the kitchen with Sarah. John had gone out to run some errands, leaving us in an awkward silence. I decided to break the ice. So Sarah, how did you and John meet? I asked, trying to keep the conversation light. Her eyes flickered with a shadow of something I couldn't quite place, a mixture of sadness and fear. We met at a support group, she replied, her voice barely above a whisper. A support group? I asked, intrigued and concerned by her answer. Sarah hesitated for a moment before continuing. Yes, it's a group for people who have experienced trauma, she said, choosing her words carefully. I could sense that Sarah was holding something back, something dark and painful. I didn't want to pry, but my curiosity got the better of me. Trauma? I asked gently, hoping she would open up a little more. She took a deep breath, her eyes welling with tears. I can't go into details, but let's just say that we've both been through some really difficult times, she replied, her voice trembling. I didn't press her for more information, but her words left a lingering sense of unease. I couldn't help but wonder what kind of trauma had brought Sarah and John together, and what dark secret she was hiding beneath her quiet demeanor. Over the following weeks, I began to notice subtle changes in Sarah's behavior. She would often startle easily, her eyes darting around the room as if expecting danger to strike at any moment. Her cheerful moments with John grew fewer, replaced by long periods of brooding silence. One evening, as I was in my room working on a project, I overheard a heated argument between Sarah and John in the living room. Their voices were raised and I couldn't make out the words, but the tension in the air was palpable. It was the first time I had witnessed such a dispute between them, and it left me with a growing sense of concern. The following morning I ran into John in the kitchen. He looked exhausted, his eyes bloodshot from what appeared to be a sleepless night. Is everything okay with you and Sarah? I asked cautiously. John sighed, running a hand through his disheveled hair. We've been going through a rough patch lately, he admitted. Sarah's been dealing with some personal demons, and it's been taking a toll on both of us. I wanted to offer my support, to reach out to Sarah and let her know that she wasn't alone, but I didn't know how to breach the subject without intruding on their privacy. Instead, I decided to keep a watchful eye on the situation, hoping that things would eventually improve. As the days turned into weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong with Sarah. She had become increasingly withdrawn, rarely leaving the apartment except for her support group meetings. I had tried to strike up casual conversations with her, but she would respond with one-word answers, her eyes haunted by a deep sadness. One evening as I was returning from work, I found Sarah sitting alone in the, her eyes fixed on the flickering television screen. Her gaze was distant, and she appeared lost in a world of her own. Sarah, are you okay? I asked, genuinely concerned. She turned to look at me, her eyes welling with tears. I can't do this anymore, Alex, she whispered, her voice filled with anguish. I sat down next to her, offering a comforting presence. Do what, Sarah? You can talk to me. She hesitated for a moment as if wrestling with her thoughts. Then, in a trembling voice, she began to reveal her dark secret. I've been living in fear for years, she confessed, her words heavy with pain. There's someone from my past, a dangerous person who's been haunting me. I thought I could escape, start a new life with John, but he's found me. And now he's threatening to destroy everything I hold dear. I listened in shock as Sarah recounted a harrowing tale of abuse, manipulation, and a relentless pursuit by a figure from her past. She had been forced to change her identity, move to a different city, and joined the support group to escape the tormentor who had haunted her for so long. Tears streamed down her face as she spoke, and I could see the terror in her eyes. It was a story of unimaginable suffering, and I couldn't help but feel a deep sympathy for her. Why haven't you gone to the police? 
I asked, my concern growing. Sarah's expression turned to one of sheer terror. I can't, she whispered, her voice barely audible. He's always been one step ahead of me. If he finds out that I've gone to the police, he'll stop at nothing to find me. I can't put John or anyone else in danger. I realized that Sarah was trapped in a living nightmare, unable to escape the dark shadow of her past. It was a chilling revelation, and I knew that I had to do everything in my power to help her. Over the next few days, I worked with Sarah to develop a plan to ensure her safety. We installed security measures in our apartment, changed her routines, and she began attending therapy sessions to address the trauma she had endured. It was a small glimmer of hope in an otherwise bleak situation. But as we delved deeper into the intricacies of Sarah's past, it became clear that her tormentor was growing increasingly relentless. Strange and threatening messages would appear on our doorstep, and we would occasionally spot a shadowy figure lurking in the shadows near our building. The situation reached a breaking point one fateful night. John had gone out to run an errand, leaving Sarah and me alone in the apartment. As we sat in the living room, the light suddenly went out, plunging us into darkness. Fear clenched at my chest as I fumbled for my phone to use as a flashlight. I could hear Sarah's rapid breathing, and I knew that we were not alone in the apartment. The sound of shuffling footsteps echoed through the darkness, drawing nearer with each passing moment. Suddenly, a figure emerged from the shadows, bathed in the dim glow of my phone's flashlight. It was a man, tall and menacing, with a look of malevolence in his eyes. He advanced toward us, a chilling smile on his lips. Sarah, you can't hide from me, he hissed, his voice dripping with malice. I sprang into action, doing my best to shield Sarah from the intruder. With a surge of adrenaline, I managed to push him back and slam the door shut, locking it securely. Call the police, I told Sarah urgently, as I braced the door with all my strength. Sarah dialed 911, and I could hear her shaky voice as she relayed our terrifying situation to the dispatcher. Meanwhile, the intruder pounded on the door, his threats growing more unhinged by the second. Minutes felt like hours as we waited for the police to arrive. The intruder continued his relentless assault on the door and I could feel my strength waning. Just when it seemed like he might break through, the sound of sirens filled the air and the intruder fled into the night. The police arrived, taking our statements and promising to investigate the incident. It was a small victory, but it came at a great cost. Sarah was traumatized by the encounter, and the fear that had consumed her for so long had now become a horrifying reality. In the days that followed, Sarah and John decided to relocate to a different city hoping to escape the relentless tormentor who had haunted their lives. I helped them pack their belongings and wished them well, hoping that the distance would finally provide them with the safety and peace they deserved. As I watched them drive away, I couldn't help but reflect on the darkness that can lurk beneath the surface of seemingly ordinary lives. Sarah's ordeal had been a stark reminder that the past can cast a long shadow, one that can engulf even the most promising futures. I returned to my apartment, grateful that Sarah and John were safe, but haunted by the knowledge that their tormentor was still out there, lurking in the shadows. It was a chilling reminder that sometimes, the darkest secrets are the ones that threaten to consume us whole, and that even in the face of unimaginable fear, there is always a glimmer of hope. And so as I settled back into my quiet, unassuming life, I couldn't help but wonder how many other individuals were living with their own dark secrets, how many others were grappling with the shadows of their pasts. It was a sobering thought, a reminder that we never truly know the demons that may be lurking just beneath the surface. I never imagined that my cross-country road trip would lead me to the silent hotel a place that would forever change the way I thought about fear and isolation. My journey had started months ago when I decided to take a break from the hustle and bustle of city life. I longed for open roads and remote destinations, and I eagerly packed my car, ready to embark on a solo adventure. My route took me through countless small towns and picturesque landscapes, but as the sun began to set on a rainy evening, I found myself in a desolate corner of the country far from any signs of civilization. That's when I saw it, the silent hotel. It loomed at the edge of the forest, 
a grand and imposing structure, its facade weathered by time and neglect. The neon sign that once proclaimed its name had long since faded, leaving only a few flickering letters that spelled the Silla Hotel. The rain battered against the windows, making it impossible to see inside. My car's gas gauge was perilously close to empty, and with no other options in sight, I decided to seek shelter there for the night. I pulled into the parking lot, the engine sputtering as I cut the ignition. The rain drummed on the car roof, and I grabbed my duffel bag, making a dash for the hotel's entrance. The worn wooden door creaked open, and I stepped into the lobby. The first thing that struck me was the silence. It was an eerie stillness, as if the very air had been stifled by years of abandonment. The reception desk stood before me, its surface cluttered with dusty papers and a tarnished brass bell that had seen better days. Behind the desk sat a middle-aged woman, her eyes hidden behind a pair of wire-framed glasses. Welcome to the silent hotel, she said, her voice barely audible over the rain. How may I assist you? I need a room for the night, I replied, my voice echoing in the empty lobby. She nodded, her movements slow and deliberate. Certainly, sign in here, please. I scribbled my name and contact information on the faded ledger, the ink smudging slightly on the yellowed pages. The woman handed me an old-fashioned key with a metal tag that read, Room 207. Take the stairs to the second floor, she said, her voice monotone. Your room is at the end of the hall. With key in hand, I made my way up the narrow staircase. The dimly lit hallway stretched before me its threadbare carpet muffling my footsteps. The walls were adorned with faded paintings of idyllic landscapes, their frames crooked and tarnished. A sense of unease settled over me as I approached room 207. Inside the room was a stark contrast to the grandeur of the lobby. The furnishings were outdated and the wallpaper peeled in places. A single lamp cast a feeble glow, revealing the cracks in the ceiling and the stains on the faded carpet. The air was stale and a musty odor hung in the room. I tossed my duffel bag onto the bed and let out a sigh. It wasn't the most inviting place, but it would have to do for the night. I stripped out of my wet clothes and took a quick shower, the lukewarm water providing little comfort. As I settled into bed, the sense of isolation began to creep in. The rain continued its relentless assault on the windows, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was the only guest in the entire hotel. The silence outside was oppressive and I found myself straining to hear any sign of life. Hours passed and I lay in the darkness, unable to sleep. The walls seemed to close in on me and the stillness was suffocating. It was then that I heard it, a faint muffled sound coming from the room next door. It was like a whisper too soft to make out any words. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. I strained to listen and the whispering grew slightly louder but it was still unintelligible. It was as if someone was speaking just loud enough to be heard, but not enough to be understood. With a sense of unease, I climbed out of bed and pressed my ear against the wall that separated my room from the mysterious neighbor. The whispering continued, and I realized it was a conversation, a conversation that was happening in hushed tones. I couldn't make out who was speaking or what they were saying, but the tension in the voices was palpable. It was as if they were arguing about something, their words filled with anger and desperation. As I listened, a feeling of unease washed over me. I considered knocking on the wall and asking them to keep it down, but something held me back. It was the feeling that I was intruding on something I shouldn't be a part of, something that was none of my business. I returned to my bed, but sleep was elusive. The whispered conversation next door continued, and my mind raced with thoughts of who could be staying in the room next to mine. Were they in trouble? Should I call the front desk or the police? The hours dragged on and as dawn broke, the whispering finally ceased. Exhausted and restless, I drifted into a fitful sleep. When I awoke, the rain had stopped and the room was bathed in soft morning light. I decided to check out and put the strange events of the night behind me. I quickly dressed and headed downstairs to the lobby. To my surprise, the reception desk was empty and there was no sign of the woman who had checked me in. The lobby was still eerily quiet, and I felt a growing sense of unease. I approached the front desk and saw the ledger from last night still open, as if it had been abandoned mid-entry. Curiosity got the better of me, and I scanned the recent entries. They were all from the same night, but the names were unfamiliar. 
Each entry had a timestamp from the early hours of the morning, suggesting they had been made after I returned to my room. Before I could investigate further, the lobby's entrance door swung open with a loud creak, startling me. I turned to see a disheveled man and a woman entering the hotel. Their clothes were rumpled and they both had a wild look in their eyes. Welcome to the silent hotel, the man said, his voice hoarse and strained. I nodded in response, my confusion growing. Is everything okay? The woman exchanged a quick glance with the man before replying. We had a long night, that's all. Just looking for a place to rest. I watched as they approached the reception desk. Their voices hushed as they spoke to the absent woman behind the counter. Their conversation was too quiet for me to hear, but their expressions grew increasingly anxious. Suddenly the woman turned to me, her eyes wide with fear. You should leave this place, she whispered urgently. Get out while you still can. Before I could respond, the man grabbed her arm and pulled her away, disappearing down the hallway. I stood there bewildered and shaken as the words echoed in my mind. With a growing sense of unease, I decided it was time to heed their warning. I turned and headed for the lobby entrance, eager to put the silent hotel behind me. But as I reached for the door handle, I realized it wouldn't budge. Panic surged through me as I tugged at the door with all my strength, but it remained firmly shut. I was trapped. Frantically, I looked around the lobby for an escape. I spotted an old fire exit at the far end, its red exit sign faintly illuminated. I rushed toward it, hoping it would lead me to safety. As I reached the door, I pulled on the handle, praying it would open. To my relief, it did, and I stepped out into the crisp morning air. But my relief was short-lived as I realized where I was, the back of the hotel facing a dense forest that stretched as far as the eye could see. I had no choice but to venture into the woods, my heart pounding with each step. The forest was quiet, and the only sound was the rustling of leaves in the breeze. I had no sense of direction, and every tree and bush seemed to blur together. Hours passed, and I felt a growing sense of desperation. I had no way of knowing if I was moving closer to civilization or deeper into the wilderness. My phone had no signal, and I had left my car behind at the hotel. Just as I was about to give in to despair, I spotted a glimmer of light through the trees. I followed it, stumbling out of the forest and onto a narrow road. A passing motorist stopped to help me, and I quickly explained my ordeal. The driver, a kind-hearted woman, offered to take me to the nearest town, which was several miles away. As we drove, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had narrowly escaped a sinister fate at the Silent Hotel. Months have passed since that night, but the memories of my stay at the Silent Hotel still haunt me. I've done some research trying to uncover the hotel's history, but I found nothing about its mysterious guests or the strange occurrences that took place there. The Silent Hotel remains an enigmatic place, a relic of the past with its secrets buried deep within its walls. I may never know what truly happened that night, but one thing is certain. I will never forget the unsettling silence that permeated the air and the chilling whispers that echoed through its halls. To this day, I can't help but wonder if the Silent Hotel still stands, its doors open to unsuspecting travelers, its secrets waiting to be discovered by those who dare to check in. But one thing is for sure, I will never return to find out. It was a journey I had long anticipated, a road trip to the remote countryside far from the demands of my busy city life. My desire for solitude and a chance to reset my frazzled nerves led me to the small, picturesque town of Crestwood. I had heard about a quaint, centuries-old inn nestled among the rolling hills, the Embers Hotel. Little did I know that my decision to stay there would become a haunting experience beyond imagination. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting a fiery glow over the winding road as I neared my destination. The evening sky was a brilliant tapestry of reds and purples, a stark contrast to the pitch-black countryside that lay ahead. My GPS led me onto a narrow, forested path, and my excitement was tinged with trepidation. Just as I was beginning to doubt the accuracy of the directions, the Embers Hotel emerged from the darkness, an imposing three-story structure framed by centuries-old oak trees. Its stone facade exuded an eerie gothic charm, while the lit windows promised warmth and comfort. The gravel driveway crunched beneath my tires as I parked my car near the entrance. As I stepped out, a blast of chilly evening air greeted me, carrying with it the scent of rain-soaked earth and the faint rustling of leaves. 
My footfalls echoed in the quiet courtyard as I approached the entrance. The heavy wooden door swung open with a low, creaking groan, revealing an opulent lobby bathed in soft lamplight. The scent of aged leather and polished wood filled the air, creating an ambience of quiet sophistication. My eyes were drawn to the reception desk, where an elderly gentleman in a well-tailored suit stood, his demeanor as dignified as the hotel itself. Good evening, sir. Welcome to the Embers Hotel. How may I assist you tonight? His voice was smooth, accentuating the old world charm of the place. I have a reservation, I replied, handing him my identification. He examined my information and offered a polite smile. Of course, Mr. Turner, you're in room 306. Here's your key. The key he handed me was an antique brass piece, cool to the touch. I nodded my thanks and made my way to the grand staircase that led to the upper floors. The staircase was adorned with intricate wrought iron railings, and the carpet beneath my feet was plush and well-worn, testifying to the hotel's storied history. On the third floor, I followed the numbered signs along a dimly lit corridor until I reached room 306. The key turned smoothly in the lock, and the door swung open, revealing a spacious suite adorned with period furniture and rich dark wood paneling. The room was as I had hoped, a blend of classic elegance and modern comfort. I unpacked quickly, and as I settled into the sumptuous armchair near the window, I marveled at the solitude of the place. I was far removed from the noise and distractions of city life, and the tranquility of the countryside had a calming effect on my frayed nerves. Despite the comfort of my surroundings, sleep proved elusive. I tossed and turned, the occasional gust of wind against the windowpane disrupting my restless dreams. The ornate clock on the wall ticked away the hours, echoing through the silent room. It was well past midnight when I heard the first whispers. They were soft and indistinct, like a faint rustling of leaves. I lay in bed, straining my ears to catch the source of the sound. The wind outside had ceased and an eerie stillness had settled over the hotel. The whispers continued, growing slightly louder but still incomprehensible. It was as though someone was engaged in a conversation just beyond the walls of my room. I contemplated dismissing it as a figment of my imagination, a consequence of fatigue. But the persistence of the voices unsettled me. With curiosity overcoming my initial reluctance, I rose from the bed and pressed my ear against the wall that separated my room from the one next door. The conversation became clearer, though the words remained muffled and indistinct. As I strained to listen, the urgency in the voices became apparent. It was not a casual conversation, but rather a heated exchange, filled with frustration and anxiety. The feeling that I had intruded on something private gnawed at me, but the words were still unintelligible. The exchange continued for what felt like hours, the voices rising and falling in intensity. The person in the neighboring room seemed to plead, while the other remained steadfast and resolute. There was a palpable tension in the air and the anxiety I felt grew with each passing moment. The feeling of intrusion weighed heavily on me, and I considered knocking on the wall and asking them to keep it down. But fear, or perhaps a strange sense of respect for their privacy, held me back. Instead, I lay back in bed, my heart pounding, trying to drown out the whispers with a pillow over my head. Morning arrived, and with it, the cessation of the mysterious whispers. As the first light of day filtered through the curtains, I realized that I had spent a sleepless night in the Embers Hotel. Despite the lack of rest, a strange excitement coursed through me. There was a mystery to be unraveled, a puzzle hidden within the walls of this grand old establishment. I decided to start my exploration with breakfast in the hotel's dining room. The room was bathed in soft golden light, and the polished mahogany tables were set with pristine white tablecloths and gleaming silverware. The elderly waiter who served me was impeccably dressed and carried himself with the grace of a seasoned professional. Good morning, sir. How did you find your first night at the Embers Hotel? He inquired with a knowing smile. Peaceful yet intriguing, I replied my curiosity getting the better of me. Tell me who are the other guests staying here? The waiter's expression remained composed, but a flicker of unease passed through his eyes. We have a few guests, sir, but the Embers Hotel values its guests' privacy above all else. We do not disclose personal information about our patrons. I accepted his response, though I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of mystery surrounding the hotel and its guests. 
Over breakfast, I observed the other diners, an elderly couple engrossed in their newspapers, a solitary writer scribbling away in a journal, and a pair of hikers planning their day's excursion. After breakfast, I ventured into the sprawling library, a treasure trove of ancient books and vintage magazines. The atmosphere was hushed, with the occasional crackling of a log in the grand fireplace providing a comforting background noise. As I perused the dusty tomes, I couldn't shake the feeling that the library held secrets of its own. The hotel's history intrigued me, and I approached the reception desk later that morning to inquire about its past. The elderly gentleman from the previous night was now replaced by a middle-aged woman with warm yet cautious eyes. I'm fascinated by the history of this place, I began. Could you tell me more about the Embers Hotel and its past guests? She regarded me for a moment as if considering her response carefully. The Embers Hotel has a storied history that spans several centuries. Many notable individuals have graced its halls over the years, seeking solace, inspiration, or escape from the world. However, our policy has always been to respect the privacy of our guests, both past and present. We do not divulge personal details or anecdotes. I couldn't hide my disappointment, though her words only fueled my curiosity further. With little information to go on, I resolved to explore the hotel on my own, to uncover the enigma of the Embers Hotel. Days turned into weeks, and my fascination with the Embers Hotel deepened. I spent my time wandering its labyrinthine corridors, admiring its antique furnishings, and absorbing the atmosphere that seemed to seep from every crevice. The whispers from the neighboring room had become a constant presence, a reminder of the mystery that hung in the air. It was during one of my explorations that I stumbled upon an unassuming door on the fourth floor. The door was slightly ajar and a soft light spilled from within. A plaque on the door read, The Embers Room, Private. Intrigued, I pushed the door open gently, revealing a room that was unlike any other in the hotel. The walls were adorned with photographs, newspaper clippings, and handwritten notes. There were mementos, too, a collection of vintage items, each with its own story to tell. As I examined the photographs, I realized that they were all of the same person, a striking woman with dark, enigmatic eyes. She appeared in various settings, from glamorous parties to solitary walks in the countryside. Newspaper articles hinted at her wealth, her mysterious disappearance, and the enduring fascination that her story had held for the public. The room was a shrine to this unknown woman, and I couldn't help but wonder about her connection to the Embers Hotel. What had drawn her here, and why had she left behind such a detailed record of her life? My curiosity had reached its peak and I was determined to uncover the truth. I began researching the woman's identity, scouring the internet for any information that might shed light on her story. The more I discovered, the more I became convinced that her connection to the Embers Hotel was a key to unraveling the mystery that had captivated me. Weeks turned into months as I delved deeper into the mystery of the Embers Hotel. My research led me down a rabbit hole of historical records, newspaper archives, and interviews with locals. It was during one of these interviews that I met an elderly gentleman named Mr. Simmons, a lifelong resident of Crestwood. You're interested in the Embers Hotel, are you? Mr. Simmons said, a twinkle in his eye. Well, you've certainly chosen a fascinating subject. I've lived here all my life and I've heard my fair share of stories about that place. I leaned in, eager to hear more. Tell me everything you know. Mr. Simmons began with tales of the hotel's early days, when it had been a haven for artists, writers, and intellectuals seeking refuge from the chaos of the world. He spoke of lavish parties, passionate affairs, and the lingering echoes of creativity that still permeated the building's walls. But it was in the 1940s that things took a darker turn, Mr. Simmons continued, his voice dropping to a hushed tone. There was a woman, you see, a woman who had it all, beauty, wealth, and fame. She was a regular guest at the Embers Hotel, always accompanied by her entourage of admirers. As Mr. Simmons spoke, I couldn't help but think of the photographs and mementos in the Embers room. It seemed that this woman had been the central figure in the hotel's history. Rumors began to circulate about the woman, Mr. Simmons went on. Whispers of a tragic past, of a secret that haunted her every step. It was said that she came to the Embers Hotel seeking solace, but that solace remained elusive. 
I leaned closer, my heart pounding. What happened to her? Mr. Simmons hesitated as if deciding whether to reveal the darkest part of the story. One night she disappeared, he said finally, his voice barely above a whisper. No one knew where she went or why. The hotel staff claimed she checked out, but her entourage was left behind, bewildered and distraught. I couldn't hide my shock. What could have driven her to leave so abruptly? That's the question that's haunted Crestwood for decades, Mr. Simmons replied. Some say she discovered a terrible secret, something that shook her to her core. Others believe she was pursued by a relentless force, a force that sought to claim her. The pieces of the puzzle were falling into place. The whispers in the neighboring room, the photographs, the embers room itself, all were connected to the mysterious woman who had vanished from the hotel. Determined to uncover the truth, I returned to the Embers Hotel that evening. The whispers had grown louder, more urgent, and I knew that the time had come to confront the enigma that had drawn me in. As I stood before the door to the Embers room, a sense of trepidation washed over me. The photographs on the walls seemed to watch, their silent presence a testament to the mystery that had brought me here. With a deep breath, I pushed the door open and stepped inside. The soft lamplight cast a warm glow over the room, illuminating the photographs and mementos that adorned the walls. I approached the photographs, studying each one as if it held the key to the woman's story. It was then that I noticed something unusual, a photograph that I hadn't seen before. It depicted the woman standing in front of a grand, ornate mirror, her reflection distorted by the aged glass. The mirror itself was a work of art, its intricate frame adorned with symbols and carvings. Curiosity peaked. I examined the mirror more closely. It was unlike any I had ever seen, and the symbols etched into its surface seemed to tell a story of their own. My fingers traced the lines, and as I did, a sense of unease washed over me. The mirror was more than a mere decorative piece. It was a portal to another world, a gateway to a place that defied logic and reason. With trembling hands, I reached out and touched the glass, feeling a surge of energy course through me. In an instant, I was transported to a realm of darkness and uncertainty. The room around me vanished, replaced by a shadowy landscape of shifting shapes and ethereal whispers. The air was thick with anticipation, and the woman from the photograph stood before me, her eyes filled with sorrow. You shouldn't have come here, she whispered, her voice a haunting echo. This place is not what it seems. I tried to speak to ask her about the secrets of the Embers Hotel, but my words were lost in the void. The woman reached out, her fingers brushing against my hand, and in that moment I understood. The Embers Hotel was a place of secrets, a place where the past and present converged, where the whispers of history lingered in the air. The woman had discovered the truth, a truth that defied explanation, a truth that had driven her to vanish from the world. With a sense of urgency, I stepped back from the mirror, the room around me returning to its former state. The photographs, the mementos, the enigma of the Embers Hotel, they were all pieces of a puzzle that I could never hope to solve. I left the Embers Hotel that night, my mind in turmoil. The whispers had faded, and the mysteries of the hotel remained unsolved. As I drove away, I couldn't help but wonder if the truth would ever be revealed. Months have passed since that fateful night, and I've returned to my busy city life. The memories of the Embers Hotel continue to haunt me, a reminder of the enigma that remains unsolved. The woman from the photographs, the whispers in the neighboring room, the mysterious mirror, all are part of a story that defies explanation. The Embers Hotel stands as a testament to the unending mysteries of the world, a place where history and secrets converge, a place where the past is never truly forgotten. It is a place that will forever remain in my memory, a place where the enigma lingers like a whisper in the night. And so the Embers Hotel remains, its secrets hidden within its walls, waiting for the next curious soul to unlock the mysteries that lie within. It is a place where history and mystery converge, a place where the past and present are forever intertwined. As I reflect on my journey, I realize that some mysteries are meant to remain unsolved. Some secrets are meant to remain hidden, the Embers Hotel is one such place, a place where the enigma of the past continues to beckon, a place where the whispers of history will forever echo in the corridors of time. 
It was a crisp autumn day when I received the peculiar invitation. An ornate envelope adorned with an elegant wax seal arrived at my doorstep. Its contents revealed an invitation to an exclusive gathering at a remote hotel, an event shrouded in mystery and intrigue. The Hotel Arcane, as it was named, was nestled deep within the Appalachian Mountains. The invitation detailed its location, a winding road, a hidden path, and a place that seemed to exist only in whispers. There was no explanation of why I'd been chosen, no mention of who the other guests might be. The invitation bore only a date and time, October 31, Saint 10 p.m. Curiosity got the better of me. I couldn't resist the allure of the unknown, and the idea of a secluded gathering in a mysterious hotel piqued my interest. The days passed and my anticipation grew. I packed my bags, drove to the nearby town, and from there, followed the directions into the heart of the Appalachian wilderness. As the sun dipped below the horizon, I found myself on a desolate road, the GPS guiding me further into the wilderness. The thick canopy of trees overhead blocked out the moonlight, creating an eerie darkness that surrounded me. I could feel the chill in the air, a foreboding sensation that seemed to whisper of the secrets hidden in the mountains. Finally, I reached the end of the road as per the instructions. There, barely visible in the darkness, was a narrow path leading into the woods. I parked my car and followed the path, my footsteps echoing in the silence of the forest. The path led to a clearing and there, bathed in an ethereal glow, stood the Hotel Arcane. It was an imposing structure, its dark stone walls towering above me. The flickering candlelight in the windows created an otherworldly ambiance, casting long shadows that danced in the night. I approached the entrance and the massive wooden doors swung open as if by their own volition. The warm light from within beckoned me inside, and I stepped into the lobby of the Hotel Arcane. The lobby was unlike any hotel I had ever seen. It was a blend of old-world charm and modern luxury, with plush velvet sofas, crystal chandeliers, and antique oil paintings adorning the walls. The room was bustling with guests, their hushed conversations and laughter creating an atmosphere of camaraderie. The hotel staff, dressed in impeccably tailored suits, greeted me with polite smiles as if they had been expecting me. They guided me to the registration desk, where a woman with a serene demeanor awaited. Welcome to the Hotel Arcane, she said, her voice soft and melodic. I trust your journey was uneventful. May I have your name, please? I provided my name and she handed me a brass key with an intricate design, a key that bore no room number. Instead, she offered a cryptic message. Your room will be revealed to you in time, she said, her eyes holding a secret I could not decipher. For now, please enjoy the gathering. It will commence shortly. With that, I was free to explore the lobby where guests in elegant attire mingled, their conversations laced with curiosity about the mysterious event that had brought them here. The air was charged with an energy I couldn't quite comprehend. Among the guests, I encountered a diverse group of individuals, a reclusive novelist, a renowned archeologist, a celebrated pianist, and a detective known for solving unsolvable mysteries. They were all in attendance. Their presence added an air of mystique to the gathering, leaving me both fascinated and slightly apprehensive. The clock on the wall struck 10 p.m., and as if on cue, the gathering hushed. The woman from the registration desk stood at the center of the lobby, her presence commanding attention. Ladies and gentlemen, she began her voice resonating through the room. Welcome to the Hotel Arcane. Tonight, you are among those who share a thirst for the enigmatic, a passion for the unknown, we have gathered to embark on a journey, one that will challenge the boundaries of knowledge and perception. The guests leaned forward, their curiosity piqued. I found myself caught in the anticipation that hung in the air. The woman continued, In the heart of this hotel lies a chamber, a chamber that holds the answers to questions you have yet to ask. But this chamber is not easily found. It will test your wits, your intuition, and your courage. It will push you to the limits of your understanding. A hush fell over the gathering as her words sank in. The challenge that lay ahead was not what any of us had expected. She motioned to the grand staircase that led to the upper floors. The chamber awaits, but you must earn your place within it. You have until midnight to uncover its location. Those who succeed will be granted access to its secrets. Those who fail, 
Her voice trailed off, leaving the consequences unspoken. With that, the guests scattered, each one determined to be the first to unlock the mystery of the Hotel Arcane. I followed the detective, drawn by the aura of confidence that surrounded him. We began our search on the third floor, exploring the dimly lit corridors and inspecting every room. It became evident that the hotel itself was a labyrinth, its architecture designed to confuse and disorient. Hidden doors, concealed passages, and rooms that seemed to shift their locations. Each step took us deeper into the puzzle. As the minutes ticked away, frustration began to mount. The detective and I were not alone in our quest. The reclusive novelist, the celebrated pianist, and the archaeologist, all were engaged in their own search, each one just as determined as the next. Time seemed to blur as we scoured the hotel. Midnight was fast approaching and desperation took hold. The Hotel Arcane revealed itself to be a place of maddening complexity, where the boundaries between reality and illusion blurred. It was then that I noticed something peculiar, a series of symbols etched into the door frames of certain rooms. The symbols were cryptic, a language of their own. With a sense of intuition, I traced the symbols with my fingers, and the door to one particular room swung open. Inside, I found a chamber unlike any other in the hotel. It was an opulent library, its walls lined with ancient tomes and arcane artifacts. In the center of the room stood an ornate pedestal, upon which rested an ancient tome, its pages filled with inscrutable text. The detective and I approached the tome, our excitement building. Could this be the key to unraveling the mystery of the Hotel Arcane? We began to decipher the text, piecing together a narrative that defied comprehension. As the last stroke of midnight resounded through the hotel, a strange sensation washed over us. The air grew thick and the room seemed to shift. The walls closed in, the ceiling descended, and the symbols on the doorframe began to glow. Panic set in as we realized we were trapped. The room had transformed into a nightmarish puzzle, a challenge that defied logic. Desperate, we tried to decipher the symbols, to unlock the room's secrets, but time was running out. As the room continued to shift and contract, I caught a glimpse of the detective's determined expression, his mind racing to find a solution. It was then that a voice echoed in my mind, a whisper, a hint of a solution hidden within the text. With renewed determination, I began to rearrange the symbols, aligning them in a sequence that matched the text of the ancient tome. The room responded, the walls retracting, the ceiling rising. We had unlocked the chamber's secrets, but the ordeal had left us shaken. We emerged from the room to find the other guests in a state of confusion. Some had succeeded in their quests while others had failed. The woman from the registration desk awaited us in the lobby, her expression inscrutable. You have passed the first test, she said, her voice betraying no emotion. You have earned your place within the chamber. With that, she led us to a grand door at the end of the lobby. The door swung open to reveal a chamber that defied description. The chamber was filled with ancient artifacts, each one imbued with a strange energy. Arcane symbols covered the walls and the air was thick with an otherworldly presence. At the center of the room stood a massive tome, its pages filled with secrets of the cosmos. The woman motioned to the tome. This is the Codex Arcana, a repository of knowledge beyond human comprehension. It holds the answers to questions you have yet to ask, the mysteries of the universe, and the enigma of the Hotel Arcane. We were given the opportunity to peruse the tome, to delve into its secrets. The knowledge it contained was vast and profound, a testament to the complexity of the universe. It was a revelation, a glimpse into the mysteries that had drawn us here. As we poured over the pages, a sense of awe washed over us. The Hotel Arcane had not been a mere gathering place. It was a repository of knowledge, a gateway to the unknown. The woman's words echoed in my mind. The hotel challenged our understanding, pushed us to the limits of our perception, and rewarded us with enlightenment. Days turned into weeks as I immersed myself in the knowledge of the Codex Arcana. The revelations it offered were both profound and unsettling, expanding my understanding of the cosmos and the mysteries that lay beyond. As the time came for my departure from the Hotel Arcane, I couldn't help but wonder about the other guests. What had drawn them to this place and what had they discovered in their quests? The enigma of the hotel remained, a puzzle that defied explanation. 
As I left the hotel and returned to the world beyond, I knew that the Hotel Arcane would forever remain in my memory. It was a place of mystery and revelation. A place where the boundaries of reality and illusion blurred. A place where the unknown beckoned. The enigma of the Hotel Arcane would continue to haunt me. A reminder of the limitless possibilities that lay beyond our understanding. It was a place that defied explanation. A place where the secrets of the universe were revealed to those willing to embark on a journey into the unknown. And so I left the Hotel Arcane behind, knowing that its mysteries would remain with me. A testament to the allure of the enigmatic. A reminder that there are truths beyond our comprehension, waiting to be discovered by those who dare to seek them. The rain pounded against the windshield as I pulled into the parking lot of the dilapidated motel. The neon sign above the office flickered intermittently, casting an eerie glow on the cracked asphalt. It was late, and I was tired from hours of driving through the desolate countryside. I just needed a place to rest for the night, and this was the only option for miles. As I approached the motel office, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The building looked as though it had seen better days, its paint peeling and its windows covered in a thick layer of grime. A flickering vacancy sign hung in the window, its letters missing here and there, making it hard to read at first glare. I stepped inside, a bell above the door jingling softly. The interior was dimly lit and the air was heavy with the musty scent of old carpet and cigarette smoke. A bored-looking clerk sat behind the counter. Her eyes glued to a small television that played a rerun of some late-night talk show. Can I help you? She mumbled without looking up. I need a room for the night, I replied, trying to sound more confident than I felt. She finally looked up, her eyes cold and distant. We got rooms, she said, her voice devoid of enthusiasm. How many nights? Just one, I said quickly, eager to be out of there. She handed me a tarnished key attached to a plastic fob with a faded room number, 13. That'll be $50, she said, her tone as dull as ever. I handed her the cash and she counted it slowly, her long, nicotine-stained fingers moving methodically. Finally satisfied, she handed me a worn-out receipt and a rusty key. Room 13 is at the end of the building, she said, her gaze returning to the television. I grabbed the key and made my way down a dimly lit corridor, the carpet underfoot squishing with each step. The corridor seemed to stretch on forever, and I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. The motel was eerily quiet, save for the distant hum of the rain outside and the low drone of the television from the office. When I reached room 13, I hesitated for a moment before inserting the key into the lock. The door creaked open, revealing a small, dimly lit room. The air inside was stifling, and I quickly opened a window to let in some fresh air. The room was sparsely furnished with a sagging double bed, a rickety nightstand, and a flickering overhead light that cast eerie shadows on the walls. As I settled in for the night, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I tried to dismiss it as my imagination playing tricks on me, but the sensation persisted. I glanced out the window and saw nothing but darkness and rain. It was just my tired mind, I told myself, playing tricks on me after a long day on the road. I decided to take a shower to relax and wash away the grime of the day. The bathroom was equally dismal, with cracked tiles and a shower head that sputtered water sporadically. As I stepped under the lukewarm water, I couldn't help but feel a creeping sense of unease. It was as though the shadows in the corners of the bathroom were moving, shifting ever so slightly. I quickly finished my shower and stepped out, wrapping a towel around myself. I tried to push the eerie feeling from my mind as I got dressed and climbed into bed. The rain outside had intensified, the drumming on the roof like a steady heartbeat. I pulled the scratchy motel blanket up to my chin and tried to relax, but sleep eluded me. Every creak of the floorboards in the corridor, every distant sound from the office, seemed amplified in the silence of the night. I tossed and turned, my mind racing with thoughts of the strange motel and its even stranger inhabitants. Suddenly I heard a soft, rhythmic tapping on the window. My heart raced as I sat up in bed, my eyes fixed on the glass. The tapping continued, growing louder and more insistent with each passing moment. I hesitated for a moment, my hand trembling as I reached for the curtain. When I finally pulled the curtain aside, I gasped in horror. A figure stood outside, 
obscured by the rain-smeared glass. It was a man, his face hidden beneath a hooded raincoat, but I could see the glint of something metallic in his hand. A knife. I stumbled back in terror, my heart pounding in my chest. The figure continued to tap on the window, his eyes locked on mine. I fumbled for my phone, my hands shaking as I dialed 911, but as I brought the phone to my ear, I realized there was no dial tone, only static. The figure outside the window began to speak, his voice muffled by the glass but filled with an unsettling calmness. You shouldn't have come here, he said, his words sending a chill down my spine. This place, it's not what it seems. I backed away from the window, my mind racing with fear and confusion. Who was this man and what did he mean? I glanced around the room searching for anything that could help me defend myself. The room was bare, with no weapons in sight. As I turned back to the window the figure had disappeared. I hesitated for a moment, my breath coming in ragged gasps, before I mustered the courage to approach the window once more. I cautiously peered outside but the man was gone leaving no trace of his presence. I locked the window and pulled the curtains closed, my heart still pounding in my chest. I knew I had to get out of there, but the rain outside showed no signs of letting up. I had no choice but to wait until morning. I spent the rest of the night in a state of heightened anxiety, my senses on high alert. Every sound, every creak of the floorboard seemed like a potential threat. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that something sinister lurked in the shadows of the motel. When morning finally came, I wasted no time packing my things and checking out of the motel. The clerk at the front desk seemed as disinterested as ever, and I couldn't bring myself to tell her about the terrifying encounter I had endured. As I drove away from the motel, I couldn't help but wonder about the strange events of the night. Who was the mysterious figure outside my window, and what did he mean by, this place is not what it seems? I knew I would never have answers to those questions, but I also knew that I never wanted to set foot in that motel again. The rain had finally stopped and the sun had broken through the clouds, casting a warm glow on the countryside. I took a deep breath, relieved to be leaving that nightmarish place behind. But as I glanced in my rearview mirror, I could have sworn I saw a faint figure standing in the doorway of room 13, watching me leave with hollow, empty eyes. I sped away, putting as much distance between myself and that motel as possible. The memory of that night would haunt me for the rest of my days, a chilling reminder that sometimes the scariest things are not the ones that go bump in the night, but the ones that lurk in the darkest corners of our own minds. I had been driving for hours, the monotonous hum of the engine and the endless stretch of highway threatening to lull me to sleep. It was well past midnight when I spotted the neon sign on the side of the road. The Lone Star Motel. Vacancy. Relief washed over me as I pulled into the gravel lot the crunching sound beneath my tires signaling the end of my long journey. The motel was a single-story building with a row of doors facing the parking lot, each illuminated by a flickering overhead light. It wasn't much to look at, but it was exactly what I needed, a place to rest for the night. I parked my car and stepped out, stretching my tired limbs. The night air was cool and a gentle breeze rustled through the trees that surrounded the motel. I made my way to the office, the crunch of gravel underfoot echoing in the stillness of the night. The office was small and dimly lit, the counter separating me from a middle-aged man with tired eyes and a worn-out expression. He glanced up from his newspaper as I entered, offering me a half-hearted smile. Can I help you? He asked, his voice lacking any enthusiasm. I need a room for the night, I replied, equally unenthusiastic after hours of driving. He nodded as if expecting nothing more. How many nights? Just one, I said, relieved to be spending only a single night at this dreary place. He pushed a weathered guest book toward me and I scribbled my name and contact information. He handed me a key with a plastic fob that read room seven inches and pointed to a small map of the motel. Your room is at the end of the building on the left, he said, his tone never wavering. I handed him some cash and he counted it meticulously before handing me a receipt. That'll be fifty dollars, he said, as if the amount was etched in stone. I took the key and thanked him then made my way to room seven. The motel was eerily quiet, the only sound the soft hooting of an owl in the distance. The door to my room was worn and faded, the paint peeling in places. 
I inserted the key and turned the handle, the door creaking open to reveal a dimly lit interior. The room was simple, with a double bed covered in faded floral sheets, a nightstand, and a rickety old chair in the corner. The overhead light flickered ominously, casting unsettling shadows on the walls. I switched on the bedside lamp, illuminating the room in a soft yellow glow. As I settled into bed, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The room had an odd, almost oppressive atmosphere, as if it held secrets of its own. The air was heavy, as though it hadn't been refreshed in years. I tried to shake off the feeling and closed my eyes, but sleep was slow to come. Every creak of the floorboards, every distant sound from the office, seemed magnified in the stillness of the night. It was as if the motel itself was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. Hours passed, and I was still awake, my mind racing with thoughts of the long road ahead. That's when I heard it, a soft, whispering voice. It was faint at first, like a distant murmur carried on the wind. I strained to listen, trying to make out the words. The voice grew louder, more distinct, and I realized it was coming from the room next door. I couldn't make out the words, but the tone was urgent, panicked. I sat up in bed, my heart pounding, and pressed my ear to the wall. Please, no. A woman's voice pleaded, followed by the sound of muffled sobs. My blood ran cold and I reached for my phone, ready to call 911. But just as I was about to dial, the voice stopped abruptly. The silence that followed was deafening, broken only by the faint hum of the motel's aging air conditioning unit. I hesitated, torn between my instincts to help and a growing sense of dread. What if it had all been in my head? What if I was overreacting? I lay back down trying to convince myself that it was just a nightmare, a trick of my tired mind. But sleep remained elusive and the minutes ticked by slowly. Finally, as the first light of dawn began to filter through the curtains, I couldn't stand it any longer. I had to know if the woman next door was all right. I got out of bed and approached the connecting door between our rooms. I listened carefully, but there was no sound, no movement from the other side. Gathering my courage, I knocked softly. Hello? I called out, my voice trembling. There was no response, just an eerie silence that seemed to stretch on forever. I knocked again, louder this time, and called out once more, but still there was nothing. With my heart in my throat, I turned the doorknob slowly, my palms sweaty. The door swung open to reveal an empty, dimly lit room. The bed was neatly made, and there was no sign of the woman I had heard. It was as if she had never been there. I stepped into the room, my heart still racing, and checked the bathroom, the closet, and even under the bed. But there was no one. It was impossible, I thought. I had heard her cries, her pleas for help, as clear as day. I returned to my own room, my mind a whirlwind of confusion and fear. Had it all been a hallucination? A trick played by my sleep-deprived mind? I couldn't make sense of it, but one thing was clear. I needed to get out of that motel as soon as possible. I hastily packed my things and went to the office to check out. The same clerk was there, his expression unchanged. I tried to explain what I had heard, but he only shrugged. People come and go all the time, he said, as if dismissing my concerns. Maybe she checked out early. I left the motel in a hurry, my heart heavy with unease. As I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was deeply wrong with that place, something hidden beneath its nondescript exterior. I continued my journey, putting miles between myself and the Lone Star Motel. The day passed in a blur, and as night fell once again, I found myself in another town, another motel. This one was newer, cleaner, and more welcoming. I checked in without hesitation, determined to put the strange events of the previous night behind me. But as I settled into bed, I couldn't escape the feeling that I was being watched. The room was pristine, the air fresh yet I couldn't shake the eerie sensation that I was not alone. I glanced out the window, half expecting to see a face in the darkness, but there was nothing. I tried to dismiss my unease and closed my eyes, willing myself to sleep. But just as I was on the brink of slumber, I heard it again. The soft, whispering voice. The same urgent, panic tone. I sat up in bed, my heart pounding in my chest. It was coming from the room next door, just like before. This time, I wasted no time. I grabbed my phone and called 911, my voice trembling as I explained the situation. The police arrived quickly and I led them to the room next door. The door was locked and they had to force it open. Inside, 
they found a woman, disheveled and terrified. She had been held against her will, the victim of a deranged man who had been stalking her for months. As they arrested the man and led him away in handcuffs, the woman thanked me, tears in her eyes. She had been sure that no one would hear her cries, that no one would come to her aid. She had almost given up hope. I couldn't help but think back to the Lone Star Motel, to the woman I had heard but had never seen. Had she been a victim too? Had I missed my chance to help her? I never found out the answer, but one thing was certain. The events of that night had changed me forever. I couldn't erase the memory of those whispered pleas for help, the feeling of unease that had followed me from that motel. As I continued my journey, I couldn't help but wonder about the darkness that could hide behind the most ordinary facades, the secrets that could be buried beneath the surface. The world was a vast and unpredictable place, and I had learned that even in the most unlikely of places, heroes could emerge and villains could be unmasked. I drove on, my headlights cutting through the darkness, my mind forever haunted by the night I had spent at the Lone Star Motel, a place where the line between reality and the unknown had blurred and where the true nature of fear had been revealed. It was a bleak and stormy night when I found myself driving down a desolate stretch of highway, the windshield wipers struggling to keep pace with the relentless rain. The gloomy landscape outside offered no solace, and I knew I had to find shelter soon. That's when I saw the neon sign flickering weakly in the downpour, like a lighthouse beckoning a lost sailor. The Midnight Haven Motel, it read. The sign was old and worn, but it promised warmth and a respite from the raging storm. With a sense of relief, I pulled into the gravel lot and parked my car under the dimly lit canopy. As I stepped out of my vehicle, I was immediately greeted by the harsh wind and rain, which seemed to intensify in this desolate part of the country. I hurried to the office, my soaked clothes clinging to my body, my shoes squishing with every step. The motel office was a small, dimly lit room that smelled of stale cigarette smoke and old wood. Behind the counter sat a middle-aged man with a gruff demeanor. He barely looked up from his newspaper when I entered, acknowledging me with a simple nod. Need a room? He grumbled as if I were inconveniencing him. Yes, please, I replied, my voice quivering from the cold. How many nights? He asked, his eyes fixed on the sports section of his newspaper. Just one, I answered, eager to be on my way in the morning. He handed me a tarnished key with a plastic fob that read Room 9. That'll be fifty dollars, he said without a hint of a smile. I handed him the cash and he counted it meticulously, as if suspecting me of trying to cheat him out of a few dollars. Finally, he handed me a receipt and I took the key and headed out into the storm once more. Room 9 was at the end of a long, dimly lit corridor. The hallway was narrow and lined with peeling wallpaper, the carpet underfoot damp and musty. The place had clearly seen better days. I fumbled with the key in the lock and when I finally entered the room, I was greeted by a stark and dimly lit space. The room was small, containing only the essentials. A lumpy double bed with faded sheets, a rickety nightstand with a flickering lamp, and a small dusty television mounted on the wall. The air was thick with the scent of mildew and the walls seemed to close in around me. I quickly stripped off my wet clothes and turned on the lukewarm shower. The bathroom was equally unimpressive, with cracked tiles and a showerhead that sputtered water intermittently. As I stood under the tepid stream, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. It was an irrational fear, I told myself, a product of my exhaustion and the eerie atmosphere of the motel. After the shower, I dried off and dressed in the spare, clean clothes I had packed. I climbed into bed, hoping to find solace and sleep, but the uneasy feeling lingered. The rain outside showed no signs of letting up, and the incessant tapping on the window pane only added to my discomfort. I tried to shake off my unease and closed my eyes, but sleep remained elusive. Every creak of the floorboards in the corridor, every distant sound from the office, seemed magnified in the stillness of the night. The storm outside raged on, the wind howling like a restless spirit. Just as I was beginning to drift off, I heard it, a soft, eerie whispering. It was barely audible at first, like a faint rustling of leaves in the wind. I strained to listen, trying to make out the words, but they were just beyond my grasp. The whispering grew louder, more distinct, and I realized it was coming from the room next door. It was a woman's voice, and she sounded panicked, 
her words tumbling out in a desperate stream. I sat up in bed, my heart pounding as I tried to make sense of what I was hearing. Please, you have to let me go, she pleaded, her voice trembling with fear. I strained to hear more, but the words became unintelligible, as if she were speaking in a language I couldn't understand. It was as though she were caught in the grip of some terrible nightmare. Fear gripped me and I considered calling the police, but I had no way of knowing if the woman next door was in real danger or if she was suffering from some kind of delusion. I sat in my room, paralyzed by uncertainty as the woman's pleas grew louder and more frantic. The minutes stretched on and I couldn't take it any longer. I had to do something. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, explaining the situation to the operator. She assured me that help was on the way and urged me to stay in my room. I waited anxiously, the minutes feeling like hours, until I heard the sound of sirens approaching. The police arrived quickly and I led them to the room next door, my heart pounding with dread. The officers knocked on the door identifying themselves, but there was no response from inside. With a sense of urgency, they forced the door open, and I watched as they entered the room, their flashlights cutting through the darkness. I could see nothing from my vantage point in the hallway, but I strained to listen, hoping to hear some sign that the woman was safe. Then there was a scream, a bone-chilling, blood-curdling scream that sent shivers down my spine. It was followed by the sound of a struggle, of furniture being overturned, of desperate cries for help. I wanted to rush into the room to assist the officers, but fear kept me rooted to the spot. The struggle seemed to go on forever, the woman's screams echoing through the corridor until finally there was silence, a silence that was even more unsettling than the chaos that had preceded it. The officers emerged from the room, their faces pale and grim. They told me that the woman had been alone in the room, her frantic screams and pleas for help seemingly directed at an invisible assailant. There was no sign of forced entry, no evidence of an intruder. I was left in a state of shock and confusion. Had I imagined the woman's cries for help? Or had she been the victim of some unseen supernatural force? The officers assured me that she was now in their care and would receive the help she needed. But the mystery of what had transpired in that room haunted me. I couldn't stay at the Midnight Haven Motel any longer. The sense of unease and dread that hung in the air was suffocating and I longed to put the unsettling events of the night behind me. I checked out of the motel early the next morning, and as I drove away I couldn't help but glance back at the flickering neon sign. The storm had passed and the motel looked almost peaceful in the pale light of dawn, but I knew that appearances could be deceiving, that darkness could lurk beneath even the most ordinary of facades. As I continued my journey I couldn't shake the feeling that I had witnessed something beyond explanation something that defied reason and logic. The memory of that night would stay with me, a chilling reminder that the line between reality and the unknown is thinner than we dare to imagine, and that the scariest things can often be found in the most unexpected places. It was a dark and stormy night when I first encountered the house on Willow Street. The rain poured relentlessly from the heavens, drenching me to the bone as I stood there, shivering and staring at the old, decrepit mansion. I had always been fascinated by abandoned houses, and this one had an air of mystery that drew me in like a moth to a flame. I had heard the rumors about Willow Street. People said it was cursed, that anyone who dared to enter the house never came out the same. Some claimed they had seen strange lights flickering in the windows late at night, while others swore they had heard eerie whispers carried by the wind. But I was a skeptic, and I believed that there had to be a logical explanation for everything. My name is Alex, and I was a freelance writer always on the lookout for a good story. I had heard about Willow Street from an old-timer at the local diner, who claimed to have seen the ghost of a woman in a white gown wandering the grounds. It was the perfect opportunity to prove that there was no such thing as ghosts, and I was eager to debunk the legends surrounding the house. As I approached the front door, I could feel the weight of the rain-soaked clothes clinging to my body. The rain was relentless, pounding on the roof and windows of the mansion like a drumbeat from another world. I took a deep breath and pushed open the creaking door, which protested loudly as it swung inward. The interior of the house was as eerie as its exterior 
Dusty old furniture covered with tattered sheets lined the hallway, and the air was thick with the scent of decay. It was clear that no one had lived here in years. I pulled out my flashlight and began to explore, determined to unravel the mysteries of Willow Street. As I moved deeper into the house, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every creak of the floorboards and rustle of the wind seemed to echo with a sinister presence. But I brushed it off as my imagination playing tricks on me. There had to be a rational explanation for everything. I entered what appeared to be the living room and my flashlight illuminated an old cracked portrait hanging on the wall. It was a painting of a woman in a white gown, her eyes seeming to follow me as I moved around the room. I couldn't help but shiver as I stared at the eerie likeness. I continued my exploration, making my way to the second floor. The rain outside intensified, creating an eerie symphony of howling winds and drumming raindrops. It was as if the storm itself was trying to warn me to leave this place. Upstairs, I found a series of bedrooms, each more dilapidated than the last. But one room stood out, a master bedroom at the end of the hallway. The door was partially ajar and a faint light flickered from within. I cautiously pushed it open. Inside, I was met with a sight that sent a chill down my spine. The room was furnished as though someone had just stepped out for a moment. A bed with disheveled sheets, a vanity covered in old cosmetics, and a writing desk with yellowed papers. But what caught my eye was the photograph on the nightstand. It was the same woman from the portrait downstairs, the one in the white gown. She was smiling in the photograph, a stark contrast to the stories of her haunting the house. I picked up the photograph and examined it closely. There was something about her eyes, something hauntingly familiar. As I studied the photograph, I heard a sound coming from the closet, a soft, mournful sobbing. My heart raced as I approached the closet door, my flashlight trembling in my hand. I slowly opened the door, and there, huddled in the corner, was a woman in a torn and tattered white gown. She looked up at me with tear-filled eyes and for a moment I saw a glimmer of recognition in her gaze. You came back, she whispered, her voice trembling. I was taken aback. Do I know you? I asked, my voice quivering. She nodded slowly, her expression filled with a mixture of sadness and relief. I've been waiting for you to return for so long. I helped her out of the closet, my mind racing with questions. Who was this woman and why did she seem to know me? As she spoke, the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. Her name was Emily, and she had lived in this house decades ago. She had been a recluse, rarely leaving the mansion, and she had a fascination with the rain. It was during a torrential downpour that she had disappeared, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions. As Emily recounted her story, I couldn't help but feel a deep sense of unease. She spoke of a darkness that had consumed her a darkness that had driven her to seek solace in the rain. She had become trapped in a time loop, reliving the same rainy night over and over again. I listened in horror as she described the torment she had endured, the isolation and despair that had slowly eroded her sanity. She had tried to leave the house countless times, but each time she stepped outside, she found herself back in the mansion as if the world beyond its walls no longer existed. It was then that I realized the truth. Willow Street was not cursed by supernatural forces, but by the darkness that had consumed Emily's soul. She had become a prisoner in her own memories, trapped in a never-ending cycle of rain and despair. Determined to help Emily, I searched the house for any clues that might break the curse. I found a journal in the study, filled with Emily's writings and musings. It was a chronicle of her descent into madness, a desperate plea for someone to free her from her eternal torment. As I read through the journal, I began to understand the key to breaking the cycle. Forgiveness. Emily had been consumed by guilt and regret, and it was only by forgiving herself for her past actions that she could find peace. I returned to Emily, who had been sitting by the window watching the rain. I gently told her what I had discovered and encouraged her to forgive herself for whatever had led her to this point. Tears welled up in her eyes as she slowly began to let go of the pain and guilt that had bound her for so long. As the rain continued to pour outside, something remarkable happened. The room seemed to brighten, and the storm outside began to subside. Emily's smile grew brighter, and for the first time in years, she felt a sense of peace. With each passing moment, the house on Willow Street transformed. 
The decay and darkness that had shrouded it began to fade away, replaced by a sense of warmth and hope. It was as if the very soul of the house was healing. As the rain finally ceased, Emily and I stepped outside, hand in hand. The world beyond Willow Street had changed, and Emily was finally free to explore it. We walked away from the house, leaving behind the memories of its haunting past. In the end, the scariest thing about Willow Street was not the supernatural, but the darkness that can consume a person's soul. It was a reminder that sometimes, the most terrifying horrors are the ones that exist within us, waiting to be confronted and forgiven. And as I looked back at the house one last time, I couldn't help but wonder how many other stories of darkness and redemption were hidden behind the doors of abandoned houses, waiting for someone to uncover them in the rain. The rain was relentless that night, falling in torrents from a sky shrouded in darkness. It was the kind of rain that seemed to wash away the world, erasing all sound except for the rhythmic drumming of water on rooftops and pavement. The storm had come out of nowhere, and I found myself driving along a desolate stretch of highway, desperately searching for shelter. My name is Mark, and I was on a road trip that had taken me far from civilization. I had always been drawn to remote places, the kind where you could escape the noise and chaos of the world. But on this particular night, I had ventured too far, and now I was paying the price. As I drove, my headlights cut through the sheets of rain, illuminating the dense forest on either side of the road. The trees loomed like silent sentinels, their branches dripping with water. I felt a growing sense of unease as the road stretched on endlessly, with no sign of civilization in sight. Just when I was beginning to lose hope, I spotted a faint glimmer through the trees. It was the soft glow of a single light, like a beacon in the darkness. I slowed down and turned onto a narrow winding path that led me deeper into the woods. The path ended at a small cabin nestled among the trees. It was a rustic structure, its wooden walls weathered and worn by time. A battered sign next to the cabin's entrance read, Rustic Rain Retreat. It seemed like the perfect place to seek refuge from the storm. I parked my car and made my way to the cabin's front door. The rain had soaked me to the bone, and I was shivering as I knocked on the door. It swung open slowly, revealing an elderly man with kind eyes and a welcoming smile. Come in, come in, he said, gesturing for me to enter. You must be freezing out there. I stepped inside, feeling an immediate sense of warmth and comfort. The cabin's interior was cozy, with a crackling fire in the fireplace and soft, inviting furnishings. The room was adorned with various oddities, antique clocks, vintage photographs, and an assortment of curiosities that hinted at a rich and storied past. I'm George, the man said, extending a hand. And you are? Mark, I replied, shaking his hand. I can't thank you enough for letting me in. I got caught in the storm, and I wasn't sure I'd make it out of there. George waved off my gratitude. No need to thank me. We don't get many visitors out here, especially not on a night like this. You're welcome to stay as long as you like. As the rain continued to pour outside, George and I sat by the fire, sipping on hot tea and sharing stories. He told me about the cabin, how it had been in his family for generations, and how he had turned it into a retreat for weary travelers like myself. There was something captivating about his tales, and I found myself hanging on his every word. As the night wore on, George offered me a spare bedroom to spend the night. I gladly accepted, grateful for the warmth and shelter. The rain showed no signs of letting up, and the thought of venturing back out into the storm was unappealing. I settled into the cozy bedroom, and as I lay in bed, the sound of rain against the cabin's roof became a soothing lullaby. I drifted off into a deep, dreamless sleep, feeling safe and secure in the heart of the forest. The following morning I awoke to the gentle patter of rain against the window. I stretched and yawned, feeling well rested and refreshed. As I made my way downstairs I could smell the enticing aroma of breakfast cooking. George was in the kitchen, preparing a hearty meal of scrambled eggs, bacon and toast. He greeted me with a smile as I entered. Good morning, Mark, he said. I hope you slept well. I did, thank you, I replied, taking a seat at the kitchen table. This place is like a hidden oasis. George chuckled. It can feel that way sometimes. Away from the noise and distractions of the world, it's easy to find peace and solitude here. 
Over breakfast, we talked some more. George shared more stories about the cabin's history and the generations of his family who had called it home. He told me about his late wife, Sarah, who had loved the rain more than anything. Her memory was woven into every corner of the cabin, from the vintage raincoats hanging by the door to the old records of rainy day songs on the shelf. As we chatted, I couldn't help but notice that there was something peculiar about the rain. It seemed to fall with a rhythm, almost like a pattern. I mentioned it to George, and he gave me a knowing smile. Ah, uh, you've noticed it too, he said. The rain here has a way of speaking to you if you listen closely enough. I raised an eyebrow. Speaking to me? How so? George's eyes twinkled with a hint of mischief. Well, you see, every drop of rain has a story to tell. It carries with it the memories of those who have passed through here. It's like a chorus of whispers in the rain. I laughed, thinking he was simply indulging in a bit of poetic license. But as I continued to listen to the rain, I began to notice something strange. It was as though I could hear faint voices in the distance, like the murmur of a crowd gathered far away. Curiosity got the better of me, and I asked George about it. He nodded, as if he had been waiting for the question. The rain here has a way of bringing back memories, he explained. It's said that the whispers you hear are echoes of the past, fragments of conversations and moments frozen in time. I leaned in, intrigued by the idea. So you're saying that the rain carries the memories of everyone who's been here? George nodded. That's one way to look at it. Some say that when you listen to the rain, you can hear the stories of those who came before us. It's a reminder that we're all connected in some way by the places we've been and the people we've met. As the day wore on, I found myself captivated by the rain's symphony of whispers. It was as though I could hear snippets of conversations, laughter, and moments of joy and sorrow. It was a haunting and beautiful experience, one that made me feel more connected to the world around me. Days turned into weeks, and I found myself settling into a routine at the Rustic Rain Retreat. George and I became fast friends, and I spent my time exploring the surrounding forest and listening to the rain's whispers. Each drop of rain seemed to carry a story, and I couldn't get enough of it. One rainy afternoon, George handed me an old leather-bound journal. I thought you might find this interesting, he said. It belonged to Sarah, my late wife. She was quite the writer. I opened the journal and began to read. It was filled with Sarah's musings, observations, and reflections on life in the cabin. Her words painted a vivid picture of her love for the rain, her deep connection to nature, and her enduring love for George. As I read through the journal, I couldn't help but feel a pang of sadness. Sarah's words were filled with a sense of longing, as though she had left something unfinished. I mentioned this to George, and his expression grew somber. Yes, he said softly. Sarah loved this place more than anything, but she always felt like there was something missing. She used to say that the rain held the key to the cabin's true purpose, but she never quite figured out what that meant. I couldn't help but wonder if Sarah's words were somehow connected to the whispers in the rain. It seemed like there was a deeper mystery to unravel, one that had been hidden in plain sight all along. As the weeks turned into months, my bond with George deepened, and the cabin truly began to feel like a second home. But there was a growing sense of restlessness in me, a nagging feeling that I had a role to play in unraveling the mystery of the rain. One stormy night, as I lay in bed listening to the rain's whispers, I had a revelation. It was as though a puzzle piece had fallen into place in my mind. I realized that the rain was trying to tell me something to reveal a truth that had remained hidden for far too long. The following morning, I approached George with my newfound insight. I think Sarah's right, I said. I think the rain does hold the key to the cabin's true purpose. George's eyes lit up with excitement. You think so? But what could it be? I explained my theory that the rain was not just a source of comfort and nostalgia, but a living record of the cabin's history. If we could decipher the whispers in the rain, we might uncover the cabin's hidden purpose and fulfill Sarah's unspoken wish. George was eager to try, and together we embarked on a journey to unravel the mystery. We spent hours listening to the rain, recording the whispers and trying to piece together the fragments of memories and stories. It was a painstaking process, but we were determined to uncover the truth. As days turned into weeks, our efforts began to bear fruit. 
we discovered that the rain carried memories of all those who had stayed at the cabin, their stories intermingling with the whispers of the forest. It was as though the rain had become a living tapestry, weaving together the threads of countless lives. One rainy afternoon, as we listened to the whispers, we heard a voice that was unmistakably Sarah's. She was speaking of her love for the cabin, her longing to understand its true purpose and her hope that someone would come along who could unlock its secrets. Tears welled up in George's eyes as he listened to his late wife's voice. She was right, he said. The rain was trying to tell us something all along. We continued to listen and the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. The whispers revealed that the cabin was meant to be a place of refuge, a sanctuary for those seeking solace and connection with nature. It was a place where the stories of the past could be preserved and shared, where the rain could carry the memories of all who had passed through its doors. With each passing day, the cabin seemed to come alive with newfound purpose. We opened it to travelers from all walks of life, inviting them to listen to the rain and share their stories. The whispers in the rain became a bridge, connecting people from different backgrounds and cultures, and the cabin became a place of healing and transformation. Years went by and the rustic rain retreat flourished. People came from far and wide to experience the magic of the cabin, to listen to the rain's whispers, and to share their own stories. The cabin had become a place of connection, where strangers became friends and where the world outside seemed to fade away. George and I grew old together, watching as the cabin fulfilled its true purpose. We knew that we had unlocked a mystery that had been hidden in plain sight, and we were grateful for the chance to be a part of something greater than ourselves. On a quiet evening, as George and I sat by the fire, listening to the rain, he turned to me with a smile. I couldn't have asked for a better friend or a better companion on this journey, Mark. I nodded, feeling a deep sense of gratitude. And I couldn't have asked for a more remarkable mentor and friend, George. This place has changed my life in ways I can't even begin to describe. As the rain continued to fall outside, I couldn't help but think that sometimes the most extraordinary mysteries are hidden in the ordinary moments of life. The rustic rain retreat had taught me that even in the quietest whispers of the rain, there could be a world of stories waiting to be discovered. And as I listened to the rain's gentle whispers, I knew that I was exactly where I was meant to be. It was a stormy evening in the small town of Willowbrook. Rain lashed against the windows and thunder rumbled ominously in the distance. The townsfolk had long grown accustomed to such weather, but this night was different. This night would be forever etched in their memories as the night the rainfall murders began. My name is Detective Sarah Mitchell, and I had been assigned to Willowbrook's police department for the past five years. Despite the town's reputation for being peaceful and quiet, my job had never lacked excitement. But nothing could have prepared me for the series of gruesome murders that would soon send shockwaves through our community. It all started with a phone call late one rainy night. The dispatcher's voice crackled through the receiver. Sarah, we've got a situation. There's been a murder down on Elm Street. I groaned inwardly, already dreading the sight that awaited me. Elm Street was a quiet neighborhood home to many elderly residents who had lived there for decades. It was the last place you'd expect a murder to occur. As I arrived at the scene, I could see the flashing lights of police cars and the gathered crowd of curious onlookers huddled under umbrellas. Officer Mike Reynolds, a seasoned veteran, met me at the tape barrier. Sarah, you won't believe this, he said, his voice filled with disbelief. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. We ducked under the yellow crime scene tape and approached the quaint white picket fenced house. Inside, we found the lifeless body of Mrs. Edith Sullivan, an elderly widow who had lived alone for years. Her frail figure lay sprawled on the living room floor, her eyes wide open in a frozen scream. I couldn't help but shiver as I examined the gruesome scene. Mrs. Sullivan's throat had been slashed and her small home was in disarray, as if a tornado had swept through it. But what struck me the most was the eerie message written in red across the walls. The rainfall begins. My mind raced as I tried to make sense of the cryptic message. What did it mean? Who would do such a thing and why? The rain outside continued to pour relentlessly, creating a disconcerting backdrop to the gruesome discovery. I knew this case was unlike any I had ever encountered, and it was only the beginning.
In the days that followed, the rainfall murders continued to terrorize Willowbrook. Each murder was as gruesome as the last, with the victims chosen seemingly at random. The only common thread was the cryptic message scrawled across the crime scenes. The rainfall begins. The town was gripped by fear, and my team and I worked tirelessly to piece together any clues that might lead us to the killer. But the investigation seemed to be going in circles, with no clear motive or suspect in sight. One rainy evening, as I sat in my dimly lit office, my thoughts turned to the victims. They ranged in age from young to old, and there was no apparent connection between them. It was as though the killer was selecting victims at random, leaving a trail of death and despair in their wake. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was a deeper meaning behind the cryptic message. The rainfall begins had to be a clue, a key to understanding the killer's motives. But what did it signify? As I pondered the message, a call came in from Officer Reynolds. Sarah, we've got another one. This time it's the Johnsons, a couple in their 60s. My heart sank as I rushed to the scene, my mind racing with questions. What did the rainfall murders have to do with the rain itself? And why was this town being plagued by such a gruesome and relentless killer? The investigation into the rainfall murders stretched on for weeks, and our frustration grew with each passing day. The killer left no fingerprints, no witnesses, and no discernible pattern to their crimes. It was as though they were a phantom, striking with ruthless efficiency and disappearing into the rainy night. The town's fear and paranoia were palpable. Residents locked their doors and windows, and children were no longer allowed to play outside. Willowbrook had become a town under siege, and there seemed to be no end in sight. One rainy night, as I sat in my car outside the latest crime scene, I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of hopelessness. The rain was relentless, as it had been for weeks and it felt like an omen of the darkness that had descended upon our town. I gazed out at the rainy streets, my mind a whirlwind of questions. What did the killer want? What was the significance of the rain in their twisted agenda? And how could we stop them before they struck again? My thoughts were interrupted by the sudden appearance of a figure in my rearview mirror. A hooded figure, cloaked in darkness, was approaching my car. I reached for my weapon, my heart pounding, as the figure drew nearer. But instead of attacking, the figure handed me a small envelope and disappeared into the rainy night. I watched in shock as they melted into the shadows, leaving me with the mysterious package. With trembling hands, I opened the envelope and found a single note inside. It read, Meet me at the old rainfall bridge tonight at midnight. Come alone. I knew it was a risk, but I couldn't ignore the possibility that this message was from the killer. It was a chance to finally confront the darkness that had consumed our town. As midnight approached, I drove to the old rainfall bridge, a decrepit structure that had long been abandoned. The rain was still falling, a steady downpour that seemed to intensify as I reached my destination. I parked my car and stepped out into the darkness, clutching my weapon tightly. The bridge creaked and groaned beneath my feet as I made my way to the center where a lone figure awaited me. The figure stepped into the dim light and I gasped in shock. It was Emily, a woman I had known for years, who had recently moved to Willowbrook. She had always been quiet and reserved, but I had never suspected her of being involved in the rainfall murders. Emily, I said, my voice trembling. What is this? Are you involved in the murders? She shook her head, her eyes filled with fear and desperation. No, Detective Mitchell, I'm not the killer. I've been trying to stop them. I was taken aback by her words. Stop them? What do you mean? Emily explained that she had moved to Willowbrook to escape a troubled past, one that had haunted her for years. She had been plagued by nightmares and visions of the rainfall murders, and she believed that the rain itself held the key to stopping the killer. It's like a curse, she said, her voice quivering. The rain speaks to me, Detective Mitchell. It shows me things, things I can't explain. I've been trying to decipher its messages and stop the killer before they strike again. I listened in disbelief as Emily described her eerie connection to the rain. She claimed that the rain had revealed to her the identity of the killer and the location of their next victim. It was a bizarre and unbelievable story, but there was something in her eyes that made me believe she was telling the truth. As we spoke, the rain continued to fall its relentless rhythm serving as a backdrop to our conversation. 
Emily begged me to help her stop the killer, to put an end to the rainfall murders once and for all. With no other leads or suspects, I had no choice but to follow Emily's guidance. She led me to a secluded spot in the woods where we waited in the darkness, listening to the rain and watching for any signs of the killer's approach. Hours passed and I began to doubt the validity of Emily's claims. But just as I was about to suggest we leave, I heard a faint noise in the distance, the sound of footsteps approaching through the rain-soaked leaves. I tightened my grip on my weapon as the figure drew nearer. And then, through the darkness and rain, I saw them. The hooded figure responsible for the rainfall murders. Emily gasped in recognition, her eyes wide with fear. That's them, Detective Mitchell. That's the killer. As the figure came closer, I could see the glint of a blade in their hand, ready to strike. With a sense of urgency, I called out, Police! Drop your weapon! The killer froze, their hooded head turning to face us. And then, in a voice that sent shivers down my spine, they spoke. I am the rainfall, and I am the answer to your town's sins. The figure lunged forward, and a struggle ensued. Rain soaked us to the bone as we fought for our lives in the darkness. But in the end, it was Emily who managed to disarm the killer, using a strength and determination I had never seen in her before. We called for backup, and the killer was apprehended and taken into custody. It was a moment of relief and closure for our town, as we had finally put an end to the rainfall murders. In the days that followed, the truth behind the rainfall murders came to light. The killer's name was David Walker, a troubled man with a deep-seated hatred for the town of Willowbrook. He had chosen his victims at random, leaving cryptic messages in a twisted attempt to instill fear and chaos. But it was Emily's connection to the rain that had ultimately led us to him. She had seen his face in her visions, and the rain had guided us to his location that fateful night on the old rainfall bridge. As I sat in my office, reflecting on the events that had transpired, I couldn't help but marvel at the strange and unsettling nature of the case. It was a reminder that sometimes, the darkest mysteries can be found in the most unexpected places, and that even the rain itself can hold secrets waiting to be uncovered. The town of Willowbrook slowly began to heal from the trauma of the rainfall murders. The rain continued to fall, as it always did, but now it was a symbol of resilience and strength a reminder that even in the face of darkness, we could find the light. And as I looked out at the rainy streets of Willowbrook, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets the rain might hold and what mysteries it might reveal in the future. Working the night shift at Walmart was never the highlight of my week. The sterile fluorescent lights seemed to drain the life out of everything, casting harsh shadows that danced eerily on the linoleum floor. But the pay was decent, and it was a job, so I couldn't complain too much. One particular night, as the clock ticked closer to midnight, I found myself manning the customer service desk. It wasn't a particularly exciting job. I spent most of my time handling returns and dealing with the occasional irate customer. But that night was different, as I would soon discover. I had just finished processing a return when I saw him. He stood at the entrance, lingering in the faint lit vestibule. His silhouette was framed by the automatic sliding doors, and something about him immediately sent a shiver down my spine. The man was tall and gaunt, his features obscured by the hood of his tattered coat. He wore dark, worn-out jeans that seemed to sag under their own weight, and his shoes were scuffed and filthy. But what really caught my attention were his eyes, or rather the lack of them. His face was hidden in the shadows and I couldn't make out any facial features, just two dark voids where his eyes should have been. I blinked thinking it was a trick of the light, but when I looked again, his unsettling gaze remained. It was as though he had no eyes at all, just empty sockets staring into the store. I felt a freezing sensation and I couldn't tear my gaze away from him. As the automatic doors slid shut behind him, he stepped into the store, his footsteps almost inaudible on the polished floor. I watched in a mix of curiosity and unease as he moved deeper into the store, his hooded head bowed slightly as if in contemplation. I quickly glanced around the store to see if any of my co-workers had noticed the strange man, but they were all busy with their tasks, oblivious to his presence. Part of me wanted to alert someone, call security, or at least keep an eye on him, but another part of me hesitated, unsure of what to make of the situation. After all, he was just a customer albeit a peculiar one. 
I decided to keep an eye on him from the customer service desk, rationalizing that it was my job to monitor the store. As I watched, he wandered aimlessly through the aisles, occasionally picking up an item, only to put it back haphazardly. His movements were jerky, almost mechanical, and there was an unsettling air of purposelessness about him. Time seemed to stretch as I observed him, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was profoundly wrong. It was as though he didn't belong here, as if he were a glitch in the system, an anomaly in the orderly world of Walmart. As the minutes turned into hours, the store grew quieter, and the few remaining customers hurried through their shopping, eager to leave. The man, however, remained, seemingly unfazed by the late hour. It was almost as if he were waiting for something or someone. I watched him for what felt like an eternity, my unease growing with each passing moment. Then, to my surprise, he abruptly stopped in front of the customer service desk, his empty gaze fixed on me. My heart pounded in my chest as I met his eyeless stare and a cold sweat formed on my brow. Can I help you with something? I asked, my voice quivering slightly. He didn't respond. Instead, he extended a bony hand, the fingers unnaturally long and thin, and placed a crumpled piece of paper on the counter. I cautiously picked it up and unfolded it, my eyes widening in shock as I read the scrawled message. They're coming for you. My heart raced and I looked up at the man, my mind racing with fear and confusion. Who's coming for me? I demanded, my voice trembling. The man remained silent, his hooded head still bowed. I felt a growing sense of dread, as though I had stumbled into a nightmare from which there was no escape. I decided to call for help. I picked up the store phone and dialed the security extension, but there was no answer, just static on the line. Panic welled up inside me as I realized I was on my own, with this mysterious man who seemed to defy reason. I glanced around, hoping to catch the attention of one of my co-workers, but they were all preoccupied with their tasks, oblivious to the tension that had gripped the store. It was as if I were trapped in a parallel reality, isolated with this enigmatic stranger. I turned my attention back to the man who had now stepped closer to the desk, his hood concealing his face even more. Who are you? I asked, my voice quivering. He finally spoke, his voice low and raspy, sending a shiver down my spine. I am a harbinger of the inevitable, he said cryptically. I didn't know what to make of his words, but they filled me with a sense of foreboding. What do you want from me? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. He reached into the pocket of his coat and pulled out a small, worn-out photograph. He slid it across the counter toward me, and my hands trembled as I picked it up. The photograph was old and faded, depicting a group of people standing in front of a dilapidated house. It looked like it had been taken decades ago. Among the people in the photo, one figure stood out, the man himself, his face whole, his eyes filled with life. I looked up at him, my confusion deepening. Is this you? He nodded slowly. It was once. I couldn't make sense of it. The man in the photograph bore no resemblance to the eyeless, hooded figure before me. What happened to you? I asked, my curiosity overcoming my fear. He didn't answer directly, instead choosing to speak in riddles. I have seen the depths of the abyss, tasted the darkness that lies beyond the veil of reality. I have glimpsed the true nature of existence, and it has taken everything from me. I didn't know what to say. His words were both cryptic and unsettling, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I had stumbled upon something beyond my understanding. Suddenly, the store's intercom crackled to life, the sound echoing through the empty aisles. Attention, Walmart associates, a voice announced. We have received a report of a suspicious individual in the store. Please be on the lookout and report any unusual activity to security. My heart sank as I realized the announcement was about the man standing before me. I had to act quickly. I grabbed the phone and dialed the security extension again, hoping someone would pick up this time. To my relief, a voice answered on the other end. Security, what's your emergency? I quickly explained the situation, the strange man, the cryptic message, and the unsettling photograph. The security officer assured me they would dispatch someone immediately. As I hung up the phone, I turned to the man who had remained strangely calm throughout the ordeal. Security is on their way, I said, my voice trembling. You need to stay here until they arrive. He nodded, seemingly unfazed by the impending arrival of security. I will wait, he said softly. 
Minutes felt like hours as I stood behind the customer service desk, the man standing before me, his hooded head bowed in contemplation. The store remained eerily quiet, the harsh fluorescent lights casting long shadows that seemed to dance in rhythm with my racing heart. Finally, the sound of approaching footsteps broke the silence. Two security officers clad in blue uniforms entered the store, their flashlights cutting through the darkness. I rushed to meet them, explaining the situation and pointing to the mysterious man. The security officers approached the man cautiously, their flashlights illuminating his hooded face. They exchanged wary glances as they questioned him, but he remained cryptic and evasive, offering no concrete answers. As the officers handcuffed him and led him away, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief. The ordeal was over, and I could finally breathe easy. But even as I watched him being escorted out of the store, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story, that the man's enigmatic words held a deeper meaning. Days turned into weeks, and the memory of that unsettling night at Walmart began to fade. Life returned to its usual routine, and I tried to put the bizarre encounter behind me. Then one evening, as I was leaving work, I found a small envelope waiting for me at the customer service desk. It was addressed to me in handwriting I didn't recognize. I cautiously opened it and found a single piece of paper inside, along with another faded photograph. The photograph depicted the same group of people standing in front of the dilapidated house. But there was something different about it. The man who had been eyeless in the previous photograph now had eyes, dark and piercing, staring into the camera with an intensity that sent a shiver down my spine. On the back of the photograph, a message was scrawled in the same handwriting as the envelope. The abyss is patient. It waits for those who seek to understand its secrets. Beware the truths you seek, for they may consume you. I couldn't make sense of it. Who had sent me this message, and what did it mean? The enigmatic encounter at Walmart had left me with more questions than answers, and I couldn't escape the feeling that I had stumbled upon something beyond my comprehension. As I left the store that evening, the harsh fluorescent lights casting long shadows around me, I couldn't help but wonder what other mysteries lay hidden in the most ordinary of places, waiting to be discovered by those brave or foolish enough to seek them out. Working at Walmart was never glamorous, but it paid the bills. I was just an ordinary employee, one among the sea of blue vests, stacking shelves and dealing with the quirks of everyday customers. The store was a monotonous place, predictable and unchanging. That was until I started working under Manager Phillips. Manager Phillips was a tall, middle-aged man with graying hair and an unassuming demeanor. He wasn't particularly friendly, but he wasn't unkind either. He ran the store efficiently, and that's what mattered to most of us. However, there was something about him that made me uneasy from the very beginning. It started with the way he looked at us, his employees. His gaze was penetrating as if he were trying to read our souls. It was a look that lingered too long that made you want to squirm and look away. But I couldn't deny the effectiveness of his management style. Our store was running like a well-oiled machine, and our sales numbers were steadily climbing. One day as I was restocking the canned goods aisle, I overheard a hushed conversation between two of my co-workers, Rachel and Mike. They were whispering about Manager Phillips and the strange things they had seen him do. My curiosity got the better of me, and I moved closer to eavesdrop. He's always in the break room during his lunch break, Rachel said, her voice barely audible. And he locks the door behind him. Mike nodded in agreement. Yeah, and I've seen him go out to the parking lot late at night, sometimes after everyone else has left. It's weird, man. I had noticed some odd behaviors from manager Phillips myself, but I had brushed them off as quirks. Now, hearing my co-workers' concerns, I couldn't help but wonder if there was more to the man than met the eye. That evening, after my shift, I decided to follow Manager Phillips. It was a foolish and impulsive decision, driven by a curiosity I couldn't ignore. I watched from my car as he left the store, his figure disappearing into the night. I trailed him at a distance, my heart pounding in my chest. He drove to a remote area outside of town, a place I had never been before. He parked his car near a secluded pond, and I watched as he got out and walked to the water's edge. In the dim moonlight, I saw him raise his hands, palms up, and begin to speak in a low, almost hypnotic voice. I couldn't make out the words, but the tone of his voice was dark and cold. It was as though he were engaged in some kind of ritual. 
I watched in stunned silence as Manager Phillips continued his strange behavior. He stayed by the pond for what felt like hours, his movements deliberate and purposeful. It was clear that whatever he was doing was deeply important to him. Finally, he returned to his car and drove back to the store, seemingly unaware that he had been observed. I waited a few minutes before I followed him back, my mind racing with questions and suspicions. Over the next few weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong with Manager Phillips. I kept a close eye on his actions, documenting the strange occurrences I witnessed. It became an obsession, something I couldn't let go of. One day, I decided to confide in Rachel and Mike, the co-workers I had overheard earlier. I told them about what I had seen at the pond, and they shared their own observations. It was clear that we all had a growing sense of unease about our manager. Rachel had noticed that Manager Phillips seemed to have an uncanny ability to predict when the store would be busy or when a major sale would occur. It was as though he had insider information that the rest of us didn't. Mike, on the other hand, had discovered that Manager Phillips had access to a room in the back of the store that no one else did. It was a small, windowless space and the door was always locked. Mike had tried to ask about it, but Manager Phillips had brushed off his inquiries, claiming it was simply a storage room. As our suspicions grew, we decided to do some digging. We scoured the store's records and discovered that there were financial irregularities that seemed to be connected to Manager Phillips. Money was unaccounted for and inventory seemed to vanish mysteriously. It was as though the store was bleeding money and Manager Phillips was at the center of it all. One evening, as we were discussing our findings, Rachel had a breakthrough. She had been looking into Manager Phillips' background and had discovered that he had a history of involvement with a secretive and obscure religious group. The group's beliefs were unconventional, to say the least, and its members were known for their eccentric rituals. It all clicked into place. Manager Phillips' strange behavior, his ability to predict the store's fortunes, the locked room, and now his connection to this enigmatic religious group. It was all part of a puzzle that we were determined to solve. We decided to confront Manager Phillips with our suspicions. We confronted him in his office one evening, armed with our evidence and the determination to uncover the truth. He listened to us calmly, his expression unreadable. When we presented our findings, his only response was a chilling smile. You've been very observant, haven't you? He said, his voice dripping with condescension. But you have no idea what you're getting into. We demanded answers, but Manager Phillips refused to divulge anything more. Instead, he warned us to drop our investigation and forget everything we had discovered. It was a veiled threat, and we knew we were treading on dangerous ground. Undeterred, we decided to take our concerns to higher-ups in the company. We believed that they needed to know about Manager Phillips' behavior and its impact on the store's finances. We gathered our evidence and prepared to make our case. But before we could take our concerns any further, things took a sinister turn. Rachel disappeared one night after her shift. She had been conducting her own investigation into Manager Phillips, and we feared that she had crossed a line that put her in danger. We reported her disappearance to the police, but there was no sign of her. It was as though she had vanished without a trace, leaving us with a growing sense of dread and helplessness. Mike and I were now the only ones left to unravel the mystery of Manager Phillips. We knew that we were risking our own safety, but we couldn't turn back. We had to uncover the truth, not only for Rachel's sake, but for our own as well. We continued to gather evidence, documenting every irregularity and suspicious behavior we could find. The financial discrepancies grew more alarming, and it became clear that Manager Phillips was siphoning money from the store for reasons known only to him. One night, as I was going through some old records in the break room, I discovered something creeped me out. I found a photo of Manager Phillips with a group of people all dressed in robes, standing in front of a dark, imposing building. It was the same building I had seen in my dreams, the one that haunted me with its foreboding presence. The photo was old, faded, but there was no mistaking Manager Phillips's face among the group. It was as though he had a connection to that sinister place. I showed the photo to Mike and he recognized the building as well. It was located on the outskirts of town and it had always been associated with rumors of strange rituals and secretive gatherings. With this new piece of evidence, we decided to investigate the building ourselves. We couldn't ignore the possibility that it held the key to uncovering Manager Phillips's dark secret. 
Late one night, we drove to the location, our hearts pounding with anticipation and fear. The building loomed before us, a dark and imposing structure that seemed to radiate malevolence. We knew we were walking into the unknown and we were prepared for whatever we might find. As we entered the building, the air grew cold and the silence was oppressive. We made our way through a cloudy lit hallway, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The building was filled with strange symbols and markings, and the walls seemed to pulse with an otherworldly energy. Finally, we reached a large cavernous chamber, and what we saw inside made our blood run cold. Manager Phillips stood at the center of the room surrounded by a group of robed figures. They were engaged in a ritual, their voices raised in a chant. In the center of the room was an altar, and on it lay a figure covered by a black shroud. It was Rachel, unconscious and seemingly lifeless. Manager Phillips was overseeing the ritual, his eyes filled with a manic intensity. We watched in horror as the ritual reached its climax. The figures chanted louder, and the air crackled with an unnatural energy. And then the unthinkable happened. Rachel's body began to twitch and convulse, and she let out a haunting scream. It was as though she were being possessed by some dark force. We couldn't bear to watch any longer and we turned to flee. But before we could escape, we were discovered by manager Phillips and his followers. They cornered us in the chamber, their eyes filled with a fanatic zeal. Manager Phillips spoke in a voice that was not his own, his words filled with an eerie resonance. He revealed the true nature of his secret, a pact with a sinister entity that granted him power and knowledge beyond comprehension. He offered us a choice, join him in his dark endeavors or become sacrifices to the entity he served. We refused to submit to his twisted desires, and a battle ensued. It was a desperate struggle for our lives, as we fought against Manager Phillips and his followers, determined to stop their sinister ritual. As we grappled with them, we managed to disrupt the ritual, freeing Rachel from the entity's grip. She was weakened and traumatized, but she was alive. In the end, we managed to escape the building, leaving Manager Phillips and his followers behind. We reported the incident to the police, but they found no trace of the manager or his group when they arrived at the scene. The experience left us scarred and haunted, but we knew that we had done the right thing. We had uncovered Manager Phillips's dark secret and put an end to his dark plans. We never returned to that Walmart store and we never saw Manager Phillips again. But the memory of that night of the sinister rituals and dark entity would haunt us for the rest of our lives. As we moved on, we couldn't help but wonder how many other secrets were hidden in the most ordinary of places, waiting to be discovered by those brave or foolish enough to seek them out. The world was full of mysteries, some more terrifying than we could ever imagine, and we had come face to face with one of them. It was an ordinary Tuesday evening when I decided to make a quick trip to Walmart. The sun had already dipped below the horizon, casting the sprawling parking lot into darkness. A flickering streetlight hummed above me as I exited my car. I shook it off as a result of the chilly autumn air, reminding myself that Walmart was just a stone's throw away, and I'd be inside the well-lit store in no time. I strolled through the automatic sliding doors, greeted by the familiar overhead hum of fluorescent lights and the sight of endless aisles filled with products of every kind. There's something oddly comforting about the predictability of Walmart even at night, Rows of neatly stacked shelves, the faint smell of plastic and cleaning supplies, the muffled chatter of employees and late night shoppers, it was all so ordinary. I had come for a few essentials, so I grabbed a shopping cart and began to browse. The soft squeaking of wheels echoed around me as I navigated through the labyrinthine aisles. My footsteps seemed unusually loud against the linoleum floor, but I shrugged it off as my imagination playing tricks on me. I picked up a box of cereal, some milk, and a few other items, steadily making my way toward the checkout lanes. As I turned into the snack aisle, something caught my eye, a man in a faded green hoodie. He was standing near the potato chips, his head buried in a bag as if he were genuinely shopping. At first there was nothing remarkable about him, just another shopper in a Walmart hoodie. But then something about his posture struck me as odd. He seemed tense, like a predator sizing up its prey. He didn't glance my way, but I couldn't shake the feeling that he was watching me, studying me. It made my blood freeze, making me hesitate. I continued down the aisle, glancing over my shoulder to find him still there, 
pretending to examine bags of chips. I quickened my pace, now acutely aware of my surroundings. Every aisle I turned into, he was there, never too close but always within my line of sight. Panic started to creep in and I told myself I was being paranoid. Maybe he was just doing his shopping and I was reading too much into it. But deep down, I knew something wasn't right. When I reached the personal care aisle, I decided to test my theory. I grabbed a random item off the shelf, a bottle of shampoo I didn't even need, and headed for the electronics section. If he was following me, he'd have to reveal his true intentions. Sure enough, as I entered the electronics section, he followed. I tried to act nonchalant, glancing at the TVs and browsing the video games, but my heart raced. There was no doubt now, he was following me. Fear constricted my chest as I considered my options. I couldn't confront him directly. I needed help. I reached for my phone, but a quick glance told me I had no signal. Walmart's notorious dead spots, I thought. Panic set in as I realized I was on my own. I decided to make a beeline for the front of the store, where there were always employees at the registers. The man could be a harmless coincidence, but my gut told me otherwise. I picked up the pace, my cart squeaking loudly in protest. I passed through the clothing section, then the home goods aisle, but he stayed with me, never more than a few aisles away. I could feel his eyes on me, and I knew he was closing in. Finally, I reached the main thoroughfare of the store, lined with registers and manned by Walmart employees. I hurriedly pushed my cart toward the closest checkout lane, relief washing over me. The cashier, a young woman with a friendly smile, scanned my items and made small talk as she worked. But just as I was starting to calm down, I saw him. The man in the green hoodie was standing a few lanes away, pretending to examine a display of candy bars. He wasn't shopping. He was watching me, waiting for his chance. I paid for my items, thanked the cashier, and made a quick decision. Instead of heading for the exit, I turned and pushed my cart toward the pharmacy section at the back of the store. It was further away from the entrance, but it was also less crowded, and I hoped I could lose him there. As I walked, I took a deep breath and tried to think rationally. I needed to find a store employee and alert them to the situation. I knew I couldn't confront this man on my own. But where were the employees? It was as if the store had emptied out, leaving only me and the stalker. I turned a corner and entered the pharmacy area. It was eerily quiet, with only the soft hum of fluorescent lights above. I scanned the rows of medicine and health products, desperately searching for a store employee. There was no one in sight. I felt a cold sweat forming on my brow as I continued to push my cart. My heart pounded in my chest, and every sound, every shadow, seemed amplified. The man in the green hoodie was still behind me, closer now, his footsteps echoing ominously on the linoleum floor. I rounded another corner and my heart sank. There, standing in front of me, was a display of Halloween masks and costumes. Rows of plastic faces leered at me, grotesque and terrifying. The irony of the situation hit me. The scariest thing in the store wasn't a mask, it was the man following me. I knew I couldn't keep running forever. My phone still had no signal and there were no store employees in sight. I had to make a stand, find a way to escape this nightmare. I glanced around, searching for anything that could help me. That's when I saw it, a fire extinguisher mounted on the wall. It was my only chance. I approached it, trying to remain calm. The man was now just a few feet away, his eyes locked on me, a sinister grin playing on his lips. With a surge of adrenaline, I grabbed the fire extinguisher and aimed it at him. Stay back, I shouted, my voice quivering but determined. The man froze, his grin fading into a look of surprise. Whoa, whoa, calm down, he said, holding up his hands. I'm not here to hurt you. I wasn't convinced. Then why are you following me? I demanded, my finger on the extinguisher's trigger. He hesitated for a moment, then sighed. I'm not following you. I work here, in loss prevention. I thought you might be a shoplifter. My heart pounded in my chest as I considered his words. Could he be telling the truth? I lowered the fire extinguisher slightly, but I didn't put it down. You're a Walmart employee, I asked, still on edge. Yes, he replied, his hands still raised. I'm just doing my job, trying to prevent theft. I'm sorry if I scared you. I looked around, finally noticing the security cameras placed throughout the store. It made sense. He was an employee trying to protect the store's assets. I felt a wave of embarrassment wash over me as I realized my mistake. 
I... I thought you were stalking me. I admitted feeling foolish. He nodded sympathetically. I can see how it might have looked that way. I should have introduced myself and explained, but I didn't want to blow my cover. Relief flooded through me as I lowered the fire extinguisher completely and handed it back to him. I'm sorry for overreacting, I said, my voice shaky. It's just that, well, it's been a really strange night. He offered a friendly smile. No worries. I'm Chris, by the way. I promise I won't be following you anymore. We both chuckled nervously, and I finally started to relax. Chris walked me to the front of the store where other employees were now visible at the registers. He explained the situation to a manager who assured me they would review the security footage to confirm everything was okay. As I left the store, I couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity of it all. What had started as a routine trip to Walmart had turned into a terrifying ordeal, all because of a misunderstanding. I realized that sometimes fear can distort our perceptions and lead us to make rash decisions. From that night on, I never looked at Walmart the same way. It was no longer just a place to shop. It was a reminder that even the most ordinary settings can become the backdrop for a terrifying encounter. And as I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that the man in the green hoodie had given me a glimpse into the darker side of the ordinary world. A world where shadows lurked in every aisle and fear could turn even the most mundane moments into a nightmare. In the heart of the city, where towering buildings cast long shadows and neon lights flickered against the cold November sky, Black Friday unfolded like an annual ritual. People flocked to the sprawling mall, drawn by the promise of jaw-dropping discounts and once-in-a-lifetime deals. The atmosphere crackled with excitement as shoppers hurriedly lined up outside stores eager to seize the best bargains before they vanished like whispers in the wind. Among the throng of bargain hunters, Sarah, a young college student, was brimming with enthusiasm. Clutching her shopping list and navigating through the pulsating crowd, she darted from store to store, her eyes gleaming with anticipation. But amidst the chaos, a sense of unease settled in the pit of her stomach, a subtle prickling sensation that refused to fade. As dusk descended, casting a scary glow through the mall's glass facades, Sarah noticed a figure that seemed out of place, a man clad in a dark hoodie, his features obscured by shadows. He moved with an unsettling sense of purpose, weaving through the bustling masses like a specter drifting through a fog. Sarah brushed off her apprehension, attributing it to the frenzied atmosphere of the shopping extravaganza. The mall's interior buzzed with excitement, the air thick with the scent of coffee mingled with the faint aroma of new merchandise. The incessant chatter of excited shoppers echoed against the walls, punctuated by the occasional shrill laughter. Sarah found herself drawn into the whirlwind of consumerism, her initial discomfort fading into the background as she succumbed to the allure of the sales. As the night deepened, the throngs of shoppers dwindled, leaving behind a quieter, almost dark ambience. Stores began to close their shutters, signaling the end of the frenetic shopping spree. Sarah, laden with bags and weary from the day's excitement, decided to head for the exit. A sudden shiver raced down her back as she realized she was being followed. A faint rustling of footsteps, barely audible over the hum of distant voices. Glancing back, she caught a glimpse of the hooded figure from earlier, his shadowy form looming closer. Panic surged within her, and she quickened her pace, her heart pounding in her chest. The mall, once bustling with life, now seemed hauntingly desolate. The flickering lights cast elongated shadows that danced along the empty corridors, amplifying Sarah's growing sense of dread. She veered down narrow alleys and deserted passages, desperate to shake off her pursuer. But the hooded figure persisted, a menacing silhouette in the darkness. With every step, Sarah's fear intensified. Her breaths came in ragged gasps, and her pulse thundered in her ears. Her mind raced, conjuring terrifying scenarios, each more gruesome than the last. She stumbled and glanced over her shoulder, her eyes widening in horror as the hooded figure closed the distance between them. In a last-ditch attempt to escape, Sarah dashed towards the emergency exit, her trembling hands fumbling with the latch. The door swung open with a creak, and she burst into the cool night air, her lungs heaving with exertion. She sprinted across the empty parking lot, her feet pounding against the asphalt but the sound of pursuit echoed behind her. A blood-curdling scream tore through the silence as Sarah felt a vice-like grip seize her shoulder. 
She twisted around to confront her assailant, but before she could react, a glint of steel flashed in the moonlight. Pain exploded through her body as a blade plunged into her abdomen, ripping a strangled cry from her lips. Gasping for breath, Sarah collapsed to the ground, her vision swimming in a haze of agony. The hooded figure loomed over her, his face concealed by the shadows, as he delivered the final blow. Darkness enveloped her, and the world faded into oblivion. The next morning, the headline screamed of a gruesome Black Friday tragedy. A young woman found brutally murdered in the mall's parking lot. Panic swept through the city as rumors of a deranged serial killer among the shoppers spread like wildfire. The mall, once a bustling hub of consumerism, now bore witness to unspeakable horror. Story 2 The anticipation of Black Friday hung thick in the air like an impending storm. Crowds congregated outside the mall gates, their murmurs forming a symphony of excitement as they eagerly awaited the doors to swing open. Among them was Mia, a young woman with a passion for bargain hunting. The throng surged forward as the clock struck midnight, flooding the mall with a sea of shoppers. Mia navigated through the chaos, her eyes alight with the promise of irresistible deals. But amidst the frenzy, a peculiar unease nestled in the pit of her stomach, a feeling she couldn't shake. As the night wore on, the mall teemed with life, its corridors packed with eager consumers. The air buzzed with energy, the scent of new merchandise mingling with the cacophony of voices. But amidst the hustle and bustle, something sinister lurked in the shadows. Reports began to surface, whispers among the crowd of people disappearing without a trace. At first, it was dismissed as hearsay, a figment of overactive imaginations. But as the night deepened, the disappearances became undeniable. Shoppers vanished into thin air, leaving behind empty spaces in the crowded aisles. Mia noticed the disconcerting absence of familiar faces. Friends she had seen moments ago had vanished without a trace. Panic flickered in her chest, but she brushed it off as paranoia, focusing on navigating through the swarming masses. In the midst of the chaos, a soul-chilling sight caught her eye. A man stood at the far end of an empty corridor, his silhouette obscured by the weird lighting. He watched, unmoving, his gaze fixed on the shoppers. His presence sent a cold feeling down Mia's back, but when she blinked, he was gone. Fear gnawed at her insides, but when Mia tried to alert others, she was met with incredulous stares or dismissive shrugs. No one believed her, not even her boyfriend, Alex, who brushed off her concerns as Black Friday hysteria. As the night dragged on, the mall grew quiet. The once bustling corridors now echoed with hollow emptiness. Stores that had teemed with shoppers were now deserted, their shelves abandoned, goods forgotten in the haste of vanishing customers. Mia's unease intensified, her steps faltering as she wandered through the desolate passages. She felt watched, followed by an unseen presence that slithered just beyond her line of sight. She called out for Alex, but her voice echoed into an abyss of silence. A chilling realization struck when she stumbled upon a small enclave tucked away in a remote corner of the mall. There, amidst discarded shopping bags and forgotten goods, lay a trail of personal belongings. Phones, purses, jackets, all abandoned as if their owners had evaporated into the night. Panic surged through Mia's veins as she retraced her steps, her heart racing in terror. The once familiar maze of the mall now felt like a labyrinth of dread. Shadows danced at the corners of her vision, whispering of an impending doom. Frantic, she rushed towards the exit, praying for an escape from this nightmare. But as she reached the door, a bone-chilling silence enveloped her. The world seemed to freeze as she turned around, and standing before her was the man she had seen earlier, his presence suffocating. Before Mia could react, a vortex of darkness consumed her. Her screams echoed through the empty halls as she vanished into the abyss, leaving behind only a haunting emptiness. The following day, the mall remained deserted, a ghostly monument to the inexplicable events of that Black Friday night. No trace of the missing shoppers was ever found. Rumors circulated, tales of a malevolent force lurking within the mall's walls, a sinister entity preying on the frenzied crowds. And as time passed, the mall was sealed off. Story 3 Amidst the annual frenzy of Black Friday, the bustling shopping center became a maze of fluorescent lights and echoing chatter. Among the throng of eager shoppers was Emma, a young woman eagerly browsing the sales, her heart racing with anticipation for the best deals of the year.
As she weaved through the crowded aisles, Emma couldn't shake off an uneasy feeling prickling the back of her neck. The relentless bustle seemed suffocating, and a sense of foreboding settled within her. She brushed it off as pre-shopping jitters, attributing it to the frenetic atmosphere of the day. Yet as the hours passed, her unease deepened. Each time she glanced over her shoulder, a fleeting shadow seemed to dart behind racks of clothes or vanish into the crowd. She attributed it to tiredness, the disorienting buzz of the packed mall, dismissing her paranoia as mere figments of a fatigued mind. As she waited in the long queues at various stores, Emma caught glimpses of the same individuals nearby. An elderly man with piercing eyes, a young woman in a red coat, and a figure obscured by a hood. Their presence seemed unnervingly persistent, and their gazes felt intrusive, burning into her soul. Attempting to shake off her growing anxiety, Emma hurriedly continued her shopping spree. But as she navigated the labyrinthine paths of the shopping center, the feeling of being watched intensified. Whispers of voices that seemed too close yet too far echoed around her, instilling a profound sense of dread. Despite her efforts to rationalize, Emma's heartbeat quickened with each step, a relentless drumming in her chest. Her mind played tricks on her, conjuring shadows that slithered at the edges of her vision. She found herself glancing over her shoulder incessantly, catching fleeting glimpses of figures that seemed to vanish into thin air. Eventually, Emma sought solace in the restroom, hoping a moment of respite might quell her escalating fear. The restroom was empty, the fluorescent lights casting harsh shadows across the tiled floor. She splashed water on her face, attempting to regain composure, but a movement in the mirror caught her attention. A shadowy figure lurking behind the stalls. Panic surged through her veins and Emma bolted out of the restroom, her breath shallow and erratic. She felt a cold sweat trickling down her neck as she raced through the maze of corridors, seeking an exit from this suffocating nightmare. The world seemed to close in around her as she darted between aisles, desperate to escape the relentless feeling of being hunted. She tried to call her boyfriend, but the network was inexplicably jammed. No one responded to her frantic cries for help as the mall's usual buzz dissolved into an horrific silence. Determination to escape consumed her, but no matter which direction she turned, she found herself back in the same junction of corridors. The figures she had glimpsed earlier appeared and vanished like phantoms, their faces obscured, yet their eyes bore into her soul. With trembling hands and a racing heart, Emma stumbled upon a service door. Hope surged within her, but as she reached for the handle, the lights flickered and a haunting silence descended. She turned and there, looming in the dark corridor, stood the silhouettes of the figures, their eyes gleaming with an unsettling hunger. Frozen in terror, Emma felt a hand grasp her shoulder a cold, clammy touch that made her blood freeze. She turned to face her assailant, only to be met with an abyss of darkness engulfing her. The last thing Emma felt was a suffocating embrace of shadows before she vanished into the abyss, leaving behind only a haunting emptiness. Story 4 The countdown to Black Friday had begun and the anticipation hung thick in the air. Shoppers eagerly planned their strategies for snagging the best deals, and stores were adorned with enticing banners proclaiming massive discounts. Among the throngs of excited shoppers was Max, a young man with an insatiable hunger for bargains. He had mapped out his route through the shopping center, determined to make the most of the sales and emerge victorious. As the clock struck midnight, the doors of the mall flung open and a surge of eager consumers flooded in. Max plunged into the chaos, darting from store to store, his eyes scanning for the best deals. But amidst the hustle and bustle, a sense of unease crept over him. The crowded corridors felt suffocating and the continuous hum of chatter seemed almost deafening. Max pushed the feeling aside, attributing it to the frenzied atmosphere of Black Friday. As the night progressed, the shopping center thrived with life. The aisles teemed with enthusiastic shoppers, their arms laden with discounted goods. But amidst the excitement, Max noticed something unsettling a peculiar figure lurking among the crowd, its features obscured by a hood. The figure appeared intermittently, always at the edge of Max's vision. He tried to dismiss it as a trick of the bustling crowd, but a prickling sensation at the back of his neck refused to fade. He attempted to alert a security guard, but the figure vanished whenever Max sought assistance. 
Dismissed as a paranoid shopper in the midst of the Black Friday chaos, Max's concerns were met with indifferent shrugs and impatient glances. As the hours ticked by, the once exhilarating atmosphere grew oppressive. Max's movements became frantic, his eyes darting around trying to catch another glimpse of the mysterious figure. The persistent feeling of being watched made him freeze up. In his haste to escape the perceived stalker, Max found himself lost in the labyrinthine corridors of the mall. The deafening noise of excited shoppers had given way to a sinister silence, broken only by the faint echo of his own footsteps. Desperation clawed at him as he frantically searched for an exit. The deserted passageways seemed to stretch endlessly, and the disorienting maze left him feeling trapped. He tried calling for help, but his voice echoed into a void of emptiness. A sense of impending doom loomed over Max as he stumbled upon a small corridor, its flickering lights casting unsettling shadows. There, standing at the far end, was the hooded figure. It remained motionless, its presence chilling Max to the bone. Heart pounding, Max cautiously approached, his voice trembling as he demanded answers. But as he drew closer, the figure turned, revealing a haunting emptiness where its face should have been. A featureless void that sent a surge of terror through Max's veins. Before he could react, darkness enveloped him, swallowing him whole. The last thing he felt was an icy grip wrapping around him, pulling him into an abyss of nothingness. In the heart of Elmwood, a quiet suburban neighborhood nestled between towering elms, stood a house frozen in time. Its weathered facade loomed ominously over the street, shrouded in tales of a sinister past. The Jenkins house, as it was known, had remained uninhabited for decades, casting a dark presence over curious locals. Rumors swirled like autumn leaves about the Jenkins family, who had mysteriously vanished one stormy night, leaving behind a sinister legacy. Many claimed the house was cursed, plagued by restless spirits seeking vengeance for past wrongs. Others dismissed it as mere superstition, a cautionary tale told to keep children away from its decaying porch. However, when the Jacobs family moved into the neighborhood, they saw opportunity in the old Jenkins house. The couple, Alex and Sarah, thought it was the perfect fixer-upper. They believed in the charm of restoration, unaware of the ominous air that clung to the peeling walls and creaking floorboards. As they settled in, strange occurrences became a daily ordeal. Doors slammed shut inexplicably, and chilling whispers echoed in the dead of night. Sarah's antiques would inexplicably rearrange themselves, and Alex often heard faint, haunting melodies when no music played. Despite these scary events, the Jacobs remained undeterred. Sarah attributed it to the house's age, while Alex dismissed it as their imagination running wild in the new environment. One fateful evening, a storm descended upon Elmwood. The wind howled mournfully, and lightning danced across the sky like an angry god's wrath. The house trembled under the onslaught of nature's fury, and the shadows within seemed to writhe in response. As the night wore on, the house began to reveal its darkest secrets. Sarah, unable to sleep, wandered downstairs, drawn by an inexplicable force. The ancient floorboards groaned beneath her feet as she entered the living room, illuminated only by the occasional flash of lightning. There, in the faint glow of the storm, she saw them the spectral figures of the Jenkins family. Their hollow eyes bore into her soul, their mouths agape as if trying to convey an unspeakable truth. Terrified, Sarah stumbled backward, her heart pounding against her ribcage. She called out for Alex, but her voice seemed to get lost in the ominous symphony of the storm. Shadows danced wildly on the walls and a bone-chilling coldness seeped into the room. Suddenly, the apparitions vanished, leaving Sarah paralyzed with fear. And then she heard it, a mournful wail emanating from the depths of the house, a sound that echoed the agony of souls long tormented. In a panic, Sarah raced upstairs to find Alex, but the house seemed to twist and turn, its corridors morphing into a labyrinth of terror. She couldn't recognize her surroundings. The walls seemed to breathe, the air thick with malevolence. Finally, she reached their bedroom, but Alex was nowhere to be found. Instead, in the corner stood a spectral silhouette, a distorted figure clad in tattered remnants of old clothing, its features obscured by darkness. Sarah's heart raced as she recognized the figure from faded newspaper clippings as Mr. Jenkins himself. 
In that fleeting moment before the apparition lunged forward with a blood-curdling shriek, Sarah understood the dreadful truth. The house was a vessel for the vengeful spirits of the Jenkins family, forever trapped within its cursed walls, hungering for retribution against any who dared to call it home. The storm raged on, and Elmwood fell into in silence, the legend of the cursed suburban home claiming yet another victim. Frozen in terror, Sarah stood face to face with the apparition of Mr. Jenkins. His hollow eyes bore into hers, sending a cold sweat down her back. Every nerve in her body screamed for escape, but the room seemed to warp and contort, trapping her within its nightmarish embrace. Who? What are you? Sarah managed to stammer, her voice quivering with fear. The figure wreathed in darkness let out a haunting wail that reverberated through the house, causing the walls to shudder and the floor to tremble beneath Sarah's feet. You should not have come here, the spectral voice echoed filled with agony and bitterness. This house, cursed by our suffering, we will not allow anyone to claim it as their own. Sarah's mind raced, searching for an escape route, but the layout of the house seemed to shift and twist, defying logic. She felt a chilling presence closing in on her, the air thick with an otherworldly chill. Desperate, Sarah clutched onto a fragment of courage. Please, we didn't know. We'll leave. Just let us go. But the figure remained unmoved, its ghostly visage contorted in anguish. You can't leave. None do. The curse binds us here. As Sarah edged backward, her trembling fingers brushed against an old ornate mirror hanging on the wall. Its surface seemed to ripple like water, revealing fleeting glimpses of tortured souls within its depths. Driven by panic, she reached out to touch the mirror, hoping against hope for an escape. Instead, her fingers sank into its surface, sending ripples cascading across its dark reflection. A ghastly force seized hold of Sarah, pulling her into the mirror's abyss. She screamed, her voice drowned by the cacophony of tormented whispers emanating from within. In an instant, Sarah found herself suspended in a realm between worlds. Shadows danced around her, each one a trapped soul, their anguished faces etched with tales of horror and despair. She struggled against the spectral hands that grasped at her, pulling her further into the mirrored abyss. But the more she fought, the tighter their grip became, threatening to consume her very essence. Back in the physical realm, the storm outside reached its crescendo its fury mirroring the chaos within the cursed house. Lightning tore through the sky, illuminating the darkened windows as if nature itself recoiled from the malevolent energy within. Neighbors peered out from behind curtains, sensing an inexplicable disturbance, but fear rooted them to their homes. The haunting cries and unearthly wails that emanated from the Jenkins house, warning them to stay away. Inside the house, the spectral presence tightened its hold on Sarah, dragging her deeper into the mirror's twisted reality. She felt herself slipping away, consumed by the darkness closing in around her. Then, in one final burst of terror, Sarah vanished into the depths of the mirror, her anguished cries fading into the night. The storm gradually subsided, leaving Elmwood shrouded in an unsettling calm. The Jenkins house stood in silence once more, its cursed legacy claiming yet another victim condemning Sarah to an eternity trapped within its malevolent embrace. And so, the legend of the cursed suburban home persisted, a cautionary tale whispered among Elmwood's residents, warning them of the unfathomable horrors lurking within its haunted walls. Story 2. Nestled amidst fog-laden moors stood the Weatherby Manor, its silhouette looming against the haunting landscape. A place of grandeur turned desolate, the manor was a secluded haven for the peculiar and the unexplained. Stories whispered among the locals spoke of the van der Haas family, who vanished mysteriously on a stormy night, leaving the manor to decay in solitude. The legend woven around Weatherby Manor was one of chilling intrigue. It was said that the spirits of the van der Haas family still roamed its halls, seeking solace for their untimely demise. Tales were spun about unexplained echoes, phantom footsteps, and spectral apparitions that danced in the mist that perpetually enshrouded the manor. Despite the ominous reputation, a group of paranormal enthusiasts sought refuge within the decaying walls of Weatherby. Among them was Dr. Emily Harper, a skeptic famed for her rational explanations of supernatural phenomena. Determined to debunk the myths surrounding the manor, Emily led her team into the heart of the mist-shrouded estate. 
As the day succumbed to the embrace of twilight, the manor's atmosphere thickened, a sense of darkness settling upon the group. Doors creaked open of their own accord, casting elongated shadows across the ornate halls, and whispers barely discernible echoed through the emptiness. Undeterred, Emily and her team pressed on, setting up equipment to capture any semblance of spectral activity. However, as night descended, the manor awakened, and the line between reality and the supernatural began to blur. The once forgotten whispers grew louder, manifesting into desperate pleas for release. Shadows danced upon the walls, taking shape as ethereal figures that drifted through the mist-filled corridors. Each step reverberated with echoes of the past, carrying the sorrowful lament of the van der Haas family. Emily, skeptical yet unnerved by the palpable tension, delved deeper into the manor's mysteries. Her team on edge witnessed apparitions materialize before their eyes, their translucent forms hauntingly vivid in the moonlit haze. As the clock struck midnight, a tempest encircled the manor, unleashing an unearthly symphony. Thunder roared in harmony with ghostly wails, and lightning illuminated the once opulent halls, revealing twisted portraits and shattered remnants of forgotten splendor. Emily's rational facade began to crumble in the face of the inexplicable. The spectral energy surged, as if demanding acknowledgement of the tragic fate that befell the van der Haas family. In the heart of Weatherby Manor, Emily stumbled upon an ancient journal, its pages yellowed with age. The fading ink unveiled the family's plight, a tale of betrayal and unresolved anguish. Desperate for closure, the spirits yearned for the truth to be revealed. A chilling realization dawned upon Emily. The manor wasn't merely haunted by spirits, but shackled by the unresolved grievances of the van der Haas family. Determined to grant them peace, Emily uncovered the hidden truth buried within the journal's pages. With trembling hands, she unveiled the long-buried secret, speaking the words that echoed across the ethereal realm. As the truth emerged from the depths of the manor's silence, the spirit's anguish transformed into serene whispers dissipating into the misty night. With a solemn calm settling over the manor, Emily and her team retreated, leaving Weatherby behind, its secrets finally laid to rest. Yet, as they departed, a soft whisper lingered in the wind, a silent gratitude from the freed spirits, their legacy fading into the mists that veiled the secluded manor. Emily and her team, the weight of the manor's secrets heavy on their shoulders, retreated into the night, the image of the spectral figures etched vividly in their minds. As they left the estate, the fog seemed to part, allowing a sliver of moonlight to pierce through the dense mist, illuminating their path back to civilization. Days passed and Emily couldn't shake off the haunting memories of Weatherby Manor. Despite her skepticism being tested, she found herself drawn to the enigma that surrounded the estate. Determined to delve deeper into the history of the van der Haas family, she embarked on a quest for answers. Her research led her to archives and forgotten manuscripts, uncovering the story behind the mysterious disappearance of the van der Haas lineage. Emily's obsession with unveiling the truth intensified, driving her back to Weatherby, accompanied by a newfound resolve. Returning to the manor, she found the mist had retreated, revealing the aging grandeur of the estate beneath the clearing skies. Armed with the revelations from her research, Emily stepped back into the halls haunted by the tormented spirits of the past. As she ventured deeper, the manor seemed to respond to her presence. Shadows waltzed across the walls, whispers echoed through the corridors, guiding her towards the heart of the mystery. In a forgotten chamber, obscured by layers of dust and neglect, Emily uncovered a hidden alcove. Within it lay a cache of long-forgotten artifacts, a trove of heirlooms, each holding a piece of the van der Haas family's tragic history. Among the relics, Emily stumbled upon an ornate locket, its surface etched with intricate designs. Opening it revealed a faded portrait, a depiction of a young girl, the last remaining heir of the van der Haas lineage. The realization struck Emily like lightning. She had unraveled the tragic tale that had haunted the manor for decades. The family's disappearance was a result of betrayal and deceit orchestrated by those they once trusted. Driven by a sense of duty, Emily sought to put the spirits to rest. Armed with the truth, she retraced her steps through the manor, the artifacts in hand, intending to offer closure to the lingering souls. As she reached the heart of Weatherby Manor, 
A profound silence enveloped the estate. The air, once filled with whispers, hung heavy with anticipation. Emily held the artifacts aloft, sharing the lost family's tale, every word a tribute to their untold suffering. In a mesmerizing spectacle, the spirits materialized before her, their ethereal forms radiant yet sorrowful. They listened intently as Emily recounted their tragic legacy, their eyes reflecting gratitude for finally having their story heard. With a gentle nod, the spectral figures dissipated into a radiant mist, vanishing into the ether. A serene calm settled over the manor, the oppressive atmosphere replaced by a sense of closure. Emily stood amidst the fading echoes of the spirits, a bittersweet satisfaction filling her heart. As she exited the manor once more, she felt a lightness in the air. The oppressive shroud lifted, leaving behind a legacy of peace and redemption. Weatherby Manor, no longer a haven for restless spirits, stood as a testament to the power of truth and empathy, its secrets finally laid to rest within the mists that veiled its history. And Emily, forever changed by the experience, carried the echoes of the Van der Haas family's tragic tale as a testament to their memory. Story 3 Nestled deep within the sprawling countryside stood an imposing structure known as the Sanctuary of Echoing Whispers. Once a refuge for troubled souls seeking solace, the sanctuary had now become a haunting edifice, steeped in the lingering agony of its past inhabitants. The sanctuary's history was fraught with tragedy, a tapestry woven from the tales of lost souls and unresolved fates. Legends whispered of a myriad of tormented spirits, their anguished echoes reverberating through the halls, begging for absolution. Dr. Sophia Carter, a renowned psychologist with an unwavering belief in rationality, was intrigued by the legends surrounding the sanctuary. Drawn to uncover the truth behind the haunting whispers, she embarked on a journey to delve into the depths of the enigmatic structure. Accompanied by a team of scholars and researchers, Sophia ventured into the heart of the sanctuary, its towering walls bearing silent witness to the anguish trapped within. As they traversed the echoing corridors, each step seemed to awaken the spirits, their fragmented cries echoing through the stone walls. The atmosphere grew dense with sorrow, and shadows danced eerily amidst the flickering candlelight. Sophia's skepticism wavered as inexplicable phenomena manifested before her eyes. Objects moved of their own accord, and whispers echoed tales of past sorrows. Despite the unsettling occurrences, Sophia pressed on driven by a determination to unearth the truth hidden within the sanctuary's haunted embrace. Her team, both intrigued and unnerved, observed the unfolding events with a mix of fascination and trepidation. In a chamber veiled in perpetual darkness, Sophia stumbled upon an ancient tome, its weathered pages bound in faded leather. The cryptic writings chronicled the tragic tales of the sanctuary's residents, each soul scarred by unfulfilled desires and unresolved regrets. As Sophia deciphered the cryptic accounts, a sense of empathy welled within her. She realized that the tormented spirits longed for acknowledgement and closure, their echoes a plea for redemption. In a resolute gesture, Sophia gathered her team and began a solemn ritual, an offering of understanding and compassion to the restless souls that haunted the sanctuary's halls. With each word spoken, she sought to unravel the tangled web of anguish that bound the spirits to their unresolved pasts. In a mesmerizing spectacle, the chamber filled with a haunting symphony of whispers, a cacophony of long-suppressed emotions surfacing from the depths of the sanctuary's history. Shadows coalesced into spectral forms, their faces etched with a mixture of despair and hope. Sophia, guided by an unspoken connection, spoke words of empathy and absolution. She shared their sorrows, acknowledging their pain, and offering a semblance of closure to the tormented souls that lingered within the sanctuary's confines. As the ritual reached its crescendo, a profound silence descended upon the chamber. The spectral figures, their ethereal forms radiant yet serene, acknowledged Sophia's compassion. With a tranquil nod, they dissipated into shimmering wisps of light, vanishing into the ethereal realms. A serene calm settled over the sanctuary, the oppressive atmosphere replaced by a sense of peace. Sophia and her team stood amidst the fading echoes of the spirits, a newfound reverence for the power of empathy and understanding filling their hearts. 
As they departed the sanctuary, Sophia carried with her the echoes of the tormented souls, their tales now etched into the annals of history as a testament to the sanctuary's transformation, from a haven of despair to a sanctuary of redemption. And in the silence that followed, the whispers of gratitude lingered in the air, a gentle reminder of the healing power of empathy and closure. Having facilitated the spectral release within the sanctuary of echoing whispers, Dr. Sophia Carter and her team emerged from the ancient halls, carrying with them an indelible sense of accomplishment and awe. The sanctuary, once steeped in spectral anguish, now exuded an aura of tranquility, as if the very essence of the place had been cleansed of its haunting afflictions. As they made their way back to the world beyond the sanctuary's walls, Sophia couldn't shake off the weight of the experience. The echoes of the tormented spirits lingered in her mind, their stories interwoven with her own, leaving an undeniable mark on her soul. Despite the passing days, Sophia found herself drawn back to the sanctuary in her thoughts, haunted by the unresolved stories she had encountered within its enigmatic confines. Her nights were restless, filled with fragmented whispers that echoed the agonies of the spirits she had encountered. Driven by an insatiable curiosity and a profound sense of responsibility, Sophia embarked on an arduous journey of research and introspection. She pored over ancient texts and delved into the annals of history, determined to unravel the untold tales of those who sought refuge within the sanctuary's walls. Her quest for understanding led her to disparate sources, forgotten manuscripts, cryptic artifacts, and the fading memories of the elderly townsfolk. With each revelation, Sophia uncovered the interconnected lives of the souls that had once sought solace within the sanctuary. The deeper she delved, the more she came to understand the intricacies of their sorrows, the heartaches, betrayals, and unfulfilled aspirations that had trapped these spirits within the sanctuary's spectral embrace. Driven by empathy and a sense of duty, Sophia sought to memorialize the stories of the sanctuary's former inhabitants. She meticulously documented their lives, weaving together the fragmented echoes of the past into a tapestry of empathy and remembrance. Months passed, and Sophia, consumed by her endeavor, found herself drawn back to the sanctuary. Armed with the culmination of her research, she returned, accompanied by historians, preservationists, and artists, all dedicated to honoring the legacy of the sanctuary and its spectral residents. Together, they breathed new life into the old halls, transforming them into a living memorial, a sanctuary museum that recounted the tales of the past inhabitants. The walls bore witness to the lives once lived, adorned with artifacts and exhibits that chronicled the experiences of the tormented souls. As the museum took shape, visitors from far and wide were drawn to the sanctuary. They walked its hallowed halls, immersed themselves in the narratives of those who had found solace within its walls, and learned the importance of empathy and understanding in the face of profound suffering. Sophia, standing amidst the sanctuary-turned-museum, felt a sense of closure. The whispers that had once haunted her nights now resonated as poignant echoes of remembrance and appreciation. The spirits, no longer trapped in a realm of anguish, seemed to hover in the periphery, their presence a silent testament to the transformative power of empathy. The sanctuary of echoing whispers had transitioned from a forgotten haven of despair to a revered sanctuary of remembrance, a place where the echoes of past sorrows were heard, understood, and immortalized for generations to come. And as Sophia gazed upon the tranquility that now enveloped the sanctuary, she felt a profound sense of peace, knowing that the echoes of the tormented souls had found a place of honor and repose. Story 4. Shrouded in mist and veiled by the passage of time, the forgotten asylum stood as a haunting relic of the past. Its crumbling walls whispered forgotten tales of the lost souls who once sought refuge within its halls. Legends spoke of the asylum's enigmatic history, a haven turned prison for the afflicted, a sanctuary now consumed by spectral echoes. Dr. Thomas Harding, a psychologist known for his empathy and unwavering dedication, harbored a deep fascination with the stories surrounding the forgotten asylum. Driven by a desire to understand the obscured narratives, he embarked on a journey to unearth the untold truths buried within its walls. Accompanied by a team of researchers and historians, Thomas ventured into the depths of the dilapidated asylum, its decaying corridors resonating with the lingering whispers of the past. Shadows danced in the dimly lit hallways, 
and the air hung heavy with a palpable sense of despair. Despite the ominous ambience, Thomas pressed forward, determined to uncover the mysteries that had cloaked the asylum in a veil of haunting enigma. His team, a mix of trepidation and curiosity, followed as they navigated through the dark chambers. In an abandoned library covered in layers of dust and neglect, Thomas stumbled upon a collection of journals, tattered remnants of the asylum's forgotten history. The faded pages chronicled the lives of the afflicted, their struggles, fears, and the profound injustices they endured within the asylum's confines. As Thomas pored over the journals, a sense of empathy surged within him. He realized that the tormented souls yearned to have their stories acknowledged and validated, to be liberated from the shadows that had imprisoned their existence. Driven by compassion and a quest for redemption, Thomas gathered his team and embarked on a solemn mission, a ritual of understanding and acknowledgement aimed at providing solace to the lingering spirits trapped within the asylum's spectral embrace. In a chamber steeped in darkness, Thomas initiated the ritual, invoking words of empathy and remembrance for the forgotten souls. As he spoke, the atmosphere trembled with a profound energy, as if the very essence of the asylum responded to the collective plea for redemption. Spectral forms materialized, their ethereal presence a poignant reflection of the anguish and despair they had endured. Their eyes, brimming with emotions long suppressed, met Thomas's gaze, yearning for absolution. In a reverent gesture, Thomas acknowledged their suffering, speaking words of empathy and understanding. He shared their pain, acknowledging the injustices they had faced, and offered a semblance of closure to the tormented souls that lingered within the asylum's desolate chambers. As the ritual reached its apex, a serene calm descended upon the chamber. The spectral figures, their ethereal forms radiant yet solemn, acknowledged Thomas's compassion. With a tranquil nod, they dissipated into shimmering wisps of light, ascending towards an ethereal realm. A profound silence enveloped the forgotten asylum, the oppressive atmosphere replaced by a sense of peace. Thomas and his team stood amidst the fading echoes of the spirits, a newfound reverence for the power of empathy and understanding filling their hearts. As they departed the asylum, Thomas carried with him the echoes of the tormented souls, their stories etched into his soul as a testament to their memory. And in the silence that followed, the whispers of gratitude lingered in the air. After the solemn ritual at the forgotten asylum, Dr. Thomas Harding found himself haunted by the memories of the spectral encounter. The echoes of the tormented souls lingered in his thoughts, their tales intertwining with his own, leaving an indelible mark on his soul. Driven by an insatiable curiosity and a profound sense of responsibility, Thomas delved deeper into the forgotten history of the asylum. Nights turned into days as he pored over ancient archives, meticulously piecing together the fragmented narratives of the afflicted souls. His relentless pursuit of understanding led him to forgotten manuscripts, cryptic artifacts and fading recollections from the few surviving town elders. With each revelation, Thomas unraveled the intertwined lives of those who had sought refuge within the asylum's walls. The deeper he delved, the more he comprehended the intricacies of their sorrows, the traumas, injustices, and the unbearable weight of societal ignorance that had confined these spirits within the asylum's spectral embrace. Empathy and a sense of duty guided Thomas's quest to provide closure to the tormented souls. He meticulously documented their lives, crafting a narrative that honored their existence, a testament to the forgotten and misunderstood. Months passed and Thomas, consumed by his endeavor, returned to the asylum. Accompanied by historians, preservationists, and artists, he aimed to transform the dilapidated asylum into a memorial, a sanctuary of remembrance for the afflicted souls. Together, they breathed new life into the abandoned halls, transforming them into a living museum, a repository of the forgotten stories, adorned with artifacts and exhibits that chronicled the lives of the tormented souls. As the museum took shape, visitors from far and wide were drawn to the asylum. They walked its hallowed halls, immersed themselves in the narratives of those who had found refuge within its walls, and learned the importance of empathy and understanding in the face of profound suffering. Thomas, standing amidst the transformed asylum-turned-museum, felt a sense of closure. The whispers that had once haunted him now resonated as poignant echoes of remembrance and appreciation. The spirits, 
no longer trapped in a realm of anguish, seem to hover in the periphery, their presence a silent testament to the transformative power of empathy. The forgotten asylum had transitioned from a haunting symbol of despair to a revered sanctuary of remembrance, a place where the echoes of forgotten souls were heard, understood, and immortalized for generations to come. As Thomas gazed upon the tranquil asylum, now a haven of redemption and empathy, he felt a profound sense of peace, knowing that the echoes of the tormented souls had found a place of honor and solace. And in the serenity that followed, the whispers of gratitude lingered in the air, a gentle reminder of the healing power of empathy and remembrance. Hello, everyone. Just wanted to say how thrilled and deeply grateful to each of you for being a part of our journey. Your unwavering support and enthusiasm have propelled our community to nearly 400 subscribers, and I couldn't be more thankful. Thank you for believing in this channel, sharing your thoughts, and being the incredible individuals you are. On that note, let's get into the stories. Story 1. In a small, picturesque town nestled amid verdant landscapes, a peculiar urban legend shrouded the tale of Dr. Jacob Fairchild. Decades ago, Dr. Fairchild, a respected physician and scientist, was renowned for his radical theories in regenerative medicine and life extension. His controversial research delved into the realms of cellular regeneration and biological resurrection. As the town's folkloric tales would have it, Dr. Fairchild's ambitious pursuits led to secretive experiments in his secluded mansion on the outskirts of town. Stories whispered of peculiar lights emanating from the mansion at odd hours, unsettling rumors of disquieting screams echoing through the night, and sightings of shadowy figures roaming the property. Emily Carter, an inquisitive journalist with a penchant for uncovering the truth behind local legends, found herself entangled in the enigma of Dr. Fairchild's legacy. Her journalistic instincts piqued by the macabre tales, she delved into the archives, unearthing faded newspaper clippings and scattered testimonials that chronicled Dr. Fairchild's mysterious disappearance. The more Emily investigated, the deeper she delved into the physician's unorthodox theories. His belief in the possibility of regenerating life beyond its natural course became the cornerstone of his research, an ambition that led to his eventual fall from grace and disappearance under suspicious circumstances. Driven by an insatiable curiosity, Emily sought to demystify the legend and uncover the truth behind Dr. Fairchild's experiments. She traversed the town, piecing together fragmented accounts from elderly residents and stumbling upon hidden journals and discarded lab notes that hinted at the scientists' radical pursuits. Armed with compelling evidence and a thirst for the truth, Emily journeyed to the outskirts of town, where Dr. Fairchild's secluded mansion stood an imposing structure shrouded in overgrown foliage and mystic silence. As she approached the decaying mansion, a disquiet sense of unease settled upon her. The dilapidated facade exuded an air of desolation, its shattered windows and weathered doors a testament to the passage of time. The overgrown garden rustled with whispers of forgotten secrets, and a sense of being watched by unseen eyes lingered in the air. Undeterred by the ominous ambience, Emily ventured into the decaying mansion, guided by flickering rays of sunlight that filtered through the broken windows. The interior lay in disarray, a dilapidated laboratory adorned with arcane contraptions, vials of murky liquids, and discarded scientific apparatuses. As Emily explored the forsaken laboratory, she unearthed traces of Dr. Fairchild's ambitious experiments esoteric journals and scattered notations detailing his relentless pursuit of defying mortality and resurrecting life from the brink of death. Her investigation led her deeper into the mansion's depths, where she stumbled upon a concealed chamber, veiled in shadows and obscured by a sense of unease. The chamber, adorned with strange symbols and archaic diagrams, harbored a scary energy. In the heart of the chamber lay an ominous contraption, a colossal apparatus surrounded by intricately designed machinery and a mystic hum that reverberated through the air. At its center, an ominous pedestal housed an ancient-looking book, adorned with cryptic writings and faded illustrations. Drawn to the mysterious tome, Emily approached cautiously, her fingers tracing the weathered pages that chronicled Dr. Fairchild's radical experiments in resurrection and cellular reanimation. 
The pages hinted at a ghastly process, a method to harness the essence of life and rekindle it within the confines of death. As she perused the ominous pages, a sudden surge of dark energy engulfed the chamber. Shadows coalesced, twisting and contorting into sinister shapes that danced across the walls, a haunting manifestation that seemed to echo the forbidden experiments once conducted within the mansion's walls. In a heart-stopping revelation, Emily sensed a presence, a spectral echo that emanated from the unearthly apparatus. The ghostly remnants of Dr. Fairchild's relentless pursuit lingered within the chamber an ethereal essence bound by an insatiable thirst for knowledge and the dark secrets of resurrection. In a horrifying crescendo, the spectral presence surged forth, a maelstrom of unearthly energies that enveloped Emily in a suffocating grip. She recoiled in terror, realizing the sinister truth. The mansion harbored remnants of an unholy experiment gone awry, an eerie echo of Dr. Fairchild's ambitious but macabre pursuits with a blood-curdling scream, Emily was ensnared within the spectral vortex, a fate sealed by the unnerving echoes of resurrection, condemning her to an eternal dance amidst the shadows of Dr. Fairchild's relentless experimentations. As the night settled over the desolate mansion, a stillness pervaded the atmosphere. Emily Carter's disappearance became yet another unsolved mystery a harrowing testament to the dangerous pursuit of forbidden knowledge and the perils that lurked within the unexplored realms of the unknown. Story 2. In the heart of an old town nestled amidst rolling hills and lush forests lay a weathered cemetery known as Oakwood Rest. Among the rows of faded tombstones stood one solitary monument that captured the town's dark lore, a tombstone marked by the name Edgar Hawthorne. Edgar's grave bore the weight of a dark legend that echoed through generations. Tales spoke of Edgar as a recluse, an eccentric man of mystery who lived on the outskirts of town. His enigmatic life ended in tragedy, leading to a local belief that his restless spirit haunted the cemetery. The tombstone stood weather-beaten, its engravings faded by time. Locals recounted spine-chilling anecdotes of whispers heard around the grave, flickering lights at twilight and an inexplicable sense of being watched by unseen eyes. Alicia Richards, a young investigative journalist with an intrigue for local legends, stumbled upon the curious lore of Edgar Hawthorne's tombstone. Driven by her passion for uncovering truth amidst folklore, she set out to unravel the mysteries shrouding Oakwood Rest. Researching archives and interviewing elderly residents, Alicia pieced together the fragments of Edgar's life, a once prominent figure in the town, known for his reclusive nature and fascination with the occult. With each revelation, the lines between fact and legend blurred. Some accounts painted Edgar as an enigmatic but misunderstood figure, while others perpetuated the belief in his haunting presence. Alicia's pursuit led her to the cemetery, determined to uncover the truth behind the mysterious tombstone. As she ventured through Oakwood Rest, a haunting ambience enveloped her. The rustling leaves, the creaking of old trees, and the distant howls of nocturnal creatures set an uncanny backdrop for her investigation. The tombstone loomed ahead weathered but undeniably imposing. Alicia meticulously examined the inscription, tracing the faded letters etched into the stone. A gust of wind whispered through the trees, causing the hair on her neck to stand on end. The tombstone remained silent, seemingly void of any spectral presence. As night fell and shadows stretched across the cemetery, Alicia felt an unsettling chill. Her flashlight flickered, casting elongated shadows that danced among the gravestones. A sensation of being watched lingered, and a faint voice seemed to whisper on the wind, sending shivers down her spine. Intent on unraveling the truth, Alicia lingered by the tombstone, her determination clouded by a sense of worry. Suddenly, a strange sensation gripped her, and the ground beneath her feet quivered. A low, guttural sound emanated from the earth, a sinister vibration that resonated through the cemetery. Alicia stumbled back, her heart racing, as the ground near Edgar Hawthorne's tombstone began to crack and split open. In a horrifying turn of events, skeletal fingers emerged from the earth, clawing their way into the moonlit night. Alicia's shock turned to terror as the ground continued to rupture, revealing a ghastly sight. A decrepit skeletal figure adorned in tattered remnants of clothing, rising from the grave. Horror seized Alicia as she witnessed the unearthly spectacle. 
The figure resembling the remains of a long-deceased man staggered from the grave, its empty eye sockets fixated on her. A silent scream lodged in Alicia's throat as the revenant stumbled toward her with an unnatural jerking gait. In a heart-stopping moment, the ghastly specter extended its bony hand toward Alicia, as if beckoning her to join him in the realm of the dead. Paralyzed by fear, she could only watch in terror as the revenant drew closer, the air thick with a putrid stench of decay. The horrifying encounter sent Alicia reeling backward, scrambling away in sheer panic. With adrenaline-fueled desperation, she managed to break free from the ghastly apparition's reach, fleeing the cemetery in terror. As she stumbled out into the safety of the moonlit streets, the echoes of her racing heart drowned out the haunting cries that lingered behind her. The encounter with the revenant at Edgar Hawthorne's tombstone became a haunting tale etched into Alicia's memory, a spine-chilling testament to the depths of Oakwood Rest's enduring legend. Story 3. Nestled within the heart of Greenridge Town, cloaked in a serenity that contrasted the bustling streets lay the silent grounds a cemetery steeped in history and adorned with weathered gravestones that bore witness to the passage of time. Legends whispered of a silent guardian, a figure veiled in mystery, watching over the hallowed grounds. For decades, tales had circulated among the townsfolk, weaving the enigmatic narrative of the guardian. Stories depicted the figure as a silent sentinel, a solitary presence that prowled the cemetery's pathways under the moon's pale light a protector of the sanctity of the resting souls. Amongst the local populace, Emma Hayes, a young librarian with an insatiable curiosity for the town's folklore, found herself drawn to the mysterious tales surrounding the silent grounds and its elusive guardian. Her fascination led her to delve into the annals of history, uncovering fragments of forgotten lore that hinted at the guardian's existence. As Emma delved deeper into the town's archives, she unearthed tales dating back centuries, accounts of an enigmatic figure cloaked in darkness, whose silent vigilance over the silent grounds was a testament to an unspoken oath to protect the graves from desecration. Driven by a thirst for unraveling the truth behind the legends, Emma embarked on nocturnal expeditions to the silent grounds, each visit tinged with a curious blend of trepidation and fascination. She wandered through the labyrinthine paths, tracing her fingers over the time-worn epitaphs that adorned the crumbling gravestones. Amidst the moonlit silence, Emma felt a peculiar sensation, a subtle shift in the atmosphere that hinted at an unseen presence. Shadows flickered at the corner of her vision, teasing her senses with an ephemeral dance that vanished upon closer scrutiny. Undeterred by the elusive nature of her pursuit, Emma ventured deeper into the cemetery's depths, a peculiar sense of being watched tugging at her consciousness. Her steps echoed amidst the sepulchral silence, each footfall seemingly resonating with the untold stories buried within the silent grounds. On one fateful night, as Emma wandered the cemetery's pathways, a solemn stillness settled over the grounds. The air grew heavy with a palpable tension and an inexplicable scent shivers down her spine. A whisper of movement caught her attention a fleeting shadow that seemed to glide among the gravestones. Emma's heart quickened its pace as she followed the elusive silhouette, an amalgamation of fear and intrigue propelling her forward. Through the mist-draped alleys, she glimpsed the outline of a figure, a solitary sentinel shrouded in darkness, standing vigil over the resting souls. With bated breath, Emma approached the figure, an unspoken curiosity overriding her trepidation. The guardian stood motionless, a silent silhouette amid the moon's ethereal glow, exuding an air of somber authority that sent a coldness down Emma's spine. As she drew closer, the Guardian's features remained veiled in shadow, an enigmatic presence emanating an aura of ancient wisdom and unwavering resolve. The moonlight cast an odd luminescence upon the figure, lending an otherworldly quality to the scene. In a daring move, Emma attempted to address the Guardian, her voice quivering as she sought answers to the age-old mysteries that shrouded the silent grounds. Yet her words dissipated into the night, met with a profound silence from the stoic figure. A sudden gust of wind rustled through the trees, carrying with it an ominous whisper that seemed to echo from the guardian itself. Emma's heart raced as a sense of impending doom clouded her thoughts, a realization that she had trespassed upon an ancient sanctum guarded by an entity beyond mortal comprehension. In a haunting climax, the Guardian's shadowy form began to shimmer, 
a spectral metamorphosis that defied explanation. Emma's breath caught in her throat as the figure dissolved into wisps of darkness, an unsettling manifestation that sent a surge of terror coursing through her veins. With an abnormal howl that pierced the night, the Guardian's ephemeral form dissipated into the ether, leaving Emma trembling in its wake, a witness to the fleeting apparition that guarded the silent grounds. The encounter left an indelible mark, etching the enigmatic Guardian's presence into the annals of the Silent Ground's enduring legend. Story 4 In the outskirts of Ashford Valley, nestled amidst a dense thicket of ancient oaks and veiled by the passage of time, lay an unassuming clearing, a place long forgotten by the town's inhabitants. Within this tranquil glade stood a forgotten burial ground, its gravestones weathered by years of neglect, bearing silent witness to an untold history. The tales woven around this burial ground were shrouded in mystery. Whispers of a forgotten chapter in Ashford Valley's past. Tales of an abandoned cemetery where those from eras long past found their eternal repose. Overgrown with ivy and embraced by the encroaching wilderness, the burial ground remained an enigmatic relic, a testament to the forgotten souls resting beneath its soil. Among the curious souls drawn to the town's lore was Adam Turner, an earnest historian whose fascination with untold stories led him to unravel the secrets veiled by the veil of time. Adam's quest for the forgotten burial ground's history led him to delve deep into dusty archives and tattered manuscripts, seeking fragments of a past obscured by neglect. As Adam unearthed obscure accounts and forgotten narratives, he pieced together the burial ground's faded legacy, an integral part of Ashford Valley's history erased by the passage of time. The burial ground, once a revered site for the town's early settlers, had fallen into obscurity, forgotten amidst the progress of modernity. Driven by an insatiable desire to resurrect the burial ground's forgotten history, Adam ventured into the forgotten clearing, a quiet oasis hidden away from the bustling town. The burial ground lay in disrepair, its gravestones marred by moss and neglect, a testament to the passage of time that had consigned the site to oblivion. Adam, armed with reverence and a sense of duty, navigated the overgrown paths, tracing his fingers over the weathered gravestones that bore the faded names of those who had long departed. Each inscription held a tale, an echo of a life once lived now relegated to the annals of forgotten memory. As the afternoon sun waned, casting elongated shadows across the burial ground, Adam felt an inexplicable sense of unease, and bizarre sensation that stirred the air as if the voices of the departed echoed through the silent glade. Yet his fascination with uncovering the burial ground's hidden history urged him to press forward. Amidst the fading light, Adam stumbled upon a dilapidated crypt, its stone facade adorned with intricate carvings that spoke of an era long past. An air of melancholy hung around the crypt, and a haunting silence pervaded its surroundings. An unsettling aura that hinted at buried secrets waiting to resurface. Driven by an unyielding curiosity, Adam approached the crypt, his footsteps echoing in the stillness of the clearing. A sense of darkness settled upon him, the weight of forgotten histories tugging at his conscience, urging him to unearth the buried truths obscured by time's veil. With trembling hands, Adam brushed aside the encroaching vines that obscured the crypt's entrance, revealing the yawning darkness within. The crypt's interior exuded an oppressive atmosphere, an unnerving silence that resonated with the weight of untold stories entombed within its walls. As Adam stepped into the crypt's depths, an inexplicable cold enveloped him, a sensation that clawed at his senses, hinting at an unseen presence that lingered in the shadows. A faint whisper echoed through the crypt, a haunting murmuring that seemed to reverberate from the forgotten souls resting within. Suddenly, a sepulchral groan emanated from the crypt's depths, a guttural sound that shattered the silence, sending shivers down Adam's spine. The air thickened with an unsettling energy, and a sense of imminent dread coiled around him, binding him within the crypt's suffocating embrace. In a heart-stopping moment, the shadows coalesced into spectral forms, ethereal remnants of the forgotten souls rising from their eternal slumber. Their ghostly apparitions clad in tattered remnants of an era long past, drifted towards Adam with spectral grace, their hollow eyes fixated upon him. With a blood-curdling realization, Adam found himself ensnared in a spectral congregation, an unearthly assembly of souls forgotten by time, 
The apparitions encircled him with a haunting reverence, their ghastly visages evoking an unspoken tragedy, an eternity spent in the purgatory of obscurity. In a mystic climax, the apparitions reached out to Adam, their spectral hands grasping for his mortal essence, a harrowing attempt to draw him into their spectral realm, condemning him to an eternity of forgotten torment. With a primal scream, Adam struggled against the spectral grasp, fighting to break free from the unearthly embrace that threatened to claim him. His frantic attempts to escape were met with an overpowering force, an inevitable descent into the abyss of forgotten souls. As the night descended upon the burial ground, a haunting silence settled over the crypt, a testament to the enigmatic allure of forgotten histories that lingered within its depths. Adam Turner's disappearance became yet another unsolved mystery, a true testament to the perils that awaited those who dared to unearth the buried echoes of the past. Story 5. In the serene outskirts of Cedarwood Village lay an old abandoned cemetery known for its unmarked graves a peculiar testament to forgotten souls who found their eternal rest amidst the veil of obscurity. The cemetery, with its weathered tombstones and unmarked plots, was a place shrouded in silent mysteries. Tales whispered among the villagers spoke of an ancient curse that plagued the unmarked graves, a solemn reminder of an era obscured by the sands of time. The absence of identifiable markings rendered the graves a haunting enigma, a silent chorus of forgotten stories etched into the soil awaiting discovery. Amongst the curious inhabitants drawn to the village's enigmatic history was Sarah Collins, a young historian with a fervent passion for unraveling forgotten narratives. Sarah's fascination led her to delve into the village archives, seeking fragments of a past veiled by neglect and abandoned recollections. As Sarah sifted through dusty records and faded documents, she pieced together fragments of the cemetery's obscured history a once revered burial ground overshadowed by an ancient curse. The unmarked graves bore testimony to an unresolved tragedy, a legacy of silent echoes waiting to be unearthed. Driven by an insatiable curiosity, Sarah ventured into the abandoned cemetery, a hallowed ground nestled within the embrace of time-worn trees. The atmosphere was heavy with a sepulchral silence, and an inexplicable feeling lingered in the air as if the whispers of the forgotten souls echoed through the dilapidated gravestones. Amidst the overgrown foliage and decrepit tombstones, Sarah traced her fingers over the weathered engravings, hoping to discern clues that might unveil the stories hidden within the unmarked graves. Each unmarked plot carried an air of solemn mystery, a silent testament to lives obscured by the passage of time. As the daylight waned and shadows danced across the cemetery, Sarah felt a palpable unease, a spectral presence that seemed to stir amidst the forgotten graves. The absence of identifiable markers seemed to intensify the freakish ambience, hinting at stories yearning to be remembered. Undeterred by the foreboding atmosphere, Sarah continued her exploration, guided by an unwavering determination to unravel the secrets veiled by the unmarked graves. Each step forward felt like a journey deeper into the unknown, an enigmatic labyrinth of obscured histories waiting to resurface. Amidst the fading light, Sarah stumbled upon a peculiar section of the cemetery, a cluster of unmarked graves shrouded by encroaching foliage, seemingly untouched by time's passage. An air of disquiet settled upon the area, as if the silent echoes of the forgotten souls beckoned her to uncover their buried truths. With a sense of trepidation, Sarah knelt beside one of the unmarked graves, feeling an inexplicable pull a haunting resonance that seemed to emanate from the soil itself. Her fingers traced the faint impressions left by time, a somber reminder of a life unmarked by legacy or remembrance. Suddenly, a sinister realization gripped Sarah, a warning sense of impending doom that coiled around her senses. The atmosphere shifted, the air thickening with an unseen presence, and an ominous feeling of being watched by unseen eyes enveloped her. In the moment, the ground beneath Sarah began to tremble, a sinister force stirring from the forgotten depths. A hollow whisper echoed through the cemetery, carrying an ancient lament, a spectral chorus of voices yearning to break the shackles of silent obscurity. With a sudden jolt, the unmarked grave seemed to quake, a haunting manifestation of the curse that bound the forgotten souls to their obscured resting places. The ground churned and heaved, and unearthly cries pierced the air as if the silenced voices of the buried emerged in a lamentation. 
In a horrifying climax, the spectral unrest surged forth, a cacophony of ethereal apparitions rising from the unmarked graves. The ghostly figures, draped in tattered shrouds of time, converged upon Sarah with an ethereal presence, their mournful visages a testament to the unresolved tragedy that tethered them to their forgotten resting grounds. Sarah's heart raced with terror as she found herself ensnared within the spectral congregation, a dark encounter with the tormented echoes of the unmarked graves. Their spectral hands reached out, grasping for her essence, an attempt to draw her into the perpetual limbo that plagued their silent existence. In a desperate bid to escape the spectral grasp, Sarah fought against the unearthly apparitions, struggling against the ethereal force that sought to claim her. Her terrified cries echoed through the cemetery, lost amidst the haunting lamentation that reverberated through the night. As the moon cast its pale glow upon the cemetery, a silence settled once more, a haunting reminder of the curse that lingered within the unmarked graves. Sarah Collins's disappearance became yet another enigmatic chapter in Cedarwood Village's history, a testament to the perils that awaited those who dared to disturb the silent echoes of forgotten souls. Story 6 in the quaint town of Ravenwood, nestled amidst rolling hills and shadowed by ancient trees, lay the Whispering Oak Cemetery, a serene resting place for the departed souls of generations past. The caretaker of this silent sanctuary was an enigmatic figure known only as Old Man Harrington, the graveyard keeper whose mysterious presence stirred whispers among the townsfolk. Rumors swirled around Old Man Harrington, tales woven from threads of suspicion and speculation, some regarded him as a solitary soul, committed to tending the graves with unwavering diligence, while others whispered darker stories, an inscrutable past veiled by shadows, hinting at a hidden secret buried within the cemetery's grounds. Among the curious townsfolk was Rebecca Thornton, an inquisitive journalist with an insatiable appetite for uncovering hidden truths. Rebecca's journalistic instincts led her to the intriguing lore surrounding Old Man Harrington, the enigmatic graveyard keeper whose enshrouded past beckoned her to unravel its mysteries. Through tireless research and tireless inquiries, Rebecca pieced together fragments of Ravenwood's folklore, a patchwork of tales hinting at Old Man Harrington's elusive past. The townsfolk's whispered suspicions coupled with cryptic accounts from decades past wove a tapestry of uncertainty around the keeper of Whispering Oak Cemetery. Driven by an unyielding curiosity, Rebecca ventured to the cemetery, her footsteps echoing amidst the gravestones that bore silent witness to the passage of time. The serenity of the graveyard belied an underlying sense of unease, a palpable tension that hung in the air, hinting at stories waiting to be unearthed. With each visit, Rebecca observed old man Harrington's meticulous care for the graves, a steadfast devotion that seemed intertwined with a veiled melancholy. She sought to penetrate the enigmatic facade of the graveyard keeper, yearning to uncover the truth concealed beneath his stoic countenance. As twilight cast elongated shadows across the cemetery, Rebecca's inquiries led her to approach Old Man Harrington, a figure shrouded in the fading light, his weathered features etched with the weight of unspoken secrets. She endeavored to engage him in conversation, hoping to glean insights into the hidden depths of the graveyard keeper's past. Yet, Old Man Harrington remained elusive, a man of few words whose silence spoke volumes. His guarded demeanor hinted at a past veiled in shadows, warding off Rebecca's attempts to unearth the secrets buried within the cemetery's hallowed grounds. Undeterred by the Keeper's reticence, Rebecca's determination to uncover the truth led her deeper into the labyrinth of Ravenwood's folklore. She ventured into the town's archives, scouring faded manuscripts and dusty records for clues that might unveil the enigma surrounding Old Man Harrington. Amidst the passages of time-worn chronicles and fading ink, Rebecca stumbled upon cryptic accounts, anecdotes hinting at an incident from decades past, an occurrence shrouded in mystery and linked to the whispers that swirled around the graveyard keeper. The account spoke of a tragic event, an incident that plunged Ravenwood into mourning, leaving scars upon the town's collective memory. References to an unsolved disappearance, coinciding with Old Man Harrington's arrival as the graveyard keeper, fueled Rebecca's suspicion that a hidden truth lay buried beneath the cemetery's serene facade. With relentless determination, Rebecca sought to confront Old Man Harrington once more, hoping to coax a revelation from the keeper's enigmatic demeanor. 
She approached him, her voice laced with urgency as she pressed for answers, her inquiries echoing through the silent expanse of Whispering Oak Cemetery. In a rare moment of vulnerability, a haunted expression flickered across Old Man Harrington's weathered face, an echo of pain veiled by years of guarded solitude. His silence spoke volumes, hinting at a burden carried in the recesses of his soul, a secret that lingered like a specter within the graveyard keeper's stoic facade. As the night descended upon the cemetery, a breathtaking realization dawned upon Rebecca, an unsettling truth lurking within the keeper's guarded countenance. In the revelation, the graveyard's shadows seemed to converge, whispering echoes of an obscured past that refused to be silenced. In a heart-stopping moment, old man Harrington turned to Rebecca, his eyes a window to the hidden torment veiled by the facade of stoic resolve. With a shudder, he uttered cryptic words, a haunting confession that shattered the silence of the graveyard, a revelation that shook Rebecca to the core. In a voice laden with sorrow and remorse, Old Man Harrington spoke of a dark secret buried within Whispering Oak Cemetery, a buried truth intertwined with his own tragic past. He confessed to a long-buried secret, an unsolved mystery that bound him to the graveyard's silent grounds. Before Rebecca could comprehend the weight of the revelation, a sudden darkness enveloped the cemetery, a malevolent presence that seemed to manifest from the Keeper's whispered confession. A haunting specter emerged from the shadows, an apparition draped in the veil of long-forgotten sorrow. With a blood-curdling shriek, the apparition surged forth, an unearthly entity bound to the hidden secret within the cemetery. Its spectral form loomed over Rebecca and Old Man Harrington, its mournful wail echoing through the graveyard in a symphony of tortured echoes. In a sudden pinnacle, the apparition's ethereal touch reached out, enveloping Old Man Harrington within its spectral embrace, an agonizing fate that condemned the graveyard keeper to an eternity bound by the curse of the cemetery's unspoken secret. Rebecca watched in horror as Old Man Harrington's form dissipated into the night, his anguished cries lost amidst the haunting wails that reverberated through the graveyard. The cold encounter left Rebecca paralyzed by terror, a witness to the tragic fate that awaited those entangled within the enigmatic secrets of Whispering Oak Cemetery. Story 7. In the heart of Stonehill Valley, concealed within a veil of dense mist and shadowed by ancient elms, stood the enigmatic cryptic mausoleum, a structure cloaked in whispered tales and centuries-old mysteries. The mausoleum's weathered facade exuded an uncanny allure, drawing curious souls with its cryptic aura and enigmatic presence. Amongst those intrigued by the mausoleum's enigma was Daniel Evans, an inquisitive historian whose fascination with forgotten relics led him to uncover the mysteries veiled by the passage of time. Daniel's tireless quest for historical truths guided him through dusty archives and faded manuscripts, seeking to unravel the secrets that surrounded the cryptic structure. Through his research, Daniel pieced together fragmented narratives, an intricate tapestry woven from centuries of folklore and forgotten tales. Whispers among the locals hinted at the mausoleum's elusive history, a resting place for a noble family shrouded in enigmatic circumstances and steeped in dark legends. Driven by an insatiable curiosity, Daniel journeyed to Stonehill Valley, his steps echoing amidst the mist-draped pathways that led to the cryptic mausoleum. The atmosphere was thick with a haunting silence, and an inexplicable chill hung in the air, a prelude to the mysteries veiled within the mausoleum's ancient walls. As Daniel approached the weathered structure, an uncanny sense of fear settled upon him. The mausoleum's dilapidated grandeur bore the weight of forgotten histories, its stony visage adorned with cryptic symbols that hinted at untold secrets waiting to be unveiled. Undeterred by the ominous ambience, Daniel ventured inside the mausoleum, guided by the dim light filtering through stained glass windows that cast kaleidoscopic hues across the chamber's stone walls. The interior lay shrouded in a sepulchral silence, each step echoing through the hallowed halls. As he traversed the mausoleum's labyrinthine corridors, Daniel encountered sarcophagi adorned with ornate carvings and faded inscriptions, a testament to the noble lineage entombed within. The cryptic symbols etched upon the walls hinted at hidden meanings, veiled beneath layers of forgotten lore. In his exploration, Daniel stumbled upon a secluded chamber, an antechamber veiled by shadows and suffused with an odd ambience. The chamber harbored in sinister presence, a cryptic energy that seemed to permeate the very air. 
urging Daniel to decipher its arcane mysteries. Drawn to an ancient sarcophagus at the chamber's center, Daniel sensed a peculiar resonance, an enigmatic force emanating from the ornately crafted casket. His fingers traced the faded engravings adorning the sarcophagus, attempting to decipher the cryptic symbols that adorned its surface. In a sudden revelation, the chamber seemed to shudder, a disconcerting tremor that reverberated through the stone walls. Shadows coalesced, twisting and contorting into enigmatic shapes that danced along the cryptic inscriptions, teasing Daniel's senses with their elusive meanings. In a heart-stopping moment, a sepulchral groan echoed through the chamber, a haunting lamentation that pierced the silence. The air thickened with an unsettling energy, and a sense of being watched by unseen eyes enveloped Daniel in a frightening embrace. Suddenly, a series of cryptic symbols began to glow upon the sarcophagus, an ominous manifestation that hinted at an ancient secret on the verge of awakening. Daniel's heart raced with trepidation as the mausoleum seemed to pulsate with a hair-raising resonance, a strange presence poised to reveal its enigmatic truth. At a high point, the ancient sarcophagus trembled, an unsettling movement that heralded a sinister revelation. With a blood-curdling shriek, the lid of the sarcophagus shifted, revealing an abyssal darkness that seemed to beckon from within. From the depths of the sarcophagus emerged a ghastly figure, a specter draped in tattered shrouds of time, its hollow gaze fixed upon Daniel. The apparition's anguished visage bore the weight of centuries, an echo of unresolved sorrow bound within the cryptic confines of the mausoleum. With a spectral wail that reverberated through the chamber, the apparition surged forth, an unearthly force that enveloped Daniel in its ethereal embrace. His terrified cries echoed through the mausoleum as the spectral entity claimed him, condemning him to an eternity trapped within the enigmatic shadows of the cryptic mausoleum. As the night settled over Stonehill Valley, an eerie silence descended upon the mausoleum, a testament to the enigmatic secrets that lingered within its ancient walls. Daniel Evans's disappearance became yet another haunting mystery, a real testament to the perils that awaited those who dared to unravel the enigmatic echoes of the past. The Thompsons had recently installed a ring doorbell camera in their suburban home, hoping to add an extra layer of security. But what began as a safety measure soon turned into a source of unease. One chilly autumn evening, the doorbell rang, and Mr. Thompson hastily checked the live feed on his phone. To his confusion, the screen displayed only the empty porch, bathed in the soft glow of the porch light. No one was there. Strange, he muttered, dismissing it as a glitch. However, a few minutes later, the doorbell chimed again. This time, Mrs. Thompson approached the camera, opening the app on her phone. The screen remained unchanged, an empty porch, devoid of any visitor. But then they heard it, a faint sound, barely audible, but distinct enough scare them. Heavy breathing, ragged and ominous, it seemed to emanate from the speakers of their ring doorbell. Did you hear that? Mrs. Thompson asked her voice quivering with a mix of curiosity and apprehension. Mr. Thompson furrowed his brow, his gaze fixed on the doorbell camera. Yeah, someone's breathing, but where are they? The breathing continued, growing louder and more erratic with each passing second. They checked the live feed repeatedly, but it showed nothing but the silent porch. Unease settled in as the breathing persisted, creating an unsettling atmosphere inside the house. The Thompsons exchanged worried glances, feeling the weight of the unknown presence lurking just beyond their front door. Despite their growing discomfort, they decided to investigate. Mr. Thompson cautiously opened the front door, expecting to find someone standing on the porch or nearby, but the chilly night revealed nothing but empty streets and rustling leaves. They retreated indoors, unnerved by the inexplicable occurrence. As the night progressed, the unsettling breathing episodes continued sporadically, always accompanied by the sound of heavy labored breaths, yet never revealing the source. With each occurrence, their nerves frayed, their minds tormented by the relentless and inexplicable phenomenon. Sleep eluded them, replaced by the haunting anticipation of the next instance of a sinister breathing echoing through their home. Hours dragged on, the tension escalating with each passing minute until suddenly the breathing stopped, a deafening silence enveloped the house, amplifying the Thompsons' fear and confusion. 
Just as they began to exhale a collective sigh of relief, a blood-curdling scream pierced the silence. <coughs> resonating from the direction of the ring doorbell camera, the scream was gut-wrenching and primal, sending shockwaves of terror through the Thompsons. Frozen in terror, they stared at the camera feed, their eyes widening in horror as the screen showed a distorted, contorted face. Eyes wide with madness and a twisted, maniacal grin contorting the features of the unknown visitor. Before they could react, the camera abruptly cut to black, plunging them into darkness. The house was silent once again, but this time their fear was palpable, rooted in the horrifying uncertainty of what lay beyond their door. As the ring doorbell camera abruptly cut to black, leaving the Thompsons in a chilling darkness, panic seized their senses. Mrs. Thompson fumbled for her phone, attempting to reconnect to the camera feed, but the app displayed nothing but a blank screen. Heartbeats thundered in their chests as they stood in the silence, enveloped by the foreboding atmosphere that had invaded their once cozy home. The seconds stretched into an agonizing wait, each moment feeling like an eternity. Suddenly the tranquility shattered with a resounding crash, the sound of a window shattering in the living room. They exchanged panicked glances, dread gripping their every nerve. Without hesitation, they dashed toward the source of the disturbance. As they entered the living room, a bone-chilling sight greeted them. A figure cloaked in darkness standing amidst the shattered glass, its presence casting a haunting shadow against the moonlit wall. Who are you? What do you want? Mr. Thompson's voice quivered with a mix of fear and defiance. The intruder remained silent, their face obscured by the darkness of the hood. A sinister aura emanated from their form, freezing the Thompsons in place, rendering them powerless against the overwhelming terror. With a slow, deliberate movement, the intruder raised a hand, revealing a glint of metal, a menacing blade gleaming in the moonlight. The Thompsons recoiled, their minds racing with a chilling realization. They were facing imminent danger. A cacophony of emotions surged within them, fear, desperation, and a futile attempt to comprehend the inexplicable nightmare unfolding before their eyes. Their frantic attempts to reason with the intruder were met with a cold, unyielding silence. Time seemed to stand still as the intruder inched closer, the glint of the blade dancing ominously in the light. The Thompsons backed away, their backs against the wall, the echoes of their racing heartbeats drowning out all other sounds. In a sudden burst of movement, the intruder lunged forward, the blade flashing with deadly intent. A gut-wrenching scream tore through the night, but the source was unclear. Was it the Thompsons or the intruder? In the heart-stopping chaos that ensued, the Thompsons fought desperately to fend off the assailant, their survival instincts kicking into overdrive. A struggle ensued, a harrowing battle between life and death played out in the confines of their home. Adrenaline surged through their veins as they fought for their lives, grappling with the unknown assailant in a desperate bid to escape the impending doom. But the intruder seemed unrelenting, driven by a chilling determination that transcended reason. Amidst the chaos and terror, the Thompson's world narrowed to a single instinct. Survival. With a surge of strength born from sheer desperation, they managed to break free, darting towards the front door. Their pounding footsteps echoed through the house as they raced toward the escape that lay beyond the threshold. As they flung open the door, relief and hope flickered briefly within them, only to be shattered by the shocking sight that awaited them outside. A sinister congregation of hooded figures stood on the porch, surrounding the house in a dark display of silent malevolence. The chilling realization dawned upon the Thompsons, the horror they faced was not a singular event, but part of a hauntingly orchestrated nightmare. Before they could comprehend their dire predicament, the assailant caught up, their menacing presence casting a long, ominous shadow over the Thompsons. In a final horrific moment, the blade struck, and darkness consumed the Thompsons, their anguished cries echoing through the desolate night, a night eternally shrouded in unanswered questions and unimaginable terror. Story 2 it was a typical evening in the serene neighborhood of Maplewood. The sun had dipped below the horizon, casting elongated shadows across the houses. The street lamps flickered to life, illuminating the quiet streets. Inside one of the cozy homes, the Washingtons were just finishing up dinner when the doorbell rang. Samantha, curious about the unexpected visitor at this hour, 
glanced at her husband David before heading to the door. She peered through the peephole, finding no one in sight. Puzzled, she noticed the faint glow of the Ring doorbell camera. A notification pinged on her phone. The Ring app displayed a live feed of their doorstep. Squinting at the screen, Samantha saw a man standing there, barely visible in the darkness outside. His features were obscured by a shadowy hood, and his eyes seemed fixed on the camera as though he knew he was being watched. Unease settled in her chest and she called out to David. Someone's at the door, but they're not there anymore. It's just a man in a hoodie staring at the camera. David joined her, checking the app. That's odd. Maybe he left. Let me check outside. He stepped onto the porch, scanning the area, but the street remained empty. He returned, reassuring Samantha that there was no one around. As they settled back inside, Samantha couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. Hours passed, and the incident faded into the back of their minds until the doorbell rang again. This time they hurried to the camera, but the feed showed only darkness. No one was there. Uneasy, they decided to call the police, suspecting a potential prank or suspicious activity. Minutes crawled by, and just as the police were about to arrive, the doorbell rang again. Samantha's heart raced as she hesitated, contemplating whether to check the feed. David rushed to the door, peeking cautiously outside. But there was no one in sight, just the cold, empty night. Before they could gather their thoughts, a chilling realization dawned on them. The doorbell camera hadn't rung. It was the old-fashioned doorbell this time. A cold feeling ran down Samantha's back. The unease escalated into fear. They exchanged nervous glances, their minds racing with uncertainty and dread. Something was terribly wrong. Their unease turned into terror when they heard faint scratching noises coming from the front door. It was as if someone was dragging their fingernails along the wood, creating a scary symphony of dread. Suddenly the scratching ceased, replaced by a haunting silence that echoed through the house. Samantha and David exchanged a fearful glance, frozen in place, their minds consumed by fear and uncertainty. Then a blood-curdling scream shattered the silence, echoing from the hallway. They rushed towards the sound, only to find the source, the ring doorbell camera. The live feed displayed a horrifying scene, a figure cloaked in darkness, their face twisted into a dark and scary grin, staring directly into the camera. As Samantha and David recoiled in horror, the door behind them slammed shut, trapping them in the chilling darkness. The last thing they heard was a whisper, barely audible but unmistakably chilling. I've been waiting for you. Story 3. In the suburban town of Crestwood, the Monroe family had recently installed a ring doorbell camera, eager to bolster their home security. However, what began as a safety measure soon led them down a path they could never have anticipated. One chilly evening, the doorbell chimed, and the camera's live feed showed a man standing on the porch, his features partially obscured by the hood of his jacket. Mrs. Monroe peered at the screen, recognizing the man as someone she'd seen on the news, the face of a notorious criminal who had been on the run for weeks. Panic seized her momentarily, but she hesitated, uncertain of what to do. The man glanced directly at the camera, an unsettling grin playing on his lips. His presence creeped them out. Who is it, dear? Mr. Monroe asked, noticing his wife's apprehension. It's nobody, she lied, not wanting to alarm her family. Maybe just a salesman. Despite her unease, Mrs. Monroe found herself hesitantly pressing the button to unlock the front door. The man stepped inside, his demeanor oddly calm, belying his criminal notoriety. I need help he said, his voice carrying a sense of calmness that sent a cold feeling through the room. Mrs. Monroe's heart raced, unsure of how to react. Her instincts told her to call the authorities, but the man's presence rendered her momentarily paralyzed. Please, he pleaded, his eyes meeting hers. I'm not what they say. I need shelter. The tension hung thick in the air as Mrs. Monroe exchanged uncertain glances with her husband. They wrestled with the conflicting emotions of fear, sympathy, and an unsettling sense of obligation. Against their better judgment, they allowed the man inside, albeit with cautious trepidation. His presence seemed to cast a pall over the once welcoming atmosphere of their home. As the night progressed, a strange unease settled in. The criminal, whose name they dared not utter, stayed in their guest room. His occasional glimpses and cryptic remarks kept the Monroes on edge trapped in a constant state of discomfort and anxiety. 
The atmosphere grew increasingly oppressive, suffocating the family in a cloud of fear and uncertainty. Mrs. Monroe couldn't shake off the unsettling feeling that they had made a grave mistake letting the wanted man inside their home. The man's behavior grew increasingly erratic, his demeanor shifting from pleading desperation to unsettling calmness. It was as if he reveled in the discomfort of his hosts, relishing their unease. As the night wore on, the family attempted to maintain a semblance of normalcy, but the criminal's presence loomed like a menacing shadow, staining their once tranquil haven. In a moment that shattered the fragile facade of normalcy, the man disappeared from his room, leaving behind a cold silence. Panic surged through the Monroes as they frantically searched the house, their hearts pounding with dread. The sickening realization dawned upon them. He was nowhere to be found. They were trapped in a house with a known criminal, his intentions unknown and terrifying. Their frantic search ended abruptly when they stumbled upon a grisly sight in the basement. The man standing amidst in sinister display of newspaper clippings and photographs, all detailing his heinous crimes. Before they could react, the man turned to them, his eyes void of remorse, consumed by a chilling madness that sent terror coursing through the Monroe's veins. In a swift, horrifying moment, he lunged forward, his intentions unmistakably clear. The Monroe's screams pierced the night, echoing the horror of their last moments, a night forever stained with the terror of trusting a stranger. Sarah Turner was an aspiring photographer, renowned for her captivating images capturing the essence of rural life. She often ventured to remote locations to find the perfect shot, and her latest expedition led her to a small town nestled amidst vast cornfields, seeking the ideal photograph to define her portfolio. The town of Briarwood boasted endless fields of golden corn, a picturesque landscape that drew Sarah's artistic eye. Eager to capture the rural charm, she set out one autumn afternoon, navigating the rows of towering stalks, her camera in hand. The afternoon sun cast elongated shadows across the cornfield, creating a surreal ambience that mesmerized Sarah. As she ventured deeper into the labyrinth of stalks, the rustling leaves and whispers of the wind became her symphony, guiding her in pursuit of the perfect shot. Hours passed and Sarah was lost in her passion, absorbed in framing the beauty of the sun-kissed cornfield. However, as dusk descended and the skies turned crimson, a sense of disorientation crept over her. The rows of corn seemed endless, forming an enigmatic maze. Attempting to retrace her steps, Sarah discovered herself disoriented, no longer able to discern the direction back to town. Panic tinged the edges of her consciousness, but she attempted to remain composed, confident in her navigation skills. As twilight deepened into night, the once charming cornfield became an ominous landscape, a daunting labyrinth shrouded in darkness. Sarah's footsteps echoed through the silent rows, the crunching of dry leaves beneath her feet amplifying her growing unease. Faintly, Sarah discerned the sound of whispers. The wind carried ethereal murmurs that seemed to emanate from the very heart of the cornfield. A sensation of being watched enveloped her, and she quickened her pace, desperate to find her way out. In her frantic search for an exit, Sarah stumbled upon a clearing, a small, secluded space within the cornfield. Strange symbols etched into the ground caught her attention, illuminated by an uncanny glow emitted by the moonlight. Captivated yet unnerved by the inexplicable symbols, Sarah felt an inexplicable force pulling her closer. Instinct warned her to retreat, but an irresistible curiosity urged her to investigate further. As she knelt to examine the markings, an overwhelming dizziness consumed her. In a chilling moment, the ground beneath Sarah's feet seemed to shift, a disorienting sensation as if reality twisted around her. Time blurred, and a haunting echo reverberated through the field, drowning her senses in a cacophony of inexplicable sounds. When Sarah regained her bearings, the once familiar cornfield appeared distorted, a different realm that bore no resemblance to the landscape she entered. Panic surged through her veins, but she found herself paralyzed in the inexplicable environment surrounded by towering stalks that seemed to reach towards the starless sky. A profound sense of dread washed over Sarah, an unsettling realization that she had stumbled into a grim dimension hidden within the cornfield. Desperate attempts to find an escape proved futile as the maze shifted, thwarting her every effort. 
Suddenly, shadowy figures emerged from the rows of corn, indiscernible shapes that flickered in and out of visibility, haunting echoes that circled Sarah with an ominous presence. Her heart raced with terror as the spectral figures closed in, their intent unknown and their forms shrouded in darkness. In a final moment of sheer horror, the figures enveloped Sarah, an unearthly force that seemed to consume her very essence. Her terrified screams echoed through the surreal landscape before silence engulfed the night, leaving behind a dark emptiness in the cornfield. Sarah Turner had vanished without a trace, lost to the enigmatic depths of the inexplicable realm hidden within the corn. Story 2 In the heart of the countryside nestled the serene farming town of Millfield, renowned for its sprawling fields that stretched as far as the eye could see. Among these fertile expanses, one plot held a dark reputation, Holton's Field. Once a thriving land that yielded bountiful harvests, it now lay barren, haunted by an ominous curse that lingered like an unspoken secret among the townsfolk. Whispers of the curse stemmed from the tragic tale of Old Man Holton, the land's former owner, whose fate had become entwined with the cursed acres. Legends spoke of a Faustian bargain struck between Holton and a mysterious stranger, sealing the land's doom with an unbreakable curse that condemned it to wither and decay. Nathan Monroe, an ambitious farmer driven by a passion to restore the land's lost vitality, seized the opportunity to purchase Holton's field, undeterred by the warnings and superstition shrouding its history. Determined to defy the curse and resurrect the dying acres, Nathan set out on a mission to breathe new life into the desolate soil. As Nathan plowed the fallow fields and sowed the seeds of hope, the air crackled with anticipation. Tender shoots emerged from the once barren earth, a glimmer of promise amidst the cursed land. The townsfolk, skeptical yet hopeful, watched with cautious optimism as the land seemed to respond to Nathan's unwavering dedication. However, the burgeoning promise soon gave way to dread signs that hinted at the curse's spiteful presence. Whispers spread throughout Millfield of peculiar occurrences, strange shapes etched by moonlight on the desolate landscape, spectral rustlings that echoed through the night, and an unnerving aura that enveloped the field. As the crops flourished, so did the ominous undertones. Reports surfaced of shadowy figures lurking among the rows, their elusive forms seemingly shifting and vanishing into the cornstalks. Fear crept insidiously through the town. The legend of Old Man Holton's curse resurrected, casting a haunting pall over the community. Undeterred by the mounting unease, Nathan forged ahead, driven by an unyielding determination to witness the transformation of the cursed acres. The ripening cornfield swayed in the gentle autumn breeze, a haunting symphony that filled the air with an unsettling melody. Yet it was on the eve of the harvest when the town's darkest fears materialized. The harvest moon ascended, casting an odd glow over Holton's field, as an ethereal fog enveloped the land, concealing it in a strange haze. The once promising crops now bore a ghastly countenance, twisted and contorted stalks warped and mutated beyond recognition. A disconcerting chill gripped Nathan's heart as the fields transformed, an unnatural metamorphosis that defied explanation. Sinister shadows danced amidst the twisted rows, their ominous movements drawing Nathan's gaze with a morbid fascination. As Nathan ventured further into the cursed expanse, the shadows coalesced, morphing into ghostly figures that materialized from the cursed soil. Spectral entities, embodiments of the dark curse, emerged from the land, their ghastly forms pulsating with an unearthly evil. Frozen in terror, Nathan stood amidst the haunting spectacle, paralyzed by fear and disbelief. The spectral entities encircled him, their ethereal presence suffocating and oppressive. Panic surged through Nathan's veins as he realized the gravity of the curse that now held him captive. With an ear-splitting shriek that reverberated through the desolate field, the entities surged forth, their ghostly apparitions ensnaring Nathan within their ethereal grasp. Agonizing cries echoed through the cursed expanse, a chilling lament that marked Nathan's descent into the dark abyss of Old Man Holton's curse. The cursed land had claimed its latest victim, leaving behind a harrowing testament to the relentless grip of an ancient curse. As dawn broke over Millfield, the cursed acres stood silent and desolate, a haunting reminder of the tragic fate that befell those who dared to challenge the ominous legacy of Holton's Field. Story 3. In the heart of a rural community lay the idyllic town of Greenview, 
surrounded by vast expanses of cornfields that extended as far as the eye could see. Among these fields lay a shadow that tainted the serene landscape, the chilling legend of the cornfield murders. The tale of the cornfield murders haunted Greenview, an unsolved mystery that shook every resident. It began a decade ago when a series of heinous crimes transpired, all linked to the vast cornfields that define the town's landscape. The first victim, Rachel Thompson, a local school teacher, went missing on a balmy summer evening. Her disappearance sent shockwaves through the community, leaving behind only a few cryptic clues, signs of a struggle near the edge of the cornfields and faint traces of footsteps leading into the maze-like expanse. As the investigation into Rachel's disappearance commenced, a disturbing pattern emerged. More residents vanished under eerily similar circumstances. Each victim had one thing in common. They were last seen near or within the labyrinth of cornstalks that enveloped Greenview. Detective Mark Stevens, a seasoned investigator haunted by the unsolved cases, delved into the chilling enigma that plagued the town. His pursuit led him to the edge of the cornfields, a dreadful expanse that seemed to hold the secrets to the baffling disappearances. Despite exhaustive searches and relentless investigations, the maze-like nature of the cornfields defied logic, thwarting attempts to unravel the mystery. The townsfolk grew apprehensive, avoiding the fields after dark, fearful of falling prey to an elusive predator that lurked within the shadows. Sarah Wilson, a young journalist eager to unearth the truth, arrived in Greenview, drawn by the enigmatic aura surrounding the cornfield murders. As Sarah delved deeper into the town's haunting legacy, she encountered a mosaic of chilling accounts. Determined to uncover the truth, Sarah ventured into the fields, navigating the twisting paths in search of answers. The dense rows of corn towered above her, casting elongated shadows that seemed to dance in the moonlight, forming a strange tapestry. As Sarah probed further into the labyrinth, an unsettling sensation of being watched enveloped her. Faint whispers carried by the rustling leaves echoed in the silent night, as though the cornfield itself harbored a hidden darkness. In a moment of chilling revelation, Sarah stumbled upon a clearing within the cornfield marked by a grotesque sight, a circle of symbols etched into the ground. The symbols pulsated with a dark glow, casting an ominous aura that sent a tremor down Sarah's back. Before Sarah could decipher the cryptic symbols, a shadowy figure emerged from the cornrows, shattering the silence. Panic surged through her veins as she recognized the dark silhouette, its scary presence looming closer. With a sudden realization, Sarah understood the harrowing truth. The cornfield concealed a sinister entity that preyed upon unsuspecting victims, ensnaring them within its ominous depths. Before she could flee, the shadowy figure lunged forth, its ghostly apparition enveloping Sarah in an ethereal grasp. Her terrified screams pierced the night, a harrowing chorus that echoed through the silent fields before fading into a mysterious silence. As dawn broke over Greenview, Sarah Wilson became the latest victim claimed by the Cornfield murders, leaving behind an unsolved mystery that continued to cast its haunting shadow over the town. The labyrinth of Cornstalk stood as a grim testament to the chilling fate of those who dared to venture into its sinister embrace. Story 4 Nestled in the heart of the countryside lay the serene town of Ashwood, bordered by endless stretches of cornfields that whispered tales of an ancient secret. Among the town's enigmatic folklore lay the legend of the ancient tunnels, a network of mysterious underground passages concealed beneath the fertile soil of Ashwood's sprawling fields. The tale of the ancient tunnels was woven into the fabric of Ashwood's history. Centuries ago, a forgotten civilization had left behind a labyrinth of subterranean tunnels beneath the fertile lands, a testament to an age lost to time. The tunnels were said to hold ancient relics and untold secrets, hidden from the world above. As the modern world encroached upon Ashwood, the legend of the tunnels became a distant memory, fading into obscurity. However, rumors persisted among the town's older residents, whispers of hidden entrances scattered throughout the cornfields, waiting to be rediscovered. Matthew Hayes, an aspiring archaeologist captivated by the town's mysterious past, arrived in Ashwood, drawn by the elusive legend of the ancient tunnels. Determined to unearth the truth behind the folklore, 
Matthew embarked on an ambitious quest to unearth the secrets buried within the cornfield's depths. His fervent search led him to the outskirts of town, where the sprawling cornfields stretched endlessly. Armed with ancient maps and enigmatic clues gleaned from folklore, Matthew embarked on a solitary expedition, weaving through the rows of towering cornstalks in search of the hidden entrances. Days turned into weeks as Matthew meticulously scoured the fields, his tireless efforts driven by an insatiable curiosity. As twilight descended, a sense of anticipation coursed through him, accompanied by the silence that enveloped the deserted fields. In a moment of startling discovery, Matthew stumbled upon an overgrown mound nestled amidst the cornfield, a subtle anomaly that caught his attention. Excitement surged as he uncovered an ancient entrance concealed beneath layers of earth and vegetation, a portal to the forgotten world beneath the soil. With cautious reverence, Matthew descended into the depths of the subterranean passageway, its dank interior cloaked in shadows that seemed to harbor echoes of a long-lost civilization. The air was thick with a musty scent, a reminder of centuries that had passed since the tunnels were last traversed. As Matthew ventured deeper into the labyrinthine network, ancient symbols etched into the walls caught his eye, their significance shrouded in mystery. His footsteps echoed through the cavernous passages, reverberating like a haunting melody that stirred an inexplicable sense of trepidation within him. In the heart of the tunnels, Matthew encountered a chamber adorned with ancient artifacts, an enigmatic tableau frozen in time. Forgotten relics lay scattered amidst the chamber, each bearing the weight of a forgotten era that whispered tales of an age long past. Suddenly a chilling realization dawned upon Matthew. The tunnels were not merely a relic of the past, but a repository of ancient malevolence. Unearthly whispers echoed through the darkness, carrying a sinister resonance that freaked him out. In a harrowing moment, the chamber trembled with an otherworldly force, the walls pulsating with an ominous energy. Before Matthew could comprehend the danger that loomed, the tunnels unleashed their wrath. The subterranean passages convulsed violently, trapping Matthew within their ancient grip. A deafening roar reverberated through the tunnels as the earth itself seemed to rise against him. Unseen forces encircled him, their spectral presence suffocating and oppressive. In a chilling crescendo, the tunnels sealed shut, trapping Matthew within their dark embrace. His anguished cries echoed through the buried depths before fading into a scary silence, leaving behind only whispers of the horrors that lurked within the ancient tunnels of Ashwood, a cryptic testament to a fate entwined with the secrets of a forgotten civilization. Story 5. In the heart of the countryside stood the tranquil town of Greenleaf, enveloped by vast swaths of cornfields that held a chilling secret, the enigmatic crop circle mystery. Whispers of mysterious symbols etched into the cornfields circulated among the townsfolk, hinting at an unexplained phenomenon that left an unnatural mark on the landscape. The crop circle mystery had haunted Greenleaf for years, each intricate pattern in the cornfields, a riddle that defied explanation. Tales spoke of bizarre formations appearing overnight, intricate glyphs carved into the cornstalks with uncanny precision, leaving behind an enigmatic puzzle that confounded both residents and scientists alike. Among the townsfolk, speculation ran rampant, theories ranging from extraterrestrial visitations to elaborate hoaxes. However, the truth behind the cryptic symbols remained elusive, shrouded in an unsettling air of mystery. Alexandra Evans, a determined investigative journalist, arrived in Greenleaf, drawn by the enigmatic tales of the crop circle mystery. Intrigued by the unexplained phenomenon, Alexandra set out to unravel the truth behind the weird glyphs that adorned the cornfields, armed with a relentless curiosity and a desire for answers. Her pursuit led her deep into the heart of the cornfields, where the towering stalks formed an intimidating maze. The evening sun cast elongated shadows, creating an ethereal ambience that added to the mystery shrouding the landscape. As Alexandra ventured further, she stumbled upon the first signs of the inexplicable phenomenon, a vast expanse of cornstalks that bore intricate patterns, forming a labyrinth of enigmatic symbols etched into the soil. The glyphs were a mesmerizing sight, their complex designs hinting at an intelligence beyond human comprehension. Alexandra meticulously examined the formations, the precision of the glyphs leaving her awestruck and unsettled simultaneously. 
In the twilight hours, the cornfield seemed to awaken with an uncanny presence. Faint whispers carried by the rustling leaves danced through the air, as though the fields themselves were alive with a mystical energy. Alexandra's senses tingled with an inexplicable foreboding. Driven by an insatiable curiosity, Alexandra delved deeper into the heart of the glyph-marked fields, determined to uncover the truth. The air crackled with an ethereal aura, the glyphs pulsating with an ethereal glow that intensified as she approached. In a chilling revelation, Alexandra realized the glyphs were more than mere symbols. They were a conduit, a bridge between worlds, and the catalyst for an evil-minded force lurking beneath the cornfields. As she stood amidst the mesmerizing formations, a deafening silence enveloped the fields before an unearthly resonance reverberated through the air. The glyphs began to shift and contort, an ominous transformation that heralded the descent of an ancient darkness. Before Alexandra could comprehend the danger, the glyphs released in mystic energy, ensnaring her within their eldritch grasp. An agonizing scream tore through the night as she became intertwined with the ominous force that lay dormant beneath the soil. In a final moment of horror, the glyphs sealed shut, swallowing Alexandra within their cryptic embrace. Her anguished cries echoed through the desolate fields before fading into a silence, leaving behind only whispers of the chilling fate that befell those who dared to unravel the mysteries of the crop circle glyphs. Story 6. In the heart of the rural town of Milford, enveloped by vast cornfields that stretched across the horizon, lay the unsettling legend of the cornfield abduction. It was a chilling tale whispered among the townsfolk, a story that spoke of inexplicable disappearances haunting the labyrinthine rows of the cornfields. The legend traced back to a series of baffling events that unfolded years ago. It began with the mysterious disappearance of a young couple, Anna and Jacob, who ventured into the cornfields on a moonlit summer evening, never to return. Their absence sent shockwaves through the town, igniting speculation and fear within the community. Desperate searches yielded no trace of the missing couple, leaving behind only cryptic clues, an abandoned flashlight near the edge of the cornfields and fragmented footprints leading into the rows. As the town grappled with the unresolved mystery, more incidents emerged. Reports surfaced of strange occurrences, a disorienting sense of being watched while traversing the cornfields, peculiar lights flickering among the stalks, and an ominous aura that hung over the fields fueling the folklore of the cornfield abduction. Detective Benjamin Hayes, haunted by the unsolved cases, devoted himself to unraveling the enigma shrouding the cornfields. He delved into the labyrinthine paths, studying the patterns of disappearances and seeking clues that might reveal the truth behind the unsettling legend. Among the townsfolk, tales of strange encounters and fleeting glimpses of elusive figures among the cornstalks spread like wildfire. Many attributed the phenomenon to extraterrestrial activity or clandestine experiments, while others believed in a more terrestrial, albeit unknown threat, lurking amidst the rows. Amidst the speculations, Lydia Campbell, an inquisitive young reporter eager to uncover the truth, arrived in Milford. Driven by an insatiable curiosity, Lydia embarked on an investigation into the cornfield abduction, determined to unravel the chilling mystery. Guided by the folklore, Lydia ventured into the cornfields, her footsteps echoing through the silent rows. The moon cast an eerie glow upon the sprawling expanse, creating haunting silhouettes that danced amidst the swaying stalks. As Lydia navigated the labyrinth of the cornfields, an unsettling sensation of being watched enveloped her. Faint whispers carried by the rustling leaves seemed to echo cryptic messages through the night, heightening her sense of trepidation. In a chilling moment, Lydia stumbled upon a clearing in the heart of the cornfield, a subtle anomaly amidst the rows. Strange markings etched into the soil caught her attention, an intricate pattern reminiscent of the tales surrounding the abductions. Before she could decipher the cryptic symbols, an inexplicable force gripped Lydia, engulfing her in an ethereal aura. Panic surged through her veins as she realized the impending danger lurking within the cornfields. In a harrowing crescendo, the rows around Lydia seemed to warp and distort, an unsettling transformation that defied reality. She found herself ensnared within a tight grip, an unseen force that rendered her powerless. In a final moment of horror, Lydia's cries pierced the night before the rows of corn enveloped her, swallowing her whole. 
The silence that followed echoed with a haunting emptiness, leaving behind only whispers of the terrifying fate that befell those who dared to tread into the sinister depths of the cornfield abduction. Story 7. In the heart of the countryside nestled the picturesque town of Willowbrook, surrounded by sprawling cornfields that whispered tales of a haunting mystery, the legend of the haunting echoes. Among the townsfolk, stories circulated of inexplicable phenomena that echoed through the rustling stalks, leaving behind an odd atmosphere that cast a shadow over the otherwise tranquil community. The legend of the haunting echoes traced back to a tragic incident that occurred decades ago. It began with the unexplained disappearance of a local farmer, Samuel Taylor, who ventured into the cornfields on a fog-shrouded night and vanished without a trace. Samuel's sudden disappearance became a chilling enigma haunting the town for years to come. As time passed, whispers spread of strange occurrences within the cornfields. Residents reported unsettling echoes that reverberated through the stalks, an abnormal chorus that lingered in the air, faint whispers that seemed to convey cryptic messages, and an unshakable feeling of being watched amidst the rows. Among the townsfolk, superstitions mingled with curiosity, theories ranging from ghostly visitations to natural phenomena, Yet the truth behind the enigmatic echoes remained elusive, shrouded in an unsettling air of mystery. Emma Reynolds, an intrepid investigator with an insatiable thirst for unraveling unsolved mysteries, arrived in Willowbrook, drawn by the chilling tales of the haunting echoes. Determined to shed light on the mysterious phenomenon, Emma embarked on an investigation, armed with her unwavering resolve and a thirst for truth. Her exploration led her to the outskirts of the cornfields, where the towering stalks formed an intricate maze. The wind whispered through the rows, creating an ethereal ambience that seemed to carry murmurs of long-forgotten secrets. As Emma ventured deeper into the heart of the cornfields, an uncanny sensation enveloped her, an inexplicable presence that seemed to watch her every move. Whispers carried by the rustling leaves sounded like faint echoes of distant voices, heightening her sense of foreboding. In a moment of chilling discovery, Emma stumbled upon a clearing nestled amidst the cornstalks, a peculiar space that seemed to emit a mystical energy. Strange symbols etched into the soil caught her attention, an intricate pattern that echoed the tales of the haunting echoes. Before Emma could decipher the cryptic symbols, an unsettling phenomenon unfurled around her. The rows of corn seemed to come alive, swaying in an unnaturally synchronized motion. The air crackled within dark resonance as the echoes intensified, forming an unsettling chorus that reverberated through the night. As Emma stood amidst the haunting tableau, a sudden realization struck her. The echoes were not mere sounds, but a conduit to an ancient malevolence lurking within the cornfields. In a spine-chilling crescendo, the echoes coalesced, swirling around Emma in an ethereal dance. An unseen force seized her, enveloping her in an overwhelming grip an icy coldness that rendered her paralyzed. In a final moment of horror, the echoes consumed Emma, their haunting resonance drowning her in an abyss of chilling whispers. The silence that followed was deafening, leaving behind only whispers of the terrifying fate that befell those who dared to probe the chilling depths of the haunting echoes. Story 8. In the heart of the countryside stood the quaint town of Rockwell, encircled by vast expanses of cornfields that held a chilling secret. The legend of the cornfield cult. Whispers of a clandestine group that lurked amidst the rows, practicing rituals shrouded in secrecy, haunted the townsfolk, casting an ominous shadow over the serene community. The legend of the cornfield cult was steeped in mystery, stemming from a dark chapter in Rockwell's history. It was said to have originated generations ago, when a charismatic leader, Reverend Elijah Grant, established a fervent following preaching doctrines of devotion to the land and the bountiful harvest it promised. The townsfolk whispered tales of sinister gatherings held within the cornfields, a secluded sect that adhered to arcane rituals beneath the moon's pale glow. Strange symbols etched into the soil and whispered incantations became the whispers of the cult's presence, leaving the townsfolk gripped by fear. Detective Mia Thompson, renowned for her unrelenting pursuit of the truth, arrived in Rockwell, drawn by the haunting rumors of the cornfield cult. Determined to unravel the mystery, Mia embarked on an investigation, propelled by her tenacious spirit and a commitment to uncover the chilling truth. 
Her inquiries led her to the outskirts of the cornfields, where the whispering stalks formed an intimidating maze. The rustling leaves carried an uncanny ambience, setting the stage for a confrontation with the unknown. As Mia delved deeper into the heart of the cornfields, a sensation of being watched enveloped her. The air crackled with an unsettling energy, and the faint murmur of distant chants seemed to echo amidst the rose, heightening her sense of unease. In a chilling revelation, Mia stumbled upon a clearing nestled amidst the cornstalks, a sight that bore the unmistakable signs of the cult's clandestine activities. Strange symbols adorned the soil, remnants of eerie rituals conducted under the cloak of darkness. Before she could process the implications of her discovery, an ominous presence materialized from the shadows. A group of hooded figures emerged from the cornrows, their faces obscured by dark robes, their eyes ablaze with fervent devotion. Realizing the danger that loomed, Mia attempted to retreat, but it was too late. The cultists encircled her, their fervor fueled by unwavering devotion to their leader's teachings. In a harrowing crescendo, the cultists seized Mia, binding her in a ritual. Unearthly chants reverberated through the night, invoking an ancient force that pervaded the air, suffocating and oppressive. As Mia struggled against the cultists' grip, a chilling realization dawned upon her. The Cornfield cult was not merely a group of fanatics, but an entity that wielded a sinister influence over the land itself. In a final moment of horror, the cultists conducted their ritual, offering Mia as a sacrifice to appease the land. Her screams pierced the night before being swallowed by an ominous silence, leaving behind only whispers of the terrifying fate that awaited those who dared to confront the dark secrets of the cornfield cult. In a quaint suburban town nestled among the autumn-kissed trees, the Johnson family was gearing up for their annual Thanksgiving gathering. The crisp air outside hinted at the impending holiday, while inside, the aroma of roasting turkey and simmering spices filled the cozy household. Warm hues of amber and gold adorned the walls, casting a welcoming glow upon the family members as they bustled about, preparing for the festive evening ahead. Margaret Johnson, the matriarch of the family, was orchestrating the culinary symphony in the kitchen. Her husband, Thomas, was meticulously arranging the dining table, making sure every detail was perfect for the impending feast. Meanwhile, their two children, Emily and James, were setting up the living room, adorning it with autumnal decorations and flickering candles to create a comforting ambience. As the day waned and darkness draped over the neighborhood, a sense of anticipation filled the Johnson household. However, unbeknownst to them, a horrific scenario was about to unravel. Far across town at the local psychiatric institution, a man named Gabriel Smith had been undergoing treatment for severe schizophrenia. Gabriel had been committed after a series of violent episodes and delusions that made him a danger to himself and others. Despite the institution's strict security measures, Gabriel had managed to devise a plan, exploiting a moment of negligence by the staff to escape into the night. Disoriented and consumed by his fractured reality, Gabriel embarked on a harrowing journey through the moonlit streets. His mind was a labyrinth of tormenting whispers, urging him to find his way back to a place he vaguely remembered, a place where he believed his fractured memories could be made whole. As the Johnsons continued their Thanksgiving preparations, a sudden knock echoed through the quiet neighborhood. Thomas, curious about the unexpected visitor, made his way to the front door, assuming it might be an early guest. However, as he swung the door open, he was greeted not by a friendly face, but by a disheveled figure standing in the shadows. It was Gabriel, his eyes wide with a manic intensity and his demeanor erratic, a stark contrast to the serene ambience of the holiday. Please, I need to find her, Gabriel muttered, his voice trembling with urgency, his hands shaking uncontrollably. Thomas, taken aback by the stranger's frantic state, attempted to calm him down. Who are you looking for? Can we help you? But Gabriel's gaze remained fixed, his words disjointed. She's here. I know she's here. I have to find her before it's too late. Sensing the man's distress, Thomas hesitated, unsure of how to handle the situation. Before he could respond, Gabriel pushed past him, rushing into the house with an unsettling determination. The sudden intrusion startled Margaret and the rest of the family. Emily let out a startled gasp, while James stood frozen, 
uncertain of what to do. Who are you? What do you want? Margaret demanded, her voice laced with concern and a hint of fear. Gabriel's eyes darted around the room, his breath shallow and rapid. I need to find her. She's my daughter. They took her away, but I know she's here. The tension in the room escalated as Gabriel's presence became increasingly unsettling. His frenzied search led him through the house, overturning furniture and rummaging through belongings in a desperate quest that made the family uneasy and fearful. Attempting to defuse the situation, Thomas cautiously approached Gabriel. Sir, please calm down. We don't have anyone here. Before he could finish his sentence, Gabriel's erratic behavior reached its crescendo. With a guttural scream, he lunged at Thomas, his eyes ablaze with madness. The family's shrieks reverberated through the house as chaos erupted. Furniture crashing and the once serene Thanksgiving atmosphere shattered. In a horrifying blur, Gabriel unleashed a frenzied assault, wielding objects at the family in a frenzy fueled by his fractured reality. Margaret's cries echoed in the chaos as James and Emily scrambled to escape the onslaught, their hearts pounding with terror. Amidst the pandemonium, a chilling realization struck the family. Gabriel was not merely a stranger, but a harbinger of unfathomable horror, an embodiment of relentless madness unleashed upon their tranquil Thanksgiving celebration. The harrowing ordeal culminated in a scene of unfathomable horror, a nightmare etched into the Johnson family's memory forever, a stark reminder of how swiftly and mercilessly darkness could descend upon the most joyous of occasions. As the sirens wailed in the distance, echoing the arrival of law enforcement, the once vibrant household stood desolate. A haunting tableau of thanksgiving turned tragically nightmarish, a tale of a broken mind that shattered the serenity of a family's cherished gathering, leaving behind a trail of unspeakable horror and irreparable devastation. Story 2. In the picturesque town of Maplewood Hills, the serene air was thick with the essence of autumn, painting the landscape in hues of gold and crimson. The Stevens family was bustling with anticipation, eagerly preparing for their annual Thanksgiving celebration. Sarah Stevens, the mother of the household, had spent days meticulously planning the feast, while her husband David tended to the fireplace, filling the home with a cozy warmth that contrasted the crisp November breeze outside. Their children, Michael and Rebecca, were giddy with excitement hanging decorative turkeys and cornucopias, transforming the house into a festive haven. Laughter and the aroma of roasting turkey wafted through the air, promising a joyous evening of gratitude and togetherness. As dusk descended, an unexpected knock echoed through the Stevens' door, interrupting the harmonious ambience. Sarah, puzzled by the unanticipated visitor, opened the door to reveal a figure standing in the dimming light, an elderly man with weathered features and a somber demeanor. It was George Reynolds, a distant relative Sarah hadn't seen in years. George, what a surprise. Come in, come in. Sarah greeted him warmly, though a flicker of uncertainty danced in her eyes. George, clad in worn clothing and bearing a heaviness in his gaze, hesitated before stepping into the welcoming embrace of the Stevens household. His presence evoked an unsettling aura that lingered in the air, an unspoken tension palpable among the family members. I hope it's not too late to join your celebration, Sarah," George said softly, his voice tinged with a hint of regret. Of course not, George. We're delighted to have you here, Sarah replied, masking her unease with a gracious smile. As George settled in, his presence cast a shadow over the jovial atmosphere. The family attempted to engage him in conversation, but George remained distant, lost in his thoughts, occasionally offering solemn remarks that disrupted the festive cheer. Throughout the evening, Sarah observed George's demeanor with a growing sense of disquiet. Memories of distant whispers about George's troubled past surfaced in her mind. A past marked by a grim incident that had stained the family's history. Years ago, George had been involved in a harrowing incident, a murder that had sent shockwaves through their family. He had served his time in prison, but the haunting specter of that dark chapter lingered an uncomfortable reality Sarah had hoped to bury in the depths of forgotten memories. As the evening progressed, unease simmered beneath the veneer of familial warmth. George's presence felt like a looming specter, his hollow stares and subdued demeanor casting a scary pall over the gathering. As the family sat down for their Thanksgiving meal, an unsettling silence settled upon the table. 
The clinking of utensils against plates was accompanied by fleeting glances exchanged between family members, an unspoken acknowledgement of the disquietude that George's presence had stirred. Midway through the meal, a somber hush enveloped the room, shattered only by George's sudden words, uttered in a tone that pierced through the tranquility. I remember this place, George mumbled, his voice hollow, eyes fixed on a distant corner of the dining room. Sarah's heart skipped a beat as she exchanged a worried glance with David. Unnerved by George's cryptic statement, the atmosphere grew increasingly tense. Suddenly, a dark realization dawned upon Sarah. The unsettling silence that had cloaked George's past, the distant whispers, all converged into a haunting moment of dreadful recognition. Before anyone could react, George's countenance contorted into a visage of anguish and remorse. With a tortured expression, he stood abruptly, knocking over his chair in a startling motion that shattered the fragile semblance of normalcy. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, George whispered, his voice laden with guilt as he clutched his chest, his body trembling violently. The room fell into a stunned silence, the air thick with disbelief and horror. Sarah's heart pounded in her chest as she watched in frozen terror, realizing the grim truth that was unraveling before her eyes. In a haunting culmination, George collapsed to the ground, convulsing in agony, his anguished cries echoing through the once celebratory household. Shocked and paralyzed by the unfolding horror, the family could only stare in sheer terror as George's body convulsed and writhed, a haunting finale to their Thanksgiving gathering. Amidst the chaos and distress, the truth unfolded. The harrowing burden of George's past had consumed him, unleashing an unfathomable nightmare upon the Stevens family, forever staining their cherished thanksgiving with the unbearable weight of a dark and ghastly revelation. Story 3 In the cozy town of Willowbrook, anticipation filled the air as families prepared for the cherished Thanksgiving celebration. The Reed family, adorned in warm sweaters and smiles, gathered around the dining table, their home illuminated by the soft glow of flickering candles. Mark Reed, the patriarch, had spent the morning roasting the perfect turkey, while his wife Emily skillfully crafted an array of delectable side dishes, filling the house with enticing aromas. Their children, Ethan and Olivia, buzzed with excitement, eagerly setting the table with vibrant autumn-themed decorations. The mood was festive, and laughter echoed within the walls as the family anticipated the arrival of their relatives for the Thanksgiving feast. As the sun dipped below the horizon, a knock on the door shattered the serene atmosphere. Mark, puzzled by the unexpected interruption, answered the door to find two stern-faced police officers standing on his porch. A chill ran down his back at the sight of their grim expressions. Mr. Reed, we need to speak with you, one of the officers stated, his voice laced with solemnity. Bewildered and apprehensive, Mark invited them in, his mind racing with confusion and concern. Emily and the children watched in worried silence as the officers explained the purpose of their visit, an allegation connecting Mark to a recent homicide in the vicinity. Mark's heart sank, and a wave of disbelief washed over him as he vehemently denied any involvement. The officers, however, insisted that they had evidence linking him to the crime scene, they informed Mark that they needed to take him into custody for further questioning. Stunned and desperate to clear his name, Mark attempted to reassure his family. I promise it's a mistake. I'll sort this out and be back soon, he assured them, his voice wavering with uncertainty. As the officers escorted Mark away, Emily and the children stood in shock, grappling with the sudden upheaval that had shattered their Thanksgiving bliss. Fear and confusion clouded their thoughts as they watched Mark being led away, their hearts heavy with disbelief. Hours passed, and the once vibrant household now felt eerily desolate without its patriarch. Emily struggled to maintain a facade of normalcy for the sake of Ethan and Olivia, but the weight of uncertainty hung heavily in the air, casting a pall over the Thanksgiving celebration. As the evening wore on, anxiety gnawed at Emily's core, and the children's fretful glances mirrored her distress. With every passing moment, the absence of Mark loomed larger, an ominous void that tainted the warmth of their familial gathering. Then a sudden ring of the doorbell pierced the silence, jolting Emily and the children from their worried thoughts. Ethan rushed to answer the door, hoping for Mark's return, but his hopes were shattered as he faced a disheveled man standing in the doorway. It was Mark, 
but his countenance was a haunting contrast to his usual demeanor. His eyes held a hollow emptiness, his clothing disheveled, and an air of desolation clung to him like a shroud. Mark, what happened? Are you okay? Emily's voice trembled with a mixture of relief and apprehension. Mark's response was a hollow whisper devoid of its usual warmth. I didn't do it. I didn't... He trailed off, his words trailing into a haunting silence. Before anyone could comprehend the gravity of the situation, Mark staggered forward, his gaze fixed on an unseen horror that seemed to consume him from within. With a sudden, shocking realization, Emily and the children recoiled in terror as Mark's hands trembled violently, clutching something, a blood-stained knife. In a horrifying twist of fate, the truth slowly unraveled, a truth too devastating to comprehend. Mark's fragmented recollections and the damning evidence against him collided in a dark revelation, a revelation that shook the foundation of the Reed family's world. Unable to bear the weight of his torment, Mark's shattered psyche succumbed to a terrifying reality. With a gut-wrenching scream, he raised the knife, plunging it into his own chest, the metallic tang of blood mingling with the acrid scent of tragedy. Shock and horror paralyzed Emily and the children, their cries drowned by the sudden nightmarish crescendo that shattered the once hopeful Thanksgiving celebration. The gut-wrenching sight of their beloved father and husband succumbing to the depths of despair stained their cherished memories, forever etching a harrowing finale to their once joyous holiday gathering. Story 4. The air hung heavy with the fragrant promise of Thanksgiving, a day for warmth, laughter, and family. The Carter household bustled with activity. The aroma of roasting turkey permeated every corner, blending harmoniously with the sweet scent of pumpkin pie. In the heart of the kitchen, Mrs. Carter orchestrated the culinary symphony, meticulously stirring gravies and basting the golden turkey with utmost care. Mr. Carter, with a jovial smile, prepared the dining room, adorning it with autumnal decorations while their children, Sarah and Michael, playfully set the table, their laughter echoing through the house. As dusk began to descend, guests trickled in, relatives bearing pies, casseroles, and heartfelt smiles. Warm embraces and cheerful greetings filled the air, enveloping the house in a cocoon of familial bliss. Stories of yesteryears intermingled with peals of laughter forging memories to be cherished for years to come. As the night wore on, the Carter residence glowed with contentment, the crackling fire in the hearth casting a gentle warmth over the gathering. Amidst the lively chatter, a disconcerting sense of unease began to pervade the atmosphere. A faint smell of smoke wafted into the room, initially dismissed as a mere errant ember from the fireplace. Unbeknownst to the jubilant occupants, a sinister presence lurked just beyond their sanctuary. A dark figure cloaked in shadows, skulked in the periphery, clandestinely surveying the house, a simmering resentment fueling their every move. Unnoticed amidst the revelry, the figure's malevolent intent festered, stoking the flames of a nefarious scheme. Outside, under the cloak of night, the figure moved with ominous purpose, dousing the walls with a volatile accelerant. The air grew thick with the acrid scent of gasoline as the fiend meticulously drenched the foundation of the Carter home, marking it for destruction. Each sloshing step echoed their vengeful resolve, their heart pulsating with a sinister rhythm. With the stealth of a specter, the figure retreated into the shadows, a flickering match igniting their sinister design. The flame danced to life, a malevolent entity born from the betrayal seeping through the cracks of the night. It crept along the walls, greedily devouring the home, a monstrous fiend unleashed by the twisted desires of one consumed by hatred. Inside, the jovial symphony of laughter abruptly ceased as a faint crackling sound breached the festivities. Initially dismissed as part of the fireplace's ambience, dread slithered into the hearts of the celebrants as wisps of smoke curled around the door frames. Panic seized the gathering. The festive cheer devolved into frantic chaos. Sarah's piercing scream pierced the clamor, her eyes wide with terror as she beheld the tendrils of fire licking at the walls. Reality twisted into a nightmarish tableau, the once joyous home now a blazing inferno devouring everything in its insatiable hunger. Mr. and Mrs. Carter ushered their guests towards the exits, their faces etched with terror and determination. Smoke billowed, choking the once pristine air while flames roared, devouring memories and dreams in equal measure. Amidst the pandemonium, the figure watched from the shadows, 
their twisted grin a grotesque mask of satisfaction. Heart-wrenching sobs echoed through the night as the Carter family, surrounded by the anguished cries of their loved ones, stumbled into the cold embrace of the night, their sanctuary reduced to a fiery abyss. The flames painted an infernal portrait against the dark canvas of the night sky, their home, a mere skeleton consumed by the insatiable appetite of destruction. With a final roar, the structure collapsed in a cacophony of splintering wood and billowing flames, a haunting crescendo to the symphony of terror. The figure, shrouded in darkness, vanished into the night, leaving behind the smoldering ruins and shattered lives, a twisted legacy etched in the embers of treachery. The echoes of that fateful Thanksgiving night lingered, a haunting reminder of the fragility of joy the devastation wrought by betrayal and the horrifying depths of human malevolence. The Carter family's once joyous celebration lay ensnared in the clutches of an unforgiving fate, their lives forever scarred by the flames of betrayal that ravaged their home and shattered their world in a terrifying denouement of horror. I had always been an adventurous soul. The thrill of the unknown and the call of the wild had guided me through countless trails and uncharted paths. But nothing could have prepared me for that one fateful journey into the dense, foreboding woods. It was a crisp autumn morning when I set out, the leaves beneath my boots crunching like brittle bones. A cold wind rustled the trees and I shivered, though I couldn't tell if it was from excitement or the chilling breeze. The forest loomed before me, a sea of trees that seemed to stretch endlessly. I had heard tales of its vastness, but my youthful arrogance led me to believe I could conquer it. As I ventured deeper, the trees closed in around me, casting long, sinister shadows. The sunlight filtered through the leaves in sporadic beams, creating a scary patchwork of light and dark. With each step, my sense of direction began to blur. The trail I'd followed was gradually erased by the relentless march of the undergrowth, Panic clawed at the edges of my mind, but I pushed it away, convincing myself that I could backtrack. Hours passed, and my futile attempts to retrace my steps only left me more disoriented. The forest was a labyrinth, a place where time and space seemed to warp and twist, playing tricks on my senses. The more I struggled to find my way, the further I sank into the heart of the wilderness. My hunger gnawed at my insides, and the water in my canteen was running dangerously low. Panic had now fully engulfed me. The forest felt sentient, as though it were mocking my feeble attempts to escape. The distant calls of wildlife became whispers, and the rustling leaves carried unsettling secrets. I felt as if I was being watched, stalked by something unseen. Night fell like a shroud, and I huddled under a makeshift shelter of leaves and branches, feeling utterly exposed. The chilling symphony of the forest at night enveloped me, the howls of distant animals and the rustling of unseen creatures. Sleep was elusive, as every rustle or distant sound sent me into a state of high alert. Morning brought no solace. The woods seemed to have transformed overnight, the once familiar path now a maze of confusion. I decided to walk in a straight line, desperate to escape this haunting place. But the forest had other plans. It led me in circles and my strength waned with each step. I was hungry, tired, and on the brink of despair. It was then that I saw him or at least I thought I did. A shadowy figure darted between the trees just at the edge of my vision. My heart raced and I chased after it, convinced it was my way out. But the figure remained elusive, a phantom in the woods. Days turned into weeks and my desperation grew. I survived on a diet of berries and rainwater, but it was far from enough. My once taut frame had become emaciated and my clothes clung to my shrunken body. The lines between reality and delusion blurred, and I often heard voices calling my name from the darkness, though no one was there. One night, as I lay beneath a twisted oak tree, the forest revealed its true nature. I was jolted awake by the sensation of something warm and wet on my hand. In the pale moonlight, I saw it. An animal carcass torn and eviscerated, its entrails spread around my shelter like a gruesome offering. Fear clenched my heart as I realized the cruel message that the forest had sent. It was as if the wilderness had become a sentient, sinister entity, toying with me, luring me deeper into its clutches. 
I knew then that I was no longer alone in these woods, but I could never be sure who or what was watching me. The forest held secrets darker than the night, and I had become ensnared in its web of terror. Hunger and fear drove me to the brink of madness and I began to question my own sanity. And then, one fateful day, I saw him again. The shadowy figure, this time closer, more distinct. It was a man, disheveled and wild, with eyes that held a hint of madness. He beckoned to me, his voice a mere whisper on the wind. In my fragile state, I followed him without question, convinced that he was my salvation. He led me to a small clearing in the heart of the forest, where a ramshackle cabin stood. It was a crude structure, cobbled together from rotting wood and tattered cloth. Inside, a fire crackled in a makeshift hearth, casting mystic shadows on the walls. The man, whose name was Elijah, explained that he had been lost in the woods for years, just like me. He had learned to survive in this unforgiving wilderness, and he offered me food and shelter. Desperation clouded my judgment and I accepted his hospitality, though a nagging voice in my mind warned me that there was something deeply unsettling about him. Days turned into weeks as I lived in the cabin with Elijah, my only companion in this forsaken place. He spoke of the forest as if it were a living, breathing entity, a dark force that demanded sacrifices. He claimed that he had made a pact with the forest, offering it sustenance in return for his own survival. As the weeks passed, I began to notice the gruesome trophies that adorned the cabin's walls, skulls of animals and even a few human bones. It was then that the horrifying truth began to dawn on me. Elijah was not merely a survivor, he was a part of the very darkness that had consumed the forest. He was a cannibal. The realization struck me like a lightning bolt and I knew I had to escape. But the forest, now even more sinister, seemed to tighten its grip on me. Every attempt to leave was thwarted, as if the trees themselves conspired to keep me there. Elijah's sanity unraveled further, and he spoke of the forest's insatiable hunger, of the countless lost souls who had met their end within its depths. I knew that my only chance lay in outwitting Elijah, and so I bided my time, pretending to embrace his twisted worldview. I learned his routines and waited for the right moment. One fateful night, as he lay in a feverish sleep, I made my move. The forest, it seemed, had grown tired of its plaything. I crept out of the cabin, my heart pounding like a drum, and plunged deeper into the woods, my every step a prayer to the forces of nature for salvation. The forest seemed to part before me, as if it had grown weary of the game, and I stumbled upon a trail. With a newfound burst of energy, I followed it, guided by the distant glow of moonlight. But I was free, and I would never forget the horrors I had witnessed within the heart of the unforgiving forest. The tale of my ordeal became a cautionary legend among those who dared to enter the woods, a reminder of the darkness that could consume even the most adventurous souls. I've always had a deep love for the outdoors, so it wasn't unusual for me to spend weekends exploring new hiking trails in the wilderness of upstate New York. This particular weekend, I decided to venture into the vast Catskill Mountains, an area renowned for its beauty and serenity. The crisp morning air greeted me as I embarked on my hike following a well-marked trail into the dense forest. The path was clear and the sun filtered through the leaves, casting a dappled light on the forest floor. The sounds of nature surrounded me, from the chirping of birds to the gentle rustling of leaves in the breeze. As I hiked deeper into the woods, I became increasingly aware of the sheer solitude that enveloped me. There was a tranquil and a dead silence that settled over the forest. Although I was alone, I couldn't help but feel as if unseen eyes were watching my every step. The feeling was unnerving, but I shrugged it off as a product of the profound quiet. Hours passed as I ventured further into the forest. The trail had become narrower and the dense underbrush encroached on both sides. I felt a sense of vulnerability, a realization that I was in a remote area where help was far from reach. My goal for the day had been to reach a pristine mountain lake I had read about, nestled deep within the Catskills. It was rumored to be a hidden gem, a place of breathtaking beauty. But as the day wore on, I began to worry that I had veered off the path. I took out my map and compass to assess my location, but to my shock, I couldn't find them. Panic surged through me as I realized that I must have left them behind at my last rest stop. I cursed my carelessness, but told myself that I could rely on my intuition and make my way back. I turned to retrace my steps, but to my surprise, the trail I had been following seemed to have disappeared. 
The once clear path had become an overgrown tangle of branches and underbrush. I fought back the rising fear and decided to push forward, confident that I could eventually find my way back to the main trail. The hours passed and my sense of unease deepened as I continued to walk deeper into the woods. The forest around me had grown unfamiliar, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was lost. The towering trees seemed to loom over me, their branches blocking out the sunlight. The stillness of the woods was broken only by the occasional call of a distant bird. As the day turned into evening, I made the difficult decision to set up camp. I gathered wood for a fire and constructed a makeshift shelter using branches and leaves. The night was quiet and dark, save for the soft rustling of leaves in the wind. The following morning I was determined to find my way back to civilization. I scoured the area for any signs of the trail, but it was as if the path had vanished entirely. I couldn't understand how I had managed to get so disoriented in what should have been a straightforward hike. I continued to walk, driven by a growing sense of desperation. The forest felt like a labyrinth, with no clear direction or landmarks to guide me. The solitude of the wilderness, which had once been so serene, now felt oppressive and isolating. Each step I took seemed to lead me further into the depths of the forest, away from the familiar world I had known. The shadows of the trees cast long shapes on the ground, and the silence was punctuated only by the sounds of my own footsteps. I searched for any signs of human activity, a path, or a clearing that might lead me to safety, but the forest held no answers. I couldn't help but feel as if I had stepped into a different world, a place where the rules of reality no longer applied, desperate to find my way back. My supplies were running low, and I had no means of communication with the outside world. I was well and truly alone, a lost soul in the heart of the Catskills. The forest offered no relief from the oppressive silence, and the solitude weighed heavily on my shoulders. The feeling of being watched never left me, and I couldn't escape the sensation that I was not alone. In my desperate search for a way out, I stumbled upon a small, decrepit cabin deep in the woods. It was an unexpected discovery, a structure that seemed out of place in the heart of the wilderness. I approached cautiously, the cabin's weathered walls casting long, creepy shadows in the fading light. Inside I found the remnants of a life long gone. Old furniture, rusted cookware, and faded photographs covered the cabin's interior. It was as if time had stood still, frozen in a moment from the past. I couldn't help but wonder who had lived in the cabin and what had become of them. The place seemed abandoned, but there was an unsettling feeling of being watched, as if the walls themselves held secrets. I spent the night in the cabin, sheltered from the elements. The hours passed slowly, the darkness outside growing more oppressive. I couldn't escape the feeling that the forest was closing in around me, that I was a mere intruder in a place that did not belong to me. The following morning I continued my journey through the woods, determined to find a way out. But the forest seemed intent on keeping its secrets. I came across strange symbols carved into the trees, intricate patterns that seemed to form a trail of their own. I followed them hoping they would lead me to safety, but they only seemed to take me deeper into the wilderness. The sense of isolation and despair deepened with each passing day. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being drawn deeper into the heart of the forest, as if it had a scary will of its own. I fought to keep my hope alive, clinging to the belief that I would one day find my way back to civilization. The forest had become my prison, a place of fear and uncertainty and I was a lost soul in a realm of shadows and enigma. In the end, I couldn't escape the feeling that I had ventured into a world where time had no meaning, a place where the boundaries between the known and the unknown had blurred and merged. The forest had become a place of isolation and fear, and I was forever lost in its depths. My ordeal in the wilderness had been a descent into the unknown, a journey into a realm of solitude and desperation. The forest had revealed its enigmatic and unforgiving nature, and I had emerged from the experience forever changed. I had returned from the depths of the wilderness, but the memories of my time lost in the woods would continue to haunt me, a reminder of the beauty and the dangers that exist in the natural world. I've always been a nature enthusiast, and hiking has been a passion of mine for as long as I can remember. It was a sunny Saturday morning when I decided to embark on a solo hiking adventure in a remote and less traveled part of the Rocky Mountains. 
The idea was to find tranquility, to escape the bustling city life and reconnect with nature. The trail I chose led into an uncharted territory, a region that had been rarely explored by hikers. It was an area rich in dense forests, rolling hills and breathtaking vistas. The promise of solitude and a genuine wilderness experience excited me. The day began with optimism and a sense of adventure. The early morning sun cast long shadows through the trees as I hiked deeper into the woods. The trail was marked, but it became increasingly overgrown and less maintained as I progressed. It was clear that few had ventured this far, but that only added to the appeal. The songs of birds and the rustling of leaves underfoot accompanied me. As the day wore on, I paused by a tranquil creek to refill my water bottle. The sun dappled the water's surface, and I could see small fish darting in the clear stream. I was in awe of the untouched beauty of the place. My goal was to reach a high ridge from which I'd have a panoramic view of the surrounding wilderness. I knew I would need to make camp up there for the night. With each step, I felt more disconnected from the outside world and more attuned to the wilderness that enveloped me. As the sun began to set, I found the perfect spot on the ridge to set up my campsite. I pitched my tent near the edge where I'd have a clear view of the sunrise. I sat by the fire cooking a simple meal and watching the stars twinkle above. But as night fell, the forest around me came alive with strange sounds. Owls hooted in the distance and the leaves rustled in the breeze. It was the kind of experience I had yearned for, and I was fully in my element. However, it was during the night that my journey took an unsettling turn. I awoke to a cold, chilling howl that echoed through the trees. It was unlike any sound I had ever heard, a low and mournful cry that sent shivers down my spine. My heart raced as I listened to the haunting howl. It was followed by more, as if a pack of unseen creatures were communicating through the night. Fear gripped me and I realized that I was not alone in the wilderness. I had been trained to handle encounters with wildlife and knew that some animals could be territorial or curious, but this felt different. The howling continued, drawing nearer to my campsite. The sensation of being watched grew stronger and I began to question whether this was a natural occurrence or something more ominous. With a flashlight in hand, I unzipped the tent and peered into the darkness. I couldn't see anything beyond the circle of light but the howling was closer now, echoing from the surrounding trees. My instincts told me to remain in the tent, but curiosity and fear pushed me to investigate. I cautiously made my way to the edge of the ridge where the forest below was obscured by shadows. The howling grew louder, and I began to make out the silhouettes of creatures moving through the underbrush. Their eyes gleamed with an scary, phosphorescent glow in the dim light of my flashlight. It was a pack of wolves, their silvery fur illuminated by the beam of my flashlight. They moved with a fluid grace, circling my campsite, their eyes locked onto me. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched the pack. It was a mesmerizing and terrifying sight. I had encountered wolves before, but I had never seen them behave like this, so close to a human presence. The leader of the pack, a massive silver-coated wolf, approached the edge of the ridge and locked eyes with me. Its gaze was intense and unwavering, as if it held a deep intelligence. I knew better than to run or make any sudden movements. For what felt like an eternity, I and the wolf maintained our silent standoff, each assessing the other. The howling of the pack had ceased, and the forest was still. The moment was surreal, a connection between man and beast in the heart of the wilderness. Then, with a subtle nod of its head, the wolf turned and led the pack back into the darkness of the forest. The dark phosphorescent glow of their eyes faded into the night, and the howling resumed, echoing through the trees as they disappeared from view. I was left with a profound sense of wonder and a touch of fear. The wilderness had a way of revealing its secrets, and I had just witnessed a spectacle that few could claim to have experienced. The following morning, I awoke to the sound of birdsong and the warmth of the rising sun. The wolves were gone, leaving only their footprints and the memory of their haunting presence. I continued my hike, my perspective on the wilderness forever changed. I marveled at the untamed beauty of the land and the mysteries that it held. It was a reminder that even in the most remote corners of the world, we are not truly alone. As the days passed, I trekked deeper into the uncharted woods, exploring landscapes that few had laid eyes on. The trail had become less defined and the forest more untamed, but I continued on, 
driven by a sense of adventure and the allure of the unknown. The solitude of the wilderness surrounded me, and I embraced it as a kind of sanctuary. I couldn't help but feel that the forest had revealed a side of itself to me, a realm that few would ever have the privilege to witness. But as time passed, I began to realize that I was venturing deeper into uncharted territory, away from the well-trodden paths of civilization. The forest had a way of distorting time and space, and the sense of isolation grew stronger with each passing day. I continued my journey searching for the next breathtaking vista, the next uncharted wonder. My supplies were dwindling and my encounters with wildlife became more frequent. In the end, I couldn't help but wonder if the uncharted woods held a truth that was beyond my comprehension, a realm of solitude and fascination that would forever remain a mystery. My journey had been a descent into the unknown, a venture into a realm of fear and wonder, and I had emerged from the experience forever changed. I had returned from the depths of the wilderness, but the memories of my time in the uncharted woods would continue to haunt me, a reminder of the beauty and the uncertainty that exist in the natural world. As I sit here alone in this forgotten room, the memories of that fateful summer flood back, like a relentless tide of darkness. I never thought I'd be entangled in something so sinister, so surreal. But here I am, recounting my story, hoping that it serves as a cautionary tale. It all began innocently enough. I had recently graduated from college, eager to embark on the adventure of adult life. The world stretched out before me, full of possibilities. I had moved to a new city and was slowly settling into my job. But something was missing. A sense of belonging, a community. Little did I know that longing would lead me down a path I could never have imagined. One sunny afternoon, while sipping coffee at a local cafe, I noticed a flyer on the community board. It was an invitation to a gathering promising enlightenment and inner peace. The group called themselves the Cult of the Silent Shadows. The flyer showed a serene, masked figure bathed in moonlight, holding a candle. It piqued my curiosity, and with nothing to lose, I decided to attend their meeting. The address led me to an unassuming building on the outskirts of town. I entered a room filled with people of all ages, races, and backgrounds. The atmosphere was warm and inviting, and I felt an immediate sense of camaraderie. It seemed like the community I had been searching for. Their leader, a charismatic man named Gabriel, took the stage. He was a tall figure with piercing blue eyes and an air of magnetism that was impossible to ignore. He spoke eloquently about the struggles of modern life, the chaos of the world, and the need for inner tranquility. We are the silent shadows, he proclaimed, and we offer you a path to serenity, away from the noise and distractions of the outside world. His words resonated with me as they did with everyone else in the room. Gabriel spoke of meditation, mindfulness, and the power of silence in a world filled with constant chatter. It all sounded so appealing, so simple. Over the next few weeks, I attended the Silent Shadows gatherings regularly. The teachings became the anchor of my life. Gabriel's charisma and the sense of belonging I found within the group were addictive. I was not alone in my devotion, many others were equally captivated. As the days turned into months, the group's activities grew more intense. We were encouraged to immerse ourselves fully in their teachings. I began spending more time with my fellow members, often at the cult's secluded retreat deep in the woods. It was during one of these retreats that I began to notice something strange. The teachings, once focused on meditation and mindfulness, had taken a darker turn. Gabriel spoke of the need to shed our former selves, to become shadows of our former lives. He preached the power of silence, not just as a form of meditation, but as a way of life. The group started practicing silence for days at a time, communicating only through gestures and writing. We were discouraged from contacting our families and friends outside the cult, as they were seen as distractions from our true purpose. I began to feel a growing unease, but my attachment to Gabriel and the community kept me from questioning too deeply. I was not alone in my hesitation, but no one dared to speak out against the charismatic leader. One evening, as the sun set behind the trees, Gabriel gathered us around a roaring bonfire. The atmosphere was charged with anticipation. Gabriel announced that to become true silent shadows, we must undergo a ritual of purification. 
The ritual involved fasting for three days, spending all our waking hours in complete silence and meditating by the fire. It was meant to cleanse our minds and souls, to make us more receptive to the cult's teachings. I felt a knot of dread in my stomach but couldn't bring myself to refuse. As the days of fasting passed, I became increasingly weak. My body ached, and my mind felt like a stormy sea. The silence, once soothing, now pressed down on me like a heavy weight. It was as if we were all sinking into a darkness, a collective silence that threatened to swallow us whole. On the third night of the ritual, something changed. As we meditated around the fire, the flames seemed to dance with an eerie, unnatural intensity. Gabriel stood at the center, his eyes closed in deep concentration. Then, with a sudden and unsettling calmness, he began to chant in a language I didn't recognize. The chant grew louder and more fervent, and the flames leaped higher, casting bizarre flickering shadows on the faces of the cult members. I watched in growing horror as the atmosphere shifted from one of serenity to something altogether different. It was at that moment that I realized the true nature of the silent shadows. We were not a community seeking enlightenment and inner peace. We were pawns in Gabriel's grand delusion. He had manipulated us into a cult of silence, using our vulnerability and desire for belonging against us. I knew I had to escape. With trembling hands, I rose from my meditation spot and slowly backed away from the fire. The cult members were so engrossed in the ritual that they didn't notice my departure. I slipped into the darkness of the woods, my heart pounding like a drum. As I made my way back to civilization, I couldn't help but wonder about the fate of my fellow cult members. Had they truly become the silent shadows Gabriel had envisioned? Or had they fallen victim to a madness born of silence and isolation? I reported the cult to the authorities, but by the time they arrived at the retreat, it was empty. Gabriel and his followers had vanished, leaving behind only the lingering echoes of their chilling silence. In the years that followed, I rebuilt my life, forever haunted by the memory of the silent shadows. I learned the hard way that the quest for belonging and purpose can sometimes lead us down the darkest of paths, and I vowed to never let the shadows of silence consume me again. But even now, as I sit here alone, I can't shake the feeling that Gabriel and his cult are still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for their next unsuspecting victim. The darkness of that summer still clings to me, a constant reminder of the horrors that can hide behind a mask of serenity. Months had passed since my escape from the cult of the silent shadows. I had rebuilt my life, but the memories of that nightmarish experience continued to haunt my every waking moment. I couldn't help but wonder what had become of my fellow cult members, and whether Gabriel and his twisted teachings still held them in their grip. I kept a low profile, fearing that the cult might somehow track me down. My days were spent in constant vigilance, always watching my back, always on edge. But I couldn't shake the feeling that Gabriel and his followers were out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the right moment to strike. One day, as I was going through my mail, I came across a letter. It was an anonymous message, a simple piece of paper with a single word written in bold letters. Silence. My heart raced as I realized that the cult had found me, or at least someone who knew about my past involvement with them. I had to find out who sent the letter, and more importantly, whether the cult was still active. I began to dig deeper, retracing my steps and reaching out to former cult members who had managed to break free like me. It wasn't easy. Many were still too frightened to talk, but gradually I pieced together a picture of what had transpired after my escape. It seemed that in the wake of my departure, the cult had become even more secretive and reclusive. They had changed their meeting locations frequently, always staying one step ahead of anyone who might be looking for them. Gabriel's hold on his followers had grown stronger, and his teachings had taken a more extreme turn. Rumors circulated that the cult had become involved in criminal activities, using their collective silence as a cover for illegal operations. But these were only whispers, and concrete information was hard to come by. Determined to expose the cult and bring an end to their reign of silence, I reached out to a journalist friend who had a reputation for investigating secretive organizations. With the evidence I had gathered, we began to dig deeper into the activities of the Cult of the Silent Shadows. Our investigation led us down a twisted and treacherous path. We followed leads, interviewed former cult members, and even managed to infiltrate some of their gatherings undercover. What we discovered was chilling. 
The cult had evolved into a tightly knit secretive society with Gabriel as its unquestioned leader. His charisma and manipulative tactics had only grown more potent over time. The members had become fanatical in their devotion, believing that silence was the key to ultimate enlightenment. But behind the facade of serenity and inner peace lay a darker truth. The cult had indeed become involved in criminal activities, ranging from money laundering to extortion. Their network stretched far and wide, with members in positions of power and influence across various industries. As we delve deeper into our investigation, we realize that exposing the cult would not be easy. They had eyes and ears everywhere, and anyone who tried to speak out against them faced threats, intimidation, and even violence. But we were determined to unmask the shadows and bring an end to their reign of terror. We compiled our findings, collected evidence, and prepared to blow the lid off the cult of the silent shadows. Our investigative report was set to be published in a major newspaper, promising to expose the cult's criminal activities and the dangers they posed to society. But as the publication date drew nearer, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were walking into a trap. My fears were realized on the night before the report was scheduled to be released. I received another anonymous message, this time more ominous than the first. It was a simple warning, silence is golden. I immediately contacted my journalist friend and we decided to go public with the threats we had received. We believed that the cult would think twice about taking any drastic action if their actions were brought to light. The next day, as the report hit the headlines, the cult's reaction was swift and brutal. They released a statement denying all allegations and accusing us of spreading lies and slander. Gabriel, in a chilling video message, warned that those who sought to expose the cult's secrets would face dire consequences. Despite our fears, we pressed on, believing that the power of truth and justice would prevail. But the cult was not to be underestimated. They launched a campaign of harassment and intimidation against us, trying to discredit our investigation and silence us through any means necessary. As the pressure mounted, my journalist friend and I received a tip that Gabriel and his inner circle would be holding a secret gathering in an isolated location. It was an opportunity we couldn't pass up. We contacted law enforcement and provided them with the information we had gathered. On the night of the raid, we accompanied the police to the remote location where the cult's gathering was taking place. The tension was palpable as we approached the compound. We knew that this would be the moment of reckoning, the final showdown with the cult of the Silent Shadows. As we stormed the compound, a fierce battle ensued. Gabriel and his followers, armed with unwavering devotion and a willingness to protect their secrets at all costs, put up a formidable resistance. But the combined efforts of law enforcement and the evidence we had gathered proved to be their undoing. Gabriel was arrested, and his mask of charisma finally shattered. The cult members were taken into custody, their reign of silence broken. The truth about their criminal activities was exposed for the world to see. In the aftermath of the raid, I couldn't help but reflect on the journey that had led me from a naive seeker of belonging to an unwitting victim of a dangerous cult, and finally to a crusader for justice. The cult of the Silent Shadows had been dismantled, its darkness brought into the light. But the scars it had left on my psyche and the lives of its former members would never fully heal. I had learned the hard way that the search for meaning and community could sometimes lead to places of unimaginable darkness. The experience left me with a profound sense of caution and a determination to be vigilant against the allure of charismatic leaders and their promises of enlightenment. As I looked back on the long and harrowing journey, I couldn't help but wonder if the shadows of the cult would ever truly fade away, or if they would continue to haunt me like a lingering echo of silence in the darkest corners of my mind. My name is Sarah and I grew up in a quiet suburban neighborhood with my loving parents David and Linda and my younger brother Michael. We were an ordinary family leading an ordinary life. Our days were filled with school, work and the occasional family outing. But that all changed one fateful day. It was a crisp autumn afternoon when we first encountered the cult. David had taken us to the local farmer's market, a place we often visited on weekends. As we strolled among the stalls, sampling fresh produce and enjoying the vibrant atmosphere, a woman approached us. She was dressed in simple robes, her demeanor calm and serene. Hello, she said with a warm smile. I couldn't help but notice your family. You seem like kindred spirits. 
We exchanged pleasantries and the woman introduced herself as Emily. She spoke of a community called the Tranquil Souls, a group of like-minded individuals seeking inner peace and enlightenment. Emily's words were captivating and we found ourselves drawn to her presence. Over the following weeks, Emily became a frequent visitor to our home. She brought with her the teachings of the Tranquil Souls, a philosophy centered around mindfulness, meditation, and a simpler way of life. She spoke of finding tranquility in a chaotic world, and her words resonated deeply with my family. One evening, as we sat around the dinner table, Emily proposed that we attend one of the Tranquil Souls gatherings. It's an opportunity to experience our community firsthand, she said, to see if it aligns with your desires for inner peace. We were hesitant at first, but the allure of tranquility and the sense of belonging that Emily offered were too enticing to resist. With her guidance, we made the decision to visit the Tranquil Souls. Our first gathering with the Tranquil Souls was held in an idyllic rural setting. A small group of people dressed in robes similar to Emily's welcomed us with open arms. They exuded an air of serenity that was both captivating and unnerving. The teachings of the Tranquil Souls revolved around meditation, minimalism, and the renunciation of worldly possessions. At first, it seemed like a path to inner peace, a way to simplify our lives and find a sense of purpose. But as time went on, the teachings became increasingly extreme. We were encouraged to sever ties with our old lives, to let go of our possessions, and to embrace a life of austerity. The cult members spoke in hushed tones about the need to transcend the material world and reach a higher state of consciousness. My family and I became increasingly isolated from our friends and extended family as the tranquil souls became the center of our lives. Emily, once a mere acquaintance, had become our de facto leader. Her charisma and unwavering devotion to the cult were impossible to resist. As the cult's grip on our family tightened, I began to notice disturbing changes in my parents and brother. They had become increasingly distant, their eyes vacant and hollow. The cult's teachings had taken a darker turn, emphasizing the need for complete submission and the rejection of individuality. I tried to reason with my family, to convince them that we were headed down a dangerous path, but my words fell on deaf ears. They saw me as an outsider, a threat to their newfound sense of purpose. One evening I overheard a chilling conversation between my parents and Emily. They spoke of a final ceremony that would allow them to transcend the material world and achieve true enlightenment. The details were shrouded in secrecy, but the sense of foreboding in the air was palpable. Terrified for my family's safety, I reached out to a childhood friend, Rebecca, who had been concerned about our sudden withdrawal from society. I confided in her about the tranquil souls and their increasingly sinister teachings. Rebecca, now a journalist, took it upon herself to investigate the cult. She uncovered a trail of disappearances, financial irregularities, and allegations of mind control associated with the tranquil souls. It became clear that the cult was not what it appeared to be. Together, we devised a plan to rescue my family from the clutches of the tranquil souls. We contacted law enforcement, providing them with the evidence Rebecca had gathered. It was a race against time to stop the impending final ceremony. As the authorities prepared to raid the cult's compound, Rebecca and I infiltrated the tranquil souls in disguise. We attended one of their gatherings, where the atmosphere was tense with anticipation. The cult members dressed in their robes gathered around a massive bonfire. Emily stood at the center, her eyes closed in deep concentration. The cult's teachings had culminated in this moment, and I feared what would happen next. As the authorities closed in on the compound, Rebecca and I sprang into action. We distracted the cult members, urging them to reconsider their choices, while law enforcement moved in to apprehend Emily and the cult leaders. A tense standoff ensued, but ultimately the cult members, my family included, were freed from the clutches of the tranquil souls. Emily and the cult leaders were arrested, their twisted beliefs exposed for all to see. In the aftermath of the rescue operation, my family and I faced a long and difficult journey of recovery. The hold of the tranquil souls had left deep scars, both physical and psychological. But with the support of therapy and the love of our extended family and friends, we began the process of healing. Rebecca's investigative reporting on the cult led to a nationwide expose, 
shedding light on the dangers of cults and the tactics they use to manipulate and control their members. The tranquil souls were disbanded and their leaders faced justice for their crimes. As I look back on that harrowing chapter of our lives, I can't help but reflect on the thin line between seeking inner peace and falling prey to the allure of a charismatic leader and a dangerous ideology. My family and I emerged from the darkness stronger and wiser, with a newfound appreciation for the importance of critical thinking and the bonds of love that hold a family together. The tranquil souls may have left their mark on us, but we refused to let their darkness define us. We were survivors, and we were determined to live our lives with newfound strength, resilience, and a commitment to never let the shadows of a cult engulf us again. My name is Mark, and I've always considered myself a rational and level-headed individual. I was in a loving relationship with my girlfriend, Emily, who shared my passion for adventure and self-improvement. We enjoyed exploring new places, seeking out unique experiences, and pushing the boundaries of our comfort zones. Life was a grand adventure with Emily by my side. One sunny afternoon, as Emily and I were sipping coffee at our favorite local cafe, she excitedly showed me a beautifully designed invitation. It was embossed with intricate symbols and read, The Benevolent Cult of the Hidden Truth. Emily explained that she had stumbled upon this group online and had been following their teachings for a while. She believed that they held the key to enlightenment and personal growth. The idea of joining a group called a cult made me uneasy, but Emily insisted that it was different. She claimed that they were focused on self-improvement, kindness, and uncovering hidden truths about oneself and the world. With her enthusiasm and persuasive arguments, I reluctantly agreed to attend their introductory meeting. The introductory meeting took place in a cozy yet elegant room in an inconspicuous building. We were greeted by friendly and seemingly ordinary individuals who welcomed us warmly. Emily introduced me to the group's leader, a charismatic woman named Sophia, who exuded an air of calm and wisdom. Sophia began by explaining the group's philosophy centered around kindness, self-discovery, and the pursuit of hidden truths. She emphasized that they were not a typical cult, but rather a community of like-minded individuals seeking to improve themselves and make the world a better place. Emily and I attended several more meetings, each one focusing on personal development, mindfulness, and the cultivation of empathy. The group's teachings were captivating, and I started to believe that perhaps I had misunderstood the word cult. As the months went by, Emily became increasingly involved in the benevolent cult of the hidden truth. She attended their gatherings more frequently, sometimes staying overnight at their retreats. She spoke passionately about the positive changes she was experiencing and urged me to become more involved. But something didn't sit right with me. I noticed that Emily was becoming more distant from our friends and family, and her devotion to the group was bordering on obsession. She began to spend less time with me, and I couldn't help but feel like I was losing her to the cult. One evening, I decided to investigate the group further. I attended one of their gatherings without Emily's knowledge, hoping to uncover the truth behind their seemingly benevolent facade. As I arrived at the retreat, I noticed a serene atmosphere with participants engaged in meditation and deep philosophical discussions. Sophia, the charismatic leader, led a session focused on the concept of inner purity and the need to shed one's past to embrace a brighter future. But then as the night wore on, I witnessed something terrifying. The group's teachings took a darker turn. Sophia began speaking about the ultimate truth that could only be achieved through sacrifice. She spoke of letting go of one's attachments, even to loved ones, to attain a higher state of consciousness. I knew I had to act quickly. The group's teachings had taken a disturbing turn and I feared for Emily's safety. I reached out to a friend, Alex, who had experience in investigating cults and the tactics they used to manipulate their members. Together, we delved deeper into the benevolent cult of the hidden truth, uncovering a trail of disappearances, financial irregularities, and allegations of psychological manipulation. It became clear that this cult was far more sinister than it appeared. We also discovered that Sophia, the cult's leader, had a history of leading similar groups that had all ended in tragedy. She had a talent for drawing in vulnerable individuals and using her charisma to exploit them. With the evidence we had gathered, Alex and I contacted law enforcement and shared our findings. It was clear that Emily was in grave danger, along with the other members of the cult. 
We knew that we had to act swiftly to rescue them from Sophia's grip. We devised a plan to infiltrate the cult's compound during one of their retreats. With the help of law enforcement, we would apprehend Sophia and her followers and put an end to their reign of darkness. The night of the rescue mission was tense with anticipation. Alex and I disguised ourselves as cult members, armed with the evidence we had collected, and a determination to free Emily and the others from the clutches of the benevolent cult of the Hidden Truth. As we infiltrated the cult's compound, we witnessed Emily and the other members gathered around a massive bonfire. Sophia, in her charismatic and persuasive manner, was preparing them for the ultimate truth, which involved a ritualistic act of sacrifice. With law enforcement at the ready, we began to confront the cult members, urging them to reconsider their choices and the darkness that had enveloped their lives. Sophia, however, was not easily swayed. A tense standoff ensued with cult members torn between their loyalty to Sophia and the evidence of her dark intentions. As the authorities closed in, Sophia's grip began to weaken and some members started to question their devotion. In the end, Emily and the other cult members were freed from the clutches of the benevolent cult of the hidden truth. Sophia was arrested, her charismatic facade shattered. The truth about the cult's sinister activities was exposed for the world to see. As Emily and I emerged from the darkness of the cult's influence, we faced a long and challenging road to recovery. The scars ran deep, both physically and emotionally. But with the support of therapy and the love of our friends and family, we began the process of healing. The benevolent cult of the hidden truth may have left its mark on us, but we were determined to emerge stronger and wiser. With a newfound appreciation for the importance of critical thinking and the bonds of love that held us together. Looking back on that harrowing chapter of our lives, I can't help but reflect on the fine line between seeking personal growth and falling prey to the manipulative tactics of a charismatic leader. Emily and I emerged from the darkness stronger and more resilient, committed to living our lives with newfound wisdom and a determination to never let the shadows of a cult engulf us again. The benevolent cult of the hidden truth may have temporarily ensnared our lives, but it ultimately failed to extinguish the light of reason and love that guided us back to the truth. In a quiet, unassuming town nestled deep within the heart of the countryside, secrets festered like mold in the damp corners of forgotten basements. The town was a place where people whispered of mysterious happenings and unsettling tales that kept them awake at night. None of these tales, however, could match the scary legend of the grave robber. The townsfolk had always known something wasn't right about the old cemetery on the outskirts of town. The cemetery had existed for generations, but it was more than just a final resting place for the deceased. It was a place of ominous stories and ominous sightings. For many, it was nothing more than a place they visited during daylight hours, never daring to linger once the sun began to dip below the horizon. The townspeople knew the grave robber's name but dared not utter it aloud for fear that even mentioning it would summon his dark presence. He was known as Elias Thorne, a man with a shadowy past and a reputation that would crack even the hardest of men of those who whispered about him. Elias had a penchant for lurking in the shadows, his gaunt face concealed by a tattered hood and his bony fingers clutching an old rusty spade. The grave robber was no common criminal. He was driven by a morbid obsession a compulsion to unearth the secrets that lay beneath the ground. He wasn't interested in valuables or riches. Instead, he sought something more sinister. No one could quite understand his motives, but it was clear that he was on a relentless quest to unearth the past. The townspeople were haunted by the unsolved mystery that surrounded Elias Thorne. Whispers of his late night visits to the cemetery had spread like wildfire. Some claimed to have seen him, his hunched figure silhouetted against the pale moonlight, while others spoke of creepy sounds and restless spirits. But these tales were always hushed, never reported to the authorities, for fear of retribution from the enigmatic grave robber. As the years passed, the mystery deepened. No one could explain why Elias chose to disturb the graves, why he unearthed the dearly departed and what he did with them. The townspeople grew more and more wary and some believed that he was conducting a sinister experiment, perhaps searching for a long-lost treasure buried in the depths of the cemetery. One crisp autumn evening as a harvest moon hung low in the sky, 
a brave soul decided it was time to uncover the truth about Elias Thorne. Matthew Dawson, a local investigator with a relentless curiosity, had heard enough rumors and could no longer bear the weight of uncertainty. Dawson began researching the history of the cemetery, pouring through old records and archives. He discovered that the cemetery was much older than anyone had suspected, dating back to the town's founding in the 18th century. It was said to be the final resting place of a long-forgotten family, the Wraith Moors, whose dark history was entwined with the town's own. As Dawson delved deeper into his research, he unearthed a disturbing connection between Elias Thorne and the Wraith Moors. It was rumored that Elias was a distant relative of the family, a black sheep who had been cast out due to his twisted obsessions. The Wraith Moors had been known for their bizarre rituals, and it was said that they had been practitioners of dark magic. Dawson's investigation led him to conclude that Elias Thorne was seeking something hidden in the depths of the Wraithmore family crypt. It was believed that the crypt contained not only the remains of the family but also a repository of forbidden knowledge and arcane artifacts. Armed with his newfound knowledge, Dawson decided to confront Elias Thorne on a fateful night when the moon was at its zenith. He knew that he needed to reveal the truth and put an end to the grave robber's reign of terror. Dawson ventured to the cemetery, shrouded in darkness, and approached the Wraithmore family crypt. There he found Elias Thorne hard at work, his spade clinking against the cold stone surface. Dawson watched in horror as Elias uncovered the heavy crypt lid, revealing a chamber filled with ancient tomes and arcane relics. With a voice trembling with fear, Dawson demanded answers from Elias. The grave robber's eyes, hollow and devoid of emotion, met Dawson's gaze. In a voice that sent shivers down Dawson's spine, Elias spoke of his obsession with the Wraith Moors, of the dark knowledge hidden within the crypt, and the power he sought to harness. Elias confessed to practicing the same dark arts as his ancestors, believing that the secrets contained within the crypt held the key to ultimate power. He spoke of the restless spirits that he had awakened, trapped within the cemetery's boundaries, and how he intended to use them to achieve his sinister goals. Dawson knew he had to put an end to Elias Thorne's madness. He pleaded with the grave robber to reconsider his actions, to let go of his obsession, but Elias would not be swayed. With a chilling grin, he reached for a cursed amulet from the crypt, a relic said to grant dark powers. As Elias raised the amulet, Dawson lunged forward, knocking it from his grasp. A struggle ensued with the two men locked in a desperate battle for control of the sinister artifact. The ground beneath them seemed to tremble as the amulet crackled with unholy energy. The amulet's power was unleashed in a cataclysmic burst of energy. The ground shook and the earth itself seemed to rebel against the dark forces at play. The crypt crumbled, burying Elias Thorn beneath its rubble, and sealing the ancient secrets within. Dawson managed to escape the collapsing crypt, but the cemetery had changed forever. The restless spirits that Elias had awakened were finally put to rest and the town was free from the malevolent presence of the grave robber. The mystery of Elias Thorne was buried along with him, and the old cemetery became a place of quiet reflection once more. The townspeople never spoke of Elias Thorne again. The legend of the grave robber faded into obscurity, and the dark history of the Wraithmoors remained a buried secret. But one question lingered in the minds of the townspeople. What had Elias Thorne truly sought in the depths of the cemetery, and had he found it in the end? As the years passed, the memory of the grave robber became a distant echo, a chilling tale told around campfires on dark, moonless nights. The town moved on, but the shadow of Elias Thorne continued to haunt their dreams, a reminder of the darkness that could lurk in even the most unassuming of places. And so the mystery of the grave robber remained, a story that would never be forgotten, a tale of obsession, darkness, and the unearthing of secrets that should have remained buried for all eternity. Years passed, and the town's legend of Elias Thorne began to fade from memory. The once dreaded cemetery was now a tranquil place, its overgrown paths and time-worn headstones standing as silent witnesses to the past. But some residents couldn't shake the feeling that there were still secrets buried beneath the ground waiting to be unearthed. One such resident was Sarah Whitman, a young historian with a keen interest in the town's history. Sarah had grown up listening to the stories of Elias Thorne and the Wraithmore family, and she had always been intrigued by the mystery that surrounded them. 
She was determined to pick up where Matthew Dawson had left off and delve deeper into the enigma that shrouded the cemetery. Sarah began her investigation by poring over the old records, letters, and diaries of the town's founding families. She spent countless hours in the town's dusty archives, uncovering long-forgotten documents that shed light on the Wraithmore family's dark past. She also studied Elias Thorne's genealogy, tracing his bloodline back to its origin. As Sarah delved deeper into her research, she uncovered a startling revelation. The Wraithmore family had indeed practiced dark arts, but it wasn't just dark magic they were involved in. They had been pioneers in the study of alchemy and the transmutation of elements, seeking the elixir of life itself. The family had believed that immortality was within their grasp, and their experiments led to mysterious disappearances and unsettling legends. Sarah's research revealed that Elias Thorne's obsession with the Wraithmoors had been driven by a belief that they had discovered the key to eternal life hidden within the crypt. He believed that the crypt's contents held the final piece of the puzzle, the culmination of centuries of experimentation. The Wraithmoors' experiments were nothing short of alchemical madness, and the secrets they had sought were both tantalizing and horrifying. Sarah couldn't help but wonder if Elias Thorne had succeeded in his quest or if he had met a fate worse than death in his relentless pursuit. Sarah was haunted by the story of the cursed amulet that had caused the cataclysmic showdown between Elias Thorne and Matthew Dawson. She decided to revisit the wreckage of the family crypt, hoping to find clues that had been overlooked. Among the rubble and broken stones, she discovered a shard of the amulet, still emanating in dark energy. As she touched the fragment, Sarah felt a rush of unearthly sensations. Visions of the Wraithmoor's experiments, their twisted pursuits, and the restless spirits they had awakened flooded her mind. She knew that the Shard held a connection to the family's cursed past, and that it held the power to reveal the truth behind Elias Thorne's obsession. Sarah's quest for answers took her deeper into the dark history of the Wraithmoor's and their experiments. She was able to piece together a chilling account of their alchemical pursuits their belief in the elixir of life and the horrifying results of their experiments. It became clear that Elias Thorne had indeed unearthed the crypt's secrets. In his relentless quest for power and immortality, he had discovered the elixir the Wraithmoors had sought. He had taken their research to its final terrifying conclusion, and he had achieved a form of eternal existence. However, the price for such a dark triumph had been high. The restless spirits he had awakened the cataclysmic power of the amulet, and the burden of the Wraithmore's dark legacy had all taken their toll. Elias Thorne had become a prisoner of the very immortality he had sought, a tormented soul bound to the cemetery for all time. Armed with the knowledge of the crypt's secrets, Sarah realized that the only way to free Elias Thorne and the tormented spirits was to reverse the dark alchemical rituals of the Wraithmore's. She embarked on a journey to gather the necessary components to create a counter-ritual one that would restore balance to the cemetery and release the trapped souls. As Sarah worked tirelessly to break the curse, she faced challenges and obstacles that tested her determination and courage. She enlisted the help of local experts in alchemy and ancient rituals, studying forgotten texts and seeking guidance from those who had knowledge of the arcane. After months of research and preparation, the day of the counter-ritual arrived. Sarah, accompanied by a small group of trusted individuals, returned to the cemetery and entered the ruined crypt. They performed the ritual with precision, invoking the power of light and restoration to counteract the darkness that had plagued the Wraith Moors for centuries. As the ritual reached its climax, a surge of energy enveloped the crypt, and the restless spirits, including Elias Thorne, were released from their torment. The ground ceased to shake, and the crypt began to repair itself restoring the tranquility that the cemetery had long lost. With the curse lifted and the spirits at rest, the cemetery was reborn as a place of peace and reflection. The dark chapter in the town's history was finally closed, and the legend of Elias Thorne took on a new significance. Sarah's tireless efforts had not only unveiled the truth behind the grave robber's obsession, but it also brought closure to a long-forgotten story of alchemical folly and the pursuit of immortality. The townspeople, once haunted by their own history, now found solace in the newfound peace that Sarah had brought to the cemetery. The town's residents came to view Elias Thorne in a different light. No longer a malevolent grave robber, he became a figure shrouded in tragedy. His relentless pursuit of immortality had led him down a path of darkness. 
but in the end it was his quest that had ultimately restored peace to the cemetery. The memory of Elias Thorne, the grave robber, lived on as a cautionary tale, a reminder of the dangers of obsession and the consequences of tampering with the unknown. The town would never forget the legend, but they would remember it with a newfound understanding and respect for the mysteries of life and death. In the end, the cemetery stood as a testament to the enduring power of history and the complexity of human nature. The town's past was filled with tales of darkness, but it was also marked by the resilience of those like Sarah Whitman who sought to uncover the truth. The legacy of the grave robber lived on in the form of stories, whispered secrets, and the undying curiosity of those who were drawn to the enigmatic cemetery. And as the years passed, new mysteries and legends would continue to surface, each adding another layer to the town's rich tapestry of history. So the tale of the grave robber Elias Thorne remained a haunting mystery, a story of obsession, redemption, and the unending quest to unravel the secrets. As the sun dipped below the horizon, its final rays painted the sky in shades of crimson and violet. The dense forest surrounding us whispered secrets of the unknown, and the cabin, a remote sanctuary hidden deep within the woods, seemed to beckon with an otherworldly allure. Our group of friends, Sarah, Alex, Mark, Lisa, and Eric, had chosen this cabin for a weekend retreat, ignorant of the eerie tale it held. Sarah, the intrepid explorer of our group, had stumbled upon the listing while seeking an escape from our daily lives. The cabin was a two-story structure, its weathered facade hinting at the stories etched into its very wood. Little did we know this weekend would etch its own chapter into the cabin's history. The first night passed relatively uneventfully. We arrived with excitement, unpacked, and settled into the cozy interior of the cabin. The fireplace crackled with warmth, dispelling the chill that clung to the air. We enjoyed a hearty meal, shared laughter, and played card games long into the night. The cabin embraced us with its charm, and the unsettling feeling that had loomed on our arrival seemed to ebb away. The following day, we decided to explore the forest, its dense trees looming like ancient sentinels. The air was cool, the leaves rustled in the breeze, and the beauty of nature surrounded us. It felt like an ideal escape from the urban chaos we left behind. As we ventured deeper into the forest, a feeling of unease settled upon us. The silence was profound, and the trees with their gnarled branches seemed to close in around us. Lisa, usually the calm and collected one, leaned over to Mark and whispered, Do you feel that? It's like the forest is watching us. Mark, typically the skeptic of the group, couldn't shake the eerie atmosphere either. The woods seemed to have a life of their own, secrets that they guarded with an ironclad silence. That evening, as we gathered around the dining table, we heard it for the first time, a faint ghostly whisper that seemed to emanate from the very walls of the cabin. It was as if the very wood and stone were infused with ancient tales. An uneasy shiver rippled through us and we exchanged concerned glances. Eric, the one with an insatiable curiosity, couldn't resist the urge to investigate the source of the sound. The whisper seemed to guide him to a small locked room within the cabin. Layers of dust veiled the forgotten chamber, and as he swung open the door, he discovered an old journal amidst the relics of the past. The journal had aged, its pages yellowed and brittle. It belonged to a previous inhabitant of the cabin, and the entries told a chilling story. The author wrote of strange occurrences of whispers in the night, shadows that moved of their own volition and a final entry, a desperate plea for help. We gathered around as Eric read the journal aloud, and though we tried to dismiss it as the ramblings of a tormented mind, the cabin's unsettling atmosphere clung to us like a second skin. That night, as we retired to our beds, strange occurrences commenced once again. The whispers grew louder, and eerie shadows danced upon the walls. I was the first to see it. A shadowy figure, human-like but not quite, moved slowly and menacingly across the room. I gasped, awakening the others. Terrified, we huddled together in the living room and our fear escalated with each chilling sound and movement. It was then we decided that this place was no longer safe and we needed to leave at first light. Morning came, but the cabin had other plans. The front door, which had welcomed us so willingly, refused to open. Panic set in as anguished cries emanated from the cabin's very walls. We were trapped, our fate seemingly sealed. 
Desperation led us to the attic where we discovered an old dusty Ouija board. It was a relic of the past, a forgotten game, and its presence heightened the eerie atmosphere. It felt like our last hope, our final attempt to communicate with whatever entity had ensnared us. Placing our hands on the planchette, it began to move on its own, spelling out words in response to our questions. The spirit identified itself as the restless soul of the man who had penned the journal. He had been consumed by a dark force within the cabin and needed our help to escape. We hesitated but ultimately agreed to assist the spirit, hoping that by doing so we could free ourselves from the cabin's sinister grip. We followed the spirit's guidance, which led us to the cellar. There, he claimed, was the source of the sinister, an old locked chest containing the key to our release. As we found the chest and returned to the attic, the cabin's grasp intensified. Objects moved on their own, doors slammed shut, and the whispers evolved into a cacophony of haunting voices. We were undeterred, determined to complete the ritual that would release us from this nightmare. Finally, the oppressive force was expelled, and the cabin descended into an eerie silence. The front door swung open as if granting us passage to freedom. We fled without looking back, leaving behind the haunted cabin, its darkness expelled at last. As we drove away, we couldn't help but cast one final anxious look back at the cabin. It stood serene and innocent in the warm sunlight, its history hidden beneath the wooden facade, as if the evil had never taken root. We returned to the city forever marked by our weekend in the woods. The memory of the cabin would stay with us, a constant reminder that some places, no matter how charming, should remain untouched by human curiosity. We left the cabin to the mysteries of the forest, hoping that it would remain dormant, at least for another generation. The forest of whispering shadows remained an enigmatic guardian of the cabin's history, and the whispering shadows whispered secrets to those who dared to listen. It was a tale we'd carry with us, a story of survival against the unknown, a memory of a weekend none of us would ever forget. The memories of our haunting weekend at the Whispering Shadows cabin remained etched in our minds long after we returned to the familiarity of city life. We tried to move forward, but the eerie events of that retreat were not so easily forgotten. It was as if the cabin's history had left an indelible mark on our souls, and as time passed, that mark only grew more pronounced. Sarah, the one who had originally found the cabin, bore the burden of that experience more than anyone else. She couldn't let go of the feeling that something remained unresolved, a story left incomplete. Her determination to unveil the cabin's dark history became an obsession, a mission to confront her own fears and put an end to the secrets that haunted that secluded place. As she delved deeper into the cabin's history, Sarah uncovered a trail of stories and tragedies that had unfolded over the years. The cabin had changed hands multiple times, each owner leaving behind tales of unexplainable occurrences and bizarre accidents. The most recent owner, a reclusive scholar of the occult, had mysteriously vanished, leaving behind an unfinished manuscript that hinted at a mysterious presence residing in the cabin. The book contained cryptic rituals meant to bind the being, but it was incomplete leaving the entity unrestrained. Sarah became convinced that the key to ending the cabin's curse lay in completing the ritual and sealing the entity. Her determination was unwavering, and she believed that our group, bound by the memories of that fateful weekend, owed it to the cabin's lost souls and to future visitors to confront our fears and put an end to the malevolence. Despite the reservations of the group, we agreed to return to the Whispering Shadows cabin, driven by a mixture of curiosity, determination, and lingering dread. The closer we got to our destination, the more the unease we had felt before seemed to wrap itself around us once more. As we arrived at the cabin, an eerie silence greeted us, as if the forest itself held its breath. The cabin stood before us, its history shrouded in shadows, and it seemed to welcome us back with an unsettling sense of anticipation. We crossed its threshold, not as unsuspecting visitors, but as individuals haunted by memories we couldn't forget. The moment we entered, the whispers began anew, soft and forlorn, as though the cabin itself yearned for release. We descended into the cellar, the incomplete manuscript in hand, determined to complete the ritual that had eluded its former owner. As we followed the ritual steps, the cabin seemed to resist. Objects moved on their own, doors slammed shut, and the whispers grew more insistent. 
the atmosphere became tense and threatening, as though the cabin itself fought to protect the entity that dwelled within. But we pressed on, united by our shared goal, determined to complete the ritual and bring an end to the cabin's terror. The final steps of the incantation were heavy with foreboding, and the air crackled with an unseen force. As the last words left our lips, the cabin let out a chilling scream, its walls seemingly protesting the expulsion of the dark presence. In that moment, the cabin itself seemed to wither and age, as if the very life force that had sustained it was being drained away. We left the cabin for the final time, the forest surrounding it now echoing with a newfound stillness. The cabin had changed, its once haunting presence had lost its malevolence, and it stood silent and unassuming in the light of day. As we departed, we couldn't help but cast one final apprehensive look at the cabin. It stood there, serene and tranquil, its history hidden beneath the wooden facade, as if the darkness had never existed. Returning to the city, the memories of our haunted retreat began to lose their sharp edges, but they remained a part of us, forever etched into our shared history. The Whispering Shadows cabin had lost its ominous reputation, and we left it to the secrets of the forest, with the hope that it would remain undisturbed for years to come. The Whispering Shadows forest continued to whisper its tales, but the cabin had become just another story, an echo of the past. It was a reminder that some places held secrets that were better left undisturbed. The night shift was always my least favorite part of the job. The empty hallways of St. Martin's retirement home seemed to echo with the ghostly memories of its inhabitants. The corridors played tricks on my tired eyes, and the creaks and groans of the old building were unnerving. But it was a paycheck and I had bills to pay. As the new night nurse on duty, I was responsible for the well-being of the elderly residents during the darkest hours. Most of them slept through the night, but a few would occasionally need my assistance. The isolation of the night shift only heightened my unease. It was as if the building itself was haunted by the shadows of the past. The first few weeks were relatively uneventful, except for the occasional patient needing assistance to the bathroom or a glass of water. But as the nights passed, I began to notice peculiar things. The residents, particularly the ones with dementia, would sometimes speak in hushed tones to no one in particular. They claimed to see figures standing at the foot of their beds or hear distant whispers. I tried to reassure them, chalking it up to their old age and fragile mental states. But deep down, their stories sent a cold feeling down my spine. And then there was Mrs. Henderson. Mrs. Henderson was an elderly woman who lived in room 212. She was sharp for her age, a former librarian who still possessed a wealth of knowledge. But as the weeks went by, I noticed she became increasingly agitated during my shifts. One night as I entered her room to check on her, she grabbed my arm with surprising strength. Her eyes were wide with fear as she whispered, They're watching. Don't you see them, dear? They're always there. I followed her gaze, but there was nothing to see. The room was empty, save for the soft glow of the nightlight. I tried to soothe her, telling her it was just her imagination. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. As days turned into weeks, I noticed a pattern. The residents' restlessness seemed to increase with each passing night. They would talk of shadowy figures, distant voices, and faces in the windows. I began to doubt my own sanity, wondering if the isolation and dark atmosphere of the retirement home were playing tricks on my mind. One night, as I made my rounds, I heard a faint sound coming from the basement. It was a soft, melodic hum that made my blood freeze. I decided to investigate, my curiosity getting the best of me. I descended the creaky stairs and as I reached the bottom, the humming grew louder. The basement was a labyrinthine maze of storage rooms and long forgotten furniture. The source of the humming seemed to be coming from one of the rooms at the end of the corridor. The door was slightly ajar and a pale eerie light seeped through the crack. As I pushed the door open, I was met with a scene that froze me in my tracks. In the center of the room, a group of elderly residents sat in a circle their faces twisted with a strange mix of fear and ecstasy. They were chanting in a language I couldn't comprehend, their voices rising and falling in an unsettling rhythm. In the center of the circle was Mrs. Henderson. Her eyes rolled back in her head, her frail body swaying to the haunting melody. 
My heart raced as I watched the bizarre spectacle unfold before me. I had no idea what I was witnessing, but it felt like something out of a nightmare. I couldn't move, couldn't speak as the chanting continued. It was as if time had stopped and I was trapped in this surreal otherworldly moment. I finally mustered the courage to step back and quietly close the door, retreating to the safety of the narrow corridor. My mind raced with questions and fear. What were they doing? What was the purpose of that strange ritual? I decided to consult my supervisor in the morning, hoping for an explanation. The morning couldn't come soon enough. I rushed to my supervisor's office, my heart pounding with anxiety. I explained what I had witnessed in the basement, expecting shock and disbelief. But to my surprise, my supervisor's face remained unnervingly calm. That's nothing to worry about, he said with a dismissive wave of his hand. Sometimes they just do strange things at night. It's part of their condition. I tried to protest to convey the urgency of the situation, but he brushed it off as the ramblings of confused elderly residents. I couldn't help but feel as though there was more to the story than he was letting on. That night I couldn't get the image of the basement ritual out of my mind. I felt a growing sense of unease, a gnawing fear that there was something sinister lurking in the shadows of St. Martin's retirement home. As I made my rounds that evening, I couldn't help but notice the tension in the air. The residents seemed more restless than ever, their eyes darting around as if they were constantly on edge. It was as if the retirement home had become a pressure cooker ready to burst at any moment. And then it happened. As I entered Mrs. Henderson's room, I found her lying in bed, her eyes wide with terror. She pointed a trembling finger towards the window, her voice barely more than a whisper. They're here, she said, her voice quivering. The watchers in the night, they're waiting for you. I turned to look out the window, half expecting to see some malevolent presence lurking in the darkness. But there was nothing. Just the same empty courtyard and the distant glow of streetlights. I tried to calm Mrs. Henderson, but her fear was palpable. She clutched my arm and begged me not to leave her alone. I decided to stay with her, hoping to provide some comfort in the face of her overwhelming terror. As the night wore on, Mrs. Henderson's fear only intensified. She spoke of the watchers in the night, of the things they had seen and the terrible secrets they held. It was a chilling narrative that creeped me out. Suddenly, the lights in the room flickered and dimmed, casting mysterious shadows on the walls. Mrs. Henderson's grip on my arm tightened, and she gasped in terror. I turned to look at the window, and that's when I saw them. Figures, dark and indistinct, stood outside the window. They were tall and featureless, their outlines shifting and swaying in the night breeze. Mrs. Henderson's eyes were locked onto them, her face a mask of pure horror. I tried to pull the curtains shut to block out the nightmarish figures, but they seemed to flicker in and out of existence, as if they were ethereal and insubstantial. I was overcome with a sense of dread, a feeling that we were being watched by something vicious and beyond our understanding. Mrs. Henderson's frail voice broke the silence, her words laced with terror. They're the watchers in the night. They've been waiting for you, waiting for your turn. I couldn't bear to look at those shadowy figures any longer. I grabbed Mrs. Henderson, her trembling body in my arms, and rushed out of the room. As I made my way down the hallway, I noticed that the other residents were also in a state of fear and agitation. They spoke of the watchers in the night, of their long-awaited arrival. The retirement home had descended into chaos. Residents roamed the corridors in a daze, their voices filled with terror and confusion. It was as if a sinister force had descended upon the building, and there was no escape from its grasp. I desperately tried to call for help, but the phone lines were dead, and the lights continued to flicker, casting weird, dancing shadows on the walls. The building seemed to groan and creak, as if it were a living, breathing entity. As I led Mrs. Henderson down the stairwell, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being pursued. The air was thick with an oppressive sense of dread, and the dark figures seemed to be closing in on us. Finally, we reached the ground floor, but the entrance seemed impossibly far away. The retirement home had become a nightmarish labyrinth, and we were trapped in its web of fear and uncertainty. Just as we reached the entrance, I heard a soft, melodic hum the same creepy tune that I had heard in the basement. I turned to look behind us and the figures were there, their shadowy forms looming in the darkness. They were closing in, their presence suffocating and malicious. 
I pushed the heavy double doors open, the night air rushing in to greet us. As I stepped out into the courtyard, I felt a strange sensation, as if the ground beneath me was shifting and undulating. I turned to look back at the retirement home and what I saw will haunt me for the rest of my days. The building seemed to contort and twist, its windows transforming into gaping, hollow eyes that stared out at me with an otherworldly malevolence. The retirement home had become a nightmarish entity, a living, breathing abomination that defied all reason and logic. Mrs. Henderson's voice broke through my shock, her trembling words a haunting lament. They've been waiting for you, waiting for your turn. I turned and fled into the night, leaving the retirement home and its horrors behind. The night air was cold and unforgiving, and the darkness seemed to stretch on into eternity. As I stumbled through the streets, I couldn't help but wonder what had become of the residents and the sinister figures that had pursued us. I was haunted by the memory of the retirement home, a place where the boundaries between reality and nightmare had blurred and twisted. The night shift had turned into a night of terror, a night that would forever haunt my dreams. The retirement home and its dark secrets were now a part of me, an unending nightmare that I could never escape. And as I walked through the cold, unforgiving darkness, I couldn't help but wonder if the retirement home was still there, waiting for its next victim, waiting for my turn to come. Working the night shift in a small research facility was always a creepy experience. The building was situated on the outskirts of town, surrounded by dense forest and far from the comforting glow of the city lights. As a laboratory assistant, I had grown used to the solitude of the night, but one particular night would forever change the way I viewed the facility. My shift began like any other. The research facility specialized in studying rare plants and their potential medicinal properties. Most nights, the silence was broken only by the soft hum of the air conditioning system and the distant chirping of crickets. But that night was different. As I made my rounds, checking on the various experiments, I noticed something odd. In one of the isolated containment chambers, a peculiar plant had grown much larger than it should have. It was a rare species known as Luminaris, with phosphorescent leaves that emitted a soft, eerie glow. But this plant had exceeded its normal size and now filled the chamber. I approached the containment chamber. My curiosity peaked. The soft green glow of the Luminaris leaves cast a surreal, almost otherworldly light on the surroundings. I reached out to touch the leaves, but before my fingers could make contact, a voice behind me said, Don't touch it. Startled, I spun around to see Dr. Eleanor Weber, the head researcher. She was known for her reclusive nature and rarely ventured into the facility during the night. Her face was pale, and her eyes held a mixture of fear and fascination. What's going on, Dr. Weber? I asked, bewildered by the strange occurrence. Why has this plant grown so large? She didn't answer immediately, her eyes fixed on the Luminaris. Finally, she spoke, her voice barely more than a whisper. It's not just the size, it's the rate of growth. I've never seen anything like it. We both watched in silence as the Luminaris continued to expand, its leaves pulsating within strange light. Dr. Weber's fear was palpable, and I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. As we left the containment chamber, she explained that the Luminaris had been a subject of intense research for years. Its unique properties made it a potential game-changer in the pharmaceutical industry. But its cultivation was notoriously difficult, with growth rates measured in millimeters over months, not inches and hours. Dr. Weber believed that something extraordinary had occurred, something beyond our comprehension. She was determined to find answers, and as the night progressed, we delved deeper into the anomaly. Our investigation led us to the main research lab where the Luminaris seeds were stored. To our shock, the seeds had begun to germinate, their tiny shoots pushing through the soil. It was as if an invisible force was propelling their growth. Dr. Weber took a sample of the anomalous plant, and we returned to her office to examine it under the microscope. What we discovered was beyond belief. The plant cells showed signs of accelerated growth, as if they had been subjected to some unknown force. As the night wore on, we became increasingly absorbed in our research, forgetting about the time. The Luminaris anomaly was unlike anything we had ever seen, and it held a dark, magnetic allure. At around 3 a.m., while we were engrossed in our research, a low, guttural sound echoed through the facility. 
Dr. Weber and I exchanged worried glances. The sound was unnatural, a discordant blend of whispers and growls. We decided to investigate, following the sound to its source. It led us to a remote section of the facility that housed the staff quarters. As we approached, the strange noises grew louder and more unsettling. It was as if the building itself was alive with a sinister presence. Inside one of the quarters, we discovered a horrifying scene. The room had been torn apart, furniture scattered, and the walls were covered in strange symbols. At the center of the room was the facility's janitor, Mr. Ramirez. He was huddled in a corner, his eyes vacant, and he muttered incoherently. Dr. Weber tried to speak to him, to understand what had happened, but Mr. Ramirez's words were a nonsensical jumble. He kept repeating the word growth over and over. We called for security and Mr. Ramirez was escorted from the facility. But the sense of dread remained. The mysterious anomaly of the Luminaris and the strange events of the night had left us all deeply unnerved. We returned to the main lab, determined to find answers. As we examined the Luminaris sample, Dr. Weber made a chilling discovery. The plant cells were mutating, merging with other organisms in ways that defied the laws of nature. The more we delved into the research, the more we realized that we were dealing with something far beyond our understanding. Dr. Weber's fascination had given way to fear, and I couldn't help but feel that we had stumbled upon something malevolent. We worked through the night, our research becoming increasingly frantic as the luminaries continued to grow and mutate. Those sounds that had plagued us earlier had returned, filling the facility with a sense of foreboding. At around 4 a.m., as we reached a breakthrough in our research, a blinding flash of light filled the lab. We shielded our eyes, stumbling back in shock. When the light subsided, we were met with an astonishing sight. The Luminaris had grown to an enormous size, its leaves stretching out like dark, outstretched hands. It pulsed within green light, filling the lab with an otherworldly glow. Dr. Weber and I exchanged horrified glances. The Luminaris had become a monstrous, mutated entity, its presence dominating the room. It was as if it had absorbed the very essence of the facility. We tried to retreat to escape the nightmarish scene, but the door to the lab had become sealed shut. Panic set in as we realized we were trapped with the abomination. The Luminaris leaves seemed to reach out, as if they had a mind of their own. We fought to break free, our desperate struggles doing little against the overwhelming power of the Luminaris. The plant seemed to pulse with malevolence, its unnatural growth spiraling out of control. As the luminaries closed in, the facility itself seemed to come alive, the walls shifting and contorting as if they were part of some grotesque living organism. The guttural sounds grew louder, filling the air with a cacophony of whispers and growls. Dr. Weber and I clung to each other, our fear mounting as the monstrous plant closed in. It was as if we had become part of a grotesque experiment, one that defied all logic and reason. The luminaries' leaves enveloped us, their scary light casting us into a surreal, nightmarish world. It was a place where the boundaries between reality and nightmare had blurred. A place where the laws of nature were bent and twisted. And as the luminaries consumed us, I couldn't help but wonder if the plant had become a doorway to a world beyond our comprehension. A world of darkness and malevolence. It was a world that had claimed us. A world that we would never escape. The night shift had become a night of horror a night that would forever haunt my dreams. Working the night shift at an old small town museum had always been a strange and solitary experience. The hallways were lined with dusty exhibits, their silhouettes casting long, unsettling shadows. On most nights, the silence of the museum was broken only by the occasional creak of the wooden floors and the distant hum of a malfunctioning air conditioning system. But one night, as I soon discovered, held something far more sinister beneath its seemingly mundane surface. I had been the night security guard at the Hamilton Historical Museum for years, tasked with keeping watch over the priceless artifacts and ensuring the security of the building. It wasn't a glamorous job, but it paid the bills, and the quiet nights allowed me time to work on my novel. One particular evening, as I settled into the monotonous routine of my shift, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. The usual stillness of the museum felt different. I checked the locks on the main entrance, but they were secure. I dismissed the feeling as mere paranoia, a side effect of the solitude of the night. 
As I made my rounds through the museum, my flashlight beam danced over the glass display cases, revealing a treasure trove of antiques and relics. Ancient weapons, old photographs, and delicate porcelain figurines seemed to watch me as I passed. I couldn't help but feel that the artifacts held stories of their own, secrets that the passage of time had failed to erase. One exhibit in particular drew my attention. It was a display of Victorian-era dolls, their porcelain faces frozen in a lifelike expression. The dolls had always unnerved me, and I never lingered near them for long. However, on this night I noticed something unusual. One of the dolls had shifted position, its porcelain head now turned to face me. I approached the display, my heart pounding. I had been the only person in the museum all night, and I was certain I had locked up securely. But there it was, the doll, its tiny, lifeless eyes seemingly following my every move. I reached out to examine the doll, my fingers trembling. As my hand brushed against the cold porcelain, I noticed a faint scratching sound coming from within the exhibit. I swung my flashlight around, but there was nothing to explain the noise. My unease grew as I continued my rounds, the sensation of being watched lingering at the edge of my consciousness. The more I investigated, the more unsettling discoveries I made. In the natural history section, the stuffed animals seemed to have shifted position, their glassy eyes appearing more animated than usual. I dismissed it as a trick of the light and a result of my imagination. However, the creeping feeling of being watched never left me. I couldn't help but glance over my shoulder, half expecting to see something lurking in the shadows. The museum, once a place of quiet solace, had become a source of unrelenting paranoia. The night wore on and I returned to my desk in the security office to catch up on some writing. I had always been an aspiring novelist, and the quiet nights at the museum provided the perfect backdrop for inspiration. But that night the words eluded me. I couldn't focus, my attention continually drawn to the ambiance of the museum. At around 2 a.m., as I sat staring at a blank page, the museum's old grandfather clock chimed loudly from the adjacent hallway. The sudden, unexpected sound startled me. I got up and approached the clock, wondering how it could have possibly chimed on its own. It was a mechanical clock, not connected to any electrical system. As I examined the clock's intricate gears, the scratching sound from earlier returned. It was now louder, more insistent. I followed the noise down the hallway, my heart pounding in my chest. The source of the scratching was coming from a small, nondescript door that led to the basement. The door, typically locked at night, was now slightly ajar. I couldn't explain how the door had come open, but my sense of unease deepened. With cautious trepidation, I pushed the door open and descended the creaky stairs into the dark basement. The overhead light was dim, casting long, mystic shadows on the walls. The scratching sound grew louder as I descended further into the basement. It was coming from behind an old, dusty curtain that separated a storage area from the rest of the basement. I approached the curtain and cautiously pulled it aside. What I saw made me grasp for air. Huddled in a corner was a homeless man, his eyes wide with fear, his clothes tattered and filthy. He clutched a small, worn-out notebook and scribbled furiously in it with a shaky hand. The room smelled of decay and desperation. I took a step back, my mind racing with questions. How had he entered the basement, and why was he here in the museum at this hour? The homeless man appeared to be incoherent, muttering to himself as he continued to write in his notebook. Are you okay? I asked, my voice trembling. The man's head snapped up and his eyes locked onto mine with an intensity that made my blood turn cold. They're coming, he whispered, his voice hoarse. They're always coming and I have to document it. You mustn't let them in. I couldn't make sense of his words and the feeling of unease deepened. I took a step closer, trying to offer help, but the man recoiled, his eyes filled with terror. They're watching, he said, his voice growing louder. You can't trust anyone, not even yourself. Before I could respond, he bolted from the corner and disappeared into the darkness of the basement. I called out to him, but he was gone, leaving behind his notebook, open on the ground. Curiosity got the better of me, and I picked up the notebook, my hands trembling. The pages were filled with rambling, cryptic notes, sketches of strange symbols, and frantic scribbles about being watched and the need to document everything. It was a chaotic, nightmarish diary of someone who had lost touch with reality. I had a million questions, but no answers. Who was this man? 
and what had brought him to the museum. What had he meant by their coming? As the night dragged on, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The homeless man's ominous warning echoed in my mind, and I couldn't help but wonder if there was more to the museum than met the eye. The sense of unease had escalated into a full-blown paranoia. Around 3 a.m., I made my way back to the security office, intending to call the authorities about the intruder. But the moment I picked up the phone, a chilling sound filled the room. A soft, melodic hum that seemed to emanate from the museum itself. I turned to look out into the hallway, and there, standing in the dim light, was a group of people. They were dressed in black, their faces obscured by masks. They moved silently, in perfect unison, as if they were part of some ritual. My heart raced as I watched the bizarre spectacle unfold. The group of masked figures moved in a circular formation, their movements fluid and graceful. It was a surreal, otherworldly performance. I couldn't explain what I was witnessing and I couldn't tear my eyes away from the haunting scene. The humming sound grew louder, filling the air with a hypnotic melody. And then, with a sudden jerky movement, the group of figures raised their arms in unison and pointed toward me. The sight sent a jolt of terror through my body, and I stumbled back, my pulse racing. I dropped the phone and fumbled for the door to the security office, desperate to escape the nightmarish scene. But the door was stuck and I couldn't get it open. The humming sound grew louder and the masked figures continued to point in my direction. I was trapped, surrounded by the enigmatic performance. The sense of dread deepened as I realized that the homeless man's warning had come true. I was being watched, and I had no way to escape. As the figures closed in, their masks devoid of expression, I couldn't help but wonder what their intentions were and what secrets the museum held. The night shift had taken a surreal, nightmarish turn, and I was left with an overwhelming sense of dread, my every instinct screaming at me to run, to escape the bizarre, sinister spectacle unfolding before my eyes. But the figures advanced, their hands reaching out, and the world around me began to warp and distort. It was as if reality itself had become unhinged, and I was trapped in a waking nightmare, a place where the boundaries between the mundane and the inexplicable had blurred and twisted. And as the figures closed in their masks a chilling mask of indifference, I couldn't help but wonder if I would ever escape the enigmatic grip of the night shift, if I would ever uncover the truth behind the museum's eerie and unsettling mysteries. The chill of autumn had settled into our small college town, and with it came the promise of new beginnings. I was excited to start my freshman year at Crestwood University, eager to make friends and explore the world beyond my hometown. Little did I know that the darkest, most unsettling chapter of my life was about to unfold within the walls of my dormitory. My roommate Mark seemed like an ordinary guy at first. He was friendly, always willing to help with my heavy bags during move-in day and he even offered to share his stash of snacks. We hit it off quickly, bonding over our shared love of horror movies and late-night gaming sessions. Everything was perfect, or so I thought. As the weeks passed, I began to notice odd things about Mark. He was a night owl, staying up until the early hours of the morning. I'd often wake to find him hunched over his desk, staring at his computer screen with an intensity that creeped me out. I tried not to think too much of it, chalking it up to his eccentric study habits. One evening, curiosity got the better of me. Mark had left his laptop open and I couldn't resist taking a peek. What I saw made my blood run cold. His screen was filled with newspaper articles and photographs of missing persons, each one carefully cataloged with notes. My heart raced as I realized the extent of his obsession. Mark, what is all of this? I asked, my voice trembling as I confronted him about the disturbing discovery. He turned to face me, his eyes devoid of emotion. Just a hobby, he replied casually, as if discussing the weather. I'm interested in unsolved mysteries, that's all. But it wasn't just the obsession with missing persons that unnerved me. Mark's behavior grew increasingly erratic. He would disappear for days on end, claiming he was visiting his family or taking impromptu trips. Whenever he returned, he'd bring back strange, unmarked packages that he stashed in the depths of our closet. I tried to distance myself from Mark, spending more time with my new friends on campus, but he always managed to pull me back into his world. 
He'd invite me to movie nights or offer me his snacks, and I'd find myself unable to refuse. It was as though he had some strange power over me, a magnetic pull I couldn't resist. One evening after a particularly long gaming session, I couldn't hold back my questions any longer. Mark, what are those packages you keep bringing back? And why do you always leave in the middle of the night? He grinned a chilling, predatory smile. I have a secret, he whispered, his voice laced with menace. But I can't tell you just yet. You'll find out soon enough. I should have run then, fled from the darkness that seemed to envelop my roommate. But fear held me captive, and I couldn't tear myself away from the web he'd woven around me. Weeks turned into months, and the campus buzzed with rumors of missing students. It was as if our peaceful college town had become a breeding ground for tragedy. I couldn't help but connect the dots, wondering if Mark's obsession with missing persons had taken a sinister turn. One night as I lay in bed unable to sleep, I heard the creaking of our closet door. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched in horror as Mark emerged, carrying one of the mysterious packages. He didn't notice me, too consumed by whatever dark purpose drove him. I watched in terror as he unwrapped the package, revealing a collection of photographs, all of them featuring me. Each image had been taken without my knowledge, capturing intimate moments from my life. Fear gripped me as I realized that I was at the center of his obsession. Mark, what the hell is this? I screamed, my voice trembling with rage and fear. He turned to face me, his eyes filled with a manic intensity. You see, I have a secret and you're a part of it, he hissed. I knew I had to escape to run as far away from Mark as possible. I leaped out of bed and bolted for the door, but he was faster, tackling me to the ground. We grappled on the floor, my fear-fueled strength matching his desperation. As we struggled, Mark's words spilled out in a frenzied confession. He had been responsible for the disappearances on campus, luring unsuspecting students into his twisted web. He had been studying me, preparing for the day when I would become his next victim. With every ounce of strength, I managed to break free from his grip and make a run for it. I dashed out of the room, the chilling echo of his maniacal laughter following me down the dormitory hallway. My mind raced as I fled, knowing that I had narrowly escaped a fate worse than death. I reached the campus security office, breathless and covered in bruises. They took my statement and launched an immediate search for Mark. As they combed through his room, they discovered a chilling array of evidence including photographs and personal items belonging to his victims. Mark was apprehended, and the truth of his dark secret was laid bare for all to see. He had been living a double life, posing as an ordinary college student while hiding a sinister obsession with abducting and tormenting his fellow classmates. In the aftermath, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had taken hold of me. The scars, both physical and emotional, ran deep a constant reminder of the horrors I had narrowly escaped. Crestwood University would never be the same, and neither would I. As the seasons changed and the years passed, I found solace in therapy and the support of my friends and family. Mark was locked away, never to harm another soul. But the nightmares of that fateful year would haunt me forever. The darkness that had once resided within my own dormitory had been exposed, but the true nature of Mark's secret would forever remain a chilling mystery, one that I hoped would fade into obscurity, never to be unearthed again. But the story didn't end with Mark's capture. As the investigation deepened, the authorities discovered a network of hidden chambers beneath our dormitory, each one containing evidence of Mark's depraved activities. The underground lair was a chilling maze of photographs, journals, and mementos, each one linked to a different victim. It became clear that Mark had been operating in secret for years, selecting his victims with disturbing precision. He had meticulously documented their lives, collecting information and mementos that allowed him to assume their identities. It was a nightmare beyond comprehension, a secret so dark and twisted that it defied explanation. The campus was in shock and the media descended upon Crestwood University, hungry for every detail of the horrifying discovery. Students and their families demanded answers, and the university was forced to confront the unthinkable truth that had festered beneath their very noses. As the investigation continued, more victims were identified and the full scope of Mark's crimes became clear. Families were reunited with their missing loved ones, but the scars of their ordeals ran deep. 
Crestwood University would never fully recover from the stain of Mark's actions, and the dormitory where the nightmare had unfolded was forever tainted. In the years that followed, I tried to move on with my life, but the memories of that fateful year continued to haunt me. I couldn't escape the feeling of being watched, of a darkness that lingered in the corners of my mind. The nightmares persisted, a relentless reminder of the horror I had endured. As I walked the halls of Crestwood University, I couldn't help but wonder how many other secrets lay hidden beneath the surface, how many other nightmares were waiting to be uncovered. The campus had been forever changed by the darkness that had taken root within its walls, a darkness that had nearly claimed me as its victim. The legacy of Mark's dark secret would cast a long shadow over Crestwood University, a chilling reminder that even in the most ordinary of places, the most sinister of secrets could be lurking, waiting to be revealed. And so, as I looked out at the campus that had once been a place of promise and hope, I couldn't help but wonder if the darkness that had consumed Mark might one day resurface, casting its sinister shadow once again. I had always thought of myself as someone who could handle life's twists and turns with ease. After all, I had weathered my fair share of ups and downs over the years. But nothing could have prepared me for the peculiar turn my life would take when I moved in with my new roommate, Alex. It was a sweltering summer day when I first met Alex. I had been searching for a roommate to share the rent of my small two-bedroom apartment, and he had responded to my online ad. We met at a nearby cafe, and our initial conversation was pleasant enough. Alex was a tall, wiry man in his early thirties, with a mop of unruly brown hair and an awkward but endearing smile. We quickly agreed to become roommates. His rent payment would be a lifesaver for me, and Alex assured me that he was quiet and kept to himself, which sounded like a dream come true for a roommate. Little did I know that his reserved demeanor would soon unravel into a series of bizarre and unsettling behaviors. The first sign that something was amiss came in the form of late night noises. At first, I chalked it up to the usual settling sounds of an old apartment building. But as the weeks went by, the noises became more distinct and scary. I would hear faint whispers and soft thumps in the middle of the night, as if Alex were engaged in some mysterious nocturnal activity. One night, unable to ignore it any longer, I ventured out of my room to investigate. I found Alex sitting cross-legged in the living room, surrounded by an array of candles. He was hunched over a worn, leather-bound book, muttering incantations in a language I couldn't recognize. His eyes were wide, unblinking, and filled with an intensity that made my blood freeze. Alex, what are you doing? I stammered, my voice trembling with a mix of fear and confusion. He looked up at me, his eyes momentarily vacant, before a twisted smile crept across his face. Just some late night reading, he replied cryptically before closing the book and extinguishing the candles. I returned to my room, my heart pounding in my chest. The encounter had left me deeply unsettled, but I convinced myself that it was nothing more than an eccentric habit, a quirk that I could tolerate in a roommate. As the weeks turned into months, Alex's behavior grew increasingly erratic. He would spend hours locked in his room, and when he emerged, he would be carrying strange items, a taxidermy crow, an antique dagger, and even a collection of unmarked vials filled with murky liquids. I had no idea what he was doing with these items, but it was clear that he was immersed in some bizarre and unsettling hobby. One evening, I returned home from work to find our living room, transformed into a makeshift altar. Candles, incense, and strange symbols were scattered across the floor. Alex was kneeling at the center, his eyes closed in what appeared to be deep meditation. Alex, what is all of this? I demanded, my frustration and anxiety boiling over. He opened his eyes slowly, gazing at me with a scary calmness. I'm pursuing a higher purpose, he replied, his voice carrying an otherworldly quality. I've found a path to enlightenment and I must follow it. I couldn't make sense of his cryptic words and a sense of dread settled over me. It was as if Alex had ventured into a world of his own, one that was steeped in mysticism and darkness. I couldn't fathom what had led him down this path or how it had taken hold of him so completely. As the days turned into weeks, I became increasingly isolated in my own home. Alex's presence loomed over me like a dark cloud, and I couldn't escape the feeling that he was hiding something, something far more sinister than his eccentric hobbies. It was as though a wall had been erected between us and I was left on the outside, 
trying to peer in and make sense of the madness that had consumed my roommate. One night, unable to sleep, I decided to investigate further. I carefully picked the lock to Alex's room and ventured inside. What I discovered would haunt me for the rest of my days. The walls of his room were covered in intricate symbols, drawn in what appeared to be blood. Shelves were lined with ancient-looking books, each one filled with cryptic texts and illustrations of grotesque creatures. The air was heavy with the scent of incense, and in the center of the room I found a circle etched into the floor, surrounded by candles and adorned with disturbing symbols. As I inspected the room, I stumbled upon a hidden compartment beneath the floorboards. Inside, I found a collection of journals, each one filled with Alex's ramblings and accounts of his bizarre experiences. He wrote of visions of encounters with entities from other realms and of a growing obsession with the occult. My heart raced as I realized the depth of Alex's descent into madness. It was clear that he had become entangled in a world of dark magic and forbidden knowledge, and there was no telling where it would lead him or what it might mean for me. Terrified and unsure of what to do, I confronted Alex about what I had discovered. His reaction was unlike anything I could have anticipated. He laughed, a chilling, mirthless laugh. You've stumbled upon the truth, my friend, he said, his eyes gleaming with a manic intensity. I've unlocked the secrets of the universe and there's no turning back. I knew then that I had to escape, to flee from the madness that had consumed my roommate. I packed my belongings hastily and made plans to move out. But as I prepared to leave, I couldn't shake the feeling that Alex's dark obsession would follow me, that I had become entangled in a web of darkness that would never let me go. As I settled into my new apartment far away from the nightmare of my old life, I couldn't help but wonder what had become of Alex. Had his obsession with the occult consumed him completely, or had he found some semblance of peace? I would never know the answers, but the memory of those eerie nights in our shared apartment would haunt me forever. I had learned a valuable lesson about the darkness that can lurk within the hearts and minds of those we think we know. It was a lesson that would stay with me, a reminder that sometimes the most unsettling and inexplicable mysteries can be found closer to home than we ever imagined. In the years that followed, I tried to put the nightmare of my former roommate behind me to move on with my life and leave the darkness that had consumed him far behind. But I couldn't escape the feeling that some part of that darkness had latched onto me, that I had become a part of a story that was far from over. And so, as I looked out at the world, I couldn't help but wonder how many other individuals were hiding their own dark secrets, how many others were on the brink of a descent into madness and obsession. The line between reality and the unknown was thinner than I had ever imagined and I couldn't help but fear what lurked on the other side. Living with roommates was nothing new to me. In fact, it had been a significant part of my adult life since graduating from college. The shared rent, responsibilities, and the occasional company of fellow housemates had always seemed like a reasonable arrangement. But when my new roommate, John, introduced me to his girlfriend, Sarah, our home dynamic took a turn into uncharted territory revealing a dark secret that would forever change my perspective on shared living. John had moved in about a month ago, taking over the room across the hall from mine in our cozy two-bedroom apartment. He was a friendly, easygoing guy, always ready with a joke or a helping hand when needed. He had mentioned his girlfriend, Sarah, a few times in passing, but I hadn't had the chance to meet her until one fateful Friday evening. I was relaxing in the living room engrossed in a book when I heard the front door swing open followed by the muffled sound of conversation. I looked up as John and a woman entered the apartment. She was petite with a cascade of jet black hair and an air of mystery that seemed to envelop her. Hey, this is Sarah, John said with a warm smile. Sarah, meet my roommate, Alex. Sarah extended her hand and I shook it, offering a polite greeting. There was something about her that piqued my curiosity, a sense that there was more to her than met the eye. But I dismissed it as mere intrigue, thinking that perhaps it was just my overactive imagination. As the weeks went by, Sarah became a regular presence in our apartment. She and John spent most evenings together, cooking dinner, watching movies, and sharing stories of their day. On the surface, they appeared to be the picture-perfect couple, deeply in love and genuinely happy. However, I couldn't help but notice that Sarah had a certain aloofness about her. She would often retreat into herself, lost in thought as if carrying a weighty secret. 
I tried to respect their privacy and dismissed it as a personal quirk, but a growing unease began to gnaw at me. One evening, I found myself alone in the kitchen with Sarah. John had gone out to run some errands, leaving us in an awkward silence. I decided to break the ice. So Sarah, how did you and John meet? I asked, trying to keep the conversation light. Her eyes flickered with a shadow of something I couldn't quite place, a mixture of sadness and fear. We met at a support group, she replied, her voice barely above a whisper. A support group, I asked, intrigued and concerned by her answer. Sarah hesitated for a moment before continuing. Yes, it's a group for people who have experienced trauma, she said, choosing her words carefully. I could sense that Sarah was holding something back, something dark and painful. I didn't want to pry, but my curiosity got the better of me. Trauma? I asked gently, hoping she would open up a little more. She took a deep breath, her eyes welling with tears. I can't go into details, but let's just say that we've both been through some really difficult times, she replied, her voice trembling. I didn't press her for more information, but her words left a lingering sense of unease. I couldn't help but wonder what kind of trauma had brought Sarah and John together, and what dark secret she was hiding beneath her quiet demeanor. Over the following weeks, I began to notice subtle changes in Sarah's behavior. She would often startle easily, her eyes darting around the room as if expecting danger to strike at any moment. Her cheerful moments with John grew fewer, replaced by long periods of brooding silence. One evening, as I was in my room working on a project, I overheard a heated argument between Sarah and John in the living room. Their voices were raised and I couldn't make out the words, but the tension in the air was palpable. It was the first time I had witnessed such a dispute between them, and it left me with a growing sense of concern. The following morning I ran into John in the kitchen. He looked exhausted, his eyes bloodshot from what appeared to be a sleepless night. Is everything okay with you and Sarah? I asked cautiously. John sighed, running a hand through his disheveled hair. We've been going through a rough patch lately, he admitted. Sarah's been dealing with some personal demons, and it's been taking a toll on both of us. I wanted to offer my support, to reach out to Sarah and let her know that she wasn't alone, but I didn't know how to breach the subject without intruding on their privacy. Instead, I decided to keep a watchful eye on the situation, hoping that things would eventually improve. As the days turned into weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong with Sarah. She had become increasingly withdrawn, rarely leaving the apartment except for her support group meetings. I had tried to strike up casual conversations with her, but she would respond with one-word answers, her eyes haunted by a deep sadness. One evening as I was returning from work, I found Sarah sitting alone in the, her eyes fixed on the flickering television screen. Her gaze was distant, and she appeared lost in a world of her own. Sarah, are you okay? I asked, genuinely concerned. She turned to look at me, her eyes welling with tears. I can't do this anymore, Alex, she whispered, her voice filled with anguish. I sat down next to her, offering a comforting presence. Do what, Sarah, you can talk to me. She hesitated for a moment as if wrestling with her thoughts. Then, in a trembling voice, she began to reveal her dark secret. I've been living in fear for years, she confessed, her words heavy with pain. There's someone from my past, a dangerous person who's been haunting me. I thought I could escape, start a new life with John, but he's found me. And now he's threatening to destroy everything I hold dear. I listened in shock as Sarah recounted a harrowing tale of abuse, manipulation, and a relentless pursuit by a figure from her past. She had been forced to change her identity, move to a different city, and joined the support group to escape the tormentor who had haunted her for so long. Tears streamed down her face as she spoke, and I could see the terror in her eyes. It was a story of unimaginable suffering, and I couldn't help but feel a deep sympathy for her. Why haven't you gone to the police? I asked, my concern growing. Sarah's expression turned to one of sheer terror. I can't, she whispered, her voice barely audible. He's always been one step ahead of me. If he finds out that I've gone to the police, he'll stop at nothing to find me. I can't put John or anyone else in danger. I realized that Sarah was trapped in a living nightmare, unable to escape the dark shadow of her past. It was a chilling revelation, and I knew that I had to do everything in my power to help her. 
Over the next few days, I worked with Sarah to develop a plan to ensure her safety. We installed security measures in our apartment, changed her routines, and she began attending therapy sessions to address the trauma she had endured. It was a small glimmer of hope in an otherwise bleak situation. But as we delved deeper into the intricacies of Sarah's past, it became clear that her tormentor was growing increasingly relentless. Strange and threatening messages would appear on our doorstep, and we would occasionally spot a shadowy figure lurking in the shadows near our building. The situation reached a breaking point one fateful night. John had gone out to run an errand, leaving Sarah and me alone in the apartment. As we sat in the living room, the light suddenly went out, plunging us into darkness. Fear clenched at my chest as I fumbled for my phone to use as a flashlight. I could hear Sarah's rapid breathing, and I knew that we were not alone in the apartment. The sound of shuffling footsteps echoed through the darkness, drawing nearer with each passing moment. Suddenly, a figure emerged from the shadows, bathed in the dim glow of my phone's flashlight. It was a man, tall and menacing, with a look of malevolence in his eyes. He advanced toward us, a chilling smile on his lips. Sarah, you can't hide from me, he hissed, his voice dripping with malice. I sprang into action, doing my best to shield Sarah from the intruder. With a surge of adrenaline, I managed to push him back and slam the door shut, locking it securely. Call the police, I told Sarah urgently, as I braced the door with all my strength. Sarah dialed 911, and I could hear her shaky voice as she relayed our terrifying situation to the dispatcher. Meanwhile, the intruder pounded on the door, his threats growing more unhinged by the second. Minutes felt like hours as we waited for the police to arrive. The intruder continued his relentless assault on the door and I could feel my strength waning. Just when it seemed like he might break through, the sound of sirens filled the air and the intruder fled into the night. The police arrived, taking our statements and promising to investigate the incident. It was a small victory, but it came at a great cost. Sarah was traumatized by the encounter, and the fear that had consumed her for so long had now become a horrifying reality. In the days that followed, Sarah and John decided to relocate to a different city, hoping to escape the relentless tormentor who had haunted their lives. I helped them pack their belongings and wished them well, hoping that the distance would finally provide them with the safety and peace they deserved. As I watched them drive away, I couldn't help but reflect on the darkness that can lurk beneath the surface of seemingly ordinary lives. Sarah's ordeal had been a stark reminder that the past can cast a long shadow, one that can engulf even the most promising futures. I returned to my apartment, grateful that Sarah and John were safe, but haunted by the knowledge that their tormentor was still out there, lurking in the shadows. It was a chilling reminder that sometimes, the darkest secrets are the ones that threaten to consume us whole, and that even in the face of unimaginable fear, there is always a glimmer of hope. And so as I settled back into my quiet, unassuming life, I couldn't help but wonder how many other individuals were living with their own dark secrets, how many others were grappling with the shadows of their pasts. It was a sobering thought, a reminder that we never truly know the demons that may be lurking just beneath the surface. The day we moved into Sterling House was like any other. The sun cast long shadows on the lawn as we carried our boxes through the creaking front door. My husband David and I had always dreamed of owning an old Victorian house, and Sterling House was the embodiment of that dream. It was a stately three-story structure with a wraparound porch, intricate woodwork, and a history that whispered through its weathered walls. Our two children, Emily and Daniel, were thrilled at the idea of living in such a grand house, though there was one peculiar aspect that gave them pause. The townsfolk had whispered about the house, calling it haunted and cursed. They claimed it was a place of restless spirits and unexplained events. But we dismissed these stories as mere superstition, eager to start our new life. The first night in Sterling House was quiet and uneventful. We gathered in the cozy, old-fashioned living room to celebrate our new beginning. The fireplace crackled with life and Emily and Daniel played with their toys. The only thing that seemed odd was the faint odor of roses that lingered in the air, but we attributed it to some old potpourri left behind by the previous owners. That night, as we settled into our respective rooms, I couldn't help but marvel at the house's character. The rooms were spacious, 
and the moonlight filtered through the lace curtains, casting intricate patterns on the hardwood floors. I fell asleep to the soothing sound of the wind rustling through the leaves outside. But then, in the dead of night, I was jolted awake by a soft, distant whisper. It was so faint that I couldn't make out the words. I lay in bed, straining my ears, but the voice disappeared as quickly as it had come. I shook off the cold feeling, blaming it on my imagination running wild. Over the next few weeks, strange things began to happen. Emily started having vivid nightmares, waking up in tears, speaking of a dark figure at the foot of her bed. Daniel claimed he saw his toys move on their own and heard whispers in the hallways. I too experienced the whispered voices at odd hours, and the scent of roses became more pronounced. David, ever the skeptic, brushed off our concerns, attributing it to stress and our overactive imaginations. He urged us to embrace the house's charm and history, rather than fear its supposed hauntings. One day, while I was cleaning out the attic, I came across a stack of old, dusty journals. They were filled with the handwritten thoughts and experiences of previous residents. The entries were a mix of mundane daily life and accounts of strange occurrences that mirrored our own. One sentence from the year 1923 stood out. The whispers persist and I can't bear to sleep in the master bedroom anymore. The scent of roses lingers and I often feel a cold presence by my side. I know not what haunts this house, but I am certain it is not of this world. The journal was filled with similar stories and it sent a cold breeze down my back. I shared my discovery with David who, despite his skepticism, couldn't deny the scary connection between our experiences and those of the previous residents. As our unease grew, we decided to investigate the house's history. We discovered that a family named the Sterlings had lived in the house for generations until it was sold to the family we had purchased it from. The Sterlings had been prominent in the town, known for their wealth and power. Rumor had it that the family had a dark side, dabbling in the occult and dark practices. Determined to put an end to the unsettling occurrences, we decided to contact a local historian to learn more about the Sterling family's past. The historian, Mrs. Anderson, was a frail elderly woman with a wealth of knowledge about the town's history. She invited us to her home to share her findings. Mrs. Anderson's living room was filled with ancient books and dusty tomes. She began to recount the history of the Sterlings, explaining that they had been obsessed with the occult and the afterlife. They were rumored to have performed dark rituals within the house, and it was said that they had communed with the dead. The Sterlings were searching for something beyond the realm of the living, Mrs. Anderson said. They believed that the house held a gateway to another world, and their experiments were their attempt to bridge the gap between life and death. As she spoke, I couldn't help but wonder if the strange occurrences we'd experienced were somehow linked to the Sterling family's obsession with the supernatural. Mrs. Anderson offered to help us cleanse the house and rid it of any lingering negative energy. She explained that we needed to perform a ritual that would break the connection between our world and the other side. That night we gathered in the living room, the hearth crackling with a warm fire. Mrs. Anderson led the ritual, guiding us through each step. We lit candles, burned sage, and recited incantations to banish any lingering spirits. As we chanted, the air grew heavy and the scent of roses became overpowering. A soft wind rustled through the curtains. Suddenly, the temperature in the room dropped and a shadowy figure materialized before us. It was a woman, her eyes hollow and sorrowful. She seemed to be from another time, dressed in a gown reminiscent of the early 1900s. Her presence made my blood freeze. The figure spoke in a soft, mournful voice. You have awakened me from my slumber. I am Isabella Sterling, and I have been trapped in this house for eternity. The experiments of my family tethered me to this realm, and I have longed for release. Tears welled up in her eyes as she told us her story. Isabella explained that she had been an innocent victim of her family's dark pursuits. They had used her as a vessel to communicate with the dead and her spirit had been bound to the house ever since. We felt a deep sympathy for Isabella, trapped in a liminal state between life and death. Mrs. Anderson continued the ritual, beseeching Isabella to find peace and move on to the afterlife. Isabella's form began to waver, and her voice faded as she gradually disappeared into the ether. The room grew still and the scent of roses lifted. It was as though the weight of centuries had been lifted from Sterling House. We completed the ritual, 
ensuring that Isabella's spirit had found the release it had longed for. In the days that followed, the house felt different. The air was lighter, and the unsettling occurrences ceased. Emily and Daniel's nightmares subsided, and the whispers that had haunted us for weeks disappeared. It was as if the house had been cleansed of its dark past. Sterling House, once a place of fear and uncertainty, had become a warm and welcoming home. Isabella's presence no longer lingered, and the history that had whispered through its walls was now a distant echo. We had finally found peace in our new home. As the years passed, we cherished our time in Sterling House. It had become a place of happiness, where our family had grown. My name is Alex Holloway, and I never believed in ghosts until I moved into Hollywood House. I had inherited the old Victorian mansion from a distant relative I'd never met. The news of my sudden inheritance came as a shock, but the prospect of living in such a grand, historic house excited me. Little did I know that the house came with a history that would test the very limits of my skepticism. I had always considered myself a rational, level-headed person. I was an engineer by profession, and I approached life with a practical and analytical mindset. Ghost stories were nothing more than tales told around campfires designed to scare and amuse. But that was before I set foot in Hollywood House. The mansion sat atop a hill overlooking the sleepy town of Hollywood. The exterior was a sight to behold with its ornate architecture, towering turrets, and sprawling gardens. It was a place that seemed to belong to a different era, and the townsfolk whispered about its dark past. The house had stood empty for as long as anyone could remember, and its imposing presence cast a shadow over the town. My first night in Hollywood House was a surreal experience. As I walked through the echoing hallways with a single flickering candle, I couldn't help but wonder about the stories I'd heard. People claimed to have seen figures in the windows at night, heard unexplained footsteps in the empty corridors, and witnessed lights flicker and doors open and close on their own. These were the tales that had earned the mansion its haunted reputation. I settled into one of the spacious bedrooms on the second floor, the large canopy bed and heavy drapes making me feel like I'd stepped into a period drama. As I lay in bed, I tried to dismiss the unease I felt. The wind whistled through the old windows and the house seemed to sigh with its own ancient history. That night, as I drifted off to sleep, I heard it, a faint distant whisper. I dismissed it as a trick of the wind or my own overactive imagination. But the whisper persisted, growing louder and more distinct. It was as though a voice from the past was trying to communicate with me. I strained my ears and the words became clearer. Help me, the voice pleaded, soft and trembling. My heart raced as I sat up in bed, my breaths coming quick and shallow. The voice sounded desperate, like a soul in torment. I leaped out of bed and searched the room, but there was no one to be found. The windows were shut tight and the doors were locked. I had heard the voice, there was no doubt about it, but its source remained a mystery. In the following days, I tried to put the incident out of my mind, convincing myself that it had been a vivid dream. I was determined not to let such irrational thoughts take hold of me. I delved into my work, focusing on renovations to make the house livable. However, the feeling of being watched and the whispers persisted. It was as though the house itself was trying to communicate with me, to tell me something I couldn't yet comprehend. One evening, as I was exploring the dusty attic, I came across a trove of old letters and journals. They were written by the previous inhabitants of Hollywood House, the Eldridges, who had lived there in the late 19th century. The journals were filled with accounts of strange occurrences that mirrored my own experiences. One of them caught my eye. The house is not what it seems. It harbors a presence that defies explanation. We hear the whispers at night, voices from another world, and the shadows move with a purpose we cannot comprehend. The house is cursed, and it hungers for something we cannot fathom. The journals were filled with similar stories, of doors that opened on their own, of apparitions in the hallways, and of voices that pleaded for help. The Eldridges had lived in constant fear, and they eventually abandoned the house, leaving it to decay. I couldn't ignore the striking similarities between their experiences and my own. The house was not just haunted, it was cursed, as if an insatiable darkness clung to its very foundations. As I continued my research, I learned that the house had been built on the site of a tragic event a fire that had claimed the lives of several townspeople. 
It was said that the souls of those who had perished in the fire were never at rest, and their restless spirits haunted the mansion. My skepticism wavered as the evidence piled up. The history of Hollywood House was filled with inexplicable events and unexplained phenomena. It was clear that the house held secrets that defied logic and reason. One night, as I sat in the library, the whispers grew louder. They seemed to surround me, as if the walls themselves were trying to communicate. I strained to listen, and the voice became distinct, a woman's voice filled with anguish. Help me, she implored, her words resonating with sorrow. I followed the voice to the grand staircase where a shadowy figure materialized before me. It was a woman, her eyes filled with despair. She was dressed in a gown from a bygone era, and her form flickered in and out of existence. My name is Eleanor, she said, her voice trembling. I died in the fire and my spirit has been trapped here ever since. You are our only hope. Eleanor's story was one of tragedy. She had been a resident of Hollowood, a young woman with dreams and aspirations, until the fateful night of the fire. She had perished along with others, and their spirits had been bound to the house, unable to find peace. I couldn't turn my back on Eleanor's plea for help. I reached out to a local historian, Mr. Thompson, who had spent years researching the history of Hollowood House, he explained that the house was a focal point for paranormal activity, a place where the veil between the living and the dead was thin. With Mr. Thompson's guidance, we decided to conduct a ritual to free the trapped souls and cleanse the house of its dark history. We gathered in the living room, surrounded by candles and incense, and recited incantations passed down through generations. As we chanted, the atmosphere grew heavy, and the air seemed to vibrate with energy. The whispers in the walls intensified, as if the spirits were aware of our intentions. I felt a presence in the room, a gathering of souls seeking release. Suddenly the room grew icy cold and the shadowy figures of the trapped souls materialized before us. Eleanor, along with others, stood in a solemn assembly, their eyes filled with gratitude and longing. The atmosphere was charged with emotion as we completed the ritual. The spirits began to fade, their forms dissolving into the ether. Eleanor's voice, filled with relief, echoed through the room. Thank you, she whispered, and then she was gone. The house fell silent and the weight of its cursed history seemed to lift. The whispers were gone and the oppressive atmosphere had dissipated. I had not only inherited a haunted house, but had played a part in setting its restless souls free. In the weeks that followed, Hollywood House no longer felt haunted. It was a place of serenity, with no whispers or unexplained phenomena. The history of the mansion had changed from one of darkness to one of redemption. As I continued my life in Hollywood, I couldn't help but reflect on the mysteries of the house. I had learned that sometimes, the unexplainable defied the rational mind. The spirits that had haunted the house were not malevolent, but trapped souls seeking release from their torment. I had been a part of their liberation, and the experience had forever altered my perception of the supernatural. Hollywood House, once a place of fear and uncertainty, had become a sanctuary of peace and redemption. Its history no longer whispered of despair, but of the resilience of the human spirit and the power of compassion and understanding. And as I looked out at the town of Hollywood from the mansion's grand windows, I knew that the house had found its own peace, and so had I. And as I looked out at the town of Hollywood from the mansion's grand windows, I knew that the house had found its own peace, and so had I. I had always imagined that the first year of marriage would be full of love, laughter, and adventure. My husband John and I were excited to begin this journey together. Little did we know that our adventure would take us to a place shrouded in mystery and darkness, a house with a history that had the townsfolk filled with fear. The house stood at the end of Willow Street, an imposing Victorian structure that loomed over the neighborhood. The moment we laid eyes on it, we fell in love. The high, arched windows, the ornate wooden details, and the sprawling garden in the back. Everything about the house was perfect. We were told that it had been empty for years, but no one seemed eager to share the reason. As we moved in, I couldn't help but feel a sense of trepidation. The house had an air of antiquity, with creaking floorboards and long, dark hallways. The previous owner had left behind old, dusty furniture that seemed to belong to another era. 
The entire place was a throwback to the 19th century. We spent our first few days unpacking and exploring our new home. The living room was adorned with a grand fireplace, and a beautiful chandelier hung from the ceiling. It was the perfect place for cozy evenings together. The kitchen, though outdated, had a charming feel, and I couldn't wait to cook our first meal there. The bedroom, with its heavy drapes and old-fashioned wardrobe, was both enchanting and slightly eerie. It wasn't long before strange occurrences began. At first, it was the soft whispers that seemed to emanate from the walls. John and I exchanged nervous glances as we tried to make out the words. The whispers were unintelligible, but they sounded like voices from another time. One evening, as we sat in the living room, we heard the whispers again. This time, I was certain that the voice said, Help me. I shivered and looked at John, who had a concerned expression. He dismissed it as a draft or our imagination, but the unease lingered. As the weeks went by, the whispers grew more frequent. I decided to confide in our neighbor, Mrs. Davis, who had lived in the neighborhood for decades. She was known as the local historian and a keeper of town secrets. Mrs. Davis listened to my story with a knowing look. That house, dear, she began. It has a history and not a pleasant one. It was built by a wealthy family in the late 1800s, the Chattertons. They were reclusive, strange people, and the townsfolk had always whispered about their dark practices. She paused for effect. The Chattertons dabbled in the occult, trying to communicate with the dead. They believed the house had a connection to the spirit world, and they performed rituals in the hopes of unlocking its secrets. My heart raced as I realized that the whispers we heard might be connected to the Chattertons' experiments. Mrs. Davis went on. It said that they summoned a presence they couldn't control, and it cursed the house. After that, no one dared to live there, and the Chatterton family vanished without a trace. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The house we had so eagerly moved into had a dark and chilling history. But what could we do? We had just started our life together, and leaving wasn't an option. We decided to research the house's history and learn more about the Chatterton family. Our research led us to old newspaper clippings and journal entries from the late 1800s. The more we discovered, the more we realized the depth of the Chatterton family's obsession with the supernatural. They believed that the house was a portal to the afterlife and that they could communicate with the dead through seances and dark rituals. One journal in particular made my pulse rise. The whispers grow louder and I fear we have awakened something dark. Shadows move through the house at night and I've seen apparitions in the hallways. We must find a way to undo what we've done before it's too late. It was evident that the Chattertons had unleashed something beyond their control, and it had plagued the house ever since. As we delved deeper into the history, we couldn't ignore the increasing occurrences in the house. Doors would open and close on their own, and we heard footsteps in empty rooms. The whispers continued, and I couldn't help but feel that they were trying to tell us something. One night, we awoke to the sound of a child crying. John rushed out of bed and followed the sound to the nursery. There he saw a faint, ghostly figure, a little girl in a white dress. She turned to him with tearful eyes, her voice trembling as she said, Help me, please. As he reached out to touch her, she disappeared into thin air. John returned to our room, his face pale. I saw her, he said, his voice shaking. A little girl, just like the one from the old photographs we found in the attic, she was asking for help. We couldn't ignore the plea of the ghostly child any longer. We reached out to Mrs. Davis once more, hoping she could shed light on the mysterious girl. She listened intently and revealed that the Chattertons had a daughter, Emily, who had gone missing and was never found. It was believed that the entity they had summoned had taken her, and her spirit was trapped in the house. We realized that Emily's spirit was trying to communicate with us, asking for the help she never received in life. We couldn't turn our backs on her, and we decided to try and find a way to release her from the house's curse. Mrs. Davis suggested that we perform a ritual to free Emily's spirit. She explained that it would be a way to break the connection between the Chatterton's experiments and the trapped souls. We were hesitant but desperate to bring peace to the house. With Mrs. Davis's guidance, we gathered the necessary materials and prepared for the ritual. The air grew heavy as we lit candles, burned sage, and chanted incantations. The whispers in the walls grew louder and more frantic, as if the spirits were aware of our intentions. 
In the midst of the ritual, a chill filled the room and a shadowy figure appeared before us. It was Emily, her eyes filled with both fear and longing. She whispered, Thank you, before slowly fading away, leaving behind an overwhelming sense of relief. As the ritual concluded, the house fell silent. The whispers were gone and the oppressive atmosphere lifted. It was as though the curse that had plagued the house for decades had finally been broken. We felt a sense of peace we had never experienced before. In the weeks that followed, the house no longer felt haunted. It was a place of warmth, and we could finally enjoy our marriage without the constant presence of restless spirits. Emily had found her release, and the darkness that had clung to the house had dissipated. As I watched my family's car disappear into the distance, I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. My parents were heading out of town for the weekend, leaving me alone in our old creaky house. I was no stranger to solitude, but this time felt different. A heavy feeling settled in my chest, and an unshakable feeling of dread began to creep into my thoughts. The house itself was a relic of the past, a grand structure with imposing pillars and a sprawling, overgrown garden. It was beautiful in its own way, but as the sun dipped below the horizon and shadows stretched across the property, it transformed into something foreboding. I reluctantly closed the front door and locked it the click echoing through the empty hallway. The house felt too big, too silent, and suddenly I felt too small. The first night alone in a house could be daunting, but as time wore on, I had imagined myself growing into the role. I could make my own meals, watch my favorite movies, and revel in the freedom of being the master of my own domain. Yet as I moved from room to room, something about the darkness outside felt oppressive, as if it were closing in on me. I made my way to the kitchen, trying to shake off the feeling of unease. The familiar space with its warm wooden cabinets and cozy ambience was meant to be comforting. However, the faintest hint of a draft seemed to whisper through the room. I tightened the shawl around my shoulders and decided to prepare a simple meal to distract myself. As I stood at the stove, the low hum of the refrigerator and the ticking of the kitchen clock were the only sounds that reached my ears. The house was eerily silent, and with each creak and groan, I couldn't help but feel as though it had a life of its own. I had always known it was old, but that night, it felt ancient, bearing secrets from generations long past. I finished my meal and tried to find solace in the glow of the television. I put on a comedy, but even the laugh track couldn't drown out the unsettling sense of isolation. The show's canned laughter sounded more like mocking than mirth, and I switched it off, casting the room into silence once more. Reluctantly, I made my way upstairs to my bedroom. The old wooden steps creaked beneath my weight, creating a symphony of unsettling sounds. I couldn't help but look over my shoulder, half expecting to see something lurking in the shadows behind me. Of course, there was nothing there, but that didn't stop the creeping feeling that I was not alone. My bedroom, with its soft muted colors and familiar scent, should have been a sanctuary, but that night, it was just another chamber in the house of unease. The window offered a view of the moonlit garden, its unkempt hedges and statues shrouded in a cold glow. I closed the curtains and turned off the lights, plunging the room into darkness. Lying in bed, I couldn't help but listen to the strange sounds of the old house. It was as if it were alive, breathing in the night, exhaling soft sighs and whispers. I closed my eyes and tried to remind myself that it was just an old house, that my unease was nothing more than my imagination running wild. Yet despite my rationalizations, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Hours passed and the darkness seemed to press down on me, heavy and suffocating. I tossed and turned in bed, unable to find comfort. The gentle, rhythmic ticking of the clock in the hallway only served to remind me of the relentless passage of time. Just as I felt myself drifting into sleep, a noise from downstairs jolted me awake. It was a soft but distinct thud followed by the sound of something scraping against the floor. My heart began to race and I strained to listen. Silence settled in the room once more. I debated whether to investigate the source of the noise, but fear kept me frozen in place. The darkness outside my window seemed impenetrable, and the shadows in the room appeared to twist and contort. My imagination was running wild, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister lurked in the house. Another noise, this one louder and more distinct, broke the silence. 
It was the unmistakable sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, coming up the stairs. My heart pounded in my chest as the footsteps drew nearer, the creaking of the old wooden steps growing louder. I clutched the blanket tightly, unsure of what to do. My first instinct was to call the police, but the feeling of vulnerability kept me rooted in place. The footsteps reached the top of the staircase and drew closer to my bedroom. Panic surged through me, and I scrambled out of bed, searching for a place to hide. The closet seemed like the safest option, and I squeezed into it, pulling the door closed as quietly as I could. I left a slight crack to peer through, my eyes fixed on the dimly lit room beyond. The footsteps grew louder and the door to my bedroom slowly creaked open. A figure emerged from the darkness, barely visible in the moonlight. It was a man, tall and slender, dressed in tattered clothing. His face was obscured, hidden by the shadows. He moved with a deliberate, almost predatory grace, as if he knew the house intimately. The intruder's presence sent a cold feeling down my spine. He moved through the room, his eyes scanning every corner. The moonlight revealed a gaunt face with hollow cheeks and a scruffy beard. In his hand, he held a knife, its blade gleaming in the dim light. I held my breath as the intruder approached the closet. His steps were slow and deliberate, and I prayed that he wouldn't discover me. The closet door seemed like paper, too flimsy to protect me from the danger lurking just outside. My heart pounded in my chest, drowning out all other sounds. The man's hand reached for the closet door and I braced myself for the inevitable. But then, just as his fingers brushed the wood, he hesitated. A low growl echoed through the room, causing the intruder to freeze. The sound was not human. It was primal and filled with menace. I strained to see what had caused it, and my eyes widened in terror. From the darkness of the room, a pair of glowing eyes emerged. They were feral, belonging to a creature that shouldn't exist within the confines of the house. The growl grew louder, more menacing, and the intruder backed away from the closet. In that moment, fear gave way to curiosity. I couldn't see the creature clearly, but I had the distinct feeling that it was not a typical household pet. It was something wild and untamed, a guardian of the darkness. The intruder, sensing that he was outmatched, fled from the room, leaving the closet door ajar. I waited, my heart still racing as the growling receded into the distance. I had narrowly escaped a terrifying encounter and the feeling of dread had shifted to one of profound gratitude. Hours passed and the first light of dawn began to filter through the curtains. With trembling hands I emerged from the closet, still cautious and unsure of what I might find. The house was silent once more and the intruder was gone, but the encounter had left an indelible mark on me. As I watched the sunrise I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe for the mysterious guardian that had protected me. The old house had revealed a hidden secret, a protector of the night that had stood between me and danger. The rest of the weekend passed without incident, and when my parents returned, I shared my harrowing experience with them. They were understandably shocked and concerned, but we found no sign of the intruder, and the police were unable to determine his identity. In the following weeks, I began to research the history of the house, hoping to uncover the origins of the guardian that had saved me. It was then that I stumbled upon an old, faded photograph, hidden in a dusty corner of the attic. The photograph depicted a man, tall and slender, dressed in tattered clothing. His face was obscured, but I recognized the scruffy beard and gaunt features. He was standing in the overgrown garden, his gaze fixed on something beyond the frame. The photograph was dated more than a century ago. I couldn't explain the connection between the intruder and the man in the photograph, but it was clear that the old house held secrets that spanned generations. The guardian that had protected me was a mystery, a part of the house's history that had come to life in the darkest of moments. As time passed, the sense of unease in the old house began to fade, replaced by a feeling of reverence for the guardian that had watched over it for generations. The creak of the front door echoed through the empty house as my parents departed for a weekend getaway, leaving my sister, Emily, and me alone. At 17, I was no stranger to spending time on my own. I turned to Emily, who was 12, and tried to muster a reassuring smile. It's just the two of us this weekend, Em. We've got the whole house to ourselves. She nodded, her eyes wide with a mix of excitement and trepidation. Yeah, but it's kind of creepy when it's so quiet. I couldn't argue with her. 
The silence in the house was overwhelming, a heavy presence that seemed to settle in every corner. I told myself it was the absence of our parents that made the house seem so much larger and emptier than usual. We had our dinner in the cozy kitchen, chatting about school and life, doing our best to chase away the unease. But no matter how much we talked, the silence of the house lingered in the background, like a watchful spirit. After dinner I suggested we watch a movie to distract ourselves from the disconcerting atmosphere. We settled on a comedy, and Emily's laughter filled the room as the characters on the screen stumbled through their ridiculous antics. It was a welcome distraction, but even as we laughed I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone. The movie ended and Emily stifled a yawn. I'm heading to bed, you coming? I shook my head. I'll join you later. Just going to check things out downstairs first. She gave me a worried look but didn't protest. With a quick good night, she headed upstairs, leaving me alone in the dimly lit living room. The house seemed to creak and groan as I moved through it, its age and weight pressing down on me. The silence was so profound that it felt as though it was closing in, squeezing the very air from the room. I took a deep breath and tried to shake off the feeling of dread. As I passed the hallway leading to the basement, I heard a faint sound, like a whisper carried on the wind. I paused, my heart racing, straining to hear more. But the house remained still, as though it had swallowed the sound. Chalking it up to my imagination, I continued my exploration of the house. I made my way to the large, darkened living room, where heavy drapes blocked out the moonlight. I switched on the overhead light, dispelling some of the darkness that clung to the room. The furniture was old, relics from a different time, and the room held a sense of history that was both fascinating and unsettling. I'd heard stories of past occupants, tales of love and loss, of joy and sorrow, and sometimes it felt as though those stories were imprinted on the very walls. I moved to the bookshelves that lined one wall, running my fingers over the spines of old books and photo albums. As I leafed through one album, I came across a series of faded photographs, they depicted a family, a couple with two children and a house that looked strikingly similar to the one I now lived in. There was something haunting about those photographs, a sense of familiarity and yet a gnawing discomfort. The faces in the photographs were unfamiliar, but I couldn't shake the feeling that they were somehow connected to the house, as though the past had reached out to touch the present. With a shiver, I closed the album and returned it to the shelf. The room had grown colder and I could feel the presence of the past, lingering like a shadow in the corners. I decided it was time to head upstairs and join Emily. The heavy silence of the house had grown oppressive and the stories of the past were pressing in on me. As I climbed the stairs I could have sworn I heard a faint whisper behind me, a voice carried on the wind, but when I turned there was nothing there. I joined Emily in our shared bedroom the dim glow of her nightlight casting dark shadows on the walls. She was already asleep, her breathing soft and steady. I climbed into my own bed, trying to put the unsettling feeling of the house behind me. But the night brought no solace. As I lay in the darkness, I couldn't escape the feeling of being watched. The room seemed to pulse with an unsettling energy, and I could hear the soft rustling of fabric and the gentle creak of floorboards as if someone were moving through the house. Hours passed and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was not alone in the room. I turned to look at Emily, half expecting to see a figure lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing there and my unease only deepened. I decided to check on the source of the sounds, telling myself that it was probably just the old house settling. I climbed out of bed and made my way to the hallway. The darkness was thick like a shroud and I moved cautiously guided only by the faint moonlight filtering through the windows. As I descended the stairs, the sounds grew louder, more distinct. It was as though the house had come to life, its walls murmuring secrets that had been long buried. I followed the sounds to the living room, where the overhead light flickered to life, casting a creepy glow on the room. And there in the center of the room I saw her, a young girl, no older than Emily, with long dark hair and eyes that held a haunting sadness. She was dressed in an old-fashioned nightgown, her feet bare and dirty. She looked at me with a mixture of fear and longing, as though she had been waiting for someone to finally see her. My heart raced as I took in the sight of the ghostly figure before me. I had heard the stories, 
tales of a young girl who had lived in the house long ago and had vanished without a trace. It was said that she had never left the house, that her spirit still lingered in the dark corners, searching for something lost. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe, as the young girl reached out a hand toward me, her fingers trembling. And then, with a soft, plaintive whisper, she spoke. Help me. The sound was barely audible, a faint echo in the night, but it gave me a scary feeling. I knew I had to do something, to find out what had happened to this lost soul, to help her find peace. But as I took a step toward her, she faded away, dissolving into the shadows. The house fell silent once more, the only sound the thudding of my own heart. I returned to my room, my mind racing with questions and fear. The young girl's presence had shaken me to my core and I couldn't escape the feeling that her story was entwined with the history of the house. Morning came and I told Emily about the ghostly encounter. She listened with wide eyes, her fear mirrored in my own. We decided to investigate the history of the house, hoping to uncover the mystery of the young girl and the stories that had been passed down through generations. Our research revealed a tragic tale. The young girl named Isabella had lived in the house with her family in the late 1800s. She had vanished one fateful night, leaving her family in despair. Despite extensive searches, she was never found, and her disappearance had remained a haunting mystery. As we delve deeper into the history, we learned that the house had passed through various owners over the years, and each had their own stories of unexplained phenomena and ghostly encounters. It seemed that Isabella's spirit had remained in the house, searching for answers and perhaps someone who could finally help her find peace. Determined to uncover the truth, we embarked on a quest to find out what had happened to Isabella. We scoured old records, visited local archives, and even interviewed descendants of past owners. Slowly, we pieced together a narrative of a family torn apart by tragedy, a series of secrets and the mystery of a lost girl who had never found her way home. As we delved deeper into the past, we began to experience more encounters with Isabella's ghost. She appeared to us at night, her presence both scary and heart-wrenching. She would speak in soft, mournful whispers, imploring us to help her, to uncover the truth of what had happened on that fateful night so long ago. We couldn't deny her plea, and our determination to unravel the mystery only grew stronger. Together, we combed through the old attic, searching for clues that had remained hidden for generations. And then, as we sifted through dusty boxes, 